Come in. Welcome. Welcome to Mystery Theater. I am Hyman Brown. Since time immemorial, stories have begun with the classic phrase, Once Upon a Time. Then to the avid and eager listener would come a history of love, hate, adventure, horror, every emotion the teller wanted to convey. But history, like all words, is not necessarily what we think it means. Its basic definition is a narrative of events connected with a real or imaginary object, person, or career. Note. It does not confine itself to the past. So, here is a history of the future. The kind that begins, supposing if... We recognize your presence, daughter. What is your desire? Not mine, but the earth creature's. He demands an audience with you. Demands? He says that if he is not returned immediately, his people will send their ships against us and shoot the mothership out of the sky. Our mystery drama, Enemy from Space, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Mandel Kramer. I will be back shortly with Act One. This is the year of 2029. President Winston Alexander is midway through his second term, a commanding figure on the world stage who has brought America to a new surge of leadership. The unfortunate breakdown of arm limitation talks have more than ever isolated the two superpowers and with nuclear proliferation of fact, the only hope of world peace is that the two superpowers are at last nearing a major accord that will mean peace. This is where we stand on this fateful night at exactly 3 a.m., February 25th, 2029. This is Central Command, Triple Red Alert. Repeat, this is CENCOM, Triple Red Alert. Attention all units, highest priority... This is alert AAA. This is a triple red alert. An unidentified flying object has pierced the DMZ and has now landed on the front lawn of the White House. Mr. President. Mr. President! What is it, Andy? Why are you knocking so frantically at Father's door? I don't know, Ginny. We may be under attack. Now, under... Yeah, stick with me until I check on your father. I... I'd better try the door. Mr. President, I... Good Lord, no. He's not in his bed. Oh, where is he, Andy? Where is Daddy? Daddy! Daddy! The window is wide open. That thing is still there. Ginny, come back. They must have taken it. Ginny, don't show yourself to the enemy. Get down. Get down. What for? They're not paying any attention to us. That is some kind of warcraft out there. They might fire on you. I don't care what they do to me. They've got my father. Oh, stop them, Andy. Stop them somehow. Ginny, by now, every piece of equipment in the U.S. has been alerted to stop whatever the heck that thing is. Oh, Andy. That nobody wants to see the president kidnapped. I'm... But we can't bring any firepower to bear on him without risking your father's life. Well, what are you and the rest of you little soldiers going to do? Well, I can't tell you exactly. There are contingency plans for things like this? What? I don't know. I'm, I'm not a member of CENCOM, but there must be something that... Attention, please. Attention. Who's that? It's coming from a spacecraft. There is no cause for alarm. We come in peace. This is Commander Varg aboard the spaceship. We are a communications vessel from the matrix of the mothership Niklo 7. We seek information only and have borrowed your President Alexander in order to get it. 
He is quite safe. When we have completed our talk, he will be returned unharmed. I don't believe him, Andy. Why doesn't he let Daddy say something? To reassure you, we will let President Alexander talk to you now. I realize this is very unusual for everyone's best interests. I ask you to call off all alerts and to take no action for the next 24 hours. I am assured by my, my unexpected hosts that I am in no personal danger, nor is anyone else. I am being taken to meet Commander Vard's superiors for some as yet unrevealed reason. I have agreed to a truce for 24 hours. If I am not returned by then, I ask Congress to put the nation on full war footing for its defense. Alexander. Oh, but just a sec. Oh, oh, come in, Andy. Any news? No, not yet. Oh, do I have to be cooped up here like oh, this? Shinny, do I even have to answer that? You know what it's like out there? Panicsville. Oh, what do you think it's like in here? Inside me. Oh, hold me, Andy. Uh, I got you, Slugger. Oh. Now, hang in. What's happening to us, Andy? To the whole world? Who are they? I don't know, Jenny. Nobody knows yet. Where have they taken Dad and why? Don't you think I'd give my eye teeth to be able to answer those questions? Oh, never mind you. What about all those fancy tracking systems, our big sophisticated strategic command, or whatever you call them? Didn't they follow that saucer thing or whatever it was? Yeah, from the second after it lifted off, the darn thing just disappeared. Where? How? Darling, I'm a lucky little boy in the Air Force who ended up a president's aide de camp and I hope pretty soon his son-in-law, but I am not a scientist. Oh, don't try to waffle, Andy. You must have some idea. How could this spacecraft slip all our defenses? Well, first off, it has some kind of radar negator. Otherwise, it never could have gotten here. Second, who knows what this craft is vectored on? It could be traveling on a Mobius curve that took it upside down into some other space continuum or through a galactic time window. Uh -huh. All I know is we can't pick it up electronically by laser, satellite, spectroscope, nothing. It's just gone. Oh, and Dad with it? Gone? No, Gina, he's all right. What makes you so sure? You heard the man. What man? Well, whatever he was. Varg, the spaceship's commander. Oh. He promised he'd return your father after they talked to him. What do they, whoever they are, want to talk to him about? Well, search me. Oh, don't give the big stone face to me, Andy Harris. You've got to have some idea of what's going on. I swear to you, Ginny, I do not have one clue. And if they don't return Dad within 24 hours, then what? I, I guess we go on full wartime footing. Against what? Well, that's the big question, Ginny. It's bad enough that we have to take a step into the last unthinkable war, oh. but to have to make that step without knowing the enemy is kind of mind-boggling. Do we even know that they are the enemy? Yeah, I think President Alexander answered that one for us in the speech we heard. He was the one that set up the time limit. And the way I read it, he wasn't running all that scared. I think he was laying it on the other guys that they weren't dealing for much strength. You really honestly believe that, Andy? Oh, I don't know what I believe. And neither does anyone else. This is the one contingency nobody ever figured to make plans for. Welcome, Varg. You were successful, I hear. I am always successful. It's nice to know someone has a good opinion of you. Someday I will make you sorry for your contempt for me. It isn't contempt, Varg. You're beneath that. Do not give yourself airs, Zeda, because you are half borrowed from the life stream. We modules are just as good as you. I don't intend to argue with you. Have you brought our hostage? He is just beyond the door. 
Can we get on with the business at hand before the Supreme One questions the delay? Oh, one of these days, Zadar. Open. You may come in, Mr. President. Thank you. This is Dr. Zadar. You will be in her control now. May I ask why I've been brought here, wherever I am? My instructions do not permit me to do so. Then I demand to be taken before this... this Supreme One. What is it you want of me? My desires are simple and quite practical, Mr. President. I am a doctor. A medical doctor? Yes. May I ask your name? Zeda. That's all? Dr. Zeda? Won't that serve? It's only identification, after all. Why am I here? As far as it concerns me, for a basic series of tests. Medical. I'm not applying to be a citizen of whatever state you represent. You have joined Nicholas Seven as a passenger. It is routine for you to be quarantined until we can determine that you are properly immunized. There isn't time for that. I thought I had made it quite clear to your Commander Varg that if I am not returned to Earth or am not in contact with it within 24 hours, a state of war will exist between us and your country, whatever it's called. We have no country. I beg your pardon? We are survivors, limited to the travelers on this spaceship. Oh, this is a large cosmos in itself. We are not inconsequential, but we are a culture in search of a home. I don't understand exactly why I have been... Well, why mince words? Why I have been kidnapped. What function can I serve for you? I am not quite sure of that myself. It is something you will have to discuss with the Supreme One after I have finished my tests. Give me your arm, please. What for? I wish to take a blood sample. If you don't get me in to see your precious Supreme One, Dr. Zeta, you will have a bath of blood... My country, for its own protection, will throw all our might against you and blow you and your mother ship out of the sky. Not while you are hostage. Oh, yes. I would disappear with you. I am, after all, not indispensable. You mean you would permit your people to destroy you? I would expect them to if you were the enemy. Are you? First of all, I must carry out my tests. And then... I will seek an audience with the Supreme One and tell him you wish to appear before him. I bow in reverence before you, O oh my father. We recognize your presence, daughter. What is your desire? Not mine, but the Earth's creatures. He demands an audience with you. Demands? He says that if he is not returned immediately, his people will send their ships against us and shoot the mothership out of the sky. Fortunately, since we are in another time continuum, they cannot find us unless we choose to show ourselves. His threat and his demands are useless. He wants also to know why we have taken him and what it is you want of him. I want you to adapt him. Wash his brain clean so that we can send him back to fulfill our purpose. I don't think I can do that, Father. He is too strong. Then you must change him. Make him completely one of us. I don't know if that is possible. All things are possible. Did you not become completely one of us? Yes. So then shall he. But I can't do that without killing his... It is hard for me to describe to you, Oming, my father. Because we are different. It is you who are different. Do not fill me with old angers. Are you still prattling about the non-existent, what you call the soul? Did we not stamp that out of you? Yes, father. Then should we hesitate to destroy it in a stranger... I am not interested in President Winston Alexander, the earthling, except as he shall serve our needs. However you achieve the result, I want him fully conditioned to carry out those needs and our commands. Now remember... 
this is a story of supposing if. Supposing there was a mothership from some unimaginable planet coursing in space, looking for a new land to colonize, and supposing they singled out Earth and felt that it was their promised land. How much would they lay claim to? Or would they simply follow the pattern of colonialism and take it all? Mystery Theater will return shortly with Act Two. The United States, since its birth, has traditionally been a haven for all displaced persons who seek a new chance in life. By and large, with few exceptions, no country has welcomed the alien more generously. But alien in a science-oriented society is no longer a simple description of someone who may differ in minor ways, such as color, creed, or politics. Tomorrow's alien may come from a background so foreign that there is no hope there is no hope a world can be shared. You have been long, Dr. Zeta. What news do you bring? I am afraid not what you want to hear, President Alexander. You mean I am not to see your supreme one? He has commissioned me to be his ambassador. Well, under other circumstances, I couldn't be more charmed. Perhaps even under these. What do we have to discuss? Mr. Alexander, if that is a correct term to apply to you. It is perfectly correct. Except somehow between us, I... Yes. Well, I don't know what made me say that. Some... Some strange tug underneath everything makes me want to deny any formality between us. I must tell you, Mr. Alexander, you are wasting your time. I am not a woman as you conceive of women. Are you so sure? Yes. You must understand about us aboard this ship. We are only humanoids. You cannot judge us by your standards. Humanoids? Robots, if you prefer the word. Although it is not exact. Let me explain. The mother ship on which we are now traveling was named after the planet that was our home. Niklo 7 in the Adumbrian galaxy. Some generations ago, a supernova in our galaxy exploded. And in the Holocaust that swept across our planet, almost all of my ancestors were destroyed. Those that were left found in that environment that was left, the human body, as you would call it, could not be sustained. You mean there was no atmosphere? No air to breathe? What? Oh, there was atmosphere. Poisoned by radiation... And that forced us to adapt. To adapt in what way? Since the human body was eroded, we had to provide an envelope in which to sustain life. We developed what was essentially a machine, an engine wrapped in the simulacrum, the semblance of the human. And we powered it with the mind, the individual souls of those left alive. Well, if you were so successful... Why didn't you develop and recolonize your planet? Because, unfortunately, our atmosphere was not stable. And in the time following the Holocaust, we were left with no air to breathe and no way to adapt our robots to some other form of energy. The strongest of us set out on this ship to seek a home in another planet. And you have brought me here to discuss introducing you and your shipmates into our culture? Oh, no, Mr. President. There is nothing to discuss. It is my function to prepare you so that you will make it possible for us to take over your planet. How? It would be hard for me to explain. In storage, against the necessity for constant replacement, we have robots ready to be activated. You see this machine here. Machine? Perhaps you did not recognize it as such. Two rooms behind glass doors. In one, they are already placing your robot. My robot? 
He does not look much like you yet. But the electrodes they are attaching to him will be synchronized with the electrodes we attach to you. And when we are finished, he will be in every physical sense a simulacrum of you, a duplicate of you. And what happens to me? You become a husk to be discarded. What? Mm, an outmoded model, unable to function in the atmosphere of our new world. What new world? The one that will exist in the dust of radiation and the end of Earth. The world that all of us from Niklo 7 are going to build with your help. I will not be party to anything like this. You have no choice. Vog, seize him. No. Oh, 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 oh. All right, Vog. Put him in the transformer. Afternoon, Ginny. Afternoon, Andy. Oh, I've been dying till you got here. What's new? Uh, not a thing. No news of Dad? None. Oh, no. Well, what else is happening? What isn't? We've tried to keep it as secret as possible, but there are always leaks. Well, what is this? Uh, thank heavens the country doesn't know about it yet, and the press is capped, but the diplomatic wires are burning. Well, what do they say? Well, they don't say anything, baby. They just ask. <gasps> and the Veep has been on the hotline off and on all day with President Brusco. Well, what's his reaction? Uh, what's in it for them, first off? Then diplomatic regrets. They probably figure if we're going to be under attack from outside in space, it might be time for a little more cooperation. But we don't know yet that they are under attack. Baby, a pirate ship turns up on the White House lawn, and in spite of the greatest security set up in this old globe, they just take our president away like he was off for Disneyland? Hey, everybody's running scared because they don't know what's next. Baby, we don't know what we're up against. <laughs> This is President Alexander, aboard a shuttle spacecraft, returning me as promised to the White House at the pre-agreed time. I have been well treated and am in the best of health. No one need have any concern about me. I have just completed preliminary discussions with a friendly power from outer space, which will have dramatic and earth-shaking consequences for the safety of America and the whole world. I am aware that all our armed forces have been alerted. I ask them as President and Commander-in-Chief to extend safe conduct to the spaceship and allow it to land me and then depart in full safety. Where is it, Andy? I can hear it, but I can't see it. Uh, you, me, and everybody else, Jenny. Hmm? I'll lay you odds even radar and transcom haven't got a fix on it. But it can't be just invisible. Well, it could be probably sets up some sort of magnetic field which locks it out of all our sensors, including just plain old eyesight. But it sounds louder and louder. You can tell it's approaching. Ten to one, it doesn't have to. They just want to warn us they're on the way. You better keep to uh, one side of the window, Jenny. <gasps> there it is. See it, Andy? Uh, where? Oh, by the monument. It's skimming in like, like a first day. I wish that's all it was. Oh, you don't think anything's going to go wrong, do you? Sure had better not. Oh, Since that thing showed up in the first place, I got a hunch nothing's going right. Oh, Daddy. Virginia. It's all right. It's all right, baby. It's all right. Oh, it's been such a nightmare. It oh, was quite Daddy. an adventure. What are you doing, still up? Uh, is there anyone who's been aware of what's going on in the last 24 hours that sleeps and out of the quest? Well, I hope the knowledge hasn't been too general. Oh, I wouldn't know. But Andy says not. He thinks they've been able to keep the lid on. I hope so. Oh, you're, you're okay, aren't you, Daddy? As you can see. Oh, but what went on? Why did they take you? Who are they? I uh, mean... No, 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 no. One question at a time. <laughs> and incidentally, let me close this door. Tell me. Who are they? What happened? First of all, they are friends. Friends? I shudder to think of what might be about to happen to our world if they hadn't warned me. Warned you of what? A monstrous plot to destroy America. What? An unholy alliance to take over and rule the world, if there is any left of it. What do you mean? It's too complex to explain to you, Virginia. There is a secret alliance between a group of mineral-rich nations and our main enemy, which is called the Consortium. The Consortium? They are poised to unleash a massive strike against us which would wipe us out before we had a chance to reply. Now that plot has been uncovered. 
I, we have an opportunity to, to treat with them, or at least with our knowledge to instigate a preventive strike. Thanks to our friends from outer space, we have a chance to buy some time, or force enough, to hammer out a new agreement. If not, we must move first. That's the decision that I have to make. And unfortunately, it must be made alone. Oh, poor Dad. Like you always say, if you only could have shared it with Boots. Um, Boots? Mom, what you used to call her. Oh, oh, yes, yes, of course. <laughs> But what, what does that have to do with anything? This is a decision of state. Who is it, Six audience? Commander Varg, oh, Supreme One. I have a little time left. My light is growing dim. You shall be my successor, and I will have you bound in union to my daughter. In her burns the only flame which can guarantee us immortality. You must guard it first of all things. You sent for me, great father. I ask you about the earthling. Varg has delivered him back to his planet. Has this module, this simulacrum, been properly vested with our ideas and desires? Yes, father. Then... We control this robot completely? Yes, Father. And the real... What is his name? Alexander has been eliminated? I didn't hear your answer, daughter. The real Alexander has ceased to be a threat. Mm. Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah. Who, who is it? Andy, it's me. Jim. Uh, hold it. I'll, I'll be right there. Uh, uh, what is it, Ginny? Uh, what are you doing wandering around at five in the morning? Andy, I'm scared. Can I come in? Mm. I don't know how to say this, so it makes sense. You're the only one I can say it to. Say what? Uh, come on, baby, spill it. Andy, the man they brought back in the spacecraft? Uh-huh. That's not my dad. It's not President Winston Alexander. There's just no way. That is my father. As president of the United States, Winston Alexander holds the fate of the world in less than one hand. In cold fact, in the finger that may press the button to unleash atomic warfare to end the world. President Alexander has been replaced by a robot activated by a power in space that has everything to gain from the end of Earth and nothing to lose. I shall return shortly with Act Three. While America sleeps safer in the year 2029, secure that her kidnapped president has been returned safe and sound, his daughter is the only one to question what we know to be the truth, that the man who sits at one end of the hotline is a robot from outer space, controlled and operated at the whim of the leader of a spacecraft, desperate to find a home for his alien cargo. Only President Alexander's daughter faintly glimpses the truth. Can her instinct be enough to stop disaster? What are you talking about, Ginny? I tell you, he is not my father. Well, you mean they brainwashed him or something? I don't know what I mean, Andy. It's just... It's just, I, I, I don't know, little things. He is not my father. What little things? Oh, I don't know. Like, he calls me Virginia. Now, that's, that's funny. That's strange. Dad never called me anything but Jin. And he doesn't... I don't know how to describe it. It, it. it just doesn't feel right. Ginny, we've all been through the ringer and been pretty shook. Now, you're just jumping at shadows. I'm not. At, at Boots. Huh? Boots. That was Dad's name for my mother. Dad could never forget it. Ginny, your mother's been dead for 15 years. But you don't forget things like that. Dad wouldn't. He can't forget his own name for her. 
that he loved to call us? If it isn't your father, who is it? I don't know. I... Oh, Andy, do you think I'm losing my mind? Because there's something about him that scares me. It scares me right down to my heels. Wake up, Mr. President Alexander. Uh, Wake up. Uh, well. That's such a long name. Oh. We must find something more suitable. What did your wife call you? What? Well, what did you say? Did your wife have a name for you? My, my, my wife? Ruth? Boots? She, uh... Yes, yeah, she, uh... She, she, she called me Wink. Wink? Yes, short, short for Winston. It was a silly name, but... I liked it. Wink. I like it, too. Wink. Well, where am I? Where I brought you. To my bed. To your bed? I, I can't stay here. You must. Where else can I hide you? Hide me? Why, why, why must I be hidden? Because I should have destroyed you once I made your other self. What other self? The one we sent back to Earth. The one we programmed to destroy all the people on Earth. So we Nicklausians may have a home again. To destroy all the people on Earth? How? Why? You ask me. You were the ones who made the seed of your own destruction. What the bombs do not obliterate, the radiation will disintegrate. When there are no living left, we robots can make it home. Nuclear war? That's unthinkable. Look, I, I know President Bruskov. He's a man of sanity. He could not start such a war. It is not he who will start it. Who then? Yourself. What? Me? In the image I have created of you and sent back to take your place. Wait a minute. Now I'm beginning to remember that, that, that machine, that scanner, and a robot that you were molding so that it would look like me. But you, you didn't. You, you, you couldn't have. I already have. He is sleeping at this moment in your bed on Earth. When he rises tomorrow, he will still believe what he has been programmed to believe. That his friend, President Bruskov, and a number of leaders from the Third World have betrayed him and are prepared to start an atomic war against America. Convinced he has no other option, he will initiate the war instead. In the resulting Holocaust, what survivors are left, we will exterminate. So that your Earth will be fit for us to occupy. Well, then what purpose am I being saved for? When we met, you felt the same urge I did. A long-forgotten urge for me. I am not like most Nicklausians. My mother was alive, the last of the humans on our planet. You are the first living man I have ever known. What? I want you. You want me? You want me for what? Uh, as a luck charm? As, as a house pet? Look, I have got to stop what you say is going to happen. There is no way. There has to be. Zadar, listen to me. Now, you say that your mother was human, and you are her child. So you must have some feelings. If you, if you, have, any, if you have any love for me... Love? Well, what made you keep me alive? I don't know. I wanted to know, to feel, to understand why I felt these, these things in me. I never wink. Is what I feel for you, love? I doubt that. Love doesn't ask or demand. Love gives. You want me to give you something? Yes. Give me my freedom to go back and to save my world. Bog, what are you doing here? I've been listening to you plan treason against Domeng and our ship. But I ran a screen so no one could listen. As commander of the ship, I have my own communications. No one can shut them down. What is it you want? Him. Why? To eliminate him, as you should have done. Leave him alone. Give me the Earthman to destroy. And give yourself to me. And I will keep your treachery my secret. No. 
I am in no mood to argue. I will destroy him now. Don't. I warn you. How can you stop me? Like this. No. Oh, how can you? No one is to be armed but me. You fool. I am a doctor. If I can create the simulacrum of life, do you think I would not have the power to destroy it? But we, we are deathless. Only the human spirit is that. A robot dies forever with the body. But you can give another body to... Never. It's time that all of us went down to destruction. Good Lord, he's just... He's just disintegrating. It's not a body at all. It's just a mass of wires and circuits and transistors. Is that what's sitting in place of me at this very minute? And programmed to blow up your world as you know it. I've got to get back and stop it. You can't stop it. Only I can do that. Then you have got to. I don't have to do anything. But this I can do out of free will. You said that loving was giving. I only hope we are in time. We've got to get back to the White House, Andy. Yeah, I know. I have the duty in an hour. Tonight, I have the black box. The phone? Yeah, the trigger. Oh. Once the code words are spoken into it, that's the end of it all. Oh, no. No, Andy. He's not planning to use it. I don't know, honey. This has been a day to remember. Or forget... Ever since he came back from from wherever the space nicks took him, he's been obsessed by this plot, he says. They proved to him that the other side is set to push the button. I want to tell you, the cabinet meeting was a shambles. He is not my father. Well, whatever he is, he is not the president. Man, that's why I had to get you away from there to talk to you for a moment. Crazy as it is, somewhere along in this afternoon, watching him, I... I knew you were right. Mm. The guy in the White House is not our president. Could you convince any of the cabinet members or, or the Veep of that? I'm nah, just a lowly lieutenant colonel and the president's special aide. I'm still on the outside looking in. So what can we do? I try to keep cool. Nothing's happened yet. And nothing is going to happen. But you just said that... Yeah, we... that I was on the outside looking in. That, that's true. Except for one thing. Tonight, I have the special duty. Remember? The black box. Right. If he tries to use it, Ginny, I'm going to stop him. Are we going to announce this arrival? There is no need. I have the radar negator on. We can penetrate your DMZ and have landed before they can activate a screen. Still, to avoid the risk of upsetting an already uneasy situation... Wink. How much more would it upset if you were to announce yourself as President Alexander returning when your whole world believes you are already there? Yes, I suppose you're right. But what do we do when we land? There will be ground forces. Helpless against the force field I maintain and the one I shall throw around you. And then what happens? We find your simulacrum and I destroy him as I did Mark. And then? Then. All is as it was before we invaded your world. I will return to the mothership, and Earth will be safe. But you could stay, Zeda. You could stay and... Nothing. There is nothing for us. And I must return to take command of the Niklos 7 and drive it forever out of your orbit. But where will you go? Where well, we should have gone long ago, when we ceased to be anything but automatons. To course into the empty void of space till fuel or air runs out. And we will be no more. In the end, the ship will break up. We will all disintegrate like Vark and disappear into atomic dust. I won't let that happen to you. There is no way you can stop it. And no time to discuss it further. We are about to land. <laughs> Close the door, Colonel. Yes, sir, Mr. President. Only, uh... Only what? Uh, Ginny wanted to talk to you for a moment. Well, Ginny will have to wait. I have no time to talk to her now. Close the door. Yes, sir. Bring the box over to the desk and open it. Yes, sir. Why did you, uh, want me to open it, sir? Because I'm going to have to use it. 
use it, Mr. President? The forces of evil have bound themselves together in an unholy alliance to wipe the America we know from the face of the earth. We have no choice but to take preemptive action. Open the box and give me the phone. No, sir. What? If you disobey my orders, I'll have you shot. Yes, sir, but not much chance of that, since I'm the only one that's armed at the moment. You think for one moment that that outmoded weapon that you're pointing at me could... What's that? I'll, I'll open the window and... It's the spaceship. What's it doing here? Let me see. The door is opening. Zayda, what are you doing here? Eliminating you. So, that is the end of it. And us, Wink? No. Don't go. I must. But I gave you something, Wink. I gave you back your world. What can I say? Only goodbye. Me and mine. We're a disease which had to be stamped out. And will be. You will never see or hear of us again. But at least once, Wink, I gave. I found out what love is all about. I would rather have lived it. But it is also worth dying for. I'll be back shortly with a final thought. The nights are lonelier than ever now for President Winston Alexander since his daughter Ginny married full colonel Andrew Harris. Oh, they live in Georgetown, not too far away, but far away are his thoughts, far away beyond the stars, with a woman named Zaida, who learned about the miracle of love just in time, but still too late. Our cast included Mandel Kramer, Evie Juster, and Russell Horton. Associate Director, Marlon Swing. This is Hyman Brown, producer-director, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, then, pleasant dreams. Radio Mystery Theater presents Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Today, a tale of conscience the self-accusing fear that most of us at one time or another have experienced. When it's but a twinge of conscience, we can push it from us, shove it away, out of sight, under the rug, dispose of it easily. But when conscience is keenly felt, it can be so all-consuming that there's but one solution, and that is death. All I asked for, Anna, was a loan from your mother to get me started. I'm sorry she said no. Ask her again. What do you think I like begging... Oh, no, not me. I'm not going to. And as of now, they're going to have to pay their own way. If your mother and father don't shell out and help share the expenses, I'm going to tell them to get out, pack up, and leave. Jack, they're my parents. And it's my roof they're living under, food and rent free. Well, two can play at this game. I want them out of here. Our mystery drama, The Pardon, was taken from an original tale by Emil Bazin and written especially for the Mystery Theater by Gerald Keene. It stars Larry Haynes. I'll be back shortly with Act One. We're in a small mining town in Pennsylvania. Coal is again coming to the surface, much in demand. The town is beginning to prosper, but there are still the poor. And the family of Jack and his wife, Anna, are very poor. 
Jack was a miner once until his chest was crushed. Now the only work he can find is as an odd job man, which pays little. He's poor for the pocket, the spirit, and the disposition. Ada! Ada! Where is everybody? Anna! I'll smell anything on the stove at six o'clock. Well, maybe she's next door. I'll take a look outside. Anna! Where are you? Evening, Jack. Oh! Oh, good evening, Officer Garrity. <laughs> What's the problem, Jack? Huh? Problem? What problem? Who said there was a problem? Well, how many years have you known me, Jack? Oh, I don't know. Since you were a boy, about, uh, 29, 30 years. Mm-hmm. And I know you and Anna and your mother-in-law and father-in-law. So you're practically family. So you only call me Officer Garrity when something's bothering you. Well, it's Anna and the mother I, uh, come home, nothing cooking. Happens at least twice a week. You know, those two start gabbing, the world could come to an end. They wouldn't notice it. What am I supposed to do? Oh, easy, Jack. Don't get yourself riled. Yeah, just wait till you're married. Mm. The best girls have all got husbands. You don't know how lucky you are. You've got Anna. Oh, sure. I am so lucky. Forty-five, four patched ribs, right shoulder dislocated permanently. Insurance I got for the accident all gone. I can't make a decent wage. Boy, am I lucky. Now, I mean to have Anna for a wife. You're also working every day. Oh, yeah, yeah, so I am, Officer Garrity. Cleaning out laboratories, sweeping floors, raking leaves. You call that work? Now, why me, Chuck? Why do all the bad things fall on my doorstep? What did I do to deserve that? Well, maybe you need a change. Yeah, and I was uh, thinking just that, you know. But I couldn't decide which Ritz Hotel to go to, Paris or Harrisburg. Or maybe maybe go to Saratoga, taking all the races. Now, you know I didn't mean that, Jack. Now, you can't know what I mean. You know, I see those guys every single day going down into the pits. Well, they've got my job. They're making good money, but the elevator falls on me. I'm out of the game. I'm washed up. Are you through crying? How would you like to take over Bill's machine shop? What are you kidding? You mean Bill wants out of his business? Mm, that's what I heard say today. I bet if you talked to him, he'd make you a good price. Machine shop? Oh, boy, would I ever love that. But I don't have a dime. Well, what about Anna's mother? I bet she's good for it. At least the down payment. My mother-in-law is the biggest tightwad since Scrooge. Now, why do you think she and Albert live with us? They made a fortune on their condominium in Florida, come up north years ago, and moved in on us. You know where she's got her money? Right in a big old trunk at the foot of a bed. Well, maybe your father-in-law could tuck her into it. Bill isn't asking for big money. What, Albert? He's weak as water. Not that I can blame him married to that. Well... You know, when you're young, Chuck, you think you're just marrying one girl. You don't know you're marrying her whole family. Yeah. I'd think it over if I were you, Jack. Bill's place would be just the deal for you. Ask your mother-in-law. You never know. Yo, well, I know. It's hopeless. I'm pretty sure she's got a fortune locked up in her trunk. But we'll never see it. I'll tell you what. I can go talk to Herb Draper at the bank. He's married to my sister. Now, don't be crazy, Chuck. You think a bank is going to give me credit? Me, Jack Tanner, a 45-year-old handyman with a strapped-up chest? No steady job? Don't make me laugh. I sure wish you wouldn't talk like that. It's no good for a man to be as sour as you are. It, it, uh, it eats away at your insides. You know, you just reminded me. Something else is eating away at my insides, and that I won't stand for. What's that? I came home hungry, and I aim to be fed. <laughs> And I've had just about enough from your mother. Because of her, I have to wait for two hours for my dinner. And then when I ask her a civil question, I get a reply that turns my stomach. It's not that I know, I know, I know what you're going to say. She's an old lady. She has a bad heart. I shouldn't ask her questions about money. I've heard all that for years. But tonight, tonight, that was too much. I ask her, Mother, how would you like your son-in-law to go into the machine shop business? It's a wonderful opportunity. I might be able to buy it if you'll help me swing the down payment. And she gives me this look. Your own mother, Anna. Flesh, flesh and blood. And she says, you heard her. She says, if you can't afford it, don't do it. It's too much for any man to take, Anna. I'm not like your father sitting here keeping quiet. Oh, but you can take it. She's your wife. I can't. Dad, say something. I don't know what there is to say, Anna. No, it's not. It's not Albert's fault. Your, your mother's got all the money. I'm not asking for a gift. It's a loan. It's a business investment. I know the machine shop business inside out. Now, I'll never get this chance to get on my feet again. 
Now, maybe, maybe you can make her understand, Albert, that this is a chance for her own daughter to be a lot better off than married to an ex-coal miner who does odd jobs. This is terrible, fighting about money in your own family. Uh, your mother's temperamental, Anna. She, she's always been that way. Do you think, do you think I like Peggy? No, I'm, I'm not going to. And I tell you this, Albert. The way I feel right now, if you and she, and his mother, don't shell out with something, you're going to have to pack up and leave. Jack, what are you saying? Do you think it's about time? But they're my parents. And it's my roof they're living under, food and rent free. I don't think Jack's being unreasonable, Anna. I'll talk to your mother. Now, now look, I have no quarrel with you, Albert. You're all right. Now, we all make mistakes. You know what yours were. Getting stuck in a mine elevator shaft was mine. But I don't have to make things worse for myself by living under the same roof with those I can't get along with. Now, I'm sorry, but that's it. If I can't breathe easily, I might as well be dead. Jack, come to bed. You've been standing there in the dark for an hour staring out of the window. I uh, didn't know you were awake. Or Please not. come to bed. I'm not sleepy. Are you still angry at Mother? Am I crazy or doesn't she have cash money in that truck of hers and jewelry? Now, what good is it in a trunk? Well, I've never seen it. But you've heard her talk about it often enough, haven't you? Her widow's might, whatever that means. Well, I guess everybody knows she inherited a lot from Grandpa. And of course, she has all Grandma's jewelry. Anna, all I asked for was a loan, a business loan. And she never liked oh, me. Oh, of course she did. She does now. No, 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 never. And you know why? Her daughter, who went to the Philadelphia School of Music, ended up marrying a coal miner. Well, she hated That's that. That's not true. But that didn't stop them from moving in with us. Well, they were getting old. They, they had no one to take care of them. We asked them well, to. Well, that was all right. That was all right when I was making money in the mine. I thought it'd be good for you, Anna, having your folks here. But when I was laid up and after getting out of the hospital, did they ever go to the supermarket with you and say, let me buy this week's groceries? No, never. Oh, Jack, please, you wake her up. She, she's right next door. No, we push the switch to the bedside. Oh, yeah, hey, that's, that's another thing. Albert, you'll have to sleep downstairs. You snore, and I don't wish to be disturbed. He's on the sofa, and she's next door in the bedroom. Jack, you're all dressed. Will you turn that light off? I'm going out. At this hour? Don't, Jack. You need your rest. For what? I don't have a job tomorrow. What are you doing there? Let go of me, old woman. Will you let go of me, old woman? Will you let go? Get away from me. What are you doing, Jack? Jack, get away from that truck. I'm looking for something. Go back to bed. Jack, will you stop it? Jack, stop it. Jack, you're throwing every... Mother. What is it, Mother? Jack. Jack, she's over here. She's lying on the floor. Mother, will you get up? She tried to stop me. She must have fallen down. Mother. Oh, come on, she's faking. And there's nothing in this trunk but old clothes, hats, shoes. Now, where's the Mother, money? Mother, will you wake up? Nothing but shoes. So what is he, Donna? Dad, quick, it's, it's Mother. There's got to be a box somewhere in this trunk. There's a money box. Dad, look at her. She's lying there. Hey, give me a hand, Donna. We'll, we'll lift her back up on the bed. What has happened? I, I, I think I saw her blink her eyes, Mother. Mother, are you all right? I, I, I think she's just fainted. Mother, say something. What happened, Jack? Jack, what are you doing in that trunk? There's nothing, not a darn thing, not a dime. Just a lot of old clothes. She was lying to us the whole time. She must have spent it all. Jack, Jack, put down that iron bar. Have you gone crazy? Yes, I've gone crazy. Driven crazy by lies. You're smashing it. Lies. Stupid old trunk. Uh, nothing in it but rags. Anna. What is it, Dad? She's not breathing. Mother's dead. What we have just heard may have been an accident, or it may have been a crime. If it contains a spark of evil, it will light the fires of fear. You remember the saying, the mills of the gods grind slowly, but they grind exceeding fine? Once begun, those wheels of conscience can grind upon the mind of man till he may be crushed. I shall return shortly with Act Two.
What we call the hand of fate is often powered by the hand of man. As I said, the wheels are set into motion and under their own weight gather speed, sometimes of terrifying consequence. The result can be fatal, as it is in that small upstairs room where a woman lies dead, her husband horror-struck, and her daughter trembling with the growing suspicion her mother may have been murdered. Chuck, I'm so glad you're here. Hello, Anna. You, uh, you phoned the station house? Some trouble? Please come in, Chuck. Yeah, lucky I just came off duty. My one night, you know. Well, what is it? What happened? Mother's dead. Who? Your mother? Mm-hmm. Where is she? Upstairs. Lying on her bed. Uh, and where's your dad? He's with her. And Jack? He went out. Oh, did you call a doctor? It wasn't any use. How come? There was nothing a doctor could do. Uh, better have a look. Um, which way is it? Oh, just up these stairs. Yeah. Well, uh, what happened to Jack? Where'd he go? I don't know. He just ran out. At this time of night in his pajamas? No, he was all dressed. This door? No, 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 that's our bedroom. Jack's in mine. Uh-huh. Daddy, he sleeps downstairs. Mother's is is the one down, down here. It's uh, this one. Okay. Oh, Albert, I'm, uh... I'm awfully sorry about this. Oh, Dad, Dad, just all right, Dad, don't cry. It, it'll be all right. Let, let me have a look. Uh, huh? Yeah, yeah, no question about it. That's a stroke, maybe. I'll, uh, I'll put in a call to the coroner. Please, Dad. No, wh- why don't you go back downstairs, make yourself some coffee? Yeah, that's a good idea. Go ahead, Albert. You, you can't accomplish anything up here. Oh, all these years together... No, she's gone. All right, go on, Dad. Go on downstairs. If I need to ask you some questions, I'll ask you later, sir, okay? I, I can't... I just can't believe it. Yes. What happened in this room? It looks like an earthquake struck. The, the way that trunk's been smashed to pieces. Clothes all over the floor. Person must have been looking for something. That's obvious. Anna, did you catch someone in here? Well, there was no one here but us. But what's this here? Hmm. An iron bar. Uh, no, no, don't touch it. It might have fingerprints. Um, supposing we go back downstairs, and I'll call the station house. Uh, then maybe you'd better tell me exactly what you know. Scared stiff. The jury's been out two hours. Well, if they feel anything like I do, they won't know how to decide. All the time, Jack's been in jail. No matter how many times I went to see him, he'd just sit there behind that wire fence. I, I couldn't get him to open his mouth. He- he's in some other world. I hope they believed him. You know that it was an accident that Mother got up and fell and hit her head. Well, of course, that's how it happened. And I could see they didn't like him breaking open that trunk, his fingerprints all over the heavy bar, and, and him admitting he wanted to take her money. And yeah, that counted against him. Uh, Jack was so angry that night. He did terrible things when you're angry. Well, he'd never taken anything that didn't belong to him in his whole life. It was the iron bar... If they don't find him innocent, it'll be because of that iron bar. The jury. And Jack said he only used it to, to pry open the trunk. Did, did, did you see their faces? Of course, there was blood on it. Mother fell on it. Will you prisoner rise and stand before the bar? Jack Tanner, you have been judged guilty of murder in the second degree by a jury of your peers. Before this court pronounces sentence, do you have anything to say for yourself? I'm not guilty. It's you, all of you who are guilty. You broke my back. I couldn't get decent work, and now you're going to put me away. Well, as God is my witness, it was an accident. I pushed her away, and she fell. Now, is, is it my fault she hit her head, the grasping, greedy old liar? What, are you going to stop me from talking, too? You asked me, do I have anything to say? Well, I have. I swear to you all, the day I get out, if I'm 90, I'll see to it that you're all repaid. An eye for an eye. There will be no threats in this courtroom. Are you quite through? Finished. 
Yeah, I'm finished. I know that. By the authority vested in me by the state of Pennsylvania, I sentence you to 20 years in penal servitude. 20 you years? Will... 20 years? You're going to lock me up for 20 years? You will be taken from this place to the state prison where you will serve out the duration of your sentence. What you're doing is evil. Take him away. It's Mr. evil. I'll come back and I'll be revenged. You'll see if I don't. <laughs> You still in the kitchen? Dinner will be ready in about ten minutes, Dad. I hope you don't mind burned vegetables. No, 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 I'm getting used to them. I don't know why I'm so absent-minded. Can't seem to keep my mind on anything anymore. It's hard on, I know. I'll tell you something, Dad. Maybe it's terrible of me to say this. I do miss Jack. As every year goes by, it's harder. But I don't miss the Jack of the last few years before he went to prison... The man he became after that mine elevator crushed him. I miss the husband he was before that. Yes, yes. And you take a big, strong man and cripple him, Anna. You, you cripple his spirit as well. He changed so much, you have no idea. And I still, after five years and three months, I still lie awake at night thinking about what he threatened to do when he got out. Oh, Anna, don't do that. You've got years ahead of you. Twenty. Less five. Well, you could get married again. How could I? I'm married to Jack. I think I read somewhere that you can divorce a man who's in jail for murder. Oh, I can't even think about that now. Oh, did I tell you, Dad? I I'm almost finished with my typing course. <laughs> Glad to hear it. That's what you need. To get out of this house and make new friends. Glad you're going to quit the store. <laughs> in your mother's bedroom but your husband, Jack. Did you, Mrs. Tanner? I had to tell the truth. Oh, why didn't you tell all of it? That your mother always made us believe that she had money and jewelry, that she was stingy and miserly. Why didn't you tell them that? I, I, I wanted Dad to, but they wouldn't call him to the stand. But you're my wife. Why didn't you? Nobody said anything about the years I worked, about how I never took a dime from anybody. They made me out a thieving, ungrateful son-in-law who broke into your mother's trunk and then broke her head open, and you did nothing, nothing to change that opinion. Jack, well, well, what's that in your hand? What's this? It, it's that same... It's the iron bar. Yeah. It's a little heavy, isn't it? Where did you get it? I, I thought the police took it. Oh, I just happened to find it. And one little tap from this... You missed me, Anna? Yes, of course I have. You don't sound convincing. I, I have, I have. Dear little wife. Dear little Mrs. Judas. So you're interested in this iron bar, are you? Jack, please, Jack, you're not... You're not... I'm not what? Now, just look how easy it is for me to lift it. You know, I'm very strong. Stronger than I was when I went to prison. You know, you can build up a lot of muscle in five years. Here, you see, I can lift this long, thick iron bar with just two fingers. I wish you put that down, Jack. Down? How about softly down on your head? Hmm? After all, if I used it once on your mother, why not use it again? Now, you just lie still, my dear dog. Move. Now watch. I lift the bar high over your head. <laughs> What's the matter with you? I'm only demonstrating the strength of my arms. Here, you see? Look how easily I can lift it up and down over your head. Do you really think you deserve to live, Anna? I'm so terribly sorry for everything, Jack. I really am. Oh, well, let me look at your face more closely. Ah, oh, yes. Such a sweet, 
innocent face. Here, I look straight into my eyes. Ah, yes, the eyes of betrayal. Did I tell you how strong my fingers are? Now, suppose I just show you. I can just place them on your throat. No, Jack, no. Look, look, look how easily, even with one hand, five fingers can circle your throat. Now, if I place two hands here and here... You like my hands on your neck, Anna, so close to you? Jack. You'd like to scream, but the words stick in your throat, right? Please, please. Oh, you're begging now, aren't you? Now, what is it you're begging for? Mm -hmm. A life? Forgiveness? Wouldn't you prefer death? Mm -hmm. Ah, yes, I think you would. A nice squeeze. Ever so gently. Tighter. 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 Can you still breathe, dear Anna? I'll let you have one more breath and then... Anna! Anna, wake up. Oh, oh. I heard you scream. Oh. You were having a nightmare. Oh, Father. Father, you won't believe this. Jack was here. No, no, he wasn't, child. No. It was a dream. Is there a... a, a oh, Dad, that, that iron bar on the floor next to my bed. Iron bar? Uh, of course not, Anna. Uh, There's nothing here at all. Then it was... It was a dream. Yes. Oh, Dad, it was so real. It was... Dad, it was Jack. He'd escaped from prison and he was here in this bedroom. His hands were around my throat. It was horrible. No, no, no. Oh. I'll heat you a glass of milk and then you try to get to sleep. For what's left of the night. Sleep? No, I'd be afraid to sleep. Why do I have these nightmares, Dad? Jack blaming me, trying to kill me. Oh, hello, Chuck. I was just going out. Well, hello, Anna. It's a little early for you, isn't it? Oh. I'm catching a bus to the city. Not working at the store anymore? Not for long, I hope. I'm taking my final exam today at the stenographic school. Oh, then get yourself a good job. Yes. I've let too much time slip by. Yeah, I always said a woman should learn to be independent, especially a woman alone. Uh, can I come inside a minute? Oh, sure, sure. Come on in. It's not going to take long, is it? I don't want to miss that bus. No, no, only a minute. I, um, I heard on the radio this morning that the governor is planning to pardon a number of prisoners this month, and, uh, I talked to the warden in Harrisburg. I hope you don't mind. You talked to the... where Jack is? Right, right. Now, I think he's got a good chance. I don't understand. Well, uh, what the warden said was Jack's had a good record. Of exemplary conduct, he called it, for all these years, and... That, and taking into consideration the fact that there was always some doubt as to whether he actually hit your mother. Well, you remember he maintained she had fallen, hit her head? They're, they're going to pardon Jack? Well, it's not a sure thing, but I thought I'd come by and tell you the good news. Jack might be right back here in just a few weeks. <laughs> good news, is it? Or is it perhaps the most threatening news Anne could hear? Be not afraid of sudden fear, says the good book, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. Ah, but it may take more than the comforting words of the Bible to reassure this woman that freedom for her husband means safety for her. I shall return shortly with Act Three. Turn for a moment to the Proverbs. Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein. It says in the Bible, and he that rolleth a stone, it will return upon him. These very fears plagued the conscience of this young wife. Did she indeed dig a pit of evidence from which her husband could not extricate himself? These apprehensions are driving Mrs. Tanner to distraction. And from there, how far is she from madness? Dad... What am I going to do? Chuck said Jack might be pardoned. How, how can that be? It's not going to happen, Anna. Now, don't worry yourself about what might be. But he said I... Dad, he said he'd kill us all. Well, Jack said no such thing. But that's what he meant. 
I'm so afraid. I feel sick. I have to get away. That's what I'll do. Uh, where would you go? Anywhere, anywhere where he can't find me. Dad, you don't know Jack as I do. How can you leave now? When you've just got this good job with Angus McPhailin. Now, jobs aren't growing on trees these days. Oh, Mr. McPhailin, I forgot. Dad, do you think maybe he could help? Oh, but what if he can't? I've suddenly got this terrible chill. I can't stop shivering. I can't. Anna? I uh, saw your note on my desk when I came in this morning. Uh, what is it you wish to see me about? Oh, I'll be finished with this letter in a second, Mr. McFerrin. It's got to go out this morning. Oh, Anna, I have told you to call me Angus. Now, this is a family business. Yes, Mr. Uh, uh... <laughs> yes, Angus. <laughs> Here, there you are. For you to sign. All right, now, child, tell me what's troubling you. Well, I've been told... The governor may give Jack a pardon. Well, now, that is fine news. You must be very pleased. No, you, you don't understand. When they found Jack guilty, he, he... He yelled out in the court. It was awful. He said someday when he... When he got out, he'd get even with those who put him in prison. I see. Do you? Do you really? Well, I do remember reading about it, Anna, in the papers. It was a long time ago. Five years. But if he gets out, I, I, I'm afraid that he might hurt my father and me. Oh, but why would he harm you, his own wife? But Jack was the most wonderful husband any woman could ever want. I loved him, and I, I know he loved me very much. But after he was hurt in that mine accident, and they wouldn't take him back, well, he, he changed. He, he was full of anger all the time. You don't have to say any more, Anna. He said, I'll get you. That was me, he meant... That's why I have to go away. I had to tell you, Mr. McPhailin, in case you have any advice. Anna, before you do anything hasty, I'd like you to see a friend of mine. He's a very, very good attorney. You know, the law is created to protect the people, and you have rights. Anna? Anna, what are you doing? I'm packing my things. I'm leaving, Dad. Where are you going? I don't know exactly. Some place where I can feel safe. And then I'll come and I'll get you. Uh, I, I thought you were going to see Angus McPhailin's lawyer to see how you could be protected in case Jack was released from prison. I saw the lawyer, Dad. And it's no use. Uh, I'm trapped. Now, now, just slowly. What did the lawyer say? He was a very nice man. I said to him, can I leave Jack? And he said, yes, you can after you get a divorce. But unless there are very special circumstances, it takes a long time. And in order to get that divorce, I'd have to prove that Jack ill-treated me. I can see the problem. Yes, that's what the lawyer said, too. He said I'd need clear proof. But the awfulest part of it is that if Jack comes home, I, I, I have to live with him in this house as his wife. Dad, what am I going to do? He will kill me as now, soon now, as he sees now, me. I know I'll, I'll go and have a talk with that lawyer myself. He said, uh... Very special circumstances, huh? Well, that's what these are. It'll be all right. Anna, don't look at me like that. Anna, what's the matter? Stop staring. Why, well, your, your hands are icy cold. Oh, for heaven's sakes, child, what is it? Yes, sir. Oh, I'm Angus McPhailin. Uh, are you Anna's father? Oh, yes. Come in. Uh, come in by all means, Mr. McPhailin. Uh, thank you. I've heard a lot about you. I thought you were the doctor and that you'd come back because you'd forgotten something. He was just here. Well, I stopped by because I hadn't heard from Anna in a week. And then the news... Uh, I was beginning to get worried. She hasn't been to oh, work. Well, it's all my fault, Mr. McPhailin. I, I should have let you know. You say the doctor's been here? Is she very ill? Well, it, it's been a week of horrors, I tell you. She hasn't spoken one word in seven days. The poor child. Not one word. When she came back from that lawyer that you sent her to, she got bad news. She was packing to leave get herself a new place to live. Another identity. 
She was that frightened of her husband. It's a sad thing. Mm-hmm. Suddenly, and just as she was packing, she went into a kind of, uh, of seizure. And hardly knows me anymore. And speaks to no one. I had no idea what it was, why she didn't come to work. So, as soon as I heard the news tonight, I thought I'd come over and see if she knew. What news? Mm, you didn't hear it on the radio? No, I haven't heard it on. Six o'clock news tonight. I came right over. I feel about Anna the way I would about my own daughter. What news, Mr. McPhailin? He's dead. I heard it twice on the radio at the beginning and again at the end of the news. Who's dead? Why, your husband, Jack Tanner, died in prison last night. Jack Tanner is dead? What? Is that true? Anna, what are you doing down here? You're supposed to be up in bed. Is that true, Angus? Is that really true? Anna... You found your voice. Dear me, girl, I I didn't mean to get you up. Is that true? I'm afraid so. So, now you have nothing to fear, Anna. Your husband died in prison yesterday. Uh, What is it? Anna, child! She's fainted. So wrought up about everything. Here, uh, please help me lift her. We'll carry her back upstairs to bed. Uh, And then we have a friend in the police force... I can get him to call the warden just to make sure. Hello? Oh, yes, Chuck. Uh, What's that? Say that again. No, I didn't hear the radio, but somebody told me. It's not true. Uh, Mistake? You mean Jack isn't dead? Still in prison? Uh, false rumor. Oh, how these things start. Okay. Yes, I understand. Uh, thanks for calling, Chuck. Another man died with a similar name. Do you really believe someday he'll come back and revenge himself on the two of you? It doesn't matter what I think. It's what Anna thinks. What was that noise? The front door. Uh, Yes, maybe somebody came in. Oh, somebody went out. Hey, wait here, Angus. I'll just go upstairs a moment. Mr. McFailit. Angus. She's gone. Anna is gone. Is this where I buy a bus ticket? Yes, ma'am. Where to? Um, how, um... How far will $25 take me? That depends. On what? Well, I could book you to Providence, Rhode Island, or south to Baltimore, or west to Columbus, Ohio. Providence. That's certainly what I need. Maybe it's a good omen. That'll be twenty-four fifteen. Mm-hmm. Here you are. Uh, when does the next bus leave for Providence? In exactly half hour. She'll be pulling in about 20 minutes. You can board her then. Say... Aren't you Mrs. Tanner? Mrs. Tanner, come back. You forgot your change. <laughs> Another 85 cents for the poor box. Hiya, Mike. Oh, hello, Chuck. Caught any speeders today? I uh, want you to look at this picture. Um, has this girl come by here in the last hour trying to buy a bus ticket? Well, she sure did. Just a moment ago. That's Mrs. Tanner, isn't it? Uh-huh. Uh, where was she headed? Providence. Just left my window. Hey, is she in some kind of trouble or something? No, but I'll be in a heap of it if I don't find her. Dad, are you home? I got good news today, Dad. I went to see that lawyer again, and he said Hello, that... Hello, Anna. How are you? Jack, it's you. You're kind of surprised, aren't you? I guess I'm surprised, too. Did you... Did you escape? How how did you get out? What? What do you think? I'm crazy. I'm a law-abiding citizen. Didn't you expect me? No. Well, didn't anybody notify you? Nobody told us anything. I was pardoned. Yeah, it's hard to believe they wouldn't tell you. Anna? Hmm? You all right? I I, I don't know. Maybe they they did tell me, and I just put it out of my mind. Is that possible? Aren't you glad to see me? A long time ago, I had this dream about you coming home. You don't suppose this is a dream, too, is it? Oh, no. 
Uh, it's real. And I'm real. Yeah, maybe you don't recognize the suit they gave it to me. A a and some money I earned. Hey, aren't you going to give me a kiss? No, 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 don't, don't. Okay. Okay, you're the boss. You missed me, Anna? Of course I have. Oh, Lord in heaven. The last time. The dream. Have you missed me? That's what you said. Of course I have. That's what I said. This must be a dream. Anna, you home already? Uh, Jack. Hello, Albert. Is it you? It's me. You know, Anna thinks she's dreaming. Uh, Anna, where are you going? Uh, probably she's gone up to her room. You mean our room? <laughs> now, what's the matter with her? Isn't she glad to see her husband? Uh, Jack, I don't know how Anna's going to take your coming back like this all of a sudden. She hasn't been well in all these years. Oh, that seems funny. Instead of welcoming her husband with open arms, she's running away. Like, she's scared of me. Anna, why don't you come into bed? It's midnight. Hey, what are you doing standing there in the dark? Uh I'm not sleeping. But what if you aren't? You're going to stay up all night? No, 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 no. There isn't room in that bed. What are you talking about? You, you go to sleep. I'll, I'll go down to the living room. There's a book I want to read. I don't understand you. Are you afraid of me? Do you hate me? I'll see you in the morning. You come back here. You understand? Oh, no nonsense. Now, what is it with you? Your hands are as cold as ice. You know, it's morning. I'm home. You know, I clean forgot this is my own bed. Ah. Hey, Anna, wake up. Did I ever sleep great? You know, that's the best night's sleep I've had. Come on, darling, get up. Hey. Anna. It's time for breakfast. Anna. Anna. It was too short a service. We'll get him one day. He'll be back. I know what you're thinking, Chuck. With the coroner's verdict, two doctors. No, there wasn't a mark on her. But a young woman like that to die of a heart attack? I still can't believe it. Nobody can, Chuck. Least of all her husband. I hate that man. It's a good thing he left town. Ah, you're wronging him. He was crying like a baby. And the doctor said her heart just failed her. Oh, look, I'm her father. I felt just like you did, Chuck. How could it be? I said to Jack, she died of fear, that's what... He couldn't understand it. What fear, he said to me. Of you, I said. Of me? Why, I loved her. Thus, conscience doth make cowards of us all. But can it kill us? Frighten us to death? No, it was not only the self-accusing fear that stopped the heartbeat. It was the past, the present. And for Anna, it was the emptiness of the future. I shall return shortly on a slightly more hopeful note. My children are very thin, and they're very small. And I always feel, they gotta eat, they gotta eat. <laughs> Mrs. Ruth Offelbaum tells how she's always been able to get her family to eat well. Kraft macaroni and cheese, through the years, I mean, I know they like it. Even as little babies, I remember I put it on the high chair. And they pick it before they use the fork. And they pick the little noodles up with their fingers. And they, they just always have liked it. They do like it. Kraft macaroni and cheese dinner. You know they're going to like it. Reynolds Wrap. It's the wrap that makes summer more fun. Reynolds Wrap. Wraps up everything under the sun. Heavy duty 
Reynolds Wrap sure comes in handy when we go camping. Like for cooking hamburgers or fish over a campfire. Yes, and for making disposable cups and plates. And how about Reynolds Wrap under sleeping bags? Keeps dampness out. The great outdoors wouldn't be so great without it. Reynolds Wrap. Do it, Kathy, do duty. Reynolds Wrap. Good morning. Good company. Good to the last drop. Maxwell House. Maxwell House. Coffee you can count on. Always smells good. Always tastes good. Always good to the last drop. Maxwell House. Good coffee. Good to the last drop. Maxwell House. Folks, this is Jim Backus and the Lazy Boy Teddy Bear to tell about Lazy Boy's 50th anniversary. Right, Jim. <laughs> what a celebration. Yes, Lazy Boy dealers everywhere are joining this big event. And now is the time for you to purchase a famous Lazy Boy recliner or swivel rocker. Jim, they can save money, too. Right. And with Father's Day near, a Lazy Boy chair is a perfect gift. What a recliner. And folks, <laughs> that's the Lazy Boy bear facts. That little voice of conscience in us, often called the inner voice, acts like a guardian, reminding us of the truth we already know, nudging us to observe our better instincts, warning against misconduct or misdeeds. Indeed, where would we be without that voice? Renounce it, and the devil is your guide. Listen to it, and you are safe on the side of the angels. Our cast included Larry Haynes, Carol Titel, Russell Horton, and Ray Owens. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. the voice of the Rocky Mountain West. Radio 85, KOA Denver. CBS News. Tr 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 CBS News. News. Revenge is as basic a theme as you will find in mystery or drama. The Old Testament testifies often on an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. The great tragedies of the theater tell us that Othello lost his wife, Shylock his daughter, and Hamlet his life in that wild chase after justice. One man we know made many enemies when he was younger, which generally qualifies you for retribution. He is now riding a train from Dover up to London. I beg your pardon, sir. Do you mind if I join you in this compartment? Oh, not at all. I'm all alone. I had hoped to find an empty compartment on this train up to London, because I've some reading to do. But two compartments of noisy little children and three have men puffing an old different cigar. And the compartment next to this one contains a nursing mother. I don't smoke. I gave it up years ago. I never started. Oh, that's a crutch. Well, I remember the days if I didn't smoke half a pack before I got to my office, I couldn't face the day. Oh, really? Must be a very strenuous and nerve-wracking line of work. Oh, yes, it did leave me pretty edgy. But I've retired now. May I inquire what it was? Well, I was head of Fountainhead Pictures. I'm John Fountain. My goodness, yes. Your name and your movie company is a household word over here in England. Oh, my name is Arnold Lee. L-E-A. Lee. Well, that's an unusual spelling. And it's old English for thicket or shrubs. Oh, you're not in the wood business, are you? Oh, heavens no. I'm afraid I don't do much of anything. 
That's the penalty of being born well off with a large estate and farms and farmers to look after. I do have one business, a distillery in Scotland. Mm -hmm. Oh, I keep occupied. Are you on vacation from Hollywood, Mr. Fountain? No, I'm looking for a place to settle down. A permanent home. I've left Los Angeles for good. I'm retired. And I'm looking forward to spending the rest of my days in a calmer atmosphere. Instead of cultivating money, I plan to cultivate my mind. Oh, well, I don't know whether you'll find what you're looking for in London, Mr. Fountain. Mm. I shall see. And let comparison prove. Funny you should say that. Comparison proves our new advertising slogan. Oh? Lee Scotch. Uh, you may have heard of it. Lee Scotch? Well, I'm proud to say our Scotch has held a royal warrant for 90 years. I always carry a nip of it myself in a flask. Care for some? Oh, that's very nice of you. Don't mind if I do. Top of the flask actually serves as a silver cup. Unscrew it and there we are. I shall have mine. You've tasted yours. I think you'll like it. As you say, Mr. Fountain, comparison proves. Oh, wow. Well, that's, that's strong stuff, young man. What have you given me? I wish you'd stop pacing the room, Mr. Fountain. If I'm to ascertain the facts, I need you to recollect what happened on that train calmly and unemotionally. Well, Inspector Davis, I was alone in a first-class carriage on the Dover-London train. And a young man, very gentlemanly, asked if he could join me in my compartment. Yes? Arnold Lee, he said his name was. He offered me a drink of scotch from a flask. And to tell you the truth, it, it had the kick of a mule. <laughs> it uh, <clears throat> knocked you out, as you Americans say. It was lethal. Next thing I knew, not, not, I'm not sure if I was dreaming then or not, but I, I thought I was being robbed. Well, now, surely you didn't come to the yard to report a dream. Well, I woke up. I found the dream had been quite real. Well, who was robbing you? The young man? Well, well, some strange kind of person or thing I'd never seen before. He took the keys from my pocket, pulled down my attaché case from the luggage rack, opened it, and removed something. Locked it, and put the keys back in my pocket. Finally, I did wake up, and I was alone. The train was just pulling into Victoria Station. What was missing from your case? A gold cigarette case. All the thief took was a gold cigarette case? Oh, I thought that was strange, too. Uh, did you ever at any time see the face of the person who did all this? I don't know what was dream or what was real, and it, it didn't look human. It bent over like, a, like some ape-like creature. I never saw its face. Well, we shall have a good search round to locate this Mr. Arnold Lee. And I'm almost certain that what robbed me was not quite human. Did it make any sound? Yes, a horrible kind of growly laugh. I'll never forget that sound. Hmm. No one in the compartment but the young man. Well, he might have disguised himself to rob you. Oh, not him. Inspector, I've spent a lifetime casting people to type. He was no criminal. That boy was a gentleman. Well, we'll telegraph a description of the stolen property and the young man everywhere. And see what turns up. Where can I reach you? Well, for the present, I have a suite at London House. Excuse me, madam. How long have you been waiting for the elevators? Oh, two or three minutes. You mean two or three minutes before I came into the lobby? At least. No, perhaps more. I'm half a mind to go to the desk and complain. <laughs> Everything's a little slower in England. Well, you'd think in a hotel as expensive as London House, you'd have better elevator service. You're an American, aren't you? Yes, I am. Ah, here's our lift. You call it a lift, don't you? We call it an elevator. Uh -huh. Would you be good enough to press 11, please? Glad to. That's my floor, too. Yes. We use many words differently from you in America. <laughs> well, I expect I'll get the hang of it soon enough. Beautiful city you have here. I love London. You've been sightseeing, have you? No, I haven't had time. I've been house hunting. I've spent a long, rather tiring day. Really? You're going to make London your home? Are you going to hire or purchase? You mean rent or buy? <laughs> oh, there you are. What is it George Bernard Shaw said about your country and mine? England and America. Separated by a common language. <laughs> <laughs> 
I... I bid you good night, Mr. Fountain. Enjoy your stay. Oh, hold on a minute. Uh, how did you know my name? Uh, I shall be happy to tell you some other time. Mine is Norell. Mrs. Ada Norell. Hello, room service? This is John Fountain. Where's my dinner? I ordered it almost an hour ago. Hold on. There's a knock on the door. Probably the waiter. He certainly took his own sweet time. If this food is cold, I warn you, I'm sending him right back downstairs. There's no one here. Where's my dinner? What is this? Hey, you! You down the end of the hall. Say, aren't you that young fellow who was in my train compartment? Hey, come back here. Son of a gun. That's him. <laughs> Yes. Oh, it's you, Mr. Fountain. Oh, madam, I had no idea this was your door. Uh, my name is Ada Norell, I told you. I'm sorry. It, it, it's just that uh, well, I, I do apologize for the late hour, but may I have just one word with your husband? With whom? Your husband, Mrs. Norell, the young gentleman I just saw going into this room. I hope you're joking, Mr. Fountain, because if you're not, I hardly know how to take this. I... Uh, I, I just opened my door down the hall, and I thought it was the waiter with my dinner. And I saw, going down the corridor, a young man with whom I traveled yesterday on the train. Indeed. And when I called to him, he went down the hall and into this door. Uh, Mr. Fountain, I thought you were far more sophisticated than this. To make up such a transparent story in order to pursue me, <laughs> it's a bit obvious. I assure you, I, I, I swear... Mrs. Norrell, I had no idea this was your door. And I assure you, Mr. Fountain, nobody came in here. My husband passed away three years ago, and you are the only gentleman in this hotel with whom I have the slightest speaking acquaintance. I do hope we shall not be seeing one another again. Good night. Yes? Hello? Who is it? Mr. Fountain? Yes? Who's this? This is Inspector Davis, Scotland Yard. Oh. I'm downstairs in the lobby. Sorry to stop by so early in the morning, but I have some information I'd like you to verify. May I come up? Inspector, I, I wonder if you'd mind waiting for a few minutes. I, I, I just got up. I, what time is it? After nine, Mr. Fountain. Good heavens, I had such a terrible, sleepless night. I, I'll take a quick shower and get some clothes on it. Will you come up in, uh, say, ten minutes? I shall. I'm sorry to hear you had a bad night. Well, I thought when I came to England that the pressure and the strain in my life would disappear. But I, I, I have to tell you, Inspector Davis, I, I don't know. I haven't felt so dog tired and washed up since I was in the middle of production in Hollywood. I thought those days were hard on me, but the past two days. I don't really like this. I've been subjected to some pretty strange goings-on. Would you mind telling me exactly what? Well, yesterday evening, I saw that young man who rode to London with me on the train, the, the one who gave me that drink. Oh, yes. Arnold Lee. You saw him? He was right on this floor, no less. He knocked on my door. I'm sure he did. And then ran down the hall and into the room of a lady I met here, a guest in the hotel. There's something going on, some kind of a game or something. She said he never went in there. Uh, now this lady, is she a friend of yours? No, I just met her. She's extremely beautiful. A widow. And surprisingly, she knew my name. <laughs> I don't find that surprising. So did I, the moment you walked into the yard the other day. You knew me? My dear Mr. Fountain, your name as a movie producer is extremely well known. We in the British Isles are devotees of the flicks. But right now, I'm more interested in the lady's name. Mrs. Ada Norell. I did say, didn't I, that she was extremely attractive. Beautiful, in fact. Yes, yes, you did. Uh, well, this Mrs. Norell has nothing to do with my visit this morning. Well, you're on to something already? Have you located my cigarette case and that, that creature? We're not quite sure. Uh, you said for an instant you saw this person who was robbing you, but you were uncertain as to whether you saw the face. I show you this photograph and ask, 
Is there any resemblance with this? Where did you get this picture? But I... Oh! Oh! Oh, the pain. It's found oh, Help me. My, my, my chest. I, I, can't, I can't breathe. Yes, sir. In my breast pocket, is the pills. Right. It's a night and I shook. Greg, give me... Give, give me... A heart attack. The nitroglycerin pills will alleviate the pain. The inspector quickly places the tablet under the tongue of the gasping man. It will dissolve, and John Fountain will recover. But what was it about that photograph that shocked him so much that his heart was affected? I shall return shortly with Act Two. So many dramatic presentations on Mystery Theater, there's always more to the evidence than meets the eye. With that in mind, and making allowances for surprises along the way, we return to London House, where Inspector Davis of Scotland Yard has just shown a photograph to movie producer John Fountain to identify. For whatever reason, Mr. Fountain suddenly suffered a seizure of the heart. Mr. Fountain? How do you feel now? Oh, much better, Inspector. When they come, they come. Now let me see that photograph again. Are you sure you feel up to it? Let me see it. Yeah. Study it carefully. Does it resemble anyone you've ever seen? I don't know. Not a very clear picture. Oh, she's terribly disfigured, poor thing. Yes. She was caught in a fire. When was that? Oh, six months ago. Are you sure? This woman escaped from Broadmoor. That's an asylum for the insane. She made her escape several hours before the London train you were on left over. And we hazarded that she might have hidden herself on the train and it might have been she who robbed you. What's her name? We don't know. She had no identification. We call her Mrs. X. Why was she in Broadmoor? She'd set fire to one of the smaller movie houses in London. It was at night. She was the only one there. You're not saying that there's some connection with me because I used to be in the motion picture business, are you? Well, I'm not saying it's unconnected. Was there some particular movie being shown? Where, where was the fire? Well, she managed to get into the projection room. Tried to set fire to the film, but it wouldn't ignite. And then she went down into the lobby and lit a match to the drapes. They'd not been fireproofed. Uh, they were showing a revival of old movies that week. What movies? Yours, Mr. Fountain. What? A festival of the best of the Fountainhead pictures. Now you're staying late tonight, Davis. Hmm. Oh. Uh, typing up this John Fountain case, Chief. Mm. Isn't this simple robbery taking an awful lot of your time? Well, I don't think it's that simple. I have an idea that Fountain's not a little paranoid. If he weren't such a VIP, perhaps it wouldn't matter. But he's got a bad heart, and he believes that everyone he meets is out there to get him. Hmm. Who does he think is after him? Well, several people. A, someone who looks like Mrs. X. You remember the theater pyromaniac? And B, a young man he met on the Dover London train. And C, some other woman who lives at London House where he's staying and who he believes is in league with the young man. All this over the theft of a cigarette case? Well, of course, there's more to it, Chief. Fountain is an extremely nervous man with a heart condition. If he's not imagining all this, it may be there are people in London at this moment who are intent upon driving him under. Do you understand what I'm saying? No, oh, driving him crazy? Under, I said. Under the ground. Driving him to his death. Glad you stopped by this morning, Inspector Davis. If you'd come a little earlier, we could have had breakfast together. Well, I'm glad to find you so chipper, Mr. Fountain. <laughs> Things appear to be going my way. Ah, good. I've had some good luck since I last saw you. I found a nice little house on a nice little street off Welbeck Square, which I'm making an offer on. Your news is better than mine. My nice little streets have all turned out blind alleys. I keep thinking about what happened to me, Inspector. 
I had at least 250 pounds on me when I was robbed. Now, why wasn't that taken? Why just the cigarette case? Is that why I was drugged for that? And Arnold Lee, where did he disappear to? He told me he came from a prominent family and he made Lee Scotch. Uh, there is no Lee Scotch, Mr. Fountain. There never was. Never was? Really? Is that true? I'm here this morning to ask you, is there something you haven't told me? I've told you everything I know. Tell me, why does the loss of that particular cigarette case bother you so much? I'm sure you can afford many more. Uh, I attach great sentimental value to it, that's all. Why do you? It was given to me on my retirement from Fountainhead Pictures. Inside are inscribed all the names of those I made famous. Actors? Yeah, actors and directors and writers. All of them had their names engraved inside that cigarette case? Almost all. Some had died or, or moved away or got out of the picture business. If you'll excuse me, that might be my real estate agent. They may have accepted my offer. Hello? Mr. Fountain? Yes, who's this? Eden Norrell. Oh, yes, Mrs. Norrell. Are you still here at London House? I haven't seen you recently. I had a visit from Inspector Davis of Scotland Yard. You did? It was rather annoying. He questioned me about a young man you said you saw going into my room. Now, I don't know why you keep insisting on this, Mr. Fountain, but I can tell you I was very angry indeed. I am sorry, Mrs. Norrell. How can I make it up to you? <laughs> well, at least you, you sound contrite. I am. I'll do anything so you'll forgive me. How about dinner tonight? And the theater afterwards, huh? No, that doesn't intrigue me. But if you'd like to accompany me on a visit to the Tower of London this afternoon, I suppose I could forgive you. The Tower of London? Why, yes, I've never been there. Good enough. I shall meet you in the lobby at 3. No, better yet, 2.30, right inside the Tower enclosure. Goodbye. I'll be there. This is Norrell, Inspector. She didn't like your questions. Really? She didn't seem to mind at the time. She is, by the way, as extraordinarily beautiful as you told me. That woman. Had I met her ten years ago, I could have made her into one of the biggest stars ever to hit Hollywood. Mm -hmm. she's, she's got something. Not only an unusual and photogenic face, but a, a lovely manner. Yes, I could have made a big star of her. And... Uh, what did Mrs. Norrell call you about? To join her sightseeing. I, I said I would. Well, if she upsets you that much, why do it? I don't know how to analyze it, but for some reason I'm drawn to that woman. A certain charisma, maybe. It, it's what we always look for in a movie actor. It, it has nothing to do with acting talent. Don't ask me why. I, I hardly know her, but she has that quality. Yes. <laughs> All right. So long as it distracts you. Uh, where, where are you going? The Tower of London. <laughs> Be careful. Don't get locked up in the dungeon. I said I was sorry, Mrs. Norrell. I'm generally very punctual. Yes, I imagined you would be. I was just about to leave the tower when you arrived. Oh, please forgive me. An hour late is unforgivable, but I... I don't know what's wrong with me. I, I went down to hail a cab, and suddenly I, I didn't feel well. I, I had to sit down in the lobby. Are you serious? Perhaps you shouldn't have come out at all. Oh, no, no. I'm perfectly all right now. I just hope I haven't spoiled the afternoon for you. We don't have much time left before they close, and I did want you to see as much as possible... Look at all these towers in yes, here. Yes, actually 18 of them, all with different names, including the Bloody Tower. They say it was originally built by the Romans to honor Julius Caesar. It's that old. I like that, a country that respects its age and its old customs. No, some of those old customs aren't that respectable. A lot of hanging and spilling blood right where you're walking. Really? Now, follow me down this spiral staircase to the dungeon. The first room we come to is where the rack was. People were pulled apart for their crimes. 
Oh, those bells. Oh, uh, that's the curfew. That means closing up time. Probably why we're the only ones down here. Well, what's that room behind this iron door? Oh, that's where the two little princes were kept before they were murdered. Well, let's pull the door open and have a look. It's, it's heavy. Oh. I'll squeeze through here and have a look. Oh, there's so much more to see. It's a pity we I'll tell you what, Mr. Fountain. Suppose I go and find one of the yeomen and ask his permission for us to stay on a while after closing. And uh, don't go away now. Hey, the cell door's shut. There's an oil. Mrs. Norrell! Mrs. Norrell, is that you? Can you open the door and let me out? Oh, no. Oh, no, not you. Go, go away from me. Get away. Get away from here. Help. Help. Help me. Help me. Help me. The nurse said it was all right for you to receive visitors. Uh, how do you feel today, Mr. Fountain? How long have I been in the hospital? Two days. I don't know what to make of all this. Well, if you're feeding up to talking today, I'd... I'd like to know what happened. I was going to ask you, Inspector. I don't usually wake up two days later and find myself flat on my back in bed. You've forgotten, Mr. Fountain? Wait, wait, wait. Oh, no, it was all a nightmare. Wasn't it? I didn't really see anybody, did I? Well, you had a seizure in the Tower of London. The guards came by and found you in the dungeon. Somehow you'd locked yourself in. Fortunately, it's happened before. A visitor gets very excited, releases the door, finds himself locked in, faints, and so they know exactly what to do. They whisked you off to London Hospital, and since you're an American, they called me. She did it. I'm sure of it. Who did what? Mrs. Norrell. And then she sent that hideous creature to the cell. She came up to the door and laughed at me. Uh, can you be more detailed? Well, the door to the dungeon has a little window cut into it. I was calling for help. Then all of a sudden, this demented face appeared in that little window and laughed at me. Had you ever seen this person before? I, I don't know. Was she the creature that robbed you on the train? I don't know. Don't ask me. Mr. Fountain, in that dungeon in the Tower of London, you were heard to say, you, you, go away from me, get away. It sounded as if you knew who it was. Now, who was it? I, I tell you, I don't know. Mr. Fountain, we can't help you if you don't help us. Now, bear in mind, the Yard has taken everything at face value. There have been no confirming witnesses. It's all your story. There are those at headquarters who have definite doubts that you ever had a cigarette case, or that it was stolen, or that you were drugged by a young man on a train. Why would I say all those things if they weren't true? It was that mad woman, the one you call Mrs. X. And do you know her? Mr. Fountain, answer me. Yes, I did know her. But so help me, God, I, I had nothing to do with it. I tried to help. Why, after all these years, does she come back into my life to make me remember? I, I, I don't think my heart can stand much more of this. I mean it. I won't be responsible if I ever see her again. I think we're beginning to see the elements of a tale of revenge. A cast of characters, a retiring movie magnet, a widow of extraordinary beauty a young man on a train, and a Mrs. X, a woman with a disfigured face. Could it be that what began as a simple robbery may have consequences beyond imagining? As I've often told you when we are two acts into the plot, wait and see. I shall be back shortly. Act three it is. That act in which the evidence is assessed, problems solved, and the villains get their comeuppance. But what if your story has no villains, no heroes? Yet the mystery of what has been going on is as puzzling as ever, which is precisely the situation that faces Scotland Yard. We are closing the case, Davis. We spent far too many hours chasing a, a will-o'-the-wisp. Yes, and he's not a well man, Chief McGon. Yeah, that may be. It's not our concern. 
I've got something for you more immediate. A certain Ralph Glass arrives at Heathrow on the noon flight. I'd like you to interview him, find out why he's in England. What are the leads, sir? Hmm. Do you remember the Mrs. X case, the woman who escaped from Broadmoor? Certainly. I was hoping she was connected with a fountain robbery. The incredible part of that case is the woman's completely dropped out of sight. Unbelievable. Here she is, presumably with no money, escaped from incarceration. How's she existing? What has she got to do with Glass? Well, it's a tenuous lead, but we've got to go with it. When we examined your room at Broadmoor, we found some doodling in a corner on the windowsill. You know how people will scratch away with a pencil while they're thinking? Well, she hadn't been permitted a pencil. Naturally, anything sharp was kept from her. But just the same, there on the sill were scratches. Two words. Ralph Glass. Why did she write that name? And that's your assignment, Davis. You checked the incoming airlines, huh? Their name came out of the computer. Twelve o'clock. Hop to it. Heathrow. Who is it? Mrs. Morel. What do you want? To see you. How are you? All right. Come on in. Thank you. We can talk in the sitting room part of the suite. I, I was just writing a letter. I'll sit here by the window, John. I'm going to call you, John. And if you care to, you may call me Ada. What do you want to see me about? You're angry at me, aren't you? Somehow you're thinking it was my fault. You getting locked up in the Tower of London. Ada, you have me at a disadvantage. I've told you before, you're a very attractive woman. And if I'd met you years ago, you might have become a movie star at my studio. <laughs> Not everyone wants to be a movie star, John. But I shall take it as a compliment. Now, I'm going to tell you something. When I came back to the dungeon that day to find out you'd fainted and been taken away to the hospital, I was beside myself. Nobody would tell me which hospital. And finally, after calling every hospital in the phone book, when I located you and was told John Fountain had suffered from a heart attack, well, you, you don't know how I blame myself. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I guess I'm very surprised. So, we've... Made up, have we? Well, sure. Sure we have. Are you dining in the hotel alone tonight? Well, I don't know that I feel up to going out or even into the dining room. Suppose I order a light dinner for the both of us and have it brought up to my room. After all, you won't have to walk far. I'm just down the hall. Okay, Ed. That's very nice of you. And, and forgive me for... for... Well, I don't know what... <laughs> You're forgiven. I'll see you at seven, then. Are you Ralph Glass? Oh, uh, yes. Yes, I am. I, I was told by customs to come into this office. Yes. I'm Inspector Davis, Alien Division, Scotland Guard. Oh. Uh, may I see your passport, please, sir? Oh, uh, yeah. Hmm? Is there an address where you can be reached? Well, I I'll be staying at the London house. I note you list your occupation as makeup man. You're not planning to conduct any business of that nature while you're here, are you? No, not at all. I, I do make up for the movies. Yeah, I haven't come here to work. Uh, are those your bags the porter's just brought in? Oh, yes. Yes, they are. Just put them down there, will you please, porter? Thank you. You may go. Mr. Glass, would you mind opening your luggage? Oh, not at all. Do you think I'm smuggling in something? The smaller suitcase first, please. What are these, Mr. Glass? Uh, those are facial masks. What are they made of? Oh, very thin, painted latex. An invention of mine. I see. What do you do with them? Well, when an actor has to play an older person or a disfigured person, we use these masks instead of makeup. You see, it's very pliable. Your own skin can breathe through them, and they're as lifelike as a human hand can make them. Indeed. I hold this one up. Extraordinary. I do believe it resembles a lady I interviewed quite recently. Mm -hmm. I would say this is no ordinary character makeup. These masks are works of art. I've been waiting an hour. 
Did your plane get in late, Ralph? No, I had a run-in with the British Customs. And then an interview with Scotland Yard. What did they want? Mm, I don't know what he was after. I had to open my suitcases. Probably drugs. You? Smuggling drugs? That's a spot check. Every so many passengers tag, you're it. Now, what is it you want from me? Now, that's a nice way for our brother to talk. Well, I didn't fly 3,000 miles for chit-chat and compliments, Lorna. Is he here? Yes. Right down the hall, in fact. Are you sure you want to go through with this? I haven't waited ten years for nothing. What did you bring? A couple of extras and the new one of Lorna Tail. I'll show you. Get the suitcase under the bed. Here's the spare mask of Ada Norell. Good. The one I'm wearing is getting a little cracked around the mouth lines. I brought along a duplicate of Arnold Lee in case you needed that mask. Yes. There'll be one final performance from Arnold. And here's what I've spent most of my time on. The mask of Lorna Dale. Let me look at it. Lorna Dale. Oh, is this what I used to look like? I almost don't remember. Dearest sister, you were very beautiful. Uh I worked from the early stills and my memory. I could never forget the way you looked before the accident. Ralph, these masks are wonderful. But I need your personal help. I want you to stand by me. He's coming here at 7 o'clock. John Fountain? Yes. I told you he's staying just down the hall. He's coming to have dinner with Ada Norell. What are you going to do? Throw his sins into his face and watch him suffer the way he made me suffer. Who is it? It's me, Ada. John Fountain. Oh, come in, John. I'm just finishing dressing. Where are you, Ada? I'm in the bedroom. Be out in a minute. Fix yourself a drink. Thank you. Can I fix you one? Then I've ordered wine with dinner. I'll wait for that. Uh, I'll just have a whiskey and soda. I have a surprise for you, John. A visitor to see you. Say, aren't you... Yes, indeed. Oral Lee. How do you do, Mr. Fountain? What is all this? Do you remember your gold cigarette case, Mr. Fountain? I have it. Not so fast. Don't be grabby. I'll read you the inscription. With affection and respect to the founder of Fountainhead Pictures. And it's signed by all those nice people you put on the map. All but one. Who is that, Mr. Fountain? I thought you stole it. Give me that. Oh, sorry, I dropped it. Oh, how careless of me. I squashed it flat by stepping on it. Goodbye. I have to go now because there's someone else who wants to say hello. Ralph, your old boss, John Fountain, is here. Come on out to the bedroom. Hello, John. Remember me? Ralph Glass? Well, of course I do, Ralph. You were in makeup. What are you doing in London? Lorna asked me to come say hello. Said there'd be a reunion. Lorna? Yes. Lorna Dale, my sister. The most beautiful girl in the lot. Don't you remember her? Oh, sure. Sure. How, how is she? Don't you know? She was in the cabin up at Arrowhead with you and it caught fire and you ran out. You saved yourself, remember? It wasn't my fault. The kerosene stove just tipped over. It wasn't your fault that you got out without a scratch? And Lorna was so badly burned they could never fix her face again? Not your fault? Why are you doing this to me? I've left Hollywood. Why are you over here to tell me this? I know, John. You're trying very hard to escape. But things keep happening to you, don't they? How would you like to see Lorna Dale right now? Oh, no. No, please. Yeah, you have no choice. Lorna? Would you come in, please? Hello, John. Long time no see. Oh, Lorna. Oh, you're beautiful. You haven't changed at all in all these years. Remarkable, isn't it? 
considering what my face looked like after the fire. I had no idea plastic surgery could be so... so restorative. I, I don't believe it, Lorna. Not a mark on my face, is there? Look closely, John. Fantastic, no? Now, I want you to keep looking. Ralph, help me off with this, will you? No, look, John. Does this face of Lorna Dale look more familiar to you? Or did you prefer the mask of Lorna Dale? Oh, oh no. 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 You'll never forget now. You'll never be the same. There's just one more scene to play, Ralph. Is that why you're wearing your Ada Norrell mask? It's the one a certain gentleman knows me by. I telephoned him before to ask him up. Do I know him? If you don't, you will in ten seconds. Ah, Inspector Davis, it was good of you to stop by so late at night. The yard doesn't keep ours, Mrs. Norrell. Uh, This is my brother, Ralph Glass. Oh, yes, we met. But I didn't know you were related. I... I asked you here to confess to setting a fire, escaping from an asylum, engineering a robbery, and almost, but not quite, worrying a man to death. Inspector, did you ever hear of a motion picture actress called Lorna Dale? I certainly did. I had a crush on her all through school. What happened to her? She and the studio head were caught in a fire in a mountain cabin years ago. Did she die? Only her face. Inspector, I want you to write three names down on a piece of paper. Go ahead. Arnold Lee, Ada Norrell, and Lorna Dale. And then take a very close look at those three names. Mrs. Norrell, I already have. Oh? The names Arnold Lee and Ada Norrell and Lorna Dale are all the same anagram, the same letters transposed to make three different names. It was I, the same person, transposed to make three different people. But how could you? Ralph, show Inspector Davis the masks. Of course, those masks... Now I see a fire, a burnt face. Mrs. Norrell, you are really Lorna Dale. Yes, I am. I hope you will let me pay for the damages to the theater and for escaping from the madhouse. I am not crazy. May I call you Lorna Dale? Of course. Miss Dale, I can straighten out matters with both the yard and Broadmoor. I think you've... I think you've suffered enough. I'd better be on my way now, but I shall never forget your three performances. Your three people. In three masks. Remember the old maxim that went, revenge is like a boomerang? Though for a time it flies in the direction it is hurled, it takes a sudden curve, and a turning can hit your own head with quite a blow. Not this time, though. I shall be back shortly. Rather than leaving you believing that revenge is sweet, or that I endorse revenge in any shape or form, let me say that the best manner of avenging ourselves is not by resembling him who has injured us. Yet... Men are not gods, and often it is indeed difficult to turn the other cheek. Our cast included John Beale, Court Benson, Joan Shea, and Ray Owens. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. The universe goes on and on, as round and round she goes. And where she starts and where she ends is something no one knows. Beginnings and endings. Our neat and precise human minds will insist on clearly stated limits, boundaries, definitions. But unfortunately, there are no satisfactory ways to limit, bound, or define the truly important things in life. Have you interrogated the prisoner? I have. Hey, who says I'm a prisoner? We have no use for the cargo. Destroy it and confiscate the ship. What are you trying to pull? And dispose of the prisoner. What do you mean, dispose of the prisoner? Am I being sentenced to something? To death. Don't I get a trial? You have been tried and found guilty. <laughs> mystery drama, The Hole in the Sky, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Mandel Kramer. Get rid of that noise, Curly. What's the matter? Don't you like good music? <laughs> I thought you was a real space jockey. If you want to talk about space, all right. You want to get down to business? Well, how about a little drink first? When I listen to a deal from you... I better be stone cold sober. Oh, would all Curly ever steer you wrong, Raj? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, do you know where Medusa's at? Medusa? Uh, that should be a star beyond Polaris. Well, I got the chart right here. Uh, the fifth planet circling around Medusa is called Bacchus. Here you can see it. Mm -hmm. I can also see it's a pretty good trip. Uh, can that lark of yours hold a 3,000-pound cargo? What kind of cargo? Why do you care? I won't handle contraband. <laughs> What's contraband? Everything's contraband to somebody somewhere. You know what I'm talking about, Curly. Hey, what's the difference, huh? The trip's illegal anyhow. There are no solo flights allowed outside the solar system, so what do you care? No drugs, no weapons, Curly. Now, would I be mixed up with weapons and drugs? Up to your ears. Uh, no, no, no. This is just stuff for the ladies. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This Bacchus is a wild, wild place. It's just being colonized. Now, you could clear a fortune with some makeup. You know, powder, makeup, things the ladies just have to have. That's contraband. Sure, sure. Hey, but it's nice, harmless contraband. Look, if I'm caught with any sort of non-essential... If you're caught, what's the difference what you're caught with? What's the deal? Hey, <laughs> fantastic. You split the take 50-50. I what? That's right, old buddy. Right down the middle. What's the catch? No catch, no catch. No ifs, ands, and maybes. 50-50. Some deal, huh? When do I leave? Your cargo's ready right now. Tonight? Well, it better be tonight. You're due to sit down at Bacchus no later than the 21st. 21st of what? 21st of this month. 21st? That, that, that's in six days. Well, actually, six and a half. Look at the chart. You see where Bacchus is? Sure. Well, this trip should take six weeks. There's no way I could ever cover this distance in six days. Oh, sure there is. How? Why, Roger, old buddy, you know how. You just go through the hole. Oh, I see. That's the catch. Ah, oh, now, don't tell me you're scared of the hole. I'm scared out of my wits. Now, look, if anybody had ever told me that Raj Thorpe had that little streak of yellow... Don't I'm... try to get a rise out of me, Curly. I'm not yellow. I'm smart. I'll see you around. I make it around 8 o'clock. That's as long as I can hold the job open. Goodbye, Curly. Hey, don't, don't go away, man. It'll make it harder for you to come back here. I'm not coming back. <laughs> And I meant it. I was through with all that stuff. But what else was there for me to do? What else did I know how to do? I could join the Space Navy and wear a uniform and be assigned to contraband control, which meant I'd have to prowl through space hunting down guys like me or guys like I used to be. Magda was waiting for me when I got home. Curly called. Yeah? He said your ship is loaded and ready. Mm-hmm. That's what he told you, huh? 
Well, he's in for the surprise of his life because I'm not going. What did you say? I said I'm not going. Honey, that's just great. Is it? Well, it means you got something better. Oh, is that what you think? You do have something better, don't you? I don't have anything at all. Well, then I don't understand. How could you turn Curly down? Because I... Because I'm scared. How do you think I've lived this long? Being scared is what keeps you being careful. Okay. It's just I understood there was a fortune in this trip. But I'd have to go through the hole. And I'm never going to do that again. Roger, you've come through it before. Do you have any idea what it is? That hole in the sky? I don't know. Some people say it's all in the spaceman's imagination. Let somebody tell me that. You don't know what it's like. Okay, Rog, okay. It's a hole. A big black hole in the sky. I believe you, Rog. And there is nothing in there. Nothing. Honey, don't you think you need a drink? Nothing. Do you understand? It's a kind of corridor. A crazy kind of corridor. Whatever you say. It's like the back door to everywhere. Wherever you want to go, it's right there. You sound like fun. Like, like everything opens up on it. Everything is right there. Once you're there, you're everywhere. I believe you. Stars that are billions and billions of light years away from each other, like, like, like Polaris and Orion, like Taurus and Ursa Major. It's as if you can just move from one to the other, like, like crossing the street. That's why it's only six days from here, because six days is how long it takes to get to the hole in the sky. And once you get to the hole, you're anywhere you want to be. Do you understand? I keep telling you, it's not all that complicated. But I'm not going there again. Oh, honey, just try a little goblet of this and you'll go anywhere. It's a wild place. Hey, maybe I'd like to go there. A place where the whole universe is twisted and turned on itself. Sometimes it's quiet, silent as the grave. And then, then it explodes. Explodes? Everything goes haywire, crazy. There's no longer any sense of time or space or place. And you can just disappear. How can you just disappear? Take just a little sip of this. It's good for what ails you. Look. Right here on Earth, okay? There used to be a big ocean between Buenos Aires and Cape Town. Thousands of miles of ocean. Sure. And right in the middle, someplace, there used to be a spot called the Bermuda Triangle. Oh, is that so? And the ships that they had, the ones that were supported by... About. The ships that sailed over that spot disappeared. Ships that flew above this place disappeared. So? So this kind of thing has happened before. Maybe that was a hole in the ocean. Sure, Raj. If you say so. Look, get that tone out of your voice. I can't go through that hole in the sky again. I can't. I, I made a dozen trips. And nothing happened. How long can I be lucky? No, if I go this time, I, I'll be lost. I'll disappear. Oh, come on, honey. Take a drink. You'll feel better. You always do. I've been thinking about it. I'm going to sell the lark. And do what? I can sell the lark to the Navy and raise a stake. And go where? Where? Um, to a planet like Bacchus. Or maybe right here in our own solar system. A wild place like Venus. Or a mine. And you could raise enough from the sale of the lark? Oh, a good piece of it. For the rest, uh, well, I gave you plenty of jewels, money, credits. I know you did. All I'm asking is for you to give me some of it so I can get started. That's not all you're asking, Raj. You're also asking me to go with you and break my back in a mine or on a ranch. It's only tough for the first couple of years. I don't want to go. And as far as the money's concerned, it's mine. You gave it to me. I thought you and I were beyond words like yours and mine. And just said ours. No. Yeah. What'll I do the day you get tired of me? I'll never get tired of you, Magda. I'm sorry, Roger. I can't say to you, my darling, everything I own in the world is yours. Take it. Magda, I'm not asking for anything which I... You know that basically, I'm out for myself. Did you think you could change me? All right, Magda. 
Six days there and six days back. Well, honey, that's less than two weeks. I'll be waiting for you when you come home. Back from her, anyhow. She could only give me what she had to give. Why did I think I was entitled to more? And who was I kidding? I'd become a farmer, a rancher, a miner. I was nothing but a space rat. And I might as well learn to live with it. And die with it. I didn't even bother to tell Curly what he already knew. I went directly to the spaceport. The space car. But we had to go through the ritual. Hey, Roger. Hi, Joe. Hey, you inspected and cleared. Okay. That's uh, due page two. Uh, destination? Uh, Venus. And cargo? None. Purpose of journey? To visit friends. Oh, come on, Roger. You gotta do better than that. Why? What's the matter? Give me a break. The sheet does get checked. How does that look? To visit friends? Well, what do you want me to say? Well, you could say, uh, medical emergency. Say medical emergency. Mm, you gotta prove you're sick, though. You gotta name the doctor and so forth and so on. Joe, write down anything you please. Well, don't bite my head off. You and I know what you're doing. You and I know where you're going, okay? All right, look, I'm going to visit my poor old mother. Great. But you better have one, and she better be on Venus. Joe, just let me get out of here, will you? Raj, don't go. What do you mean, don't go? I mean, pack it in. Walk away from it. Are you telling me I can't go? No, I'm not telling you not to go. I'm just asking you not to. Why? Because you won't be coming back. How do you know? I know all the signs. You're not coming back, Raj. I know you are not coming back. At this point, he probably knows something we don't. But what? From the little we know about it, we can appreciate that any journey... ...and uncertain. But obviously, there's something especially dangerous and ominously unusual about this one. Well, Act Two is but a few minutes away. What was that popular song from a generation ago? It was called Far Away Places with Strange. And what were those faraway places? Oh, they were in Asia, Africa, Europe. Just a hop, skip, and a jump away. But our story today is about really faraway places with strange names like Tau Seti, Betelgeuse. And on a clear night, sometimes you may see them up there in the sky. What kind of thing is that to say to me? I'm not coming back. Because it's true. Raj, five years ago, I had my own ship, too. Five years ago, Curly had a job for me. Something like this, only uh, mine was in Orion someplace. Look, why don't we swap stories when I come back? You are not coming back, Raj. You better listen. I came out to the field here feeling just like you do. Everything inside me like jelly and... And like you, I knew I wasn't coming home again. I'd been through that hole in the sky too many times. Like you, I was scared. <laughs> scared to face guys like Curly. Also scared of starving. What was I going to do to make a living? What else can I do to make a living? Join up, Ron. No, 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 I could never do that. That's what I thought at first. But isn't it better all around if guys like you and me wear the uniform? At least we understand. I have to go now. It isn't too bad. The money's good. It's clean. Bribery, that's clean. Uh, maybe not, but... Hey, you can protect your friends. I'm only on the take as far as cargo and destinations concerned. All the money in the world wouldn't get you off the ground if I knew your ship wasn't spaceworthy. Yeah. Well, look, I got a schedule to keep. Don't go, Rod. I have to. Well, then... Don't go through the hole. You know as well as I do I have no choice. Okay. Okay, I'm on the desk tonight. Uh, maybe I can keep the hounds off your trail. In 15 minutes, I was completely clear of the Earth. I would have no problem while in the boundaries of our own solar system. 
But as soon as I was out in the galaxy, the patrols would be after me. I could outdistance any single pursuit ship. But if they had my position and course, they could set up a fire network that could destroy me in the fraction of a second. I could hear Joe Dresden on the monitor. He was getting reports from all of his scouts who had sighted or thought they had sighted me. He would be feeding all this data into a computer, which would calculate my exact position. Attention all ships, Rainbow Command. Illegal craft identified as Mark, registered Captain Roger Thorpe, probably headed for Polaris. Consult charts 946 and 202. Subtract coordinates 4 and 8 from coordinates 12 and 18. Mark, challenge. Allow five minutes for reply, then open fire. Thank you, Joe. He had sent the pursuit off in exactly the opposite direction. He had bought me at least two days' time. Attention, all ships, Rainbow Command. Fugitive reported headed for Ursa Major. Consult charts 380426. Fugitive reported headed for Tau Sandy. How skillfully he kept directing the pursuit away from me. I was coming to the end of the fifth day, and now I didn't have to worry. I was near the hole in the sky, and even though so many people were convinced that it was all fiction, that was back down there in the safety and security of Earth. Up here, even the most skeptical suddenly became believers. I could rest assured there was nobody within a trillion miles of me now. Roger. Roger. You can answer me, Roger. You won't give away your position. I'm on a sealed frequency. Joe? You're at the edge of the hole, Roger. I know. Turn back. I can't. I'll, I'll clear a path for you. I have to keep going. I'll bring you home safe and sound. I'm going in now, Joe. I'm here. And I was there. I was in the hole in the sky. It was so quiet. So peaceful. So tranquil. I'd better feed my computer. My speed, my course, my declaration. I could expect to find myself orbiting Medusa. Then I could set my bearing for the planet Bacchus. I could still hear Joe's voice. Roger, it isn't too late. Now get out of there. It's quiet, Joe. It's quiet. That doesn't mean anything. You know as well as I do, it can all change in a fraction of a second. Thanks for everything, Joe. I'm all right now. Come home, Roger. Come home before it's too late. Roger, come home before it's too late. Joe. Joe, where are you? Where are you? Suddenly, everything started to spin. Everything went out of control. Not just my computer and my instruments, but everything inside of me. It was as, as if I was just coming apart under some terrible pressure. An unbelievable stress and strain that began to pull me in every direction. It was as if it were the end of the world. Or maybe it was the beginning. Maybe it was the chaos that was in the very beginning. Then, there was nothing. Voice. What was she saying? It sounded like no language I'd ever heard before. Then I remembered what I had to do. I fed the sounds into the computer and waited. Just like the ancient anthropologists could construct an entire prehistoric animal from just a few fragments of bone, the computer could project an entire language from just a few significant sounds. Gradually... The voice became clearer and clearer. What ship is yours? Identify. Identify. Lark. Lark. How many aboard? Just one. Identify. Roger Thorpe, registered captain. Home port. Earth. Where is that? 
Consult star chart 876. What is star chart 876? Whatever you happen to use, start with Polaris. What is Polaris? You draw a line from Polaris to Deneb. There are no such stars. Hey, what's that noise? You are locked into a landing beam. Hold it. I don't necessarily want to land. Cut your power. I only need to get my bearings. Prepare to descend. Am I being forced to land? You are being invited. But I don't want... Cut all power. Step clear of the ship. But where... where... Follow instructions. Under protest. Follow the red line. Where am I going? Stop at the door. Wait. For what? It will slide open. Step inside. What's in there? Step inside. There's nothing in here. Step inside. Oh, all right. All right. What do I do now? Wait. What do you people want? Who are you? Where am I? I was in a room of some kind, a plain, bare space. There was a chair, just a single chair, and that was the only furniture. I sat down. I waited. Who were these people? What did they want? Then the wall slid away, and facing me was a woman. She was sitting behind a desk of some kind. She was young, about 30-ish. She wore a black robe. Her red hair was short. She might have been good-looking if she didn't have such a serious look on her face. She touched a switch, and suddenly on the entire wall behind, there appeared an enormous sky chart. Point out your home star. My home star? Well, it, it doesn't show up too well, you see. It's a red dwarf. I can give you its position. Yes. Uh, just let me orient myself. I'll have to find Polaris and then Tau City. I've never heard wait, of any... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. This isn't possible. I don't recognize any of these patterns. I warn you to tell the truth. But this is all, all very strange. Orion should be right there. Orion? I don't see a single thing I know in this entire sky. This is the universe. Well, maybe it's a part of it that's off somewhere. This is the complete universe. Wait a minute. The universe is infinite. Why did you do that? Blasphemy. Everyone knows the universe is closed and limited. Okay, okay, have it your way. Why are there no papers on your ship? Because I didn't need any. What is your cargo? I'm sure you looked it over by now. Cosmetics. What are cosmetics? Didn't your translating computer tell you? Yes, but I don't understand. Well, it's just... It's just stuff that women put on their face. For what purpose? I guess it makes them look better. Better? What's the difference? Please, answer the question. Is it important? It may be the most important thing in the universe. These uh, cosmetics, they change people's faces? You could say that. It disguises them. Well, strictly speaking, it might. I see. Yes. Yes, I see. But I hope you see something, because I don't. Interrogator. Yes, censor. We have examined the ship. Have you examined the prisoner? Who says I'm a prisoner? <laughs> you have not been spoken to. I have examined the prisoner. We see no use for the cargo. Destroy it. At once. Confiscate the ship. Immediately. Dispose of the prisoner. What does that mean, dispose? Uh, save him for the games or eliminate him quietly. Whatever suits you. What is he talking about? I shall save him for the games. Look, am I being sentenced to something? To death. Wait a minute. Don't I get a trial? You have been tried and found guilty. I have the right to defend myself. You have no rights at all. <laughs> 
sort of place is this? It could very easily fit certain places here on our own Earth. But this is a story that takes place far in the future, in a place so far away that the imagination can scarcely encompass the distance. But space, time, what do these things matter? People are people everywhere, aren't they? I shall be back shortly with Act Three. more things in heaven and on earth than are dreamed of in your philosophy is a favorite line of Shakespeare's. And of course, he had a rather limited idea of heaven. He didn't know that the heavens consisted of an infinity of space with an unlimited number of worlds. Can you imagine what he might have written had he been able to talk with a modern astronomer or an astronaut? From what I could gather, the man was called the censor. The girl who had been talking to me was called the interrogator. Anyhow, they both decided that it was all over for me. The man left. You will be executed at the games. What games are these supposed to be? The games to honor the establishment of the autocracy. Look, I don't have anything to do with all this. What was your purpose in coming here? I was on my way to Medusa. Medusa? Yes, it's a giant yellow star. There that... is no such star. How can you make a statement like that? Because I never heard of it. That doesn't mean that... If it existed, I would have heard of it. Since I have never heard of it, that is proof that it never existed. Why do I have to be killed? Because you have come here to overthrow the autocrat. That isn't true. Are you a stranger? Yes. The only reason strangers come here is to overthrow the autocrat. Since you admit to being a stranger, oh, now, it just means... hold on. That doesn't necessarily follow. Do you have legitimate business on this planet? Well, no. Then you admit it. Since you do not have legitimate business, you therefore must be treated as a stranger. She stood up and nodded her head. Two men in black robes came in. I understood I was to go with them. I don't care what world you're in. A cell is a cell. This was a small room with smooth white walls. There were two beds in it. I had a roommate. His name was Artie. And I asked him why he was in jail. I tried to kill the autocrat. Look, set me straight, will you? Who is the autocrat? He is the maximum ruler. And that's why you want to kill him? I want to kill him because he oppresses the people. And then what? Then perhaps the next maximum ruler will be a kinder person. And suppose he turns out worse? That has happened before. Mm -hmm. well, in that case, what do you do? Kill him and hope again. Wouldn't it make more sense to eliminate all these rulers entirely? Well, then who would rule? The people. The people? How could the people rule? Well, they would elect representatives to, well, to, let's say, to a Congress. I don't understand how that could work. It doesn't work with all these rulers, either. Well, that's because he has not come yet. Who? The ultimate ruler. And who's he supposed to be? The ultimate ruler? He will come down from the skies. How? He shall be carried by a bird. You have to be a pretty big bird. Yes. And he would mark his people. Mark them? In what way? In a certain way. In other words, you don't know. I only know what the prophecy reads. Oh, it's prophecy. For those of us who believe he will come. Still, it should be easy to explain what marking his people would mean. I suppose with a sign that will enable everyone to recognize them. All right. Meanwhile, how does it look for you and me? We shall be executed. You say you were opposed to the ruler. What'd you do? I wasn't able to do anything. We are too few, too weak. Or maybe we are many, but we do not know it. We have no sign by which we may recognize each other. Well, what did you actually do to wind up in here? I... I complained. You complained? About what? The weather. You mean you're going to be executed because you complained about the weather? It wasn't the first time. 
If you establish yourself as one who complains, it means you are basically a dissatisfied person. Therefore, you are likely to revolt. Well, do you plan to just sit here and wait? It does no good at all to make other plans. Why not? How can plans be carried out? We are sealed in here. There is no hope of escape. There has to be something we can do. We must face our fate bravely. I can't accept that. Accept it, since you may not reject it. It seemed there was no help at all. The days passed. When would it happen? The games at which the execution would take place. Or were the executions the games? Even Arnie didn't know. And the jailer who brought us our food wasn't talking. Then one morning, Artie was taken out of the cell. And I thought, this is it. But why was I being left behind? Then about an hour later, Artie returned. Hey, I thought that was the old ball game for you, Artie. You were worried, I'm sorry. It's my fault. Your fault? Oh, I should have told you. As the day draws closer, you're given a chance to save your life. Oh? What kind of chance? Well, naturally, you don't take it. Why not? What have you got to lose? Everything. You see, you are given an opportunity to inform on your fellow conspirators. Oh. The fact is, I don't have any fellow conspirators. Well, didn't you say that you belong to an organization that wants to overthrow the autocrat? I didn't say it was an organization. Well, then how do you expect to... One person can do it. If he is resourceful enough. But wouldn't it be better if you did have a group? Of course, but how would we know each other? I was very brave, but I wonder... Suppose I did have confederates. Would I have betrayed them to save my own life? I don't think you would, Artie. Then suddenly the door opened and the guards were in the cell. They grabbed me. I was hustled along some corridors and finally into a room. A small room. She was behind a table. There was no place for me to sit. Suddenly, she took a small metal rod from under her black robe. She pointed it at every part of the room. It gave off a squealing noise. One has to be sure. Of what? I'm sorry, I cannot offer you a chair. My name is Dinara. What do we have to be sure of? That we are not overheard. We are safe for a moment at any rate. What am I doing here? You know what you are doing here. You have been sent here to save us. I what? You are the ultimate ruler. Me? Now, j j just it hold on. It does you no good to deny it. I'm telling the truth. I have no idea It's probably what... the truth as you see it. You do not know that you are the ultimate ruler. But you have fulfilled the prophecy. The prophecy? Surely Artie has talked with you in the cell. Well, yes, but I didn't believe... It was predicted that the ultimate ruler will come down from the skies... He will be carried by a bird. What is the name of your ship? You can't be serious. The Lark. And it is a bird of delight. It's not an angry bird, a bird of prey. That's all coincidence. And he shall mock his people. Well? What have you brought on your ship, on the Lark? You have brought the devices with which your people can be marked. Paint and powder. Look, I'm afraid you don't understand. It's the prophecy. I am not the ultimate ruler. It does you no good to deny My it. name is Roger Thorpe. You told me that. I come from a planet called Earth that revolves around a tiny reddish dwarf star called Sol. It doesn't matter. I'm a trapped space captain. I carry mostly contraband if I want to make a living. It's not important. There's a place called the Hole in the Sky. I never heard of it. It's a spot in the universe where, where crazy things can happen. You get all twisted and turned in space. Space and time. It makes no difference. So maybe I am in an entirely strange universe. It doesn't change the prophecy. If you are aware or not of being the ultimate ruler, you fulfill all the requirements. Why are you telling me this? I, too, wish to overthrow the autocrat. You? But aren't you a, a member of the regime? There are many of us who do our work secretly and hope for the day to arrive. The fact is, I'm going to be executed any day now. So what good does it do if you think I'm the ultimate ruler? You have been brought here by your beautiful bird. You have brought the material with which to mock your people. Your people will save you. There was only one way to make sense out of any of this. I would just have to assume that I had landed on a planet of nuts. Pure and simple. And so I did. But it got pretty grim. 
One day, Artie and I were taken from our cell and brought to an enormous stadium. There must have been a 100,000 people. All of them wore black robes with hoods that covered their heads. Artie and I were led to the center of the arena. Then we heard the voice of the censor. These men have plotted against the autocrat. Their fate is to be consumed by the mighty electric energy of the state. In a few moments, they shall no longer exist. Let this then serve as a lesson to all who would attempt similar madness. Not a single word was heard from the robed and hooded crowd. And then we heard it. A humming that grew louder and louder. I began to feel warm, then hot, and soon it was as if I was on fire. Stop! Who dares halt the execution? I, the interrogator. For what purpose? Revolt. Arrest her. Before anyone dares to touch me, I shall remove my hood. Look at my face. Let all who have the same marking now show their faces. Her face was white as powder could make it. Her lips were red as the most flaming scarlet. I could hear her voice shouting. Believers in the ultimate ruler, show your markings. And now by the thousands, the hoods came off. And there they were. Men, women, children, with stark white faces and flaming red lips. Hardly anyone remained masked, except for the censor and a few high officers. And they were quickly hustled away. And now the silent crowd began to kneel. Kneel! Homage to the ultimate ruler! No, no one should kneel to me. You are the ultimate ruler. They must. About that makeup. You mean the sacred markings. Men... Men shouldn't really wear any. Would you deprive us of the privilege of showing our reverence and respect, ultimate ruler? The prophecy has been fulfilled. The ultimate ruler has arrived on a beautiful bird. He has brought with him the markings that his faithful followers have proudly put on and shall wear forever. And now, all hail the ultimate ruler! I don't understand completely. I'm the ultimate ruler. I'm treated with respect and reverence. I have whatever I want. There are times when I can't believe it. Am I lost in space? Or am I lost in my own imagination? Who knows? At times, this is real. And times when it seems like a dream. I only know one thing. I entered the hole in the sky, and I'm still in there. Do any of us know what it means? Is there a hole in the sky? Is there a Bermuda Triangle? Are there mysterious disappearances that simply defy all rational explanation? We work for centuries to solve a riddle. And then when we think we know the answer, suddenly the original question looms larger than ever. I'll be back shortly. I'm going on a picnic. That's nice. With Blanche, my sweetheart. That's her over there. And you want us to make up a picnic basket? With special wine and special food, Mr. Uh... Vino Branco. Hi, Mike McDonald. Vino Branco is the name of Lancer's white dinner wine. Vino Branco? Yes, very crisp and refreshing. It's affordable and it goes perfect with any food. Like caviar? Vino Branco is perfect with caviar. Okay, give me two quarts. Of what? Of caviar. It's $25 an ounce. How much do you want? Right. Well, there'll be two of us at the uh, picnic. Uh-huh. And uh, Blanche eats like a bird. Well, just give me an estimate. How about a quarter of an ounce? <clears throat> Perhaps you'd enjoy the Vino Bronco with something a little less expensive. You mean like this chicken? This pheasant. Blanche eats meatloaf. Isn't this meatloaf? No. She eats meatloaf by the gobs. It's not meatloaf. It's potty de foie gras. Okay, I'll take the Lancer's Vino Bronco. And what do you have to eat for under ten bucks? This jar of mustard. Perfect. Blanche eats mustard by the gobs. I'll wrap it up. How do you want to eat the mustard here? Or you what? can't eat the mustard. Ah, the summertime. When everybody's 
fancy turns to love, and Lancer's Vigno Bronco White Dinner Wine, imported by Hugh Blind, Hartford, Connecticut. You think you've got a problem buying your mother a present this Mother's Day? Try buying presents for four mothers. I have my mother, Jack's mother, my grandmother, and his grandmother. I couldn't possibly leave anybody out, so I give them each the Whitman sampler. The sampler's been a Mother's Day tradition with us for years. If you've got a problem about what to buy your mother this Mother's Day, give her the Whitman sampler. It's the perfect way to say Happy Mother's Day, no matter how many mothers you have. At the store, they told me there's a powerful anti-itch drug I can buy without a doctor's prescription. Now, I use Bicozine Cream as directed. No more burning, embarrassing itching. No more scratching. Bicozine actually speeds healing. Bicozine Cream. What a relief. Now, soften and remove hard, callous skin with the same ingredient doctors use most. Apply Dermasoft Cream to feet, hands, elbows as directed. Dermasoft Cream. Maybe there is a hole in the sky. After all, Einstein spoke of a place where the past, the present, the future are all intermixed and intermingled. He says it occurs at the speed of light. But just think, in the universe that's surrounded by our own minds, the private universe that each of us presides over, the past, present, and future frequently mix and mingle. And that truly can be where you find the hole in the sky. Our cast included Mandel Kramer, Joan Shea, Earl Hammond, and Russell Horton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. If you can't pay your gas, electric, coal, oil, or other fuel bills, you may qualify for help from the city of Detroit. To apply, you must live in... Marshall. A good deal has been made these days of the power of the ancients over life and death. Since no one has ever returned to tell us, we have no idea whether any one belief in any one deity guarantees life after death. Does Charon run his ferry across the Styx in both directions? Will Anubis guide any other nationality than ancient Egyptians to judgment? Will Vishnu appear to the Hindus or to all of us? to punish the wicked. Though we have no positive answer, today's mystery tale is worth checking out. Frank, where have you been? I've been going crazy trying to reach you. I've been to Boston for a three-day seminar. What's the matter? Can you please come over right now? You're my husband's best friend. I've nobody else to turn to. He just sits there in front of that statue like a zombie. And I'm scared. Please, Frank, hurry. Hurry! Our mystery drama, Messenger from Yesterday, written especially for the Mystery Theater by Gerald Keene, stars Norman Rose. Perhaps 
it would never have happened if the college had not been named Imhotep. But there it was, christened Imhotep College, after the Egyptian god of knowledge in a small New England town. Except for a department of Egyptology, this college carried a pretty complete curriculum from accounting basics to writing art of effective. So, why did it happen there? That man driving a 1969 station wagon into a driveway, that's where our story begins. Gloria! Hey, Gloria, I'm home. I know you are. It's one in the house. Gloria, can you come outside a moment? Darling, I'm in the middle of frosting my own birthday cake, if you want to know. I know it's your birthday, honey. That's why I want you to come out to the car. I can't come now, Rem. You'll be sorry, Gloria. Oh. All right. Oh, men, you are all alike. I have to stop what I'm doing because King Tut here, my famous professor of Egyptian history, has given an order. All right, now. Well, what is it? I don't see anything. Look in the back. Ramsey. What is that? Are you crazy? (laughs) Happy birthday, darling. A life-size statue of an Egyptian pharaoh? I don't know whether to laugh or cry. Do you think it looks all right in that corner? Oh, I don't know, Gloria. You see the way its right arm is sort of bent at the elbow? Mm-hmm. Well, I was thinking if we could sort of, you know, prop it up against the mantelpiece. How would it look like... <laughs> Ramsey, you are really too much. You bring me a life-size reproduction of a standing pharaoh, and you want to put it in the middle of the room? Oh, it'll look like it's leaning with its elbow <laughs> on the mantelpiece. Come on, how about it? A contemporary sculpture. Oh, I can imagine what our friends will say when they come to visit. Gloria, who's your friend? Or, uh, Gloria, there's a man by the mantelpiece. Uh, I was kidding. I think it looks great in the corner. Uh, can you think of any other place? It is the only place. I certainly don't want it in the kitchen, and I don't see it in the bedroom. Mm. All kidding aside, sweetie, you like it? How can I not like it? it it's beautiful. All that guilt. Must have cost a fortune, but I'm afraid to ask. Gloria. Gloria, look at it. Am I crazy, but wasn't one arm bent a moment ago? What? What? Bent? I'm not crazy because I do remember. Mr. Ray of the junk teak shop where I got it, I remember we were carrying it out to the station wagon and that, that right arm was bent. Mr. Ray said it probably had been, you know, holding something like a spear. Well, how could it have been bent? That's what I want to know. Because right now, that pharaoh has got both his arms straight down at his sides. Am I forgiven, Gloria? Oh... I don't know. I'll think about it. Dinner will be ready soon. I don't mind cooking my own birthday dinner or baking my own birthday cake, but in all the years we've been married, you have never come home without champagne. I will never forgive myself for forgetting it. Mm. I've got no excuse whatsoever. Classes were over early, too, because my students had a test today, so I didn't even have to do any teaching. Well, I guess it was all the excitement of finding this full-size standing pharaoh in that crazy place. You know, it just threw me. I can't believe he let you have it for so little. Are you telling me the truth, Ramsey? Well, it's a reproduction. The dealer said that this was a test statue. You know how they do it. They make a mold of the original and then cast copies from that. I guess this one was imperfect, so they chucked it. Well, not so anyone could tell. Well, all right, Professor West, if you can tear your eyes away from my golden cell for an hour, dinner is on the table. Oh, boy, that was some feast, Gloria. Well, I gotta loosen my belt. <laughs> that chocolate cake. Some more coffee, darling? Are you bet. Uh, look, can I have a second piece? You cannot. I'm putting the rest of this cake in the fridge where you cannot get at it. Ramsey! Ramsey West, you old faker. You bought it after all and snuck it into the ice box. What did I do? 
this bottle of champagne. And I was beginning to feel sorry for myself. Hey, where did that come from? Oh, Mr. Innocent. Gee, Glory, I forgot. I got so excited finding this Egyptian statue in a junk shop, I clean forgot it. But honey, this bottle of champagne, I, I never saw it before, believe me. You are the sweetest absent-minded professor I ever married. Go on, open it. I love surprises. But Gloria, honest. Will you stop it? Now, the next thing you're going to say is that the pharaoh put the champagne in the ice box. Gosh, it's good to hear your voice. Uh, how's Dad? Mm-hmm. How's life in Florida? What? Oh, she is. W- w- when did that happen? Oh, my gosh. Well, now, look, if Sis is ill and there's no one to take care of the kids, sure I'll go. Uh, uh, which hospital? Uh-huh. I'll take the next plane to Chicago. Don't you worry. Uh, no, Ramsey can't come. It's exam time at college. Now, listen, don't you worry about Sis. And and call you when I get there. Okay. And love to Dad. <sighs> uh, can I speak to Professor West? Uh, well, this is his wife, and it's urgent. Oh, I see. Uh, well, then can I leave a message for him? Okay, tell him that my sister is sick, and I'm taking the next plane to Chicago to help take care of her kids. Will you see he gets that? Thanks a lot. I thought you'd gone to your sister's. Oh, great Scott. The Pharaoh's vacuuming the living room. I am making this house ready for the long turn. I must be going crazy. Seeing things, hearing things. This, well, this just doesn't happen. A statue that, that moves, that talks. I better get Frank on the phone fast. He'll know what to do. Uh, hello, Frank. Hi, Ramsey. What's on your mind? Oh, Frank, are you busy? No, I was just going across the street to a diner for a little supper. I got green rice pudding. Oh, look, Frank, would you mind coming over here? When? Now. What's the problem? You sound kind of funny, Ramsey. What's the matter? Well, I, I don't know. I, I, I think I'm suffering from some kind of delusions. What's that noise I hear? Well, someone is uh, vacuuming. I thought Gloria was out of town. Look, Frank, don't ask so many questions. Just get yourself over here as fast as you can. And even when I pulled the vacuum cleaner plug out of the wall, the machine kept right on going, and the pharaoh kept moving it across the rug. Oh, come on, Ramsey. What is this? That statue over there in the corner was doing your house cleaning? Oh, what can I tell you? <laughs> Gloria will love you if you're your little Egyptian homemaker when she gets back. No minimum wage or social security to cough up. Frank, I tell you, that figure standing there against the wall was vacuuming. All right. All right. Let's be scientific about it. First, let's examine it. Now, see. Oh, it's really a beauty. I haven't seen anything like this outside a museum. Is it on loan from someone? Oh, it's... Gloria's birthday present. I picked it up at Mr. Ray's junk teak for next to nothing. You were always lucky. Look at the workmanship. This must have been made by one of the master carvers. And the age of it. 19th Dynasty, am I right? The original probably was. This five-foot-five statue is a copy? Yeah, from the Edwards collection. Even copies aren't cheap. I don't know what to tell you, Ramsey. It's a physical impossibility for this statue to move. You must have imagined it. I didn't. I tell you, it's physically impossible. Now tap all the way around to the back. See? Solid, through and through. It's not on casters. 
Now, how could the legs have been walking? Search me, but they were. I'd say, on the basis of what you tell me, you need a rest from teaching Egyptology. You've probably become so immersed in your subject, the, uh, how can I put it, the, uh, the ancient Egyptians have become so real to you that your mind has brought this statue to life. Frank, will you take a look at the handle of this vacuum cleaner? Do you see those specks? I'll be a son of a gun. Mm -hmm. Would you say that on this handle there are traces of gilt and gold paint? Oh, boy. Mm -hmm. Do you still think that I was seeing things? No. But I'm beginning to wonder about me. Ramsey, how many drinks have we had? Go on, tell me more. It said... I am making this house ready for the long journey? Right, as clearly as you're saying it now. Mm. Tell you what I think. And I'm not a professor of psychology without pretty much knowing that field. Especially aberration. Aberration? Mm. The human mind is a funny thing. There comes a time when it acts as though it had a mind of its own. You've just had a signal, that's what. A warning. Your mind is saying, Ramsey, you've been overworking. I'm going to give you a sign that'll scare the daylights out of you. So you had better take a rest. And that's what my mind is saying to me. Mm -hmm. More or less. Ah, uh, well, I guess you're right. Mm -hmm. It's been my experience that if those signals are disregarded, the subject could be heading for a nervous breakdown. Now, that's a little free advice. Now, got any food in the kitchen? I'm starving. <laughs> Wait till you see Gloria's creamy chocolate cake. She's got it tucked away in the icebox. Frank, look at all that food on the kitchen table. Say, you're a heck of a cook. And lit candles and my favorite little fat steaks. Ah, and chocolate cake on the side and coffee on the burner. Hey, I ought to come over here more often. Frank, I didn't prepare that meal. What are you talking about? I tell you, I had nothing to do with cooking this dinner or setting the table or lighting the candles. Well, whatever magic you practice, it turned out great. Sure beats the diner. I'm sitting down and digging in. Mmm. Wonderful. Cooked to a tea. I hope the nourishment was prepared as you wish. Mm. What did you say? Right. If I turn around, look who's standing in the door. Jumping Jehoshaphat. The Pharaoh. When faced with extraordinary or unexplainable phenomena, the first step is to assess what you know. Better than most other people, Professor West knows the ancient Egyptians believed that life continued after death. Whether there is fact in such a belief, who can tell? But certainly, the power of movement, recognition, and speech had been given to this plaster effigy of a man who lived 2,500 years ago. I shall return shortly with Act Two. Is there a link between the past and the present? Some theorists believe we are all linked in a chain, an endless belt of humanity destined to go round and round, which might explain why generation after generation seems to make the same mistakes. Or is there linear time, as others have said, that we are but travelers on a river of time passing the shores of events? Whatever the theory, the fact remains that in the house of a college professor, a statue has moved and spoken. It was the darndest thing. Uh, I've made a lifetime study of philosophies and psychologies, and the only explanation I could comfort myself with was mass mesmerism. Hypnotists use it, faith healers use it, and somehow, Ramsey and I had fallen for it. I swear to you, Frank, I had nothing to do with preparing that dinner. Now, don't keep saying that. 
too much for me to handle right now. Now, let me just add up what I do know. And here I am in your living room. It's 10 o'clock at night. I've eaten. I'm sitting in front of your fireplace. You're six feet away and standing upright, leaning against that mantelpiece, is a five-foot-five reproduction of a 19th Dynasty pharaoh. Now, how far would you say I am from the pharaoh? Oh, two feet, three, somewhere between. Mm -hmm. It's made of plaster, has two feet that are well-balanced on the ground, no platform, covered with gold paint. What any scientist would call a totally inanimate object. Yet I saw it move. And I heard it talk. Glad it's you too, Frank. We might get a raid on twin straight jackets. No, wait a minute. I, I never said you were disturbed. What I said was, you may be under a strain. So we're both under a strain. Right. Now, let's keep pulling it apart. Uh, do you mind if I smoke? I'm trying a new tobacco, and when I see you turning blue, I'll stop. Yeah, there are matches up there on the mantelpiece. Yeah. Now, where is that tobacco? Did you say there were matches up here? Oh, my heavens. Will you look at him? <laughs> he's, he's lit a match for you to light your pipe with. Thank you, Pharaoh. Thank you. I've got it. There was a slip-up when these copies were being manufactured, and you got yourself a robot. A robot? Well, how is that possible? Anything is possible. No, that's not what I mean, Frank. A robot has to be programmed like a computer. My pharaoh acts independently. He sees a problem. He solves a problem. He deduces we're hungry. He makes a meal. The room needs cleaning. He does it. I'm not denying that you haven't got yourself a very special kind of robot. Oh, I've got an idea. Um, well, uh, thanks a lot for coming over, Frank. I'll, uh, I'll see you to the door. But I, 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 I don't... Come on. Do you think the pharaoh can listen and understand us? Who knows? But I'm not taking any chances. Let's go outside. I'll walk you up the street. Uh, look, I'll, uh, I'll fix the latch so I can get back inside. Okay, shoot. Oh. I've got to find out who made that pharaoh. You've got something. Who indeed? Well, after my 10 o'clock class tomorrow, I've got the rest of the day off. I'll go to the junk teak and find out where he got it and keep tracking back. How about you? You want to come? Can't. Big day for applied psych. I'm free in the evening, though. A horrible thought that crosses my mind is maybe some manufacturer is turning out a whole army of robots, and all of them may not like to do housework. Hey. Hey, what is this? I'm, I'm locked out. I know I put this door on the latch. Hey, let me in. Pharaoh, stop kidding around. Let me in. About an hour later, I was home reading in bed. And Ramsey called. Told me he'd been locked out. Had to break a window to let himself in. Said the Pharaoh was just where we left him. Standing in the living room. The only thing different was all the ashtrays had been emptied. And the glasses washed and put away. I told him he'd got a good thing there. He didn't think that was very funny. Hello. Is this Museum Masterpieces Incorporated? Uh, right. Oh, this is Ramsey West. I recently acquired a reproduction of a standing pharaoh, Seti the First, I think. <laughs> it appears that way. Yeah, that's right. But you, you do make all those plaster cast copies from the Edwards collection, don't you? But yes, I do. Well, of course you can. I was going to come over and see you. Right, I'm at uh, 14 Elmhurst Drive. I'll be here the rest of the day. Oh, I didn't catch that name. Ludlow. And how will I know you? Uh, some some red hair, okay. Say, you are... <sighs> he hung up. Mr. Ludlow? Mr. Ware? I thought you were. I know you. Your face looks familiar, too. Well, you're Red Ludlow, class of uh, 61. And you're... Uh, Ramsey West. I teach Egyptology at Imhotep College. Well, good for you. Oh, so, you're with Museum Masterpieces, huh? Professor, I am Museum Masterpieces. 
Uh, there's my truck in your driveway. Oh, yes, so it is. It's a nice job. Oh, come on in, Red. Well, actually, nobody calls me Red anymore. I've got so little of it left. <laughs> uh, now, uh, where's the pharaoh? In the living room. Through here. Ah. There he be. The reason I wanted to uh, come over and talk to you, I wanted to know how many of these uh, have you made? Oh, just a hundred. If more orders come in, we'll cast another batch. Uh, do you think you could move him forward away from the wall? I want to look at something at the back. You see, we... Oh, my goodness. Was I imagining that? I, I thought he stepped forward. <laughs> well, I'm uh, <clears throat> spending too much time in the shop. Those fumes must be getting to me. What <laughs> are you looking for in back? A serial numbers. Uh, you don't think the Egyptians put serial numbers on the statues of their pharaohs? Uh, no, but we do on the copies. It... Uh, oh. I was afraid of this. What's the problem? Professor, can you keep what I'm going to say completely confidential? Well, sure, but what's wrong? Well, of course, it goes without saying. Museum masterpieces will reimburse you for what you paid for the statue. Well, I don't know that I wish to part with it. Oh, I'm afraid you'll have to. No question about that. I'd say there's quite a big question about that. I gave this one to my wife as a birthday present. Oh, in that case, does it matter to you if we give you a duplicate reproduction instead of this one? It certainly would. I, well... You see, I've become rather attached to this particular copy. I'm afraid that's just the point, Professor. This is not the copy of the standing pharaoh Seti the First. This is the original. And I'm afraid I shall have to remove it from this house. <laughs> oh, I, I'm blinded. I went off right, right in my face. All this smoke. But a fuse must a fuse must have blown somewhere. Mr. Ludlow, Mr. Ludlow, where are... Mr. 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 Ludlow? Red? Where are you? My son, he who stays the hand of Osiris must perish. Pharaoh. Pharaoh, did, did you make Red Ludlow disappear? That wasn't very nice of you. He is at peace with his ancestors. He is? Ramsey? Darling, I'm back. Oh, I'm so glad to be home. Honey, what's the matter with you? You look terrible. Oh, yes. Well, uh, it's just the uh, shock of seeing you. Uh, how's your sister? Shock? Well, that's a nice thing to say, I don't think. Oh, I tell you, it's good to be home. Ah, oh, and there's that beautiful pharaoh. How are you, pharaoh? Did you take good care of Ramsey while I was away? Don't talk to him. Uh, don't say anything. Well, why shouldn't I? He's my pet, Vero, my birthday present. Ah, you never know. What would you do if he answered you? Well, uh, depends. I guess if he spoke 19th Dynasty Egyptian, that would knock me out of the box right away. Well, so, let me look around. Well, I congratulate you. The place is spotless. Ramsey, you are a marvelous housekeeper. Well, I, uh, I had help. And the first thing I knew, Frank, there was this flash, and that was the end of Red Ludlow. Mm, I don't know what to say. And two minutes later, Gloria shows up. Her sister suddenly got well and came home from the hospital, so Gloria took the first flight back. Did you tell her what's been going on? Are you kidding? I don't even know how to explain his truck in our driveway. And what happens when museum masterpieces comes looking for the boss? They'll ring my bell, and the next thing you know, the police will stop by. What am I going to tell them? You sure can't tell them Red was atomized by a Pharaoh reproduction. They'll haul you off to the loony bin. That's another problem. It's the original. Lord knows what it's worth. It's probably priceless. First thing, get rid of that truck in your driveway. Well, how can I? When Red disappeared, the truck keys disappeared along with him. Then you're in the clear. No corpus delecti, no crime. Oh, I hope he's there. I just hope he's there. Hello. Oh, thank heaven, Frank, it's you. Yes, who's this? Gloria? Frank, please, please, could you come over right now? I know it's late, but I am so worried, and you're his best friend. I don't have anybody else to turn to. Frank, it's just terrible. 
He hasn't been to his classes all week. It's like I'm married to a zombie. He just sits there and... and... Frank, just hurry up and come over, will you please? Well, I've been waiting for you out here on the porch. I didn't want you to have to ring. Come on in. Okay. What is it, Gloria? Well, I told you he hasn't been to his classes for days. I don't know if he's ever going back. Where is he? In the living room. You won't recognize it, Frank. He, he's turned it into a tomb. What? He got some floor-to-ceiling photographic murals of the inside of some Egyptian tomb from some museum, and they're on the four walls. The fireplace he turned into an altar. And then, you know that exhibit of Egyptian artifacts in the front hall of the college? He brought everything here. All those funny statues of dogs and jackals and snakes and... Masses of dried flowers and tall grasses, and he just stuck them in jars all over the living room. But why? I don't know. It's something to do with that Egyptian statue he brought me for my birthday. Gloria, get rid of it. He just sits there like a king on a throne with this stunned look on his face. I'll go in there right now, Gloria. I'll do what I can to snap him out of it. And the worst part of it is he, he just won't let me near him. He makes his own meals. I don't know where he gets the food. Just comes out of thin air, I guess. He sleeps right in that room when that old army cot. I, I don't know what to do. And he won't let you go in there? When I go marketing, I have to go out the back door. Then I hear him talking, Frank, and I don't understand a word of it. You just leave him to me, Gloria. Go up to your room. And if I need any help, I'll holler. Between a statue thousands of years old and a teacher of today. Are there powers retained in carved wood and gilt that can transcend the ages? Was a spell woven by the ancients that can still hypnotize? If I were you, I'd just make sure your lucky charm is handy when you listen with me as I return shortly with Act Three. ordinary average house on 14 Elmhurst Drive in a room transformed to a replica of an Egyptian tomb, there is a statue, the Pharaoh Seti I. It speaks, it performs tasks, it seems to perform miracles, like making people disappear. Is there a scientist alive today who could create a robot of such powers? Or are these powers manifest beyond anything we can imagine? I'm not going to pretend I know the answers. All I knew was Ramsey West, professor of Egyptology at Imhotep College, had gotten himself much deeper into ancient death rites than he should have. And as his best friend, I would do anything to help him and protect him. Hiya, Ramsey. How are you, old boy? Who is it? It's me, Frank. Say, you really made this into quite a museum, didn't you? What are you doing sitting on that... Where did you get that chair? A lot of nice designs you painted on that. Made it look like a throne. You may advance. Oh, hey, Ramsey. It's me, Frank. Neil. Kneel, slave. What, are you kidding? You have been ordered to kneel. Oh, uh... Hiya, Pharaoh. I didn't see you standing there. Kneel, slave. Yeah, sure, sure, okay. I, I was going to kneel anyway. What is your message, slave? Uh, I just stopped by to see how you were, Ramsey. I see you got the Pharaoh still. So I guess nobody came around for him. Yes, yeah, hey... Can I get up off my knees? Rise. Oh, Ramsey. Ramsey, step out of it, pal. What's with you? Uh, what, uh, what's the matter? Ramsey, come on. 
Get up off that chair, will you? What? Uh, Frank? The least you could do is offer me a drink. Oh, Frank, Frank, is that you? Ramsey, you got to snap out of this. Now give me your hand. I'm not going to hurt you. That a boy. Now, slowly, I'm going to pull you off that throne. Here we go. Come on. Come on. Stop. Father, stop him. <laughs> Darn it. I must have tripped. How dumb can you be? I, 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 I can't get up. What's the matter with me? Bring me my crook and my flail. Ramsey, somebody stop playing games with me. Let me up off the floor. Ramsey, are you all right? Ramsey? Frank. Frank, are you hurt? I don't think so. I just can't get up. Gloria, go, run. Get out of here if you value your life. Five hours in Ramsey West's living room were about the most terrifying I'd ever known. It may be realized that, indeed, all those forgotten dynasties of ancient Egypt, all their beliefs that the dead and their families and friends would continue life after death, were no mere superstitions. But why Ramsey West should be caught in this web, I did not know then. At about two in the morning, I had talked myself hoarse. Ramsey fell asleep in his chair, and even the pharaoh's eyes seemed to close. I crept out. Frank, is that you? I didn't expect to find you still up. Been sitting here in the kitchen all this time. Oh, Frank, what am I going to do? Let's begin with a cup of coffee. I, I've got the water on. You want strong, regular, a week? How many spoonfuls? Strong, please. I just couldn't connect with Ramsey. I talked, but most of the time he just didn't hear me. He's in some spell of some kind. I don't even want to know what it is. But how can we get him out of it? Huh? What's that? It's just the tea kettle. Cooped up in that mausoleum sure made me jumpy. I don't know if I should tell you this. I guess I have to. Somehow, that Pharaoh... Somehow it, it talks. It really does. Oh, Frank. Not you, too. I am perfectly sane, Gloria. It doesn't always say things that make sense to me. Right after you got yourself out of there, I was lying on the floor, remember? Ramsey said, Father, let him live. But let who live? Me. Now, there are two ways we can go. I can pick up the phone and call the hospital and tell them to send over the men in the little white coat. No, I couldn't do that, Frank. Oh, so let's try the other way first. Once during the evening, I heard Ramsey call the statue Father. Maybe that's the key. Get rid of that statue and we're okay. Now, have you got a hammer or a hatchet or something heavy like that? I think so. I don't know if we have a hatchet... Ramsey keeps all our tools in this drawer. There's a screwdriver and an egg beater. Oh, how's this? That's a pretty good size hammer. Thanks. This ought to do the trick. Plaster is plaster, and if you hit it right, it ought to shatter like glass. Gloria, I may make an awful mess of your living room, but it's the only way. What are you going to do? You know, he's sitting in the dark now. May even be asleep. Well... I'm going to walk into that living room, turn off all the lights, go over to that plaster pharaoh, and I'm going to break it up into little pieces. Frank, it, it's not a copy. It's the real thing, an original. Oh, well, yeah, no matter how valuable it is, believe me, it's not worth having above ground. Well, couldn't we call a museum and have them take it away? It must be destroyed. Look at the damage it's already done to this house. To Ramsey, to you, to me. You want to put this... There's only one word I have for that statue, this evil thing, into a museum where it might affect thousands of people who come to look at it? I never thought of it that way. Hmm. I'm going in now. You stay here. No, I can't. I have to be with Ramsey. He may need me. Okay. Yes, uh, 
this helmet at a good weight. Let's go before we lose our nerve. Who's there? Don't sit in the dark, Ramsey. Isn't that better? Lots of light now. My crook and my flail. Bring them here. I'm here, Ramsey. So is Gloria. I don't know who you think will bring you a crook and flail, but I have my symbol of power, a hammer. I'm sorry, Ramsey, but we have to do it. There is evil intent in the air. You bet there is. Ramsey, stay there. Just stay out of my way. Don't strike the statue. I must. Frank. What happened? Why did you drop the hammer? Uh, what? The hammer. Uh, what was I doing with the hammer? The pharaoh. Yes. So? You were going to smash it. I don't see anything that needs fixing. I can't remember now why I brought it in here. You don't remember? <laughs> Gloria, forgive me. I've had a long day. A conference that lasted till two in the morning. And some of those abnormal sight papers my students handed in were a little too abnormal. Well, folks, it's been a nice evening. Thanks for the coffee, Gloria. Frank, where are you going and uh, why? Ramses has commanded me to leave his presence. I'm excused, so I obey. Frank, what's with you? You don't talk like that. So long. See you. Frank, Frank, for heaven's sake, come back. Don't leave me here. Please don't. Frank, stop. Stop. Frank, what happened? Oh, hi, Gloria. What are you doing out here? Frank, don't you remember... I don't know. Was there something I forgot? About Ramsey and that pharaoh. Oh, yes. Nice-looking statue. Of course, only someone who was into Egyptology would give it house room. Frank, you don't remember about half past nine, my phoning you, asking you to come over? Well, I guess I do. We had coffee in the kitchen, right? Do you remember why we did? What we talked about? Do you remember anything strange about our living room, the way it looks? Like an underground Egyptian tomb? And Ramsey sitting on a big wooden chair staring at that statue? Do you remember any of that? You were in there for two or three hours, you said. Vaguely. You don't remember we decided to smash that pharaoh with a hammer? Gloria, you're going to think I'm an awful dunce. And I don't know why it's all... Like some dream that starts to disappear the moment you wake up and you can't hold on to it. Now, why would I want to take a hammer to break up that pharaoh? It means an awful lot to Ramsey. Are you sure you didn't misunderstand me? Frank, do you remember saying, Ramsey's has commanded me to leave his presence and so I must go? Come on, Gloria, it's late. We're standing in the middle of the street, and you're telling me jokes. I'm getting an awful headache. So if you don't mind, I'll be on my way home. Tell Ramsey I'll call. I can't even remember what day it is. And I'll see you, Gloria. I hope so. Gloria, is that you? Yes, it's me. Oh, Ramsey, why do you have to sit there? I wish you wouldn't. I wish you were you. My father has something to say to you. Oh, glorious Seti, speak to thy handmaiden. My daughter, are you prepared for the journey? What journey, great Seti? You and my son, Ramses II have been rescued from reincarnation to return to the proud kingdom. This life you enjoyed in this century is not yours to keep. Return to join your ancient ancestors. The gods await you. Didn't I tell you, darling, this was a perfectly lovely house? 
If the real estate agent said we could spend as much time as we liked here and then bring her back the key, it's completely furnished. Oh, really? Who does it belong to? Well, that's the funny part about it. The people who used to live here, a professor and his wife, one day they just left town and disappeared. <sighs> Will you look at what's standing in that corner? A pharaoh. Mm. Yeah, they just left it here. Mm, that might be worth something. The most curious coincidence is that he was the professor of Egyptology at the college, the job you're going to be taking. Well, come upstairs with me, darling. I want to show you how big the closets are. My son, my daughter, I shall be sending you your servants very very soon. I've been looking through old textbooks on ancient Egypt to try to make sense of what happened. Of course, I was struck with the similarity of names, Ramsey and Ramses the second. Then I read all that about reincarnation, and I wondered, had they found themselves in the wrong century and had to go back? Your guess is as good as mine. Which reminds me to tell you what is inscribed over the tomb of Ramsey's father at Abydos on the Nile. Death does not end all things. An ancient king returns to earth to reclaim his son. Possible? Believable? The pharaohs placed their faith in scarabs, amulets, and colored stones and buried themselves so they might live forever. Is that any more primitive than current beliefs that opals are unlucky, jade wards off heart disease, copper wristbands cure arthritis? And as for the luck of rabbit's feet, numerology, astrology... Let's just say the ancients had no corner on superstitions. Our cast included Norman Rose, Terry Keene, Gordon Gould, and Russell Horton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. 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 I'm E.G. Marshall. Why, asks Mr. O'Hara, are we so afraid of loneliness since it must become eventually the ultimate condition of us all? And yet loneliness is the most private and prevalent of all the sorrows in our society. Never in history has the world been so noisy, so crowded, and never have so many been so silent and so alone. Just a minute. I'm coming. I'm coming. What's the rush? Please. Oh, what are you? Oh, no, please don't. Why? Why do you want to shoot me? No. mystery drama, Help Wanted, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Tony Roberts and Carol Titel. 1075 Bank Street. They say you're only as old as you feel, but like so many other generalizations, this one, strictly speaking, isn't true either. The fact is, you're as old as society perceives you to be. 
And so if you live in a youth-oriented world, you can be put out to pasture much sooner than you ever thought possible. Ah, good morning, Miss Colfax. Oh, uh, good morning, Mr. Diaz. Uh, what is there I can perform for you this morning, Miss Colfax? Oh, uh, I can wait till you're finished with this lady. Oh, no, that, that is all right. She's thinking. Well, I don't mind, my dear. As a matter of fact, I'm trying to remember what it was I came in here to buy. Oh, well, if you're sure you don't mind. No, not at all. Oh, well, um, Mr. Diaz, do you suppose... That is, I wonder if I might return this turkey. There is something wrong with the turkey. Oh, no, no, it's really quite a splendid bird. Well, then, why do you wish to bring him back? If it's uh, too much trouble... Oh, no, 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 no. No, if something is wrong, you must tell me. Well, I... Oh, you must not be afraid. Because I call up the wholesale man, I raise hell. I say to him, what are you pulling? Hey, if you think you can sell Juan Martin Diaz bad turkeys, then, my friend, you are yourself the turkey. <laughs> come, come, we look him over. Oh, but really, there's nothing wrong with the turkey. It, it's the finest, the most beautiful, the most plump... And I'm sure the most tender turkey I could ever hope to buy. Hey, hey, if he is all these things, then maybe I did not charge you enough for him, huh? It's not the turkey's fault. Miss Colfax, ¿qué pasa? What's the matter? Mr. Diaz, they... They're not coming. Not coming? Who is not coming? Robert. My son, Robert, and his wife, and the children. Oh. Uh, this year... This year, he said they would come for sure. So I... I... Hey, hey, hey. You know what you want, Miss Colfax. You want a little cup of coffee. I plan to make a, a dinner. No, no, you come. You try the coffee, huh? Hey, nice and hot. All his favorite dishes. Especially turkey. Here, here. Now, you drink some, huh? He promised. He promised this year, positively. No, no, you drink, and soon you feel so good. But just this morning, he called, and he said... Now, Miss Colfax, you just take it easy, you know. He said there was a last-minute change in plans. Well, well, what can you do? And he wouldn't be able to get away. Yes, I know these things happen. You gave me that turkey. I put him back in the freezer, and we say no more about it, huh? Yes. And I owe you eleven dollars and forty-seven cents. Here you are. Oh, thank you, Mr. Diaz. The children today, they forget. I knew you'd understand. Once they don't need you no more, they don't want you no more. You work hard. You send the boy to school. He gets a good job. Now he has his own family. <laughs> and what does he do? Huh? He forgets his mom. No. No, that isn't true. You mustn't say that. Uh, once a year, he can't even find a Sunday to come home to see his mama. You don't understand. Robert's busy. He's very busy. Nobody is too busy for the Bible. You know what it says in the Bible. Honor your father and your mother. You don't understand. Robert has a very responsible position. Without him, everything in the company comes to a standstill. Something... Extremely serious must have come up. Oh, yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, After yeah. all, he, he just can't leave everything and take a 300-mile trip. He's too busy. Too busy to see his mama? Don't you say another word about my son. Don't you dare. Oh, sure, sure. Okay, okay, sure. I don't say anything. Sure. Who do you think you are, you stupid foreigner? I'll never set foot in this place again. <laughs> Some people. I don't think she meant that, Mr. Diaz. Yes, I do. She's really an old and tormented human being. Uh, sure, sure, yes. You look at her face into her eyes and you... You see, you... You know she can never be happy again. That is too bad. I would like to help her. You would? Yes. I really would. <laughs> Thank you. 
Operator, I, I want to place a, a person-to-person call to Mr. Robert Colfax in Carter City. Uh, the, the number is 555-8585. Thank you. Oh, I'm sure if I could just talk to him again. Oh, I, I'd better turn that music down. After all... Maybe I could go visit him, even if Evelyn doesn't. Oh, oh what's that, operator? Oh, well, well, just keep ringing. I'm sure he has to be home. Oh, well, all, all right, I, I'll place the call again. Thank you. Oh, just a minute. I'm coming. I'm coming. Yes? What do you... Oh, no. Oh, please. Don't. Please. Don't shoot me. Why do you want to shoot me? Just a minute. Coming. Artie. Hello, dear. Aunt Millie, you're doing it again. Doing what again? How many times must I tell you? Really, Artie, dear, where are your manners? You haven't even said hello. Well, this is more important. Nothing is more important than plain and simple everyday courtesy. Do you know what you did, Aunt Millie? You turned the handle and opened the door. Oh. It wasn't even locked. Oh, dear, I simply forgot. Well, you just can't afford to forget. And now, after you close it, turn the lock. Make it an automatic thing. Mm -hmm. I spent most of my life in a place where people never bothered to lock their doors. Well, those days are gone forever, I'm afraid. Oh, I suppose so. Let me make you a nice cup of tea. Oh, thank you, Aunt Millie, but um, I'm here on business. What sort of business could you possibly have with me? Well police business. Oh, my goodness. Have I done anything? I guess it has to do with what we were just talking about. Keeping your door locked. Evidently, another lady in this neighborhood didn't do it, and so she's dead. You did? Yes. Are you saying that someone just walked into her apartment and, and shot her? Oh, Artie. We have another murder of an elderly woman. It's the fifth in less than two months. Oh, no. Well, she lived just down the street. Her, her name was uh, Colfax, uh, Mrs. Anna D. Colfax. Now, why is that name familiar? Well, it turns out you're one of the last people to have seen her alive. Colfax. She lived all alone, a kind of short, uh, thin lady, uh, about 70. Just a minute, Artie. Well, I was checking the neighborhood, and I went into this little grocery store. The owner, a man named uh, Diaz, said that... Yes, of course. That's where I saw her. Yeah, you, you were there when she came in. This was an hour before she was murdered. Oh, I feel awful. Mr. Diaz says she was very angry when she left. Well, I suppose you might say she was uh, on the surface. Actually, she was... she was hers. Hmm. How well did you know this, Mrs. Colfax? Well, on the one hand... I didn't know her at all. But on the other, you could say I knew her very well. Well, for just a few minutes, Aunt Millie, forget that I'm your little nephew and talk to me as Detective Lieutenant Arthur McCrae, who is charged with solving a very serious homicide. All homicides are serious, Lieutenant. Yes, but uh, this is even more serious because somebody's going around killing elderly ladies. And the police department is being accused of negligence, inefficiency, callousness. You name it. Therefore, somebody in the police department is going to be at fault, and you're looking at them. Oh, Artie, that isn't fair. Well, so, Aunt Millie, do not, I beg you, give me answers that consist of, on the one hand, we have this, but on the other hand, we have that. It's true. 
I didn't know her until I met her just for a few minutes in Mr. Diaz's store. And then I, I realized that I knew her very well. All right, now what do you know that could help me as a cop? She was lonely. Yeah, we know she lived alone. No, that's not the same thing. I live alone, but I'm not lonely. She was disillusioned with the world. She felt exploited, ill-used. She was, she, was, she was bitter, angry, frustrated. Well, those were all good reasons why she might want to kill somebody. The question is, why would somebody want to kill her? For those very same reasons. I think you just lost me. Do you remember your equations in mathematics and chemistry, physics? The basic principles that hold for all of them? Remember? I don't think I ever learned them. Both sides of the equation had to balance. Dear Aunt Millie, what has this got to do with... You must look at murder as an equation. <sighs> okay, what is this now? Stated this way. Killer plus motive... Equals victim. Of course. Therefore, victim equals motive plus killer. So, where am I? Everywhere or nowhere. It all depends. That's what I like about you, Aunt Millie. <laughs> ah, oh, the tea is ready. And don't say you have no time. All right. <laughs> I know you like yours with lemon. Aunt Millie, I really have another reason for being here. Oh, of course. All motives are complex. Nothing is ever simple. You shouldn't be living alone. I mean, certainly not down here. Oh, now, dear, I have to live alone because I'm alone in the world. That isn't true. Janie and I would love to have you stay with us. Oh, dear, Artie. I mean it. Of course you do. Did you see how you said it? You said, stay with us, as if I would be a guest. Oh, look, however I may have said it, Janie and I are sincere about it. Certainly. But there's no room for me in your lives. Aunt Millie. No, not on a daily basis, no. People need their privacy, and that's why I have to live alone. Also, I have to live in this neighborhood because it happens to be the only place I can afford. We worry about you. Really, dear, I'm very, very careful. Oh, true, I may forget to lock my door from time to time, but on the whole, I exercise the greatest caution, honestly. Will you have dinner with us on Sunday? Of course. Please, promise me to keep your door locked. Artie... I'd better talk to you. Aunt Millie, I've got work to do. It's Sunday. Well, there's no such thing as Sunday for a police officer. But there is for a police officer's wife. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of that. I realized I could do one of two things. I could help Janie with the dishes, or I could come in here and talk to you. I have to nail this killer. It's very hard on Janie. She knew what it would be like married to a cop. Not really. She only discovered afterward. Well, I'm doing the best I can. I wish I could help. Aunt Millie, this isn't exactly your field. It's more mine than yours. Oh. Well, with all due respect, what do you know about police work? And what do you know about old ladies? That's what this case is about, isn't it? Someone in the neighborhood hates little old ladies. Hates them enough to commit murder. Wait a minute. Hold on, Aunt Millie. I think... I just think I may have a clue. So soon? How long does it take? After all, the name of the game is Insight. The native ability to suddenly see the gold in the dross, the wheat in the chaff. Some people's insight works more quickly than others. Already, Artie thinks he sees something. Do you? We'll check it out in the second act. Murder. We speak of it as an aberration. Yet, it is one of the oldest of all human activities. It is, as we have learned, the final solution the ultimate argument. 
To all people of goodwill, it is abhorrent, yet fascinating. Why do people kill? Is the reason simple or complex? It all depends. Aunt Millie, I'm scraping the bottom of the barrel, but I'm thinking back to what you said the other day. You know when I first spoke with you? Well, I'm sure I said a great many things, Artie. All right, well, let me sort this out. Uh, I was looking for leads, and I walked into this little grocery store. Yes, Mr. Diaz's place. I turned out uh, she shopped there. Well, most people around here do. He's very accommodating. And I, I asked him when he had seen the Colfax woman last. He replied about an hour before. And I asked him if anyone else had been in the store. Uh, he mentioned you. Now, in talking with him, I got the impression that he didn't care much for Mrs. Colfax. Why? Oh, it's a subjective thing. I just got the feeling that he didn't like her. But I could be wrong. Oh, he's really a very nice person. I remember telling you that. Yeah, he can still be a nice person and, and not like her at the same time. What are you trying to say, Artie? Why didn't Mr. Diaz like her? Well, I didn't exactly say he disliked her. Well, I, I suppose he did have some justification. Justification? <laughs> That's a good word. It's the first time I've encountered anything even remotely like it on this case. Oh, now, don't build this up. Look, why don't you just try telling me? Well, she... She insulted him. How? Well, she said something <laughs> very stupid. What? Well, it was something very unfeeling, unfair, and untrue, and certainly uncalled for. Yes? Are you going to force me to repeat it? I'm afraid I have to. She said he was a... a stupid foreigner. Oh. Well, but of course she was almost hysterical. Mm. Why? Well, it happens quite often. They're under terrible stress... And so you bear your soul to someone. After you've done it, you feel that you really had no business doing it. So you hate the person you unburdened yourself to. The fact is, she did insult Mr. Diaz. Oh, I'm sure Mr. Diaz is too much the gentleman to hold that against her. You never know how deeply an insult can cut. You know, how much it can burn. Surely you're, you're not implying that Mr. Diaz could be the... Oh, oh no, no, no! I, I won't even say it. No, I won't. I won't say it either. But at least I have a motive. But would he kill her just because she said something? I'm not something saying I... he would or he wouldn't. I'm only saying that finally I've got something, and maybe it's a way to go. All right, Artie, what do you got? Inspector, I'm not sure. Well, now, the media is roasting us alive. I think I have a focal point. And what does that mean? Uh, a place where everything can come together. Oh, and where is that? A little grocery store in the neighborhood. It's uh, it's owned and operated by a man named uh, Juan Diaz. Oh, and what does that give us? Well, all five dead ladies shopped there. Now, all five dead ladies could have shopped in at least 50 other stores in the neighborhood also, you know. I know for a fact that Mr. Diaz did not like Mrs. Colfax. <laughs> well, does that make him the killer? No, but, well, it could be a start. Uh, at least we have somebody. Oh, uh, what can we do with them? I'm not sure yet. But, now well, I want to use some manpower to concentrate on him. Artie, we've got to get some results, and fast. Or everybody around here could be back in uniform. Now, the mayor is up for re-election. He'll throw us to the wolves. You got something on this Diaz angle? Run it all the way down. Maybe it'll save us. Who is it? Mrs. Jankowitz? Yes? I'm a police officer. Yeah? How do I know that? Well, just open the door on the chain and uh, I'll show you my badge. I got no chain. Chain's no good. Bandits reach in and snap lock. Uh, well, I have a card with my name on it. Uh, let me slip it under the door. You see? It says, Police Department. Detective Lieutenant... Arthur McRae. All right. 
You wait. Come in. Thank you, Mrs. Jankowitz. Now, uh, what do you want? Well, five women have been killed by someone in this neighborhood. I don't want to talk about it. Well, unless we get people to talk about it, we'll never get the murderer. And what's to talk about? I never seen him. I don't know him. Did you know a Mrs. Anna Colfax? No. Or Mrs. Ernestine Simpson? Yes. She was killed. Yes. Mm. She was one of the five. How well did you know her? Ernestine? Uh -huh. Pretty good. She had a bad time, that one. Yes? In what way? Uh, she was always crying. Nobody liked her. So I'd say to her, Ernestine, I like you. People did dislike her? No, no. It was all up here in the head, you know. She was old, all alone. She felt she had nothing to live for. Who were some of her other friends? Ah, uh, she was not the kind who'd have friends. Maybe I was the only one who understood her. Her problem was she was always flying off at the handle. Why? I guess she didn't trust nobody. I don't blame her. You know, her husband ran off with somebody else. Her own son cheated her out of every cent she had in the world. So she took it out on everybody. I says to her, Ernestine, you can't live like this. Then what would she say? Ah, she'd get mad at me. Did she shop at uh, Diaz's store? Uh, Diaz. Oh, the groceria. Yes. Yes, she did. Uh, then uh, she stopped. She stopped? Why? Ah, uh, they have a fight. She say he cheat her. How, how did he cheat her? Well, I remember. I go into the store. I have to buy milk. And they're having a big argument. About what? Uh, what people argue about these days. Money. Don't you tell me I owe you money. Oh, to Miss Simpson, I have it right here in the book. I don't care what you have in that book of yours. I don't owe you a nickel. Uh, perhaps you do not remember. What do you mean? I do not remember. Are you getting it at what I think you're getting at? No, no, please, please, Miss Simpson. What please. you're saying is that I don't remember because I'm an old lady. That's what you're saying. Oh, no, no, I am only saying That's that what you're... your little racket here is, isn't it? You deal with old people, so you think... They're yeah, stupid. Yeah, no, no, please, Mrs. Simpson, please forget it. Yeah, yeah, and do us both a favor. Huh? Take your business someplace else, yes? You're throwing me out of here, huh? Who do you think you are? Listen, I've been thrown out of better dumps than this oh, one. Please, Mrs. Simpson, we do not need a scene like... My husband threw me out, my kids threw me out, and now some cheating storekeeper with his thumb on the scale throws me up to. Mrs. Simpson, I must ask you to leave. Where do you want me to go? Do you want me to quit living? You have no right to insult me in front of customers to accuse me of being a thief. Don't you worry. You'll never see me in here again. And uh, how long ago was this, Mrs. Jankowitz? Uh, let me see. She dies two, three, no, three weeks ago. Yeah, it was Sunday. This, this happened on a Saturday, the day before. Mm. Tell me, Mrs. Jankowitz, do you think that uh, Mr. Diaz cheated her? Oh, not him. It's just, you know, she was old. She forgot herself. He was mad at her. Mm. Very mad? Well, people in the store and all, how, how did it look? Yes. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Jankowitz. Uh, uh, you going to catch the killer? I hope so. <laughs> Mr. Diaz, isn't the fact that you had a violent argument with Mrs. Ernestine Simpson the, the day before she was murdered? Violent? Why? What is violent? Very strong. Uh, oh, we had an argument, yes. Uh, she insulted you? Well, she... Do, you, do you deny that she insulted you? Well, a man like me, I get insults every day. 
she calls you a thief. It's America, a free country. Each person is allowed to have an opinion. Oh, come on now, Mr. Diaz. You had a pretty violent argument. Well, you know, she says something, I say something. You ordered her out of the store. Oh, no, no. No, no, never. You didn't tell her to take her business elsewhere? I think I say, Miss Simpson, if you do not trust me, you should take your business uh, someplace else. Mm -hmm. And you didn't order her to leave? No, no. You didn't say, I must ask you to leave? No, I only said, maybe you better leave and come back when you feel better. You deny there was a fight? No, there was no fight. Me? Fight? <laughs> no. How can I afford to fight with customers? And so you, you deny that there was a violent altercation? If that means what I think, yes, I deny it. And I got witnesses. They tell you the same thing. I, ah, I, I remember, sure. There was another lady in the store. She hear everything. Hmm. You remember her name? Mm, the same lady who was here when the other one, that Miss Koufax, get angry also. You talk to her. She tell you it was peaceful. I wasn't angry. The same lady who was here the other day? Yeah. She's a good customer of mine. Miss, uh, Millie, uh, Miss Millie McCray. Aunt Millie. One thing you have to say about our Aunt Millie, she sure does get around. But the pattern is emerging. We have a Mr. Diaz who runs a food store. He has an argument with an elderly woman customer, and shortly thereafter, the woman is murdered. Are we dealing with coincidence? A third act is en route with the answer. string of murders, all for what appear to be trivial motives, if indeed they can be considered motives at all. So you might say they are the work of a madman, but the problem with madness is usually that it has a logic of its own, an extremely convincing logic that makes excellent sense, that is, on its own terms. Miss Millie McRae was here when this fight took place? No, but it wasn't a fight. Mrs. Simpson wasn't angry? Oh, Mrs. Simpson, she was angry, yes. But I was not angry. And at any rate, you knew Mrs. Simpson. You knew Mrs. Colfax. The other three ladies, Mrs. Hernandez, uh, Mrs. Pinson, and Mrs. Weiss, you knew them too? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They were customers of mine. Uh, Lieutenant, uh, what are you trying to say to me? Did you have arguments with any of those three also? No, please, Lieutenant. I don't ever have real arguments with anybody. Just a minute. Artie, dear. Oh, once again, Aunt Millie, you didn't lock your door. You're right. I forgot. Do you know what's going on in this neighborhood? I'll remember. I promise to remember. Five women. Come in, Artie. Come in anyhow. Oh, no. It is nice of you to drop in. How about some lunch? Aunt Millie, I understand you witnessed another scene between Mr. Diaz and one of his irate customers. I did? Yes, another of the ladies who were killed. Mrs. Ernestine Simpson. Oh, yes. Then why didn't you tell me? Why should I have told you? Well, it's another case of where a woman gets killed after an argument with Mr. Diaz. Artie, oh, surely you, you don't suspect Mr. Diaz. Well, Mr. Diaz, rightly or wrongly, is the only suspect we are even remotely close to at this time. Oh, but he's such a nice man. Well, every now and then, nice people, well, something comes over them and uh, they commit murder. Oh, but... But, Mr. Diaz... Look, that argument some weeks ago uh, with Mrs. Simpson, do you remember? Well, let me think. She accused him of having cheated her. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, I seem to remember. 
Mr. Diaz carries many people on credit. Otherwise, there'd be no reason to buy there. I mean, a customer could do better in the chain supermarkets on many items. Yeah, well, now tell me more about uh, Mr. Diaz and Mrs. Simpson. Well, when he charges an item, he writes it down in a book. And she denied one particular entry? Oh, she absolutely refused to acknowledge it. She became furious. I suppose Mr. Diaz took it as an attack on his integrity, which I I suppose it was. Was he angry, too? Hmm. In his own way. Which is what? He doesn't raise his voice. He just turns a bit pale, bites his lip, and somehow you sense he's seething inside. So it was a rather violent scene. Well, it was a particular kind of violence. I'm afraid many of us do give Mr. Diaz a rather difficult time of it. How? Well, so many of us are alone. Oh, not me, Artie. I have you, and I have Janie. Just as much of you as I need to sustain me. I'm lucky. I'm not like so many of them. Them? You get old, Artie. And maybe you never had much money, but it didn't matter because you had other things. Well, now those are gone. And it's lonely. You don't know how lonely. Especially for women who are always dependent on others for everything. Yeah, I understand. But what is that well, got to do? It's an empty world, Artie. It's an empty life. And trifles suddenly assume unbelievable importance. And that's because life, life itself is now nothing but a, a series of trifles. You yourself are made to feel like a trifle. Would you do something for me, Aunt Millie? Of course. After each of these two incidents, you were in the store with Mr. Diaz afterwards. Can you remember what he said? Afterwards? Well, let me think. Try. I must establish his state of mind. Try the most recent one first, Mrs. Colfax, after she walked out. All right. She walked out, and he said, M Mr. Diaz said... Oh, some people to say such things. I, I don't think she meant it, Mr. Diaz. Oh, I do. She she's really a terribly tormented human being. Yes, but still and all... But you look at her face, at her, at her eyes, and you, you can see she could never be happy again. Oh, that is too bad. I would like to help her. You would? Yes. I really would. And? That was all. Okay, okay. Now, that's what happened uh, with the Colfax lady. After the incident with the Simpson woman uh, uh, three weeks ago, what did he say then? Well, let me try to frame that once more. Uh, there was another lady in the store at the time, evidently a friend of hers. I I've seen her around. Oh, no, I, I think her name is Mrs. Um, uh, Jankowitz. And when Mrs. Simpson stormed out of the store, M Mrs. Jankowitz went, went out after her, obviously to calm her down. Well, I, I just stood there looking at Mr. Diaz, and finally he said, Why do I put up with this? Oh, no, Mr. Diaz. She has no right. But the poor woman is troubled. <laughs> she knows how to give trouble. Isn't it better to forget it? How can I forget it? I'm human. Mrs. Simpson obviously needs help. Perhaps I could help her. Nobody could help her. And that was the conversation? As far as I can remember. All right. All right, what? Surely you don't believe he was angry enough to commit murder. Well, anger is a relative state. Who knows how much is enough? All right, here's how it lays out, Inspector. Uh, we know for a fact that all these ladies kept their doors locked. Nobody broke in. Uh, which means uh, they knew who it was. Yeah, right. They willingly opened the door because they knew who was ringing the bell. Uh, th these were all highly suspicious ladies. Uh, they certainly had good cause. At least two of them that we can account for had arguments, uh, episodes, 
whatever with Mr. Diaz. Uh, uh, what you're trying to build here is a case against Diaz? No, no, Inspector. I'm, I'm trying to lay out the materials and then see if it builds itself. Uh-huh. Now, after the incident in his store, Diaz goes to see these ladies, whichever one at the time. He rings the bell. They, they ask who's there. He says, Mr. Diaz. They recognize the voice. They let him in. Why? They didn't exactly part friends. Diaz may say, I come to apologize. And maybe he tells them also he's got a little gift. Logical? Hmm. It sure sounds logical to me. But the DA is going to need an awful lot more before he'll want to take it to court. Hello, Mr. Diaz. Oh, yes, Lieutenant. Do you own a gun? Uh, no, no, Lieutenant. Mr. Diaz, I'm really very sorry for you. Sorry? Why? Well, I guess you were pushed beyond that point. I uh, do not follow you, Lieutenant. Oh, well, I think you'd be found guilty, but for reasons of insanity. Oh. What, what what are you trying to do to me? All right, let me tell you a story, Mr. Diaz. There's, there's a man named Juan Martin Diaz. And uh, if you know something, there's no record of him anywhere in this country. There's no fingerprints, no birth certificate, no social security. Do you know why? He's an illegal alien. No, 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 I, no, I, I, I am not. I'm sorry, Mr. Diaz. Listen, I work hard. Oh, how hard you will never know. Day and night. I, I know, will... I know, and it'll be in your favor. First, hear me out. Illegal immigrant Diaz opens a business and does well. He's a credit to the community, but he has to take a great deal of irritation. Insult. I, I, I swallow my pride. Well, you tried to, but it's too much. We checked with the police in Mexico. You were in jail several times for assault. I I was young. I was stupid. I I had a terrible temper. That is why I left. I I had a criminal record. But but I changed. I changed. So, when some of these angry and troubled old ladies gave you a hard time, I guess it was the last straw. That is not so, Lieutenant. You, You do not understand. Well, you'll have your day in court. Just a minute. Aunt Millie. Artie, darling, please don't scold me. I know I left the door unlocked again. But it doesn't matter. They've got the murderer. Have they? You arrested him. I know. And we can build a pretty good case. It's so logical for Mr. Diaz to be the killer. Everybody's so willing to accept it. After all, he's he's an illegal alien with a record. (laughs) But as I think and think and think about it, I'm just not sure. Well, if Mr. Diaz is not the killer, who is? Do you want to tell me, Aunt Millie? Artie. You kept saying all the time you were going to help those poor ladies... Suddenly, I asked myself, is that what she meant? I have to ask her. I'm asking, Aunt Millie. Is that what you meant? Artie. You really can't allow Mr. Diaz to pay for crimes he didn't commit, can you? No. Why, Aunt Millie? Why? Oh, Artie. These poor, poor, wretched people... What was left for them in their life? You didn't see them every day as I did. On the streets. Aimless, rootless, helpless, hopeless. No one cares, Artie. No one cares, really. Or maybe there are just too many of them and not enough ways to help or whatever. But there they are, and it... It just broke my heart. That... That's how you helped? Well, what should I have done? Let them suffer through another year or two or three of being bewildered and brutalized by life? I... I wanted to be kind. I only wanted to be kind. 
Yes, yes, I understand. It, it would seem to me that they were looking at me. Their eyes begging, pleading, help me, help me. Well, what, what other way did I have? What other help could I give them? But Aunt Millie, it's wrong to commit murder. Oh, it wasn't murder. They were dead already. I'm sorry, Aunt Millie. I know. What I did was wrong, and I shall pay for it. But remember, Artie, not all the blame should rest on my shoulders. put away for what will certainly be the rest of her life, Mr. Diaz was released and will be allowed to remain here. Under no circumstances can we condone what she did. After all, no one among us can be permitted to play God. Yes, and it would be a much better world if less... Yes, Radio Mystery Theater presents... your mind does while you sleep. When you close yourself off from the active world and crawl into the passive state of sleep, your mind does not switch itself off any more than does your digestion, your breathing, or your circulation. What shall we make of this earnest exertion of our minds during sleep? Well, we propose to tell you what two people made of theirs. Gloria. Gloria, it's me. It's Ben. She doesn't hear you. She doesn't see you. She's looking right at me, Doctor. She doesn't even know you're here. Our mystery drama, Dreams, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Christopher Tabori. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. In sleep, the mind creates visions, delights and horrors, wild fantasies and oddly disguised memories. If someone tells you he never dreams... Do not believe him. His mind works in sleep as assiduously as any other's. His imaginings are as extravagant as anyone's. He simply does not wish to acknowledge them as his offspring. He won't accept the responsibility. Gloria? Gloria, I, I brought you some flowers. Look, well, yellow roses. How about that? <laughs> Gloria, isn't there a, uh, a nurse or someone who can put these roses in water? Nobody around except... Oh, well. How are you feeling anyway? Better? It's me, Gloria. It's Ben. It's no use, Mr. Bailey. What? Mrs. Bailey doesn't hear you. You're the doctor, right? Dr. Fleischer. Your wife doesn't even see you. Well, she's looking right at me. She doesn't know you're here. How can that be? She's in shock. Well, what's that? Shock is a defense mechanism the psyche employs to escape something extremely painful. She didn't have any pain. Mm, you sure of that? She didn't act like it. She just sort of stiffened up and then fell over. Like she fainted. She did faint. But she came to right away, a couple of seconds... I asked her, did you feel all right? And she looked at me sort of funny and said she felt okay, only tired. She said she felt terribly tired. 
Well, that's what she said. And then she went in the bedroom and laid down and just stared up at the ceiling. All the symptoms of shock. I thought she was sick. She is sick. Well, what's she got? I and mean, what's the matter with her? Profound depression of all the bodily processes and extreme anxiety. Oh, that doesn't sound so bad. Oh, well, doesn't it? I mean, you, you can fix that, can't you? We can try. Well, you can give us something. You mean a pill? Yeah, uh, something. We'll give her time and care. How much time? I don't know. Uh, you must have some idea. I said I don't know. Yeah, but you must know. I don't. A few days, a week. I don't know. Oh, that's ridiculous. Well, I'm sorry you think so. I've got to talk to her. You've you got to fix it so I can talk to her. What about? What about? Well, I mean, different things. Look, she can't, she can't just sit there staring. She's my wife. Yes, I want to talk to you about that. About what? About your marriage. Your relationship during your marriage. It was... Okay. Also, before your marriage. I need as much of her background as you can give me. I need to know all I can about what led up to this. It just happened. Nothing like this just happened. Well, it did. Such traumas may have their origins in the very distant past. I want to talk to her parents, brothers, sisters, Benny. But for the moment, I want to talk to you. My office is down the hall. Anybody will show you where it is. Will you be there in ten minutes? Okay, you say so. I'll be expecting you. Gloria. Gloria, I'll be back. There's something I gotta find out. It's, it's very important. I got a funny feeling you can hear me, Gloria. I don't care what the doctor says. What does he know? You just wait right there. And after I talk to him, I'll be back. You, you just take it easy. And I'll be back. Come in, Mr. Bailey. Now sit down over there. Okay. I think Gloria recognized me just now. No, she didn't. Well, she had a look on her face. I, I, I thought... I'm not interested in what you thought. Look, she's my wife, after all. I know her pretty well. How long have you been married? Five years. So I know a pretty Tell well. me about it. Tell you about it. Mm, the marriage, from the start. What has been like between the two of you? Oh, the best. Really great. Fantastic. Let's go back to the beginning. Well, we were uh, really like, you know, in love. Uh, I mean, I mean, totally. Even her parents. What about her parents? Well, parents, you know. We well, speak of them as though they were a special breed of human. Well, they are. <laughs> you know, I, I, I mean... You're not a parent. Oh, no, not me. Uh, not for a long time, anyway. When you are, you'll find out you're not of a special breed. If it ever happens, I'll be different. Like more human. Mm, yes. Uh, well, tell me about her parents. What's to tell? Small-town people... Very nice and all that, but, uh, you know. No, I don't know, or I wouldn't be asking. Gloria's mother was very ill at the time. That's why we went to see them. Gloria said we had to, on account of her mother. And what was the nature of her illness? Oh, it's not mental. Nothing like that. It, her liver, I think, something like that. So we make the trip all the way out to the boondocks to see them and tell them we're getting married. I have to talk to her father. You tell me something about her father. <laughs> He's a turkey. Hmm? Turkey? Totally straight. Oh. Well, go on. Well, this turkey starts asking me questions. Such as? Such as... Like... What do I do for a living? What do you do, do, for, a do for a living, young man? I'm a jazz musician. Oh? Uh, 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 what uh, instrument uh, do you uh, uh, play? Uh -huh. My axe is the bass. Oh, I like those. Uh, yes, uh, uh, tell me, do you have trouble carrying those things around? They let you on buses with them? Why not? Sure. Why so big? 
It's a guitar. A uh, guitar? Mine's electrical. Oh. Oh. Uh, Ben, you can support yourself with your electric guitar? I used to go on the road off and on. You know, a two-week gig in Columbus, stuff like that. Well, that's the pits. And I mean the pits. After Gloria and I are married, the road's out. I want to be with her. I'm working on some songs. There's money in songs if you hit it. Mm, I suppose. Um, Ben... You know about Gloria's mother? She's not in such good health, I understand. Well, not at all in good health. Gloria said something about that. Her mother hopes, well, we both hoped that when Gloria got married, we hoped she'd have some security. There's no security these days. Yeah, well, maybe. I don't know. No security per se. I'm hoping that when Gloria gets through talking to her mother uh, upstairs, maybe she'll have been able to persuade her that uh, that things will be all right. Oh, they'll be all right. Yes, well, maybe. I hope so. Ben, my wife doesn't have too much longer to live, the doctors say. I'm sorry to hear that. Yes. Maybe everything will be all right. Oh, here's Gloria now. Well, dear, you talk to your mother? I talk to her. Yes, and? She says if Ben and I get married, she never wants to see me again. How about that? Well, maybe she didn't mean quite that. Oh, she meant it. She meant it, all right. Oh, that's really the pits. Come on. Let's go, Ben. Let's go, Ben, she said. Then we went. I see. After all, it was very nice of us to go all the way out there to the boonies to talk to them. We didn't have to do that. Hardly anybody asked their parents anymore, can they get married or whatever. (sighs) That hadn't been for a mother being sick. Uh, Look here, I have a patient coming in a few minutes, but I want to talk to you again, Mr. Bailey. Maybe several times. (laughs) Why not? I want to go back and see Gloria, Dr. Fleischer. It won't do any good. You can't reach her. Nobody can. Not yet. Well, what I really want to do... I I, I brought some flowers, some yellow roses. I I want to get a vase and put them in some water. There was nobody around to do it, so I thought... Well, if that's all you want to do... That's all. That's it. All right. But I'll want to talk to you again. Gloria. Listen... I can only stay for a couple of minutes. I told the doctor I was going to put the flowers in some water, but... Listen, he says you can't hear me or see me. I don't buy that. I don't buy that for a minute. I think you just don't want to talk to me. Well, okay. You don't want to talk to me. I accept that. I don't like it, but I accept it. But Gloria... One thing I gotta know, and I mean I got to, it's life and death. That's how important it is, and I'm not kidding. Gloria, I've gotta know your dreams. Got to. Okay? Now, what did you dream last night? I I don't need all the details. Just in general, uh, or anything at all that that I can... Oh, Gloria. Come on now, Gloria. What did you dream last night? I've got to know. I've got to know. If you don't tell me, I don't know what will become of us. Place your bets, ladies and gentlemen. Place your bets, please. Hello. Place your bets. Hello there. All bets are down. No more bets. Black, hard and low. Son of a gun. Well, that washes me out. Come on over to the lounge. I'll buy us a drink. Place your bets, please. No, I don't know. I, I, I don't Come on, Ben, you need it. Place your bets. How's your wife? Place your bets. I went to see her this morning. Oh, yeah? Took her some flowers. And? Doctor said she didn't even know I was there. Oh. Said she's in shock. Mm. But I know better. 
She knew I was there all right, and she knew what I wanted. She just wouldn't give it to me. Well... Well, I'm not giving up. I'm going back tomorrow and the day after and the day after that. I've got it. If I don't know what she dreams, how am I going to know what number to play? There is evidence that mankind all over the world and down through the ages dreams and has dreamed the same dreams. And many men have wrestled with the problem of what to make of them. But how many have wrestled with another's dreams in order to turn them to profit? We shall return shortly with Act Two. Most people acknowledge that dreams are the creations of the human soul which struggle to the surface during sleep. Disguised as they are, these grotesqueries can be translated into recognizable thoughts and desires. But before the advent of the scientific age, everyone believed that dreams were visitations by supernatural beings and could portend the future. A small minority still does. And an even smaller group believes that dreams can foretell the winning number on a roulette wheel. Gloria, it's Ben. I told you I'd be back. Oh, Gloria, please talk to me. If you only knew how important it is. I'm going out of my mind if you don't talk to me. I don't know what we're going to do. Please, honey. Any luck, Mr. Bailey? Oh, no. Uh, she just looks right through me. No, I'm sorry about that. Me too. I'm disappointed. So am I. She's talking to me. What? She talks to you? Since when? Early this morning. I stopped by to see her. She seemed to know who I was, so I stayed for a while, and we... We had quite a chat. Oh, what, what, what about? Uh, what did you talk about? What did she tell you? Oh, oh there. Slow down. I, I gotta know. What did she say? I don't want to talk here. You meet me in my office. You know where it is. Five minutes. Five, yes, 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 yes. Come in, Mr. Bailey. Thanks, Dr. Fleischer. You sit down. Now... We have to... You talk. said that Gloria talked to you. Yes, she did. Well, what about? I mean, what did she talk about? Well, I did most of the talking. I had to explain who I was, where she was, all that sort of thing. She seemed content with what I told her. Accepted everything. Yes, yes, but what did she tell you? Why are you interested? Why wouldn't I be? Are you afraid she revealed something you'd rather she hadn't? No, of course not. One would think you'd simply be grateful that she's responding. I am, certainly. Only... Only what? Doctor, did she tell you what she dreamed last night? What a very strange question. Did she? Most peculiar. Why do you want to know about your wife's dream? Gloria always had this thing about dreams. Mm, thing? But she believed in them. Believed? How? Well, like the one about the eggs. Oh, tell me about that. You know, I told you her mother was very sick. Yes, you told me. And when Gloria told her she was going to marry me, her mother said she never wanted to have anything to do with her ever again. I remember you telling me that. Now, I want to hear about the egg dream. Gloria had this idea that if we were to have a baby, her mother's first grandchild, well, that's a big deal, right? Very big deal. But she thought if she could tell her mother she was pregnant, then they'd get back together again. Anyway, once the baby was born, they would, right? It often happens that way. Once she woke me up in the middle of the night, and she said, Ben, ben I just, I just had, a had a dream. dream. Oh, what? what? You, you had a dream. Well, I want to tell you before I forget it. Well, tell me, tell me. Go ahead. I was walking down this long corridor, all white, 
marble. And light coming through this big, tall window. And my mother was standing there with the light shining down on her. And I went up to her. I was so glad to see her. And I said, where is it? Where is it? Where was what? I don't know. Something I wanted. Something I was looking for. Something. What, what about your mother? What did she say? Nothing. She didn't say a thing. She didn't even look at me. She was looking beyond me. Off somewhere. But she was smiling. Oh, she looked so beautiful, Ben. So I kept running through this place. Stopping everybody and asking, where is it? Nobody seemed to know and I was getting desperate. It was getting to be a nightmare, kind of. But then, I found it. Yeah? Yeah, well, what was it? It was a dozen eggs. Eggs? A, a carton of eggs. Well, you know how they come, a, a dozen to a carton? Well, you know. Oh, yeah, I know. And I, I think I was pleased that I found it. You think you were? Well, I, at first I was. Till I opened the carton. And there were all these, these beautiful eggs. But one was broken. And then I felt so sad. That's when I woke you up. I, I had to. I just had to. That's all right. I'm glad you did. Ben, you know what I think the dream means? What? The eggs. They're my children. The children I'm going to have someday. I'm going to have 12 children. Well, 11 anyway. Because one of them will be broken. Only one of them will be broken. That's what she said. That's quite a dream. Yeah. Thing is, just a short time after that, after she told me the dream, Gloria got pregnant. She was so excited. And you? Me? Well, for men it's different. Mm -hmm. Somewhat for some men. Anyway, Gloria was about to write to her mother. Once she was really sure that she was going to have a baby. But before she could do that, she had a miscarriage. Yeah. She lost the baby. It was very sad for a woman. I was disappointed, too. Because I figured I was ready for a kid about then. I, I mean, if that's what Gloria wanted, I could afford for her to have it. You could afford it? Well, money-wise, I was in the chips. How did that come about? From the dreams. Gloria's dreams. Uh, I don't quite follow you. You're not a gambler, are you, Doctor? Uh, no. Life is one long gamble as far as I'm concerned. I like to try and beat the game now and then. And do you beat the game? <laughs> Not very often. Not till I married Gloria and started betting her dreams. What does that mean, betting her dreams? You see, Dr. Fleischer, every dream means something. Oh, indeed it does. It means a number. A number that is going to come up for you. You don't really believe that, do you? Certainly I believe it, because it's true. I know it's true. I know, because it worked for me. And how did it work for you? Doctor, a dream about eggs means the number 72. You don't say. Absolutely. And that night, I went to the casino. Now, you can't play 72 at the roulette table. Why not? Because the numbers on the wheel only run up to 36 and a double zero. So you couldn't bet on number 72? I figured out a way. Well, no, I, I, I actually didn't figure it out myself. There was a woman there. Oh? She figured it out. Tell me about this woman. Name's Crystal. But it's not important about her. It wasn't anything like you're thinking between her and me. I wasn't thinking anything. Anyway, Crystal's a real gambler. She's at the casino before it opens and she stays till it closes. She's the one told me about dreams meaning numbers. And it worked. It worked. Every time Gloria told me one of her dreams, I'd go to the casino and Crystal would tell me what number to play. I'd play it and it would win. Except for 72. No, 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 no. I won with that one too. Well, how could you? It's an established fact that a dream about eggs means 72. I mean, we had to start with that, you know. Um, go on. So Crystal says... Play two numbers, seven and two. I did. And in 20 spins of the wheel, one or the other came up. Interesting. Foolproof. Totally. No, I didn't mean that. 
No? Well, what did you mean? When I talked to your wife this morning, she told me a dream she had last night. She did? Why didn't you say so? What was it? She dreamed she was in a forest. And she climbed a tall tree. And at the top of the tree, she found a dozen eggs. No. You mean that? She dreamed that. She told you. A dozen eggs. All of them broken. No more bets. All bets are down. Fourteen, even, red, and low. Hear that? Now, come on, pay no attention. If I'd left my chips where they were on seven and two, I'd be broke practically. Finish your drink. We'll go back to the table and have another try. Crystal, I can't afford it. (laughs) If you could afford it, it wouldn't be gambling. How's that again? Gambling is when you stand to lose. I don't follow you. The big thrill comes when you lose everything. That's a thrill. The biggest thrill there is. Drink up. Try again. That sanitarium costs money. Dr. Fleischer costs money. But the dreams. Remember when you came in here with your wife's dream about the eggs? 72. And since there's no 72 on the wheel, we figured you should... Uh, you figured. That half on seven, half on two. And they came up. Mm, three times. And you doubled your bet. I was a rich man that night. Ah, oh, you will be again. Eggs always mean 72. Maybe the doctor wasn't telling me the truth. Maybe he made it up. Maybe. No, he wouldn't do that. Why should he? No reason. Wait a minute. Maybe the trouble is... Gloria told the dream to him, not to me. Maybe that's why it didn't work tonight. Why seven never came up, or, or two either. That could be. No. No, 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 Wait. Come on, I got it. Hmm? I know what I did wrong. I've got it. What? What is it? 72. 72, 7 and 2. I really played 7 and 2. And you won. Yeah, that was the first time. But this time I lost. The first time, Gloria told her dream about the eggs to me. This time she told it to the doctor. Yes, yes. You got something, then I can see it in your eyes. I wasn't supposed to play 7 and 2 tonight. I was supposed to add 7 and 2. And put your chips on 9. Yeah. Come on. Oh, that's it. That's got to be it. Place I know bets. this is it. I know it. Place your bets, ladies and gentlemen. Please place your bets. On 9, please. All bets are down. No more bets. <laughs> 32, red, even, and high. Hypotheses have been put forth as to why some people have a passion for gambling. Greed, boredom, excitement, and others. Even including sexual compensation. But there is a consensus that if you gamble long enough, you are certain to end up broke. Because the odds are deliberately set against you. Therefore, it would appear that the chief, the most pervasive purpose of gambling is to lose. I shall be back shortly with Act 3. Exclusively, the fools of the world that have gambled compulsively. Dostoevsky, one of the greatest of the Russian novelists, reduced himself and his family to abject poverty to gratify his inordinate passion for gambling. Other driven gamblers were Julius Caesar, Mark Antony, Henry VIII of England, and Wyatt Earp. Gloria, it's me. Baby, it's Ben. Ben? Huh? Oh, honey. You know, that's the first time you've spoken to me for three days. It is? Yeah, you've been kind of out of it. I guess I have. But you're all right now, huh? Well, I feel kind of fuzzy, you know? Oh, well, sure. You've been in shock. That's, that's what the doctor said. Oh, he's nice. The doctor. What's his name? Fleischer. Oh, yeah, Fleischer. He told me that. I don't know why I have so much trouble remembering things. Well, you remember me. Me? Yeah. I remember you. Sort of. What do you mean, sort of? I'm your husband. 
You're married to me. I know. Well, then. Were we happy? What? Being married. Were we happy together? Well, certainly we were happy. We were very happy. <laughs> what do you mean, were we happy? Well, I don't remember it very well. We were very... Ah, oh, look. It's this shock business. It does things to people. Dr. Flasher told me. I'll have to get him to tell me. Sure. He'll tell you. And then you'll be all right. And you can get out of here and come home and we can start all over. Being happy? Well, certainly. Oh, if I could just remember being happy. You will. Then I think I'd be all right. It's the not remembering. I lost the feeling somewhere. Look. You're going to be fine. Now that you're talking to me, you'll be great. <laughs> you don't know what it's been like when you wouldn't talk to me. Not even say hello or anything. I didn't know you'd been here before. Every day. Every day. I brought those yellow roses. But you don't remember that, I guess. Mm, no, I don't. Thank you. Uh, but, um... You, you've been talking to Dr. Fleischer, haven't you? He told me you started talking to him yesterday. Mm, yes, I did. I don't know why I did. But he was so quiet, so patient, very gentle, very sweet. Like my father, kind of. He wanted to take care of me. Well, sure. That, that's how these doctors are. That's their business. He didn't make it sound like business. He made it... He made it sound like he cared about me. Oh, look, don't cry, Gloria. It's going to be all right. I trusted him. Somebody I don't even know. And I trusted him. Look, I, I don't think I should stay much longer. I, I don't want to upset you. He was so gentle with me. Like nobody's ever been. Gloria, there's something you can do for me. I can't do anything for anybody. Something important. I can't even do anything for myself. Tell me if you had a dream last night. Please, Gloria. A dream? Remember, you always used to tell me your dreams. Did I? Oh, yes, I did, didn't I? What about last night? Why did you dream last night? Rain. You said rain? Lots and lots of rain. Raining all over. That means I'm going to die. No, no, it doesn't mean I'm that. I'm going to die. And I'll never remember being happy. Oh, no, Gloria, no. please don't go. Please don't. Mr. Hare, Hey, here's, here's the doctor. Don't cry. What's going on here? Oh, we were just talking, and she started to cry. Oh, it'll be all right, Mrs. Bailey. You just go ahead and cry, and later on we'll talk about it. It was so great that you recognized me and, and everything. And I want to see you in my office, Mr. Bailey. Sure. Five minutes, okay? Come in, Mr. Bailey. I'm sorry, Dr. Fleischer, about what happened. That's all right. It won't hurt her to cry. She'll be doing a lot of it, I imagine. She will? But I'd rather she cry when she's with me. Not with you, for the time being. Don't sit down. I don't know what I said that made her cry. Tell me what you were talking about. Well, her and me, us being married... Were we happy? <laughs> How about that? She says she can't remember what happy is. There are a lot of things she doesn't remember right now. A lot of feelings. That's what happens in shock. But she'll get over it, won't she? I hope so. Now, tell me what you were talking about just before she started to cry. I didn't want to make her cry, Dr. Flash. I have told you crying won't hurt her in the least. It may help. Now, what brought on the weeping? She started to tell me her dream. The one she had last night. Rain falling everywhere. Oh, she told you? Well, yes, of course. She thinks it means she's going to die. Or that she wants to. Wants to? Just when things are getting better? Why would she? Tell me, before she fell ill, did she have this dream often about rain? She... She had it one time. Tell me about it. She just told me. And, and then the mail came. The mailman dropped it through the slot, and I, I went and got it. Yes. And there was a letter from her father. 
She hadn't heard from her parents since we got married, and I said, Hey, honey, here's a letter from your father. I don't want it. What do you mean you don't want it? It's from your father. You're not still mad at your father, are you? No. Well, I'm not mad at him. Why should you... I'm not. Then why don't you want to read the letter? Because I know what's in it. Well, you don't know what... How, how can you know what's in it? Because of the dream. The dream about the rain? Yes. Well, what about it? It means my mother's dead. Oh, Gloria, come on. Now open it. Read it. Throw it away. Honey, you don't want me to do that. Come on, open it. I don't want to touch it. Get rid of it. I just can't believe it. I don't want to touch it. Throw it away. That's what she said. Throw it away. Like there was death in it, and she didn't want to touch death. Something like that. She didn't want to recognize the reality of her mother's death. Well, seeing the announcement written out in words would make it real. She was trying to put off the reality. She'd already dreamed of her mother's death, the rain dream. Now her dream had come true with all the accompanying regret and guilt and grief. You've lost me, Doctor. I, I, I can't follow you. Yes, I know you can't. It's silly of me to try and explain what's so complicated. I only hope that your wife... Well, did you throw the letter away? No, actually, I didn't. I thought maybe later she'd change her mind. I just stuffed it in my pocket, and it's a good thing I did. Because a few days later, the doorbell rang, and I went to the door and opened it, and who should be standing there but Gloria's father? He said... Hello, Ben. Hello, Ben. Well, hello. Hello there. We've been meaning to get in touch with you. Gloria's been very upset. Um, may I come in? Oh, yeah, well, sure. Certainly. Come on in. Oh, thank you. Gloria, it's your father. My father? Oh, Daddy. Oh, Daddy. Oh, there now, there now. It's all right, it's all right. It's going to be all right, little girl. I've been meaning to call mm. you. I should have called you. I wondered why you didn't. Well, I just couldn't, but I, I was going to. It, oh, it must be so awful for you. I, I shouldn't have let you go through it all alone. Uh, wait now, Gloria. When I Gloria. got the letter... You did get the letter? Of course. And I knew right away what it said. Well, then why didn't you come home? Oh, I should have. I know I should have. You would have made your mother so happy. Mother? Sit down, darling. Look, she thought the letter... Sit down, dear. I have something very sad to tell you. Mother's dead. She died last night. Listen, Gloria thought... Mother died three days ago. No, dear. She died last night. Oh, but the letter... The letter said... You know what the letter said. Well, she never read it. She, she told me to throw it away. Oh, Gloria. But, but, but I didn't. I didn't. I got it right here. It's in my pocket. I think someone should read it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it. It says, Our dearest daughter, your mother wants me to write and tell you that we're both very sorry for the way we behaved towards you when you married Ben. You're happy with him. That's all that matters. I wish you would come home as soon as you can and bring Ben with you. And that's when the thing happened. The thing? What you said was shock. Gloria stiffened up and her face took on a blank look and she fell over, fainted. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. You've been a big help. I hope so. You have, you have. Now, uh, I'm expecting a patient, Is so... she going to be all right, doctor? It will take time. Maybe a long time, but I have hopes. Yes, I have great hopes. Place your bets. No more bets, please. 28, black, even, and high. Ben, Ben, over here. Oh, Crystal. Place your bets. There you are. You want a drink? Place your I don't think so. Oh, I thought you weren't going to show up. That's what I thought, too. Well, I'm glad you did. How did your luck run tonight? Oh, rotten. How's your wife? Better. Hmm. Doctor says he has high hopes. Says it's going to take time. Maybe a long time. But he has very high hopes for her. Ah, that's wonderful. Yeah. It's going to cost a lot of money. The doctor, the sanitarium, whole bit. Oh, what's money? Yeah. <laughs> she talked to me this morning. 
she did. Hey, that's sensational. She told me a dream she had last night. Ah, oh, fantastic. What was it? It was about rain. Rain means number 36. Gloria thinks it means she's going to die. Ben, remember that fabulous night when 36 came up eight times running? Oh, what a night that was. Remember? Yeah. Oh, come on. What are we waiting for? You gonna play? Now, look here. Two hundred and fifty dollars. That's my rent money. Due tomorrow. Are you gonna bet it all? Oh, you're darn right. On 36? Well, Place generally I play my own system, but tonight I'm gonna... Place your bets. Uh, 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 36, please. Oh. Place your bets. Put your money down there. Hurry up. Oh, no, All I, I... bets are down. Place your mm, bets. No late, more bets. You dumb dumb. Thirty-three, black, odd, and high. Oh, wow. Oh, I'm sorry, oh, Crystal. I'm no. sorry. Oh, what sorry? <laughs> That's the most excitement I've had in years. Trouble with you, Ben. You're not a gambler. Not really. You don't know what gambling's all about. I guess I don't. <laughs> so long, Crystal. Nice to have known you. Hey, does that mean you're not coming back? I'm going to start looking for a job. And when I get one, I got other places to spend my money. So long. the original inhabitants gambled. The Onondagas used the stones from white plums for dice. The Iroquois preferred peach pits. The eastern tribes liked animal bones. And there is a story handed down through the centuries that the invaders who came here with Columbus made cards from the leaves of the copus tree. If true, that would mean that the first deck of playing cards appeared here in 1492. And the game goes on. Our cast included Christopher Tapori, Robert Dryden, and E.V. Juster. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. So often we take the course of our daily lives for granted... So many of us live in a routine world, knowing pretty much one day what we'll be doing the next. And this isn't bad, mind you. But every now and then, something stops us short. Witnessing a dramatic auto accident. Seeing a building collapse in flames. Well, our story isn't about such disasters, but Doug Watson, our hero, is in for what we might call the shock of his life. Doug, you'll undoubtedly be back with your wife again. As soon as we rejoin the outside world. And when will that be? I don't know. As soon as you help us to do so. 
And just how am I supposed to do that? Well, I assume you know. You came to us through this terrible invisible curtain that shrouds us. We're expecting you to lead us out. Our mystery drama, The Outsider, was written especially for the Radio Mystery Theater by Bob Juran and stars John Beale. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Take your contact, take it now. Give your cold to contact. Before you choose a cold medicine, you should know that no cold tablet, no cold liquid has found the way to give you contacts continuous relief. One contact works up to 12 hours and helps relieve all your congestive symptoms all day, all night. That's the wonder of contact. Give your cold to contact. Take only as directed. thing. It's so relative. To a child alone in bed at night, moving shadows can be real monsters, very real. Dreams are real until we wake up. What we experience is real to us. And to Doug Watson, his experience was real. It could have been a dream, but Doug doesn't think so. In fact, he knows differently. I sit here with this curious stone in my hand. Unbelieving. Smooth as polished marble. Still warm, blue, and lustrous. I know where I got it. But I still can't understand or... or believe. What happened to me? Was I permitted a glimpse of something no man should know? Did I look into a world of my own hallucination? Hallucination, I, I could accept that. But this stone in my hand is real. It must have happened. And it had to have been this evening. But it seems so long ago. I was on my regular commuter train going home. I had pressing work to do, but Lloyd Cox had already spotted me. Yeah, playing in the tournament Sunday, Doug? No, I'll be spending the weekend in the den. Semi-annual report to finish. Now, you'd better not skip Millie's buffet Sunday night. <laughs> She'll never forgive you. Alice mentioned something about that. Well, we'll see. Well, Sunday's my birthday. Yeah, we know. That's why Millie particularly wants you there. Well, I'm trying to forget the years. I stopped counting three years ago. Yeah, it happens to all of us. Well, my stop's coming up. Uh, take care, Doug. And don't work too hard. See you Sunday night. Yeah, I'll see you, Lloyd. I still had three more stops to go. I opened my attaché case and took out the forecast I'd been working on. I lost myself in a maze of profit expectations, cost factors, personnel demands, and federal regulations. And after a while, something in the back of my mind broke my concentration and I looked up. I got the shock of my life. The entire car was empty. Not another soul in the car. Ordinarily, 20 or so people are still on the train when I get off. How far had I come? I slammed my case shut and ran to the front of the car. Looking through the door into the next car gave me the next shock. It was empty, too. The entire train was empty. There wasn't even a conductor on it. We were coming to the lights of a town. I had no idea where I was. I had to get off and phone Alice to come pick me up. Stupid of me to work right past my stop. I jumped onto the platform. The station house was dark and locked. I couldn't place this town at all. I didn't know much about the villages past my own stop, so I walked toward a lighted diner and went in to phone Alice. That's when I got my third shock of the night. 
A woman was behind the counter drying dishes, and she turned toward me. Oh, oh, you! Oh, oh, no, I can't believe it. How did you get here? Oh, let me touch you. Let me know you're real. You're here. You are real. Look, miss, I, I just want to use the phone. You do have... I've got to call Walter right away. Oh, sit down. Uh, please don't go away. You won't go away, will you? Well, I can't very well go anywhere. I just got off the train. I missed my regular stop in Bloomsdale. Bloomsdale? Mm -hmm. oh, there used to be a Bloomsdale. Oh, but never mind that now. I've got to call Walter. Well, well, then can I call my home? I'll pay you for the call. Only local calls. It, it's because... Walter? Walter? He's here. At last. On the train, he says. Yes, this very minute. Of course, I'm sure. I touched him. It's the outsider. I had to get out of there. Obviously, this girl was deranged in some way. And I had no intention of waiting for Walter, whoever he was. But I did have to phone Alice. Walter will be here in a minute. He only lives half a block up Turtle Street. May I use the phone now? Or a pay phone if you have one. Let me look at you. Or let me touch you again. Now, now look, miss. I don't know what bothers you about me, but... All I want to do is call my wife and have her pick me up. What town is this, anyway? Hanover Hills. Hanover Hills? In Westchester? Oh, I just can't believe it. You're here at last. You're the first outsider to come here in 30 years. Oh, we've been praying and waiting for you. Yeah, sure. Oh, you don't believe me. You'll believe Walter. He's the mayor. Gail, you're the one we hoped for. You're right. It's him. What is this? Let me shake your hand, sir. I'm Walter Cummings, mayor of Hanover Hills. And you are... Uh... Doug Watson. Doug Watson. Oh, how refreshing to hear a new name. Oh, wait till the town hears this and meets you. Uh, now, tell me. Gail says you came in on the train. Of course. Uh, the train actually stopped? Well, I didn't jump off. A and this was... A few minutes ago. Yes? Oh, this is wonderful. This may be the break. You see, no one in Hanover Hills could hear or see the train. There hasn't been a train go through here in 30 years. You, Doug Watson, are our savior. I was now convinced that I'd met up with two genuine lunatics. I started edging for the door, thinking I could either find the police station and some real help, or at least get away. Oh, no, you cannot go, sir. You will accept my hospitality and come home with me for a celebration. Gail, close up and spread the word. Well, thank you very much for your kind invitation, but I, I really have to get home. I have work to do, and it's, it's getting late. My wife's going to be worried. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, by all means, call your wife. Let's see if it works. Gail, this will be the first test of the outsider's power. Uh, here, sir. Call your wife. Thank you. At last. I can dial Bloomsdale, can I? Uh, try it. Keep the fingers crossed. Is it ringing? No. Nothing. Oh. Like a dead line. Okay, you win. Tell me what this is all about. Am I a prisoner? We're all prisoners here, Mr. Watson. And we believe you've come here to save us. Come home with me now. You can't go anywhere else. Curiously, now I didn't feel menaced. I had a slow, creeping sensation that these people were serious and sincere. And that I had stumbled into something totally incredible. It hadn't occurred to me before how old-fashioned the lunch counter and counter stools in this diner were. Not one item smacked of the 1970s or 80s. We'll have a bite of dinner before the others arrive, and I'll tell you why we have such hopes for you. And what we expect of you. More coffee? Oh, thanks. You see, Doug, for 30 years, not a living soul, not a car, a truck, train, or bus has arrived in Hanover Hills. No one has grown a day older. No one's died. Not a single child has been born. I just can't figure you or this whole thing. 
How can you expect me to believe what you just said? <laughs> we found it hard to believe ourselves when it happened. In fact, we didn't realize that anything had happened. Well, what was it that happened, as you say? It was early in 1950. The government was involved in underground nuclear testing, but oh, far, far away over in Nevada. Yes, I remember. But one afternoon in June, we felt a, a terrible rumbling underground. The hills all around us shook. Earthquake? Well, it was just like one. But never in history had there been one here. When it settled, we, we, we saw on the highest of the hills a great fissure, a hole in the side of the hill. And from it came a curious vapor. Underground gas, no doubt. We have no idea what it is. It is? You mean it's still there? You'll see it tomorrow. It's been emerging for 30 years. And you'll see more things tomorrow that I think will surprise you. Things we've grown accustomed to. Well, you say that I'm the first outsider to come here, but why can't you leave? Can't you simply walk down the road a piece? Ah, I hear the word is spread. They're gathering outside. Who? In the townspeople. The street's full, Walter, and more coming. Yeah. You'll have to meet them, Doug. I know. I'm the savior. Oh, I think they're all getting heated up over nothing. Russ. Oh, this is my husband, Mr. Watson. Russ Harrison. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Russ, be civil. Yeah, follow me, please. They won't hurt you. Why, you're our hero. I've never been a celebrity before. Uh, please? Uh, please, quiet, everyone. Quiet down. Now, I, I know you've come to see the outsider, and, well, here he is. In the flesh. Real. His name is, is Douglas Watson. His arrival may mean we're returning to the world. Now, I say may because we must not get up false hopes. He's the first outsider, isn't he? It means we're finished with this thing? Well, that's possible. And we all want to believe it. But we'll just have to see what happens. How about a word from you, Mr. Watson? Yes, yes. Speak to them, please. Well, I... I... Well, I... I don't know what to tell any of you. I don't understand this any more than you do. <laughs> Maybe a lot less. I got off a train, and here I am. Your mayor here, Walter, was explaining something to me earlier, but uh, I don't know the whole story. Uh, well, that's about all I can say. All right, friends. You can go home now. Mr. Watson and I have some work to do, but as, as soon as we see positive results, you'll all know it. You'll see it and, and feel it. Is there anything Russin I can do, Walter? No, no, why don't you run along, too? Uh, Mr. Watson, you'll stay here with me tonight. I, I have plenty of bedrooms. Good night, Walter. Mr. Watson. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Good night. You know, I was going to ask you... Why can't you just leave? There are roads in and out of town, aren't there? Yes. Well, hasn't anyone tried to go to the next town? Call people up on the phone? Of course. And what happened? You'll find out tomorrow, Doug. Tomorrow, when it's daylight, I'll take you around Hanover Hills. But what about my wife? She'll be frantic if I don't even call. Yes, that's unfortunate, but I'm afraid you can't call her. Our phone makes local calls only. We've never been able to dial a number outside the town. Nor have we ever had a call come in. You saw what happened when you tried to call from the diner. Yeah, well, I'll have to go along with it, I guess. Uh, but be encouraged, as we all are. You'll undoubtedly be back with your wife again as soon as we rejoin the outside world. And when will that be? We don't know. As soon as you help us to do so. And just how am I supposed to do that? Well, we assume you know. You came to us through this terrible invisible curtain that surrounds us. We're expecting you to lead us out. Watson seems to have become the unwitting Pied Piper of Hanover Hills, 
a village caught in a strange and incredible time warp into which he stumbled. They're all expecting him to bring them back to the outside world. But I wonder if they really know what they're letting themselves in for. Of course, we haven't seen all of Hanover Hills yet. And we haven't really met its citizens. We'll do both when I return shortly with Act Two. Pat Summerall. If you're interested in values for your home, work, and play, you'll find the fall shopper circular from True Value Hardware Stores well worth looking into. Because inside, you'll find values to make your home more secure from theft and fire. Values to make your home more attractive, like paint and painting accessories. And plumbing and electrical supplies and fixtures to make your home run more smoothly. True Value Hardware Stores also offer new ideas to help you save on energy bills this winter. And appliance and power tool values to save you time and energy in the kitchen and workshop. Turn to the houseware section to find ways to help you clean up more efficiently and cook up new ideas. And the hardware section to help you make home repairs. See hundreds of values for your home, for work, and play in the Fall Shopper Circular from participating True Value Hardware Stores and Home Centers. And save gas. You won't have to drive far for your hardware and houseware needs. If you're looking for values, service, and selection, you'll find them nearby at any one of the more than 5,000 True Value Hardware Stores and Home Centers nationwide. Return to Hanover Hills, that curious town that claims to have lived in suspended animation for 30 years. I'd say Doug Watson has a tall order in front of him if he expects to unlock the secret of the mysterious force that gripped the town. But the human spirit will rise when challenged and meet the unavoidable obligation. After all, Doug has no choice. Oh, good morning. Trust you slept well? <laughs> yeah. Much to my surprise, with all this on my mind. Uh, it's a beautiful day. Perfect for showing you Hanover Hills. Well, I'll have to admit I am curious. I just wish you wouldn't expect too much of me. I, I haven't the slightest idea what to do. Yeah, we'll have breakfast at Russ and Gail's diner. Then we'll be on our rounds. <laughs> Your car's in fantastic shape for a 49. How do you do it? It's never changed. Nothing's ever worn out. Nothing ever does in Hanover Hills. Oh, I polish it regularly, though. Well, what about gas and oil? You said no trucks have ever come in here. Well, where do you get it? <laughs> Pumps are always full. Ed Hanley runs a filling station. Oil and gas are always there. Uh, we gave up questioning it long ago. And electricity and water. Abundant supply. Well, what about food? The fields are always full of fresh vegetables. In summer, of course. The shelves of the supermarket never go empty. Now the meat freezers. And you want to change all this? It's utopia. Not really, Doug. You'll soon see. Is that the vapor you're talking about up there on the hill? That's it. It's much farther away than it looks. It comes from that black hole on the side of the rock. And a deep wisp of steam disappears into the air. Well... Like I started to say last night, can't you just take the main road out of town? Rather than tell you what happens, I'll show you. We're now on Route 52. Runs north and south, supposedly, to New York City. Right. I take it into the city myself from Bloomsdale. In fact, if we keep going south, we should come right into Bloomsdale. Uh, look up ahead. Nothing but fields, huh? Yeah, we seem to be leaving the town behind. Oh, we are. Or, or better still, <laughs> exactly as you put it, we seem to be. And we're not? Uh, notice how the road curves up ahead? Yeah. Wait till you see what's around that bend. We rounded the bend, like you said, and there in front of us was the main street of the town we just left. It seemed impossible. We'd driven more than a mile in the opposite direction. The railroad station was on the right, and the diner just ahead of us. Not a single car on the street was more recent than a 1950. Walter pulled up in front of the diner. It's like this with every road into or out of the village. We always end up right where we started. Well, shall we have breakfast? Oh, you're 
still here. Oh, I thought last night was maybe a dream. Oh, he's very much here, all right. Tell Rusty to get some eggs over easy going. All right with you, Doug? Suits me. Two double hands over easy, Russ. Walter and Mr. Watson are here. Yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, you have to excuse my husband, Mr. Watson. He's not exactly Mr. Personality. Oh, it's all right. Yeah, he used to be before this happened. It affected lots of people in different ways. That's putting it mildly. You see, we know it's 1980. But we have no idea what the world is like. All TV and radio stopped with whatever is coming out of that hole in the mountain. How do you know 30 years have passed? Oh, we've kept track of the days, the years. Birthdays are the hardest for most people. They know they're a year older, but don't look at or feel it. And that's hard? Listen, I know a hundred people who'd give their left arm to be in that position. Yeah, it sounds great, don't it? You got any idea how boring that is? You got any idea? Oh, of course you don't. Russ, please. Get up every morning and see the same woman looking the same year after year, driving the same car, seeing the same noisy brats, never growing up, just being the same noisy brats that when you want to choke them, only it don't do no good because you can't shut them up. They ain't never going to grow up and they ain't never going to die. Russ. Let him. I know what you're thinking, Mr. Outsider. Ain't it grand? I was 40 when this thing hit. And if anyone had told me then I was going to live like this forever, I'd have said, whoopee. But I'm so sick of this diner, this town, I could die. But the funny part is, I can't even do that. I'll be out back. Uh, I I'm so sorry, Mr. Watson. No, no, I I'm glad he saw it off. He's right. I wouldn't have looked at it that way. And Russ isn't the only one. We would all like very much for time to, to resume for us again. To change, to, to grow. And you think I'm the only one who can make that possible? Your coming has given us the ray of hope. Now, after breakfast, I want to show you the fissure and the vapor. It has a very curious property. And I'm anxious to see how it reacts to you and you to it. There it is up ahead. What is this strange property you mentioned? Now, I want you to see for yourself. Now, we'll have to go on foot from here. We're going up there? Yeah, just wait and see. From this closer perspective, you can see how large that fissure really is. Yeah. And vapor is much more profuse than it appears in the village. Uh, notice that the slope of the hill is a, is a gentle one. The base is about 200 yards away. Nothing at all obstructs our view of the fissure high up there is... As we approach the bottom of the hill. That's right. In just a few seconds, notice what happens. Well? Well? But the, you don't seem surprised. But what? Don't you see that the fissure and the vapor have completely disappeared from view? Although there's nothing between us and it. We have never been able to approach any closer. They're both still there. I can see them as clear as ever. You... You still see them? Yes. Let's get closer. Quickly. You mean you can't see the vapor? Or the fissure? Not at all. <laughs> We're almost at the very foot of the hill. Now, now can, can you still... Are you pulling my leg? Telling me you can't see that hole up there? And the steam coming out of it? I can even hear it. Would I pull your leg about this after everything else that, that you've seen? We have tried since the crack first appeared to investigate it from every angle. We can never come close. The fact that you still see it must mean that you're not affected by it. You can approach it. You can learn its secrets. Well, I'm not going up there for an atomic steam bath or whatever that thing is. Oh, but you must. That's the source of our, our incredible existence. Now, you're the first outsider. You're immune to our condition. You are the only one who can approach and perhaps put an end to it. You're asking me to go into what looks like a live volcano? There's a sort of a pulsating blue light inside there. There is? We've never seen it from the village. Well, this is as far as I go. 
I'm sorry. You're right, Doug. I must try to understand how you feel. Let's go back to the car. I see it now. We've all been too anxious. You haven't even been here 24 hours, and we're expecting miracles from you. He was right. I'm no miracle worker. I was getting more worried about Alice all the time. She must be frantic. She had no idea where I was. And, of course, neither did I. At least I knew I was alive and well. Walter left me alone for the afternoon while he conferred with the city fathers. For the first time, I had a chance to think. I decided to try leaving the place the way I came in. Along the railroad tracks. It was worth a chance. I took my attaché case and started back down the tracks in the direction last night's train had come. They stretched as far as I could see. Uh, Mr. Watson, uh, you mind if I join you? Well, well, no, of course not. Well, how for a stroll? Well, I'm going to see how far I can go along the tracks. I should come to Bloomsdale. I've had enough of this nightmare. Well, we won't be run down by any trains, that's for sure. Do you mind if I take your arm? Oh. It's so nice to touch someone different. You are going to lead us out, aren't you? Look, up ahead. Oh? A train station. It's got to be the next town down the line. Do you think so? Look, at the sign on the station house. Hanover Hills. It can't be. It is. We've never left the tracks. We've never changed direction. Hanover Hills was behind us. Why are you so surprised? Uh, I don't know. I should have expected it. Let's get back. I want to talk with Walter. If you really think I can find something to help you up on that hill, I'm willing to try. We do, Doug. The fishers are only answer. And even then, who knows? You may enter that fissure, walk through a tunnel, and find yourself back in Bloomsdale, was it? Yes. You may leave us all behind. Well, that won't help you. True. But help is not coming from any other quarter either. Well, I guess you're right. A few precautions do occur to me. I think we should have a knapsack for food and water and some protective clothing. We? Of course, I'll go with you. Well, how can you? Well, even though the fissure is not visible to me, I can still accompany you. Well, I'm ready. Well, we'll go tomorrow. Well, why wait? It's mid-afternoon now. I think we should start early in the morning. And we have to get our things together. Tomorrow we'll drive to the foot of the hill and... see what we shall see. In the early evening, just before twilight, I walked alone along the road that led toward the hillside, where the vapor rose silently into the sky... The late sun tinted it with orange and red. It looked like a silk scarf gently waving in the evening summer breeze. And I thought of this morning, the hissing sound it made, the pulsating blue lights inside the fissure. And I wondered just what I was getting into. But I had no choice. There was no one but me to approach this phenomenon. And tomorrow, I would do so. Watson seems to have found the fountain of youth, a land where no one grows older, nothing wears out, and nothing changes. But no one seems happy about it. Of course, Doug himself really ought to get back to Alice and the family if he can. What lies inside the fissure in the hillside with the strange vapor and the blue lights? We'll find out when we go along with Doug in Act Three. The morning.
morning has dawned bright and pleasant in Hanover Hills. A wisp of vapor rises from the hole in the hillside in a straight, unwavering line in the still air. And on the highway leading, you should pardon the expression, out of Hanover Hills, Doug Watson is riding with Mayor Walter Cummings on their way to explore the strange phenomenon that has kept the village a virtual prisoner. Doug, you can't imagine my feelings at this time. We're on the threshold of an answer. You hope? I know that something will change when you explore that fissure. Well, I don't know what I'm going to do when I get there. Uh, you will know. Well, all we can do is try. Come on. I want to get this thing over with. Doug, whatever happens, if you find a way out and, and leave us behind or... Or if tampering with that vapor only increases our condition. I want you to know how much we appreciate your help. And your courage. Oh, forget it. Courage is the last thing I've got. I just want to get out of here. Well, this is the vanishing point. Or I'll stop seeing it. But I'll try to stay with you as, as long as I can. Well, let's go with it. It's up there. Big as day. I can still see it and hear it. I can't. Well, what do you see, then? Nothing but the hillside. Exactly as it was before this happened. Now, uh, keep describing it for me. We're starting off the hill now. I'm right behind you. I can see the blue lights now. They're much brighter as we get closer. The opening is larger than it looks from down below. It's weird. It, it doesn't seem threatening. It's, it's almost inviting a shame you can't see it, Walter. Hey, is there any heat from the vapor? No. Well, the lights pulsate with a definite rhythm. Well, how close are you? A few yards from the entrance. Looks like a cave. Big enough to stand up in. I'm going in. No turning back now. Walter? Walter? I turned, and Walter was gone. The hill behind me was deserted. And before me, the entrance to this fantastic opening in the hillside. I stepped inside the entrance. And it was like a disco. Hypnotizing, fantastic, fascinating. The walls and ceiling flashed with the pulsating blue and white light. The vapor swirled and danced inside the cave until it swept out the front of the fissure. I felt nothing. No heat. No choking sensation. Nothing but a force urging me deeper into the recess. And then I saw it. On the ground. Resting in a shallow hole. A small blue stone. Like polished marble. And from this jewel surged the light and vapor. This was the source of Hanover Hill's predicament. But where had it come from? Obviously upheaved it during the quake wall it had described. Hypnotized, I was drawn closer. The force was irresistible. It was completely in its spell. I knelt beside the hole and reached forward slowly. My fingers closed around the cool blue marble. I knelt alone in darkness. Stillness. In an instant, the lights and the vapor had stopped. And ahead of me, I could see the daylight at the opening. I hurried outside. The morning seemed just as I'd left it. Bright and beautiful. The hillside and the road below were empty. Walter was nowhere in sight. I started down toward the road and looked back. There wasn't a trace of the fissure I had so recently explored... The hillside was as unscarred as it had been for centuries. I scrambled the rest of the way down to the road. I heard it before I saw it. Coming from the south, toward Hanover Hills, was a small delivery truck. I waved and shouted, and the driver pulled to a stop. Not bad. How far are you going? Uh, into town. Your lucky day. I got a couple of deliveries there. Yeah? Baked goods, I see. You uh, know this Hanover Hills pretty good? A little. Why? Never been there before. You know where the diner is? That's my first stop. 
Yes, I don't think I can show you where it is. But right now, I'm not too sure. The town ain't all that big, is it? Uh, no, it's not. So where are you coming from? I'm up the line. Bakery's in Mount Vernon, but I deliver all over the county. You sure you got a delivery in Hanover Hills? <laughs> What's the matter with you? Would I be asking if I didn't? Right there in the dash. See them slips? Top one says Hanover Hills. Diner, handy food store, and landmark hotel. How come you never delivered there before? Never had an order that I know of. I only been working for the bakery a couple of months. Hey, we're coming into town. Which way do I go? Straight ahead. I'll tell you where to turn. It's right across from the railroad station. Holy Moses. You sure there's anyone living in this place? He had a point. The place was the most run-down looking town I'd ever seen. The nice row of houses that only yesterday were so clean and neat were in complete disrepair. Paint peeling, vines all over. The street was cracked and broken. The gas station was deserted. The roof sagged and the glass on those old-fashioned pumps were broken. We parked in front of the diner and I held my breath as we got out of the truck. First-rate bakery. Anybody here? Hello? Anybody here? Yes. And I- I'll take it. Oh, thanks, ma'am. Uh, just sign here. Say, how do I get to the handy food store? Uh, just two blocks down the main street. You can't miss it. It's half gray and half fresh painted white. Oh, okay. Thanks, ma'am. Uh, see you again on the next order. Uh, so long, buddy. Good luck. Doug! Why, I didn't see you standing there. You came back. We were wondering. Gail? What's happened? You, you've aged so. What happened to the village? Well, we caught up with 30 years. You did it, Doug. You did it. Ah, Doug, you're back safe. I saw you get off by the truck. Walter, you're all taking it so offhand. Don't you know what's happened to you? Well, of course. It's just what we hoped for. And wait till you see this town a year from now. Old Martin Briggs has a run on paint and lumber and nails like he'd never had before. We've got a town to fix up. Thanks to you, Doug. Thanks to you, we got a reason to get up in the morning. Oh, and we were so hoping we'd see you again, too. We thought perhaps you'd gone home through. We owe you a lot, Doug. I'm glad you got back. I've still got your briefcase for you. I kept it safe. But, uh, but it was only this morning, wasn't it? Less than an hour ago. Doug, we've been dying to know. What did you find up there? Only then did I realize that I still held the smooth blue stone in my hand. I opened my fingers, and it lay in my palm, cool and lustrous. I, I picked this up uh, inside the cave, and everything stopped. And for us... Everything moved forward. Uh, how long are you staying, Doug? I can put you up again tonight. Well, I want to get home as fast as I can. Well, trains are running now. You can get the southbound 607 into the city. It stops at Bloomsdale. And that's what I'll do. Oh, brother, will I ever. Yeah, here she comes, Doug. And remember, we're just up the line. Come see us again. Oh, please do. Dinner's always on the house. Yeah, we've been through something together. There's a bond between us now, Doug. You and Hanover Hill. I, I know I told you yesterday, I think it was yesterday, how much I liked you all. And I'll still be saying it ten years from now. So long, friends. So long. Doug. Thank heaven you're home. I was so worried. What happened to you? I missed my stop and ended up Where, in... for heaven's sake? Hanover Hills. Where? I never heard of it. Why didn't you call? I'm sorry. I, I didn't seem to be able well, here, to... Here, let me take your coat. Oh, dinner's a little dried up, but I can freshen it. That's okay, honey. Darling, you look tired. You have been working too hard. Oh, what's this? It fell out of your pocket. It can't be. Some sort of blue stone. Oh, it's beautiful. What is it, Doug? Alice, this is still Thursday night, isn't it? Of course. But what is this? Oh, it's so smooth and cool. 
dog. Where did you get it? I sit here with this curious stone in my hand. Unbelieving. I know where I got it, but I... I don't understand. And Alice most certainly never would. What happened to me? Did I look into a world of my own hallucination? No. This stone in my hand is real. I'll keep it. Always. And when my spirit wearies, I'll remember. I'll remember. And I'll love life more. Time is a curious phenomenon. We hate to see it pass, but we're quick to waste it. We often want to kill it, but we rarely work it to death. And we often wish that time would stand still. Well, we just saw what happened if time could stand still. I don't think I'd enjoy that any more than the good people of Hanover Hills. I look forward to each new experience, each new day, each moment, in fact, like the one we'll share when I return shortly. something new and exciting into your life? Variety is the spice of life, and change is inevitable. When things get you down, and everything seems boring and monotonous, just remember, it won't always be that way. There's another day, a bright day on the way, even if you happen to live in a place called Hanover Hills. Our cast included John Beale, Joan Shea, Ray Owens and Robert Maxwell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Theater presents Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Conscience, said Mr. Shakespeare, makes cowards of us all. Unfortunately, this places conscience in a rather unflattering light, since it implies that conscience is basically a demeaning quality. The truth is that conscience is a kind of magical and liberating force. After all, how many people have become heroes because they were too terrified to become cowards? Major, I demand to speak with the British ambassador. First, please tell us your name. I am Lady Madeleine Marston Stathclyde. My husband, the Earl of Stathclyde, is Under Secretary of Foreign Affairs. My brother, Lord Marston, is Commander-in-Chief of the British Army in India. Who is this lady, Wicklow? Sir, she is known as Limey Lily, and she runs the biggest sporting house in New Orleans. mystery drama, A Curious Experience, was especially adapted from the Mark Twain classic for the Mystery Theater by Sam Gann and stars Christopher Tabori and Robert Dryden. 
It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. One of the tragic truths of our history has been the fact that almost every generation has known the terrible trauma of war. For Mark Twain's generation, the war was the Civil War. To Mark Twain, war was the supreme folly. And why not? Wasn't warfare something that was invented and conducted by mankind? And wasn't the entire human race the greatest joke the creator played on the universe? Of course. That is why Mark Twain wrote the story you're about to hear. Hut, two, hut, four, hut, two, hut, four, company! Hut, hut, two! Order! Arms! Parade rest! Company all present and accounted for, sir. Very good, Sergeant Rayburn. Man... I'm directed to read to you this message I have just received from the War Department. To Commanding Officer Fort Trumbull from Commanding General. Subject, undercover enemy activity. This office has reason to believe that your area, New London, Connecticut, has been infiltrated by enemy agents. These people may attempt to capture your installation, burn the city, and perform other acts of violence. Therefore... Every officer and enlisted man must be extremely vigilant at this time. Signed, the Commanding General. Dated December 4th, 1862. Now, men, I can only say this. Though we are far removed from the combat zones of Fort Donaldson, Bull Run, Shiloh, we are still very much in the battle area and must conduct ourselves accordingly. Sergeant, take over. The 150 regulars of my command itched and ached to be hundreds of miles to the south and west in the thick of the fighting. I knew they would consider this message from Washington as just tap from the brass. How could I blame them? I was bored to tears myself. At any rate, I was sitting in my office writing a letter when I became aware of someone standing in front of my desk. It was a boy, pale, ragged, with big eyes and a trembling mouth. He couldn't have been more than 15 or 16. What are you doing here? Um, excuse me, sir. Who are you? My, my name? Oh, I, I'm, I'm Robert Wicklow, sir. How did you get in here? Well... How? Who let you in here? Sir, I sneaked in. You what? What do you mean, you sneaked in? Oh, I'm sorry, sir, but it was the only way. You sneaked in here? You got past the sentries? Yes, sir. How could you do that? Well, I reckon th th they, they just weren't looking. Sergeant Rayburn! Rayburn! Come in here at once. We shall see about this. Sergeant Rayburn reporting, sir. This, uh, this boy... He was able to get past the sentries and make his way to my office. Oh, begging the Major's pardon, sir, but that would be impossible. Oh, is it? Well, here he is. How do you account for it? Well, sir, I, I don't know as how I could account for it at all. First, he would have to slip past the guard at the main gate. Who is supposed to be on duty there now? Private Pope, sir. And then he would have to elude the sentry on the inner perimeter. Who's pulling guard there? Private Sparks, sir. Sparks and Pope, huh? Yes, sir. What kind of security do we have around here? I will not tolerate another incident of this nature, Sergeant Rayburn. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Now, getting back to you. What's your name again? Robert Wicklow. Why did you want to sneak in here? Because I want to enlist. Enlist? How old are you? Twenty-one, sir. Twenty-one? Rayburn, you have boys of your own at home. How old does this cub appear to you? Not a day over 15, sir. Sir, sir, I'm, I'm 18. I swear to you, I'm, I'm 18, but nobody believes me. When I told the sentry at the gate what I wanted, 
He just laughed at me and told me to go home. But I couldn't do that. I couldn't go home. Why not? I... I don't have a home. So I just sneaked in. Papa used to tell me, Boy, when you get no satisfaction from the hired hands, you just go straight to the boss himself. <laughs> Poor Papa. They killed him. Who killed him? The mob. They... They lynched him. What are you saying? What for? Because he was for Abe Lincoln and the Union. They made me watch it. They said, let this be a lesson, boy. But his last words, Papa's last words were, Abe Lincoln and the Union forever. Where was this? On our plantation near Baton Rouge in Louisiana. Uh, I was stationed in New Orleans. I know that part of the country quite well. Exactly where was your plantation located? Just off the 60-mile point, sir. And what's directly above it? Emmonsville. And right below? Kruger's Creek. Where was the Hotel de Paris? On the Tuca Tupula Street. Who were the two big steamboat rivals? The Robert E. Lee and the Eclipse. Sir, are you trying to trap me? Ask me anything you want to know about New Orleans. You're a long way from home. I told you I have no home. We were burned out, driven off. How did you get from New Orleans, Louisiana, to New London, Connecticut? I can't remember too many of the details, sir. Can you remember any of them? That night, after they burned down the house and killed Papa, I got to the river. I stole a boat and made my way down the river to the harbor. There, I stowed away on a ship. What kind of ship? Well, she was a sailing vessel. A uh, German. Her name was the Landgravine Frederica Charlotte. Or, or some, some such. Well, anyway, she put out to sea. And after a while, they found me. Well, they set me to work. I became very sick, and I don't recall very much more. I don't even know how much time went by. Well, but then one day, I was wandering around the streets of a city. It was New London. And that's all you remember? Yes, sir. That was three days ago. I, um... I haven't had anything to eat. I tried to get a job so I could earn some money and buy decent clothes. So when I tried to enlist, I wouldn't look like a tramp. But it was no use. Now, uh, sir, is it all right if I sit down? I'm, I'm afraid I'm just going to faint. No, you just sit down, son. You'll get a hot meal inside you. You'll feel so much better. Rayburn. Yes, sir. Take him around to the kitchen. Oh, sir, let me enlist. No, I'm afraid... Oh, I'll be such a good soldier. I'm oh, sorry, son. Oh, don't you see, sir? It's fate. It's the mysterious working of the will of the Lord. Why was I brought here to New London in Connecticut? He sent me to dwell among strangers. But I say to you, Major, you and the sergeant are not strangers, but men of kindness and goodwill. Oh, I should be a credit to the United States Army, sir. Rayburn, what do you think? I don't know, Major. He does appear underage for a soldier. Let's quarter him with the musicians. We'll enroll him as a drummer. Oh, a drummer? Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you, Major. I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you every night. <laughs> How's young Wicklow doing, Sergeant? Well, sir, uh, he's a funny one. How do you mean that, Sergeant? He seems to stay by himself. He don't try to make friends. Appears to be, uh, guess you could say, uh, absent-minded. He's always got a sad look on his face. Uh, well, we both know he has a great deal to be sad about. Well, when you're a young boy, it ain't natural to mope all the time. Give him a chance. I haven't had any complaints from the bandmaster. Oh, sir, he's performing his duties in a satisfactory manner. Well, then that's all we can reasonably expect him to do. The commandant of the fort really couldn't establish a personal relationship with the youngest drummer boy in the ranks. But I felt so sorry for him. There was such a look of sadness in his eyes. My heart went out to him. 
I kept wishing there was some way I could help him. But, of course, there was nothing more I could do for him. And then one day, Sergeant Rayburn asked to speak to me in private. It's the Wicklow boy, Major. The musicians are down on him to an extent you can't imagine. Why? What's the trouble? What's he been doing? Praying, sir. Praying? Yes, sir. The musicians haven't had any peace for that boy's praying. Well, we really cannot object to praying without risking an incident at higher headquarters. Well, no one objects to his praying as such. It's just the way he does it. He starts with the bandmaster and he prays for him. Next, he takes the head bugler. Next, he scoops in the bass drummer. And then he goes straight through the band, praying and begging. Sir, it's a sight. Well, I can't understand how that can be objectionable. Well, if the Major would only come and listen for himself. This way, sir. Now, what I'll do is kind of try open the back window in the musician's barracks. Oh, Lord, I pray for the soul and the spirit of Band Sergeant Major Isaiah McTaggart. He's a good man, Lord. Oh, what if he does chew and smoke and blaspheme? Oh, hey, be quiet. Up, you take a walk. For although his body, for although his body is poisoned with vice, his heart is clean and his soul is pure, oh, Lord. Give me strength to reveal to this poor sinner the shine and light of thy eternal truth. Then, oh, Lord, he shall no longer wallow in drunkenness. Ow! What on earth is happening in there now, Sergeant? They're throwing boots at him. He's kneeling behind that big bass drum. You can't be serious, Sergeant. It don't face him. He don't mind it. If I hadn't heard this was my own ears. <laughs> Begging the Major's pardon. It ain't no laughing matter. <laughs> no, no. Of course not, Rayburn. Of course not. <laughs> I promise I'll do something about it. <laughs> A couple of days went by, and I was still trying to figure out just what that something was when Sergeant Rayburn asked for permission to speak to the commanding officer on a matter of the utmost urgency. What's this about, Rayburn? Sir, it's about the Wicklow boy. Again? Who's he praying for now? He's here to talk about the praying, but the writing. You see, sir, he's all the time writing. Writing? What does he write? Letters? I don't know, sir. But he's forever poking and nosing about the fort all by himself. Well, he's just naturally curious, perhaps. That may be. But every now and then he outs with a pencil and paper and scribbles something down. Oh? I would say it looks suspicious, sir. Mighty suspicious. Surely, Sergeant, you're not saying... It... You don't think that young Wicklow could be... As the Major knows, Wicklow's from the south, and way down south at that. Ah, yes, that's true. Does the Major have any instructions? Say nothing about this to anyone else. Yes, sir. And see if you can get hold of whatever it is he's writing down. Yes, sir. Rayburn, what are you staring at? Sir, I'm, uh... Just looking out of your window. Huh? What is it? There's the Wicklow boy. He's just walked over to the west wall of the fort. Hey, Rayburn, look what he's doing. Yes, sir, I told you, sir. He's stuffing a piece of paper into a chink in the masonry. Should I go out there and grab him now? No, no, Rayburn. Well, wait for him to go away. Obviously, he's leaving a message for someone. That means... He's not the only enemy spy in the fort. I was a stranger, and he took me in. Unfortunately, it can be paraphrased to read, You were a stranger, and you took me in. They say the Civil War was the first modern war. It introduced for the first time the advanced techniques of social, political, economic, and industrial conflict. And while it didn't exactly introduce the concept of espionage, it certainly refined the tactics and strategy, more of which we shall see in Act Two. Not all. 
all the casualties in warfare are caused by physical violence, some of the greatest injuries are not to the body but to the spirit. It's bad enough that war forces us to kill our fellow man. It's even worse that we are compelled to kill our own spirit of trust and compassion. Well, look, sir, he's gone away. Yes, scoundrel. That young devil. The coast is clear. Let's get that piece of paper. He may be too young to hang, but not too young to be whipped within an inch of his miserable life. Uh, can you reach in there and get that paper? I'll try, sir. Yes, sir, here it is. Treat her like that. He don't deserve to live. We took him in when he was starving, and he... Rayburn. Yes, sir. Rayburn, I want you to read this. Is it a message? Yes, Rayburn, it's a message. I want you to read it. Yes, sir. Uh, blessed be those who give aid and comfort to the stranger. For the greatest affliction of all is to be alone in a strange city. Alone without friends, without hope. Yes, Rayburn. As you can see, that's a message. Well, sir, I, uh... Well, what? Rayburn, let's forget this nonsense we've been dreaming up about poor Robert Wicklow. As a matter of fact... If such a thing were possible, I'd even beg him for his forgiveness. A few days went by, and sure enough, Sergeant Rayburn came into my office. Sir, it's about the Wicklow boy. Rayburn, I thought I told... I can't help it, sir. I was passing by the musician's barracks just before. I looked through the window. I see Wicklow all alone, and he's writing... So, I go around to the door, give a little cough. He crumples up the paper, he tosses it into the fire. Rayburn, you have but no I evidence to... Oh, sir, I jabber with Wicklow for a bit, and then I send him on an errand. Now, he never suspected I was onto him. It was a coal fire, new built, and the writing had got behind a chunk of coal, so I fished it out. And, sir, here it is. Let me say that. Yes, sir. And he's, he's hardly even scorched. Uh, Fort Trumbull, December 8th. Colonel, I was mistaken as to the caliber of the three guns I ended my last list with. They are 18-pounders. The garrison is still 150 men, although some are to be shipped to the front. I think our plan had best be postponed to... That's where I must have interrupted him, sir. Major. Major. Something wrong, sir? Something wrong, Rayburn? Yes, I would say so. I would say that a good part of a man's faith in his fellow man has just died. A good piece of his compassion and charity has withered away. I understand, sir. But we're soldiers. And we have work to do. Yes, sir. We'll have to watch this boy closely and carefully. And we did. Every day there was a message in the same little hole in the wall. And the messages would disappear soon after. Evidently, someone was picking them up. Neither Rayburn or I could watch constantly, and we were afraid to trust anyone else. Obviously, there was a plot of serious proportions being hatched under our very noses. Huh? What is it, Rayburn? Sir, the Wicklow boy has asked for a leave to go into town this afternoon. By no means should he be permitted to... No. Wait. Of course. Let him go. And follow him. To Commanding General, Washington, D.C. Have reason to suspect enemy attempt to capture this installation and burn the town of New London. To Commanding Officer, Fort Trumbull, Connecticut. Place town under martial law. 
Suspend habeas corpus. Make necessary arrest. Hold summary court. Act with vigor and promptness. Keep the department informed. Signed, Secretary of War. Major. What can you report, Sergeant? I guess it's coming to a head. I followed the boy into town. Well, where'd he go? Nowhere. He stood in the corner of Market. Uh, what'd he do? Nothing. But the Union Hotel is just across the street. Well, sir, a kind of chubby old gentleman comes by, man, of about 60 well-dressed white whiskers. Yes? Wicklow stops him and talks to him. Could you hear what was said? No, sir, I couldn't get close enough. Oh. Huh. How long did they talk? Oh, couldn't have been more than a minute if that. And then what happened? Well, sir, then the old gentleman walks into the hotel. Did you follow him? I was about to, sir, but then blamed if he don't stop a lady. A lady? A red-haired, rather handsome-looking lady. Oh, give her maybe 35. Was she also well-dressed? Like a real swell. Wicklow gabs with her for maybe a minute. And then she also goes into the hotel. Then what did you do, Rayburn? When I see Wicklow go down the street, I figured he was headed back to the fort. So I go into the hotel. Did you find out who the man and the lady were? Yes, sir. The gentleman is a Reverend Marcus McEwen from New York City. And the lady is a British subject from London. And she's really a lady. Lady Marston Strathclyde or something. I, I got it written down here somewhere. That's a good day's work, Sergeant. All ain't over yet, sir. Coming back in the fort, I seen Wicklow sneak into the second platoon barracks. What was he doing there? Well, sir, you know how the men have their overcoats hanging on the wall by their beds? Well, I seen him sneak a piece of paper into the pockets of two of them. So, after he was gone... I just fished them out, and here they are. Oh. This one says, Eagle's Third Flight. And the other one says exactly the same thing, sir. Into whose coat pockets were these messages placed? Private Pope and Private Sparks. Pope and Sparks? You positive? Yes, sir. Pope and Sparks. I... Those two were on sentry duty the day he sneaked in here. Yes, sir. No wonder he was able to get in. They're part of the plot. We have to make our move right now, Rayburn. We can't afford to wait another minute. Stand by. I've got to send a telegram. I'm prepared to place city of New London under martial law. Troops under my command not reliable. Request one battalion of regulars from Boston or New York immediately. Private Wicklow to see the commander, sir. Stand at ease, Wicklow. Now, my boy, tell me, why do you write so much? I? Oh, I, I don't write very much, sir. You don't? Seems to me you're constantly scribbling. Oh, scribbling? Oh, well, I, I do scribble some. You do? Yes, sir. For amusement. Now, what do you do with your scribblings? Oh, nothing, sir. I, I, I just throw them away. Never send them to anybody? Oh, no, sir. I, I don't know anybody. Who's the colonel? The colonel? The one you refer to in this note. Well, I'm sure I don't know any colonel. Read this and refresh your memory. Oh, Oh, that... No, I never meant any harm. You betray vital information concerning the armament and the manpower of this post, and you never meant any harm? Speak up. Sir, I don't know any colonel. Stop lying. But this is true. The letter was never intended for anyone. It, it was just for my own amusement. I understand the foolishness of it now, but, the, but there's nothing else to it, I swear to you. What is the Eagle's third flight? I don't know. Tell me about Pope and Sparks. Oh, believe me, I, I, I don't know anything about them. Who are the Reverend McEwen and Lady Marston Strathclyde? I, I don't know, I swear to you. Now, don't make me force you to tell us. I don't like to use certain methods, but this is wartime and the fate of the city hangs on it. We have confiscated all their belongings. 
Oh, no. Oh, no. Something's gone wrong. Oh, please, please, please have pity on me. Be merciful to me. Don't, don't kill me. Promise to protect me. Save my life. I'll confess. I'll tell you everything. No, 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 no. Control yourself. Yes, I, I, I will try. All right. Now, talk. I... I will, sir. So, you are at heart a rebel. Yes, sir. And a spy. And a spy. And you've been acting under orders from outside. Yes, sir. Willingly? Yes, sir. Gladly, perhaps? Yes, sir. Why tonight? The South is my country. My heart is Southern. And this is all in a holy cause. And the tale you told me of how you've been wronged, the persecution of your family, that was made up for the occasion? They... They told me to say that, sir. Who is the colonel? And what's the meaning of Eagle's third flight? Answer me. I can't. I won't. I refuse to betray my own beloved country. This is your final answer? Yes, final. As sure as I love my beautiful southern country and despise everything this ugly northern sun shines upon, I will die before I tell you one word. Very well, Wicklow. This is war. You chose to play a man's game, and now you must pay a man's price. Sergeant Raven? Yes, sir. Assemble a firing party and have this man stop. Well, war is war. And in it, we are given no choice. One kills and is killed for one's country. War always brings out the very worst in us. But on very rare occasions, it can also bring out the very best in us. We shall have an example of this in Act Three. Shortly. And a little child shall lead them. Well, we have in our story a child, figuratively speaking. He may not be very little, but he can be considered a child. Yes, he impressed us the first time we met him as a poor babe in the woods. But look at whom he happens to be leading. Do you want to be blindfolded, Wicklow? No, sir. Instruct your firing party, Sergeant Rayburn. Yes, sir. Firing squad with one round full cartridges. Ready? Load. Lock. Firing party ready to proceed, sir. I sincerely hope you don't think we're bluffing, Mr. Wicklow. You would sooner die than betray your comrades? Is that a fact? Yes, sir. I wonder. Would they do the same for you? Well, Mr. Wicklow. I have nothing to say. In that case, you may proceed... Sergeant Rayburn. Yes, sir. Firing party. Ready. Aim. No. No. Hold it, Sergeant. No, don't kill me. Please. Please don't kill me. Oh, I'll tell you everything. Everything. But don't kill me. You will answer every question, Wicklow. No, have mercy on me, sir. I, I don't deserve it. Oh, please pity me. Please, sir. Please. Bring him inside, Rayburn. <laughs> drag and half carry him inside. We finally managed to calm him down. His resistance was broken. We brought in Private Pope. What's your name, soldier? Sir, it's Pope. Private Peter Ellsworth Pope, sir. All right, tell us the truth. It'll be better for you. I don't understand, sir. Who are you? Like I said, sir, Private Pope from New Hadleyburg, Massachusetts, sir. That's your story? Yes, sir, it's true, sir. Is it true, Wiglow? No, sir. Tell us who this man is. Major, how would he know who I am? I never laid eyes on him. That will do. You had your chance to speak. Tell us, Wicklow. His real name is George Bristow, from New Orleans. Two years ago, he was second mate of the Coast Packer steamer Capital. 
He's a violent person, sir, and has served two terms for manslaughter. One for killing a deckhand named Hyde with a capstan bar. Major! Be silent! Go ahead, Wicklow. The other term, sir, was for killing a roustabout for refusing to heave the lead, which is not part of a roustabout's business. He is a spy and was sent to enlist in the Federal Army and serve in that capacity. Well, Pope or Bristow, as we ought to call you, what have you to say to this? Barring your presence, Major, it's the infernalist damn lie that was ever spoke. And so it went with Private Sparks and seven other soldiers of the fort whom Wicklow identified. Each one of them, of course, denied every word Wicklow said. He detailed everything about them, where they came from, their families, what they did before the war. I decided to hold them in confinement pending the arrival of a special commission from the general staff that was even now en route from Washington, D.C. And now I had the gentleman and the lady from the Union Hotel brought into the fort. Major, may I ask the meaning of this outrage? The meaning, sir? Why have I been dragged from my hotel by some of your soldiers and marched in here as if I were a common criminal? Well, sir, I wouldn't say you were a common criminal, more of an uncommon one. How dare you? Do you know who I am? No, suppose you tell me. I am the Reverend Marcus McEwen of Brooklyn, New York. I am the brother of Congressman James B. McEwen, and I assure you, he shall hear about this. What are you doing in New London? I am visiting friends. I wouldn't doubt that at all. This young man standing near the wall, is he familiar to you? I've never seen him before in the... Oh, no, wait. No? No, I remember his face. He accosted me on a street corner outside my hotel a day or two ago. Yes? What did he say to you? What did he say is the truth? I don't know. Some sort of gibberish. I couldn't make it out. He didn't say anything about plans for attacking the fort? Are you mad? Have you taken leave of your senses? Wicklow, who is this man? Sir, his name is Peavy. That's a lie. Arthur L. Peavy, sir. And he is the man you addressed as the colonel in your letter? That's right, sir. He is the mastermind behind the plot? Yes, sir. He is the most notorious criminal in Galveston, Texas. This is an outrage. Give it up, Artie. They're wise to us. They've got you and me and the Countess, Pope and Sparks, everybody. So it's every man for himself. Make the best deal you can before they stand you up against the wall. I'll have you know I am Lady Madeline Marston Strathclyde. My husband is Under Secretary of Foreign Affairs. My brother is Lord Marston, Commander-in-Chief of Her Majesty's Forces in India. Now, I demand to speak with the British Ambassador. Who is she, Wicklow? Sir, she is known as Lily the Limey. She owns the biggest sporting house on Bourbon Street in New Orleans. She was arrested for selling contraband. She and George Bristow and all the rest were offered a chance for a complete pardon if they organized and executed this raid. Well, what do you say now, madame? I am speechless, Lieutenant. You will address the commanding officer as Major. Major, I found your country barbaric and boring, but at least after today, it will only be barbaric. Now, what is the meaning of this little comedy? I assure you, madame, this is a serious situation. Major... I'm not given to hysterics. You're obviously convinced that I'm part of a plot to do something or other to destroy your fortress. A rather sloppily run establishment compared to the least of ours. Are you ready to make a statement? Do you realize that by throwing me into prison on these trumped-up charges, you risk alienating public opinion in England? Lily. Oh, Lily, don't you understand? They know everything. Take her away, Sergeant. The next day, two companies of infantry, a battery of light artillery, and a squadron of cavalry marched into the fort. Now I felt safe and secure, ready for anything. 
We had almost a hundred people under arrest all along the eastern seaboard from Boston to New York. But had we captured everyone? Was the enemy still strong enough to make a move? Major. What is it, Rayburn? It's the Wicklow boy. He's gone. What? Gone? He's disappeared. How could he disappear? Well, sir, it appears he escaped. How? Have we still got traitors inside the fort? Well, it's either that or, or just plain dumb carelessness. How long has he been gone? About half an hour. Cavalry already has patrols out. Well, he can't have gone too far. Search every ship in the harbor, through every house and town, scour the countryside. We'll get him if we need the Army, the Navy, and the United States Marines. <laughs> To commanding officer, Fort Trumbull, Connecticut. Appreciate your inspired efforts and heads-up job in destroying rebel plot. And coming personally to congratulate, decorate, and promote. She'll be in New London by this evening. Signed, the Secretary of War. Major, they think they got him. Where is he? The cavalry commander says a boy of that description was seen going into a farmhouse about ten miles north of town. Have they taken him? No, sir. They've got the place surrounded. If it's him, he can't get away. Let's get out there, Rayburn. <laughs> Lieutenant, the sergeant and I will move in first. Be prepared to cover us. Let's go, Rayburn. Yes, sir. Make your way over to the side. No noise now. I'll take the lead. Be careful, sir. That window there. Let's get on either side of it. Yes, sir. Your pistol ready to fire? Cocked and ready, sir. All right. Now, can you see inside that window? Yes, sir. First be a kitchen. There's an old lady on her knees. And praying and kneeling beside her is... We close, sir. Come on. We'll see if the door is open. Don't seem to be locked. Praise the Lord. My boy, my darling. The lost is found. The dead are alive again. Stand still, both of you, Domo. Oh, my goodness, is something wrong? Robert, have you done anything wrong? Why, Sergeant Rayburn. By all its hope. Mother Wicklow. Sergeant, what's happening here? Robert has come back. Oh, poor Robert. I, I thought he was dead all these years. Madam, is this your son? My own darling Robert. Rayburn. The, sir, the, the, the name Wick, Wicklow, I, 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 I didn't make the connection. Everybody here about knows Mother Wicklow. Robert? Did you get into trouble when you were gone? No, Mama, no. Uh, and then this is her son? Robert, where have you been all this time? You're talking to your Mama now. I've been living in New Haven, Mama. I've been going to Yale University. Robert. Well, I, I, I was a janitor. But I got so homesick after a while, I, I just had to come home. Oh, he's all right, gentlemen. But I'm afraid his mind has been turned. Turned by what? Oh, all those dime novels and sensation story newspapers about all kinds of dark plots and mysteries. <laughs> he's always making up all kinds of fables. It's so hard sometimes not to believe him. No, no, no. Let me uh, try to understand this. He... Does not come from the South? Oh, bless you, sir. No. And his father was never lynched by by a mob? Oh, sir. His father was gathered into glory in the peace and fullness of his years. And he made it up? Every single word? Oh, he's so convincing, Major. Oh, I hope you didn't believe him. Whatever it was he told you... Poor boy, it's like a, a sickness. He can't help telling those wonderful yarns. He reads so much about all these places all over the world. He, 
He can make you actually see them. Madam, do you realize that on account of him, I have placed the city of New London under martial law? Oh, I'm sorry. I have put more than a hundred innocent people under arrest, including the clergyman brother of a congressman and the wife of the British Undersecretary of Foreign Affairs, and who happens to be the sister of the commander of the British Army in India? Now, that was a foolish thing to do, Robert. I shan't do it again, Mama. Oh, you will. You will. If I know you, you will. There will be a congressional investigation of the army. The British outrage may now decide to recognize the Confederate States, at which time, if we attempt to blockade their ships from southern ports, we invite another war with England. Oh, Robert, you are a naughty boy. But of more pressing and immediate personal importance to me. The Secretary of War is due here any hour tonight to congratulate, decorate, and promote me for my masterly handling of this affair. Oh, my. Oh, I do wish there was some way I could help you. There is. Could you tell me what to say to him? <laughs> she couldn't. Who could? Many, many years ago, one of the cigarette companies that is now defunct ran a series of distinctive ads. Each pictured a person in an extremely embarrassing position, and underneath the caption read, Be nonchalant. Do you remember? Ask your dad. Or better, your granddad. I shall return shortly. dying to know how the Major got out of it, or if he got out of it, I don't know. That was part of Mark Twain's unique genius. He could not only tell you an engrossing story, but when it was over, he could get your own mind running in fantastic directions to come up with a sequel. Today, this kind of thing is called audience participation. So you see, nothing is ever really new. Our cast included Christopher Tabori, Robert Dryden, Bryna Rayburn, and Jackson Beck. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. They said it couldn't be written. The book that hit America like a runaway locomotive. You have I hope you have I hope you have I hope you have I hope you have An honest man, we are told, is the noblest work of God, assuredly. And there are times, unfortunately, when it appears as if he is also the rarest. Honesty, sincerity, loyalty. Why do we call them simple virtues? These days they appear to be so complicated. 
Uh, what kind of a job did you have in mind? Well, I'm a first-class confidence operator and an all-around hustler. I can use a gun, but, <laughs> hey, I think that's for suckers. Hold it. I, I thought you said you wanted to change your way of life. I do. I'm sick of penny any swindles. I'm looking for something big. That's why I came to you. <laughs> mystery drama, Willie and Dilly, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Fred Gwynn. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. In God we trust. All others pay cash. That's a sign we read in so many commercial establishments. And yet, no matter how cynical, skeptical, or worldly wise we are, the fact is our social order is based on absolute trust. Aren't we constantly placing our lives, our health, our fortunes into the hands of airplane pilots, cab drivers, lawyers, bankers, automobile mechanics? Like it or not, we are destined to be our brother's keeper, just as he is required to be ours. You're going to meet Mr. Harrison Dillard Wentworth, and Mr. Wentworth is every bit as imposing as his name. Fifty-five years old, he is tall, white-haired, and handsome. You feel instinctively that he is just the man to handle your money. Won't you have a chair, Mrs. Zurich? That's pronounced Zurich, as in the Swiss city. Oh, I see. Uh, are you Swiss? No. Zurich was the name of my late husband's stepfather. Uh, uh, how may I serve you, Mrs. Zurich? I realize this is a very big firm, and that many of your clients are millionaires. Are you also a millionaire, Mrs. Zurich? Or should I say, millionaires? <laughs> Neither one. I'm afraid I'm not even rich. Yes? I'm a widow. A very recent widow. Oh, my sympathy. I only have a few thousand dollars. A few? To you, it would be a few. Five, to be exact. Oh? Yes. I know exactly what that O oh means. Well, Mrs. Zurich, It I... means, what right do I have to take up the time of Harrison Dillard Wentworth himself? Five thousand dollars. That's hardly worth the attention of the smallest fry in the outermost office. Yes, now that I sit here and think about it, I realize how foolish I must seem to you. And how unimportant. Mrs. Zurich, all of our clients are important. But I also need financial advice. To me, $5,000 is a fortune. Of course. And I am an important person to myself. My needs are real and urgent. I want the best. I understand. I wonder if you do. You're a top man in the field. You deal in astronomical figures, I suppose. Now, how could you possibly understand a person like me? Yeah. Mrs. Zurich, permit me to inform you that I shall personally supervise your account. Well, that... I can't tell you how wonderful you've made me feel. I... No. What am I going to do? Cry? No, Mrs. Zurich. I can't help it. I'm so happy. This is the first nice thing that's happened to me since Ogden died. Uh, Ogden? Mm, my late husband. I know very little about money, but he knew even less. Poor Ogden Zurich. He was just a sweet, kindly dreamer. Mm. I shall prepare a modest, interesting portfolio. And safe. It must be safe. That's why I demanded to see you and no one else. This money is all I have in the world. But I feel it's secure with you. Shall I write a check? Uh, there are papers to be drawn up first. Well, please do it. And we should talk about various possibilities. No, don't say that. I'm, I'm sorry, did I? No. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I had no right to flare up like that. But all my life I have been involved with men who like to talk. Ineffectual men 
who used conversation as a distraction for their inability to amount to anything. Here, for the first time, I feel I am in competent, capable hands. I hope to be worthy of your trust. Uh, excuse me. Yes? Oh, that's too bad. I suppose it means our lunch set is off. Call Rosario's and cancel my... T no. Uh, never mind. Uh, Mrs. Zurich. Yes? I hope you're free for lunch. Oh, you don't have to feel that you... But I do. I always take my important clients to lunch. Mm. Besides, we're about to begin an extremely intimate, uh, that is, <laughs> confidential relationship. Oh. I must know all about you, what your goals are, and so forth, if I am to invest your money prudently. Prudently? Mm. I like the sound of that. I never knew a man before who actually thought in those terms. Mm. Do you believe in fate? But doesn't everyone? Well, you see, I had a lunch date scheduled with a Mr. Jonathan Simpkins, a very wealthy gentleman. He's every bit of 60, yet he wears what's left of his hair down to his shoulders, dresses in jeans, and rides a motorcycle. Oh, good for him. <laughs> He'll be in the hospital for at least a month. Oh. It was ordained. He was destined to run into that truck so that you and I could have lunch today. Oh, I'm sorry to be the cause of Mr. Simpkins' accident. Uh, are you? I'm not. Oh, what a fabulous restaurant. You only see places like this in the movies. <laughs> Don't think I am actually lunching in a place like this. <laughs> Do you know what I feel like? Oh, champagne. Ah, let me order some. Oh, no. That's not what I meant. I don't feel like having champagne. I feel like champagne. <gasps> when you look into the glass and you see it fizzing and bubbling, that's me. Your eyes are glowing. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I want to thank you. You want to thank me? Why? You've just taught me a lesson. What kind of lesson could I possibly teach you? A lesson in how to live. You know, I've forgotten something very important. How to extract joy from the moment. I lunch here quite often. And I've been taking it just as a matter of course. Uh, if you'll pardon the pun. It's become just another eating place where food is merely an adjunct to a business conversation. But now... Now? Now you've reminded me why I came here the very first time. For the decor. The magnificent cuisine. You do enjoy things don't you? Oh, yes. When I get the chance. Somehow I feel you didn't get too many chances in your lifetime, Mrs. Zurich. Um, <laughs> Mrs. Zurich, I, I don't even know your first name. Oh, Wilhelmina. But my friends call me Willie. Oh, no. No? It, this is rapidly becoming a day of the most fantastic surprises. Do you know what my friends call me? I can't imagine. Dilly. Oh, <laughs> I don't believe it. It's true. A man of your stature and dignity? Who would dare? My name is Harrison Dillard Wentworth. But for some reason, no one ever wanted to call me Harrison. Or even Harry. Everyone preferred the name Dillard. Which soon became Dilly. Dilly. Now that I say it again, it does seem to suit you somehow. <laughs> and so here we are. Willie... And Dilly. <laughs> really, now, that, that, this has to be fate. Willie? It's Willie. Unless you gave some other dame a key to the apartment. Oh, tell me. Tell me. How did it go? How did it go? I'm back in school, and I come home to the sorority house from a date. How does it happen you can never give a person a straight answer? How did it go? The answer to that question is, I made him. I knew it. I had him the minute I walked into his office. Oh, I figured you would. Hey, did you use the widow angle? Well, if I read the signs, in about a week, he'll want to set me up in my very own little apartment. Oh, oh that's great. That's <laughs> great, huh? Why are we doing this? I told you. To make a million dollars. Maybe more. I don't see it. 
Oh, yes, I can get him to spend some money on me, but nowhere near a million. And uh, where do you come in? Don't worry about a thing. Blackmail? You think he'd come up with a million just to keep his wife from finding out? I don't. I told you. Don't worry about it. Or do you think the scandal would ruin him with his old-time conservative blue-chip customers? <laughs> You're not even warm, Willie. Oh, yes, I am. Warm, vibrant, vital, alive. <laughs> I am quoting Mr. Harrison Dillard Wentworth, also known as Dilly. Yeah, will you just keep heating up, Mr. Harrison Dillard Wentworth, and I'll let you know when to take him out of the oven. Oh, why can't you tell me what the angle is? Isn't it better this way? All you have to do is concentrate on the job at hand. Uh, more coffee, dear? Uh, no, thank you, darling. Oh, that's right. You've decided to cut down. <laughs> Sorry I tempted you. Uh, actually, I don't have time. I must return to the office. Billy, you haven't worked night in years. My dear, the heat is on. Uh, these are volatile times. Who knows where the economy is headed? Yes, that's true. And there's so much information to digest. We simply don't have the time to do it uh, during the day. But is it necessary for the boss to go in at night? It's when the boss comes back at night that everyone starts to take things seriously. Oh, you poor darling. Uh, I hope you didn't have anything planned. No, I didn't. But you did. Didn't you say Frank Miller was going to stop by for a chat? That's right. He's in town for a while and... Thoughtlessly, I had asked him to drop in for a drink. He's such a bore. Always moralizing about something. Frank is one of your oldest friends. Actually, we've outgrown each other. Only Frank doesn't realize it. I hate to hurt his feelings. Well, I could give him a drink. Would you, dear? I know he's dreadfully dull. Well, I'll manage to get through the evening somehow. Will you be late? I don't know. Um, I hope not. But don't wait up for me. Come in. Yes, thank you. Uh, Dilly isn't home. He's been so busy lately. He had to go down to the office. Oh. I can offer you a drink. Well, the reason I stopped by was because I wanted some advice. Why don't you call him? No, no. I I don't want to bother him. It shouldn't be a bother. No, it, uh, it can wait till tomorrow. Now, how about that drink? Although, uh, you know, I'm on a morning flight to Chicago and I... I should speak with Dilly about this first. But then by all means, I'll get him on the phone. Are you are you sure that it's no trouble? Well, actually, I'm glad of an excuse to call. Why? Uh, do you want to check up on him? <laughs> what an idea. Dilly, he has no time for other women. Why, he hardly has enough time for me. Oh, poor dear. He does put in long hours. But... You know what he always says. The first part of your life, you work hard to make your money. The second part, you work even harder to keep it. Even so, this working late is a bad habit that should be nipped in the bud. Now, that's, that's odd. Oh, what is? Well, I, I wonder, did I dial the right number? Oh, I'm sure I did. Well, did he tell you definitely he was going to the office? Well, now that you mention it, what he said was he, he might stop by at the office. Oh, oh. Yes, he's, he, he's probably out with a client. Well, yes, I'm sure of it. He's probably on his way home right now. Oh, of course. <laughs> what am I going to do? Whatever it is she's going to do, she isn't going to do it until the second act. So far, it has been our purpose to introduce a roster of characters, mix them and watch them, and see what fireworks we can ignite. You must admit we have some highly combustible materials. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. <laughs> I have been faithful to thee, Cinera, in my fashion. 
Yes. Trust a poet to justify his roving eye with such a prettily turned phrase. But has he touched a universal nerve here? Is there such a thing as complete and absolute and unwavering faithfulness? Or is each of us faithful in his or her own fashion? Well, you know what Professor Einstein said. Everything is relative. Well, Frank, sit down. Well, yes, and thank you, Dilly. Sorry I missed you that night last week. Well, I, uh, <clears throat> I wonder how to go about this. Uh, go about what? Well, I might as well just dive in. What's her name, Dilly? Uh, whose name? The girl you're having an affair with. Now, see here, Frank. You have no right now, to come. I'm your oldest friend. I have every right. This is the most ridiculous accusation. You weren't at the office that night. Louisa called you. Uh, she called? Why? Because I wanted to speak with you. And there was no answer. Uh, does she uh, suspect? Well, she doesn't want to. Well, Lily, uh, what are you going to do about it? What am I going to do? I say uh, cut it short. Well, let it end right now. Listen, Frank. Stay home. Be with her. And after a while, Louisa will believe that all her suspicions are groundless. Because that's what she wants to believe. Now give up this woman. Whoever she is. I can't. You have to. Frank, I'm 25 years old all over again. Now, that's nonsense. Don't say that. This girl makes me feel like a boy. Oh, sure. I'm enjoying life. All of life. Come on. I have young ideas. Uh, young reactions to things. You and I, Frank, we become old and stodgy and set in our ways. You should get yourself someone to be surprised what a new outlook on life it gives you. Well, what about Louisa? Louisa? But you still love her? What a question. Of course. What does one thing have to do with another? Oh, where does a thing like this end? No. Why should I think about that now? I'm only at the beginning. Hi, baby. You're late? Well, I had some loose ends to tie up. Mm-hmm, such as? Hey, you'll know everything in due time. I think due time has arrived. It's close, Willie, honey, close. Well, I hope so. Because Mr. Harrison Dillard Wentworth is beginning to bore me. Norman, what is it we stand to make out of him? And don't tell me a million bucks, because I heard that one before. Yeah, but it's true. How? We're going to help him steal. Steal? He's going to steal? Right. Well, whatever you want to say about Dilly Wentworth, he is not a crook. You are wrong. Norman, this man has a reputation as ethical as any... I say he's a crook. Well, everybody thinks he's absolutely on the level. Everybody's wrong. Oh, I see. Everybody's wrong but you. <laughs> Harrison Dillard Wentworth is a man who can't be trusted. Mm -hmm. And where's your proof? You are my proof. Me? Uh, tell me, can Harrison Dillard Wentworth's wife trust him? I mean, should she? Well, uh... So if she can, <laughs> who else can? It's not the same thing. Oh, uh, why not? A guy can be trusted or he can't be trusted. If he can be trusted, anybody can trust him all the way. If not, it's just the question of the right girl, the right deal. But there's never been a hint of him ever cheating on any of his clients. Uh, to me, that means he's never been caught. And what do you think you can get him to steal? Oh, some securities. Negotiable securities. At least a million dollars worth. Okay. Okay, Normie. Let's say you're right. He's a crook. And he would steal the securities. And why does he need us? Why doesn't he just steal them himself? <laughs> Look, if he just puts the stuff in his pocket and walks out, he has to keep walking until he gets to a place uh, somewhere in this world where there's no extradition treaty with the U.S. Such places are usually very rural and very dull and not all Mr. Wentworth's idea of a good time. However, let us assume that the stuff is stolen from him. Do you see? Oh. Then he's in the clear. His hands are clean. Uh, you think he would listen to such a proposition? He'd be all ears. If you're right about him, it sounds like a 
a great idea. I am, and it is. <laughs> now let me tell you how we're going to work it. Ah, it's a lovely day, isn't it, dear? What is so rare as a day in June? <laughs> uh, how does the rest of it go? I'm not sure. But this is a rare Saturday. I have you home with me. Unless, of course, something happens to come up. Darling, I've been neglecting you shamefully lately, haven't I? I'm not complaining. No. You're too good a sport for that. I realize that what you're doing is absolutely necessary. I may be overdoing it. Um, after all, I'm not getting any younger. You don't look very much older. <laughs> Did you have anything planned for today? No, not really. Do you mind if we don't go anywhere? Of course not. I'm just a bit tired. I'd just sort of like to sit around and relax. Uh-oh. I'll make short work of it. Hello? Kenny, darling. Ah, yes. I love you. Oh, well, yes. I'm so lonesome. Yes, I can understand that. I could die. I don't think so. I have to see you. I don't see how. These are the usual story. I'm not sure I can. Oh, it's such a lovely day. You know what I want to do? I want to go to the track. That's a rather difficult... I want you to take me. I understand. We should have such fun. And afterwards... Maybe we could arrange it for another time. I really appreciate this, and I won't let you down. Where are you now? You know where to find me, sweetie. All right. Goodbye, Tom. That was uh, Tom Wesley. I don't know if you met him. We uh, play squash at the club. Oh. He's been trying to get me together with a fellow from England who's got all sorts of money to invest. Man's going back tonight, and Tom thought it would be a good idea if he met me. First. Well, I, I suppose it's important. Yes, it is. I really don't want to go. I'll, uh, I'll um, cut it as short as I can. And that's another loser. Oh, well, lucky in love. Yeah. Do you love me? Of course I love you. You know, the minute you walked into my office... I knew you were the one I was looking for. Oh, you admit you were looking. Uh, well, yes. If, uh, Louisa is a good woman in many ways, but uh, she's dull. Oh, and so from time to time you look around for someone else to sort of uh, liven things up? None of the others ever meant anything to me. Is that what you told each of them? No. After a while, I told each of them goodbye. And after a while... Goodbye to me, too. No. I never want to say goodbye to you. What do you want to say to me? I want to buy you an apartment. Ah. A lovely, a lovely, luxurious apartment. Hmm. Is this a proposal? Um, uh, I can't divorce my wife. Why not? I don't believe in it. If she finds out, she'll divorce you. Uh, in the first place, she won't find out. How can you be sure? Mm, because she doesn't really want to find out. Hmm. And what's the second place? She can't divorce me. Who says so? Mm, practicality. The basic facts of life. She has no money of her own. Really? Didn't the papers say you married an heiress? Mm, she did come into some money when we were married. She gave it to me to go into business. How much money? About a million dollars. And you never gave it back to her? No. Why not? She never asked me. Suppose she does ask you. She can ask, but there's no paper anywhere to prove it was a loan. She just gave you the million. What could she do? She loved me. And now she's stuck. You uh, could say that. Dilly. <laughs> now I really know why they call you Dilly. Hello there, Willie. Uh, tell me who you like.
prize in the next race? Hey, what's the matter, Willie? Don't you know me? Uh, do you know this person, Willie? I never saw him before in my life. <laughs> That's a laugh. Uh, sir. Uh, please, you're annoying this lady. Well, that's another laugh. <laughs> well, you're giving me a choice. I can either ask that police officer to come over here, or I can handle you myself. Oh, that'll look great in the papers. Even greater on the 11 o'clock news. Broker gets into fistfight over woman at the racetrack. Uh, just what are you after? <laughs> I'll notice all the neat little time bombs in that headline. Woman, racetrack. I'll ask you again. What do you want? What do I want? Don't listen to him. I want maybe a little human warmth. Maybe a hello. Maybe even a little kiss from my own sister. That's what I want. Uh, Willie, is this person your brother? <laughs> if she's my sister, I have to be her brother. Can't you let me alone? Do you always have to ruin things for me? Is that a way to talk to a brother who you haven't seen in ten years? And why haven't I seen you in ten years? Because you've been in jail. Oh, Willie, dear, we can't have a scene. That's why he's here. Unless you give him money. How can you say that about your own brother? You're no good. You never were. And you'll never be worth anything. You're just a crook. Oh, well, that's behind me. Oh, sure. From now on, things are going to be different. I heard that before. I mean it. I really mean it. I had ten years to learn my lesson. I don't want to go through that again. I don't believe a word you're saying. I'm still your brother. All right, Nomi. How much do you want this time? I don't want money. I want a chance. To do what? No, no, dear. He does seem sincere enough. You don't know him like I do. Well, give me a break, will you? All right, I will. Uh, come up to my office first thing tomorrow morning. Now, don't start anything. Just give him a couple of dollars and you'll get rid of him. Now, please, Willie, I'm a changed person. Don't you believe me? No. Well, I do. Don't. My dear, I am an excellent judge of character. I have faith in this man. If he has, he has. What can we do about it? Things are proceeding apace. Our little web has been spun, and our spider steps aside temporarily to allow the fly to enter. However... Who is the spider and who is the fly? This shall be unraveled in Act 3 shortly. No one cooks but me, and so no one's in the kitchen. No one sees the package. Mrs. Donna Doinek talks about buying food that's sure to please her family. When I buy Kraft macaroni and cheese, I know that uh, it's something that we're going to be satisfied with. My family doesn't know what I put on the table. I mean, they see it in the bowl, and they see it on their plate, and the only way they tell the difference is when they put it in their mouth. It just so happens that uh, they've always been satisfied with Kraft. Kraft macaroni and cheese dinner. You know they're going to like it. Good company. Maxwell House. Maxwell House. Coffee you can count on. Always smells good. Always tastes good. Always good to the last drop. Maxwell House. Good coffee. Good to the last drop. Maxwell House. New York, Chicago, St. Louis, Miami, Seattle. Our biggest cities are sending out cries for more VISTA volunteers. VISTA means volunteers in service to America. VISTA volunteers work with groups of inner city residents to tackle the many urban problems that can't be solved alone. By working together with local leaders, entire neighborhoods can be restored. Job training centers can be created. Educational programs, health, and legal services can be expanded to reach all who need them. VISTA means working through the democratic process. is the advice that can be followed with profit by both athletes and roulette players. Yes, sometimes the mouth works quicker than the mind. And we all know the hand can be faster than the eye. And therefore, since lightning outpaces thunder, by the time you hear the crash, the flash has already done its job. Yes? Who? Oh. Send him in. Ah. Well, Norman, sit down. Um, now then, I 
understand you're looking for something to do. Yes, yes, that's right. For obvious reasons, I can't give you a job in my office. Oh, that's all right. I understand. Uh, but I do know people. Um, tell me, what can you do? I'm a first-class confidence operator. I uh, beg your pardon? I'm a good hustler. I know how to work a scheme. Under certain highly specialized conditions, I'll use a gun. Now, just a minute. Is that the kind of job you're looking for? Well, that's the only kind of jobs I'm qualified for. <laughs> One or both of us must be laboring under a misapprehension. Well, it isn't me. Norman, I distinctly heard you tell your sister you're a changed person. Well, that's true. You said you had reformed. Oh, no, I didn't. Oh, I distinctly remember. I said I was all through with the stupid stuff. And from now on, things are going to be different. But you seem to have no intention of changing your ways. Oh, I do. From now on, the stupid stuff is out. I've been in and out of jail most of my life. And do you know for what? Peanuts. Coffee and cake. You know what I learned? Obviously, not very much. No, no. I learned a very basic lesson. If a man steals a whole country, he goes down in history as a hero. If he steals $10 from somebody's wallet, he becomes a common thief and a jailbird. I do not see the relevance. Of... <laughs> when it comes to stealing, the bigger the prize, the better the chance of getting away with it. If this is your attitude, I don't know what there is for us to talk about. Personally, I'd like to steal a million dollars. A million dollars. Yeah, it's a nice round sum. I'm a busy man. Uh, you must excuse me. Wouldn't you like to steal a million dollars? I, sir, am not a thief. Why do you say that? I don't know why I sit here and prolong this nonsense. No, no, no. Just tell me why you think you're not a thief. Putting it as plainly as I know how, I can be trusted with other people's money. Oh, I don't think so. Your opinion is of no consequence. Now, sir, if you will please... The reason I say that... Is because you can't be trusted with other people's affections. Your wife's, for example. If you don't leave my office at once, immediately, I'm going to have you thrown out. Well, now, just think this over. You have a couple of branch offices. You're always sending cash and securities from here to there. Some of them can amount to a lot of money. You could tip me off when a shipment is on the way. And who the messenger is, and I, well, I could relieve him of his burden. And we would split. How dare you? Dare? What's there to dare? You're in or you're out. Get out of here. Well, you know where to reach me. I said get out. On second thought, cash could be traced. And besides, a million bucks in cash might need an armored car. Did you hear what I just said? Negotiable bonds. You know, bearer bonds. You could get about a million bucks worth in an attache case, couldn't you? Do you want me to throw you out of here? Oh, no, 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 I'm leaving. But you know where to reach me. Just ask Willie. What did you say to him? I never heard a man rave like that in my life. I gave him the proposition. I told you he wouldn't go for it. Oh, he went for it. Are you crazy? Another five seconds and he would have thrown you out the window. Now, Willie, let me tell you what's happening. It's churning and turning and burning around inside his brain. Oh, come off it, Norman. Ooh, he sees a chance to get away with half a million. But he's rich. Why should he steal? You think only poor people steal? He has all the money he could ever need. Stealing is something you do because you're a thief in your heart. Hey, I ought to know. And behind that dignified, white-haired front is a guy who's basically a hustler. But he doesn't need the money. Sure he does. A half a million, tax-free, that he doesn't have to account for. <laughs> and by this time, he's anxious to do it. He can taste it. Uh, that's your boy now. Answer it. Hello? Willie. Hi. I'm not here. Your brother around. Give him the virtuous bit. Look, uh, the less you have to do with that no good brother of mine, the better I'll like it. I think I have a job for him. Oh, don't bother. Now, darling, darling, please. We do have to give him a chance, don't we? Uh, tell him I'd like to see him. Uh, Miss Dayton, 
No calls. I don't want to be interrupted for the next half hour. We don't need a half hour, Mr. Winburn. Uh, how soon can we put this plan into operation? Uh, I knew you'd like it. We don't have to discuss anything other than the operational facts. Well, when can you have something worthwhile? I have about $800,000 worth of highly negotiable bonds that I can send to my downtown branch. Uh-huh. And, and how do you do it? One of my employees here is my confidential messenger. And he just takes the stuff? That's right. How come nobody ever jumped him? <laughs> because nobody has any reason to suspect what he carries. Only my downtown associate and I are aware of the transfer. Uh, tell me, how does he go? By taxi cab. Okay. Okay. Tip me off exactly when he's due to leave. And I'll have a friend of mine in a hack in front of the building. We'll do the rest. Sounds good. What can go wrong? A 50-50 split for you? Sounds like a great deal. Well, I'm taking all the risk, right? The thing goes sour, and you're still in the clear. Where do we meet to settle our accounts? Uh, Willie's apartment. When is the best time for the activity? Ten o'clock. Ten o'clock tomorrow morning. By that time, the morning traffic jam is over. The streets will be clear. I'll point the man out to you. You'll be carrying a black leather attache case. With 800,000 in vines. Right. Okay, partner. How do I look? Well, you ought to cut your hair, Willie. Plenty of cab drivers have long hair. Don't wear makeup. Dress in denims. A messenger won't know if you're a girl or a boy. Do you know him? Yeah, until he gave me a good look at How much time do we have? Uh, we better get going right now. Listen, Nermy. It's the first time since I've known you that you're using a gun. Hey, I'm not using it, just carrying it. But, Normie, if something goes wrong... Come on, baby. Positive thinking here, positive thinking. Oh, please, please, please don't for any reason fire that thing. The gun is for show and tell. It isn't even loaded. Miss Dayton, have Snelling come in here, please. Thank you. What's that? My wife's on the phone. Um, tell her... Uh, I'm rather busy right now, and that uh, I'll call her as soon as I get a chance. Ah, Snelling. Yes, sir. The bonds you brought in from the vault yesterday, they're ready. Very good, sir. They're in this attache case, and they're needed downtown right away. I understand, sir. It's 10 o'clock. Uh, can you leave now? I don't know why not. <laughs> I didn't know you had someone in the cab here. Hop in, Carl. We're waiting for you. What's the idea? You know what the idea is. Now, just calm in quietly and you won't get hurt. Look, I, you can't get away with being nervous. This gun isn't going to go off unless you make it. What are you such a sweat about? Hey, it isn't your money. Please, don't shoot. Now, come on. Just put that nice attache shake case on the front seat next to the nice young man driving. That's it. And now, we're going to slow down at the corner. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to open the door and hop out. Yeah. Now, now open the door. Huh? Out you go, pal. Now, okay, Willie, get around the corner. We'll dump the cab and get into our car. Okay, relax. Keep it down, Willie. We're in the clear. Let's not get picked up for speeding. Turn on the radio. Head for the throughway. The throughway? Are we going to the apartment? What for? Well, are we supposed to meet Wentworth there and give him his, his cut? What for? Oh. Well, yes. Now that you mention it, what for indeed? 800,000 in lovely negotiable bonds, and it's all ours. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt for a news bulletin. There has been a spectacular holdup. A messenger for the brokerage firm of Wentworth & Company has just been robbed of a black attache case with a million dollars in bonds inside. More details as soon as we get them. A million bucks? Either they exaggerate, or we did better than expected. Let's open this thing up and count it. And let's see. Hey, Willie. Willie. What is it? Inside the attache case. There are no bonds here. What? Hey, look out. 
paper. Just just sheets of paper. But I, I, wait, I some, wait a minute. Something's written down here. One good turn deserves another. Isn't it a dilly? He wrote that. He was wise to it all the time. Enjoying the beautiful scenery, the comfort. <laughs> Isn't it lush? Well, Dilly is tearing his hair out. He, he never thought you'd ever run out on him. Dilly takes things for granted sometimes. But for a moment, I, I was afraid you'd run out on me, too. Oh, darling, never. But you told me you were broke. How can you afford... I have plenty of money now. Oh, where? Where did you get it? I found it. You found it? Do you remember the day Dilly's messenger was held up? Oh, yes. That morning, I found a black attache case on the desk in Dilly's room. I'd never seen it before, so I called Dilly at the office to ask him about it. But I couldn't get through. The next thing I heard was a news bulletin on the radio announcing a holdup. It said something about a black attache case filled with bearer bonds. I don't know what possessed me. I just opened the attache case, and there they were. The bond. Oh, how did they get there? I really don't know. Although, no, I, 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 I shouldn't say this. Well, why not? It's entirely possible that Dilly staged the holdup. What are you saying? He arranged to have someone take the attaché case from poor Snelling at gunpoint. But if the case was stolen from Snelling, how could it be in the house? That puzzled me. Then I figured there might be two cases. Dilly had filled one with the bonds the night before and brought it home. Then he gave an empty one to Snelling. And so the robbers got nothing for their pains. Uh, you really believe me? Dilly could be a thief. Why not? He stole my affection. Why shouldn't he steal money? But, darling, you stole the money from him. Precious. It was my money. He borrowed almost a million from me when we were married. I was only getting some of my own back. Yes, indeed. That is the sweetest thing a woman, or a man for that matter, can do. Get some of your own back. And the longer you wait, the better it tastes. I'll have another tasty tidbit for you. And you won't have to wait too long for it, either. Well, it's the barbecues, I use strong, heavy-duty Reynolds wrap. I line the grill with it. Seems to make charcoal heat spread evenly. And it beats all for cooking potatoes and corn and for juicy grilled chicken. When you wrap in Reynolds wrap, you zip through barbecue cooking. Easy. Reynolds wrap. Discover the Dermasoft formula for hard, callous skin. Apply Dermasoft cream to feet, hands, and elbows as directed. Dermasoft gives you the same callous-removing ingredient that doctors use most. Now you can soften and remove hard, callous skin without painful cutting or scraping. Dermasoft cream. Dermasoft. Laxatives work in different ways. X-lax pills gently stimulate your system's own natural rhythm. That's the difference. X-lax pills, for occasional use only as directed. Fellow Americans, if you're still shopping here and there and everywhere for shoes, hold it right where you are. Put your feet together, stop running around. Just step around a kitty and you'll cover the ground. Anywhere you want to go, head your feet in our direction. Take it 
to contact video call 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 the mystery theater presents <coughs> G. Marshall. The whole of life is but keeping away the thoughts of death. Those are not my words. They were set down in the 18th century by an Englishman named Samuel Johnson. Our persistent, incurable optimism drives us to live as though there would never be an ending. The knowledge that life will close is buried deep and covered over. But deep as it lies, and hidden as it is, the knowledge is there. And we silently wonder, as Mr. Johnson did, must not all things at the last be swallowed up in death? Look there. Look there. Where, Captain? On the horizon. It's a ship. I don't see anything, Captain. Huh? But you must. It's a ship. Yes, it's a ship. It's coming for me. Our mystery drama, The Unquiet Tomb, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Fred Gwynn. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Samuel Johnson was preoccupied throughout his 75 years with the vagaries and vicissitudes that punctuate our brief lives till he wrote these despairing lines. Must helpless man, in ignorance sedate, roll darkling down the torrent of his fate. Stay with us now for the story called The Unquiet Tomb. Nicholas! Vic, where are you? Nicholas! Can't you hear me? I hear you, Captain Jack. The sun's starting to set. I know, Captain. Then where in the name of heaven is my brandy? I'm fetching it now. Hmm. Bring me a shawl to put over my knees. Yeah, I've got it. There's a sharp wind blowing from off the sea. Hand it over. Uh, shall I help uh, you? Hand it over. I'll do it myself. I'm still able. Of course you are. Shall I uh, pour your brandy, Captain Jack? Yes, you'd better do that. There you are, Captain Jack. Pour yourself one, too. H how's that? I said pour yourself a spot of brandy. Is that so hard to understand? Well, it's been years since you suggested that I drink with you, Captain. Yes, well, I'm suggesting it now. Of course, back there, it wouldn't have been proper for us to drink together. Uh, bad for discipline. Mm, bad for morale, surely. And when we came here, mm, I don't know, we stuck to the same old ways. Force of habit, I suppose. I always understood that, Captain. It would never have entered my mind to presume. But that... now, now it all seems <laughs> stuff and nonsense. Hmm? Know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Perhaps I do, Captain. In part, anyway. And besides, I I begin to feel the need of human company. It was different, of course, when Nellie was alive. You uh, remember how she was, Nick? I remember. So full of spirits. So happy to be alive. Well, you know. Yes, she was my own sister, Captain. And then there was Kevin Murdoch. Now he's gone. Why did he have to go back, Nicholas? He had a good life here. 
Why did he want to go back to the polluted life of civilization? I think you know why, Captain. Look. Look there. Look there. Oh, where, Captain? On the horizon. It's a ship. I don't see anything. Hmm? But you must. <laughs> Your eyes are better than mine. There's a ship out there. No, Captain. Yes, a ship. Ah, and it's coming for me. To carry me away. But now, Captain... Surely you don't mean you'd leave your island. I, you think I'd do that? Leave my island? No. But that ship will carry me away. Yes, it will carry me away. A flight of fancy, Captain. Huh? There's no ship. What? No? No ship? You imagine it, Captain. Hmm. Well, you, you could be right, I suppose. It's, it's possible you're right. Uh, remember, remember when I purchased this island? Hmm? From the Dutch? Or, or was it the French? Or the English? Uh, they bought it for pennies. In point of fact, I'm not sure I ever paid them anything at all, who, whoever they were. Uh, did I pay them, Nick? I don't believe you ever did. Hmm? Well, nobody cared. Nobody even knew this island was here till I put in a bid for it. And when I did, they brushed it off like you'd whisk away a fly. What did they want with an island that covered no more than eight square miles of earth, set in a distant sea? Did they care for its beauty? Hmm? Its serenity? No. There wasn't a penny to be made from it, so why should they care? Do I speak the truth, Nick? The very truth, Captain. Even you? You thought me mad to settle on this scrap of paradise, didn't you? Ha! <laughs> didn't you? Well, that was before I'd seen it, sir. Ah! But once you'd seen it... Then it was a different matter altogether. Oh, man alive. The joy in my heart when I saw you waving from the small boat. One of my own. My old compatriot. My fellow fighter. I knew straight off that together we'd have ourselves a tiny piece of heaven here. And then, and Nellie. Nellie standing beside you in the little boat. I, I never expected that. Bringing a woman with you. That was your bit of inspiration. It was to free her mind of an infatuation she'd had for a man back there. And it did. It did. Hmm? Freed her from everything that was mean and rotten. Oh, remember, Nick, how we set about building this house out of the coral rock? Build it according to no plan at all. What did we need of plans? Hmm? The soul of this place is to have no plan. No plan at all. Simply to live each day as it comes. To rest each night in order to be ready for the day that will dawn. Aye, we rise with the sun. Nellie would give us breakfast. And work like stevedores. Harder than that. Till Nellie called us for dinner. Oh, a sweet voice. I can hear it now. Captain O'Shea, I've dinner set on the bench. There's fried fish today. Captain, I'm toasting the breadfruit, so hurry. Stop your work now. This instant or the fish will be overdone. We're coming, Nellie. We're yours. Uh, now, Nick, serve up the fish and be generous. There's plenty. Oh, oh, oh this one was a whopper. Is bread fruit for you, Captain? Again? No complaining now. I won't have it. It lacks something. Bread fruit does. Yes. Taste is what it lacks. <laughs> I took a walk along the beach this morning. And you know what I found? Little yellow plums growing right out of the sand. Millions of them. Now, if there was some way to get out the pulp and some way to make a jam out of them... There should be a way. And, uh, and brandy. A yellow plum brandy. A yellow plum jam. A yellow plum pudding. There's no end to what we can do. <laughs> no end. No end. We shall go on forever and ever. There will be no end to this dream of paradise. Hmm? We shall live like this to the end of our days. Agreed? Agreed. 
Of course, the reality of the thing is, my end will come first. I'm 50 years old and a bit more. Well, now, Captain Jack... Don't dwell on such things, Captain O'Shea. Not on a day like this, when we're all so happy and content. Mm, You two. Neither of you has reached 30, but... I, I... Oh, come now, Captain, you... No, 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 no. Today's the day to think about it. Later, I'll fear it no more, and I'll push the thought away. But today, today I can think about it with a clear mind. If you must. Uh, uh, I have it. I have it. What's that, Captain Jack? I'll build me a tomb. A tomb of coral. Inlay the walls with the most beautiful shells to be found on the beach. I can find the shells. Before we go on with the house, Nick, we'll construct a tomb. And build the house about it. Yes. I shall live out my days on this wee island. And when my life is over, I shall lie in my coral tomb and hearken to the waves and the gulls and be at peace. (laughs) How happy we were, the three of us. It seemed we needed nothing more. No one else. But then, it was a particularly fine day, I remember. The the house was finished. We were were so proud of it. We were standing on the beach. Remember? You and I, Nick. Captain, that boat's aiming to anchor here. They've lowered a dinghy. There's a man in it. Oh, that's a fine ship. About 30 foot, I should say. Draws about six feet. Aye, nice and beamy. Uh, What do you say we walk down and welcome him? Find out what drew him here. Hello! Hello there! Hello! Well, he's one of us at least, not some crazy foreigner. Have I your permission, sir? Uh, You have better than that, sir. You have my welcome. My name is Kevin Murdoch. And I'm Captain Jack O'Shea. Welcome to Shea's Island, Mr. Murdoch. Thank you, sir. And this, this is Nicholas Higgins. Of course, of course. Well, (laughs) at last, Mr. Higgins. Uh, You've uh, met before, you two. Uh, One night in a bar, many months back, a year ago, it was this man told me about the island, Captain... He was taking his future into his own hands and coming to join you. Well, come up to the house, Mr. Murdoch. We'll give you some fine plum brandy, and you'll tell us... Well, I what... didn't come alone, Captain. My wife is on the boat, and my two children. And with your permission... Oh, I... oh fetch them, fetch them, fetch them. Uh, meanwhile, we go up to the house and tell Nellie we have guests. Nellie? You said Nellie? Yes, Nick's sister. She's my housekeeper, my, uh, my cook, my companion. Hmm? Now go. Fetch your family and bring them up to the house. You're very kind. They'll be most pleased. <laughs> a fine man, a fine man. And, uh, to think that you know him, Nick. Well, hardly that. We only met that one night. We talked to him. Yes, well, he doesn't seem your sort exactly. More a man of my class, if you, uh, get my meaning. Oh, yes, I do. I I get your meaning. Just what I've needed. And uh, never knew I needed. People of my own sort to converse with. Uh, Nick, I'm going to ask this man, Murdoch, to move in with us. What? Here? In this house? Why not? We've plenty of room. Yeah, but uh, if, if they stay... Oh, they'll stay. This island is going to bewitch them as it's bewitched me. They could live on the boat. Oh, no. I want them here. Uh, Another woman in the house. Company of the female sort for Nelly. And uh, children running about. Oh, it'll be wonderful. What are you talking about, Captain O'Shea? A a woman? Children here? With us? My guests, Nelly. And uh, treat them with every respect. As you do me. Certainly, Captain. Uh, Nelly. The man's name is Murdoch. What? You said... Kevin Murdoch. He's here with his wife. Yes, his wife and two children. (laughs) Oh, we'll be quite a household. Do you think it's 
wise captain, having them to live here. It'll be great fun, Nellie. Oh, we'll have such times. Uh, go and fetch brandy and biscuits, and let's make the Murdochs really feel at home. For, know it or not, this is their home. They never did move out, and we were happy together, all of us. Well, weren't we, Nick? For time, perhaps. Yes. Yes. Yes, we were happy. I insist upon it. I, I knew such pleasure, such happiness. I, I was near to bursting with it until... Yes, Captain? Until the dying began. And there is a theory, and it's only a theory, that each man holds two instincts. One is called Eros, after the god of love. The other is Thanatos, a personification of death. These two are thought to live side by side in every human soul. Sometimes the one is in the ascendancy, sometimes the other. But neither ever resigns or concedes the battle. I'll continue with Act Two shortly. If most of us push away the thought of death, our poets and philosophers dare to think about it and write about it. Here are lines written in the century past by the English poet Swinburne. From too much love of living, from hope and fear set free, we thank with brief thanksgiving whatever gods may be, that no life lives forever, that dead men rise up never, that even the weariest river winds somewhere safe to see. <laughs> such happiness, such joy. The house came alive. I could have conversation of an intelligent sort with Murdoch. Hmm? Uh, 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 no offense, men, Nick. None taken, Captain. And with Mrs. Murdoch planning the meals. And she rearranged the furniture. Uh, remember, remember that? I remember. Made draperies for the windows. Sailed the sloop to the mainland to get the material. Hmm? Uh, remember? I remember. And dyed them herself. The exact shade of the casuarina tree. Oh, she did hundreds of things to improve the house. She did indeed. This terrace was her idea, with a full view of the sea. Mm, it was indeed. Nick. Nick, it just suddenly occurred to me. Oh, what's that, Captain Jack? Did I let Mrs. Murdoch do too much to the house? Did I let her impose her own ideas on me? Well, they was good ideas. Yes, but Nellie's... Nellie'd been the only woman here up to the time the Murdochs arrived. She was happy to watch the house grow, cook the meals, tend to our wants, yours and mine. Wasn't she, Nick? Very happy. Well, now, to, to have a high-born lady move in here and start to change things around, did, did that grate on Nellie's nerves, perhaps? Did she resent another woman taking her place, as it were? Mm hmm Perhaps she did. At any rate, after a while she started to lose interest in the life here. You must have noticed it. I, I did. I talked to her about it, you know. You did? Oh, yes, I was very concerned. Because we'd been so happy. You've been happy here, haven't you, Nelly? Oh, yes, Captain. But now you're not. Yes, I am. Well, I never hear you laugh anymore. I, I hardly ever see you smile. After all, we've been to each other, Nelly, huh? After all we've accomplished together, how do you think that makes me feel? I'm sorry, Captain. Well, now I want you to tell me what I can do for you. There's nothing. Nellie, is it possible you want to go back there? Leave us and go back to that inferno you escaped from? Oh, no. No, Captain Jack. I'd never go back there. I didn't think so. But, but, no, I want to stay here. You're sure? To the end of my days, promise me. 
I can stay till I die, Captain. I want to die here on this island. Promise me that. I want to know. I want to be sure. Set your mind at rest, Nellie. You'll stay here on this island till... till you leave it. In life or in death. I want never to leave. Alive or dead. What... what do you mean, then? When I die... Oh, I know it's asking a great deal, but when I die... Will you bury me in the tomb beneath this house? Oh, I know you built it for yourself, but could you see your way? Would you... There's room there. There's plenty of room. If I could know that I would lie in that tomb through eternity... Does it mean so much to you? It means everything. Well, then you have my promise, Nellie. My solemn promise. You shall lie in the tomb beneath this house you helped to build. She seemed better after that little talk, Nick. She, she did, didn't she? Uh, livelier, more like her old self. Mm, for a time, she did. Yes, for a time. Till she sickened and took to her bed. Mm. And died. Yes. Well, but I kept my promise. Hmm? I said to you, build her a wooden coffin and put it in the tomb under the house. Which I did. Yes. I kept my promise to Nellie. She lies there now in the tomb I built for myself. And she'll lie there through eternity. I wonder if that was a wise thing to do. What else could I do? I, I gave her my word. My sacred promise. What else could I do but fulfill it? It was only a few weeks after that. The youngest Murdoch child took sick. Lived a few days. And died. Yes, I... I regret that I took so little note of it. I, I was sorry, of course, but but my condolence was uh, mechanical, perfunctory. Mm, I realize that now. But I was distraught over Nellie's passing. I, I hope they understood. They sailed the sloop to the mainland and bought a tiny coffin made of lead. They asked me if I might place it in the tomb. I said yes. I don't know why. I, I don't know that I even attended the interment. Did I? No, you did not. Mm, I should have. But when the second child died... Ah, uh, yes. When the second child was taken... We put the little body in another lead coffin. We was all there, Captain. You and I and the Murdochs. We'll place it next to the other, Kevin. Well, of course, my dear. That's be all right with you. Isn't it, Captain? What's that? My wife says we placed the coffin side by side with that of our other child. Of course. Wherever you like. Kevin? Where is it? What, my dear? The other coffin. Where is it? Why, it's right where we... It's not here. It's gone. Captain. Captain O'Shea. The other coffin is gone. It's been removed. Oh, surely not. It must be here. It's not. It's not here. Someone's stolen it. Nick, that's not possible, is it? That someone could have gotten into the tomb? Not remotely possible, Captain. Then where is it? Uh, with, with your permission, Miss Murdoch, I'll uh, look around. I remember perfectly. I couldn't possibly forget. It's here. Here. Where? Look over here, Miss Murdoch. Uh, thank the Lord you located it, Nick. What? Look at it. Kevin, look at it. It's standing on end. On the bare ground. That's not the way we left it. You know that, Nick. You were with us. We put it on that high shelf. And not standing on end like it is now. Oh, this is horrible. Oh, well, now, we'll, uh, we'll uh, put it back. Hmm? Just as it was. I'll put it back. I'll do it. You know, after that, I thought the Murdochs might leave. Desert us and leave the island. They didn't want to leave that children's burial spot, I suspect. We did go over the whole place, Nick. 
There was no indication of water seeping in. Mm, no sign of an underground quake. No sign of anything. Just just the two little leaden coffins. And, of course, Nellie. Nellie. In her wooden one. Yes. Nick. There is a boat out there. No, Captain. I can see it. I swear. I'm pouring you another brandy, Captain Jack. Or... Or do I imagine it? Here, here's your brandy, Captain. Or is it the ship of death? You'll feel better with a bit more brandy in you, Captain. Perhaps. I... I think, Nicholas, I think it was the island that held the Murdochs here. Well, you could be right. Hmm. In spite of the loss, dying. They had each other. And the island had them. Hmm. Maybe that was it. They didn't have each other for long. A few months. Mrs. Murdoch went so suddenly. Got up from the dinner table. Went upstairs. Said she felt a mite queasy. It, it couldn't have been more than ten minutes later. Yeah. She was dead. I'll never understand it, Nick. Never. Or what came after? In the tomb... Jose! Jose! It's happened again! What is it, Murdoch? What's happened? The coffins of the children. They've been moved. Impossible. I, I, I can't believe this. Look, look there. One on end, the other on its side. Eight feet apart. We put them side by side. You were there, you know we did. I swear to you, we went over the entire place. Take them out. Put them on the sloop. My children. My wife. I can't leave them here. Mr. Murdoch. It's not safe. Please, listen to me. I can fix everything. You said you had fixed everything. Leave the coffins of the children here, Mr. Murdoch. Leave your wife's here, too. In a few days, come back. And you'll find everything as it should be. Can I trust you? I believe you can, Mr. Murdoch. Trust him, Murdoch. Have I your permission, Captain? To do whatever I think necessary? Anything at all? Anything. Boom. Yes, Nick. It was worse than before. How? Uh, how was? Not only was the coffins of the children strewn about the place, but Mrs. Murdoch's was tilted to one side, leaning up against the back wall of the tomb. It was marked, scarred, and it was filthy. But, but what did you do, Nick? You promised Murdoch. I did as I promised. And three days later, when Murdoch visited the tomb, everything was in order. The little coffins side by side. Mrs. Murdoch's cleaned and set in place. But what did you do, Nick? Tell me now. The, the, the ship is coming in. I'll tell you, Captain Jack. Even if it makes you angry. Even if it makes you hate me. Even if you kill me. Who knows what happens when those we love start the long sleep called death? I don't know. And if you are honest, you will admit that you don't know either. But again, a poet tries to add his little lines of hope. Swinburne, whom we quoted before. Who knows, but on their sleep may rise such light as never heaven let through to lighten earth from paradise. I'll be back shortly with our final act.
Forgive me if I quote to you again from the writings of Algernon Charles Swinburne. He wrote these lines in 1878 in memory of his fellow poet Baudelaire, who had died the year before. There is no help for these things, none to mend and none to mar. Not all our songs, O oh friend, will make death clear. Nick, Nick, tell me now how you put things right in the tomb. Because whatever you did, Murdoch seemed satisfied. He told me so. He would visit the tomb every other day or so, and then he'd come to me and tell me everything was in order. Nothing disturbed. All the coffins in place. After a, after a while, he stopped going there. His, his mind was at rest about it. Or, or, or it seemed to be. Uh, I'm sure it was, Captain Jack. Then why did he leave the island? Why did he have to go? The house seems so empty now, just you and me. I think you know why he left, Captain Jack. No, I don't. I don't at all. Captain, you know what he wanted. He told you what he wanted. The title to the island? Is that what he wanted? <laughs> he, he and I talked about it one day. I said I'd gladly give him title, but strictly speaking, I didn't have title myself. But I was sure that after my death, You'd be free to stay on? No, it wasn't the island he wanted, Captain. Then what was it? Why didn't he tell me what he wanted? I'd have given it to him. He did tell you, Captain Jack. But it wasn't in your power to give it to him. He never told me. Oh, oh. When did he tell me? Remember the morning you and I was having coffee right here on the terrace? And he'd come out of the house looking very solemn, very grave... Unhappy, even. Good morning, Captain. Nick. Good morning, Murdoch. Sit down. Beautiful morning, isn't it? Beautiful. What are your plans for the day? Have you made any? Uh, no. Uh, I haven't. Such a splendid day. Huh? Shall we go fishing? We did that yesterday. Ah, yes. Uh, so we did. So we did. Uh, well, then, we could simply sail around the bay. Sail clear around the island. Uh, we can do that in a couple of hours or less. There's a fine breeze. Huh? What do you say? Not today, Captain Jack. Well, then, what did you have in mind? Anything special? Uh, yes. I do have something special in mind, as a matter of fact. Captain Jack, you know how I appreciate all the hospitality you've shown me. Oh, don't speak to me of hospitality. It's been a joy to have you here. Oh, I know there's been tragedy. Oh, awful tragedy. Your, your children, your, your wife. But but that could have happened anywhere, Murdoch. You know that. There's no blame attached to you for that, Captain. I, I, I well know how you must have grieved for them. It, it, it broke my heart to see you grieve. But, but I'd hoped that... Well, I'd really thought that all that grief was subsiding. Was I wrong? Not really wrong, Captain. Ah, well then, uh, everything's all right, isn't it? No, Captain. Well, well, why not? We have a fine life here, haven't we? The leisure, the easy living. Well, what is it you want, man? Well, what can I do for you to make you more content? Uh, we share equally in this island, do we not? If you think we don't, tell me where I failed and I'll correct it. Simply tell me. There is... Nothing you can do, Captain. But there must be. There, there, there must be. No. They're simply not the life for me, Captain Jack. Not the life for you? Three grown men on a little island. And what's wrong with that? It's a child's dream. <laughs> it's everyone's dream. Oh, no, Captain, it's not. Anyway, it's not mine. You... you you don't mean you, uh, you couldn't, you, you wouldn't leave, would you? Hmm? Leave the island? You, you wouldn't do that. You couldn't. I must, Captain. Oh, no. When, when we have everything here. No. Uh, Not everything, Captain. What am I to do? You'll be all right. No, no, I'll not be all right. I'll, I'll be, I'll be lonely. And if I stay, Captain Jack, I'll be lonely. A uh, loneliness I cannot bear. Now, now, what do you mean by that? I, I, I don't understand you at all. 
What do you mean by that? If you don't know, Captain... Well, I do not know. Dear, dear Captain O'Shea, you must simply take my word for it. I cannot stay with you on this island. I shall set sail tomorrow. What did he mean, Nick? He, you know, he never really told me. What did he mean he'd be lonely here? He uh, needed a woman, Captain. A woman? Why, well, he could have had a woman any time he wanted to. He only had to sail the sloop to the mainland to find a woman. Hundreds of them. Thousands. He, he, he could have had his pick. Not that sort of woman, Captain. Well, well what sort of? Oh, 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 oh. You mean he wanted a wife? Someone who loved him. That sort of woman. Oh, well. well I suppose that's different. Aye. Very different. Yeah. I suppose he wanted to get married again. I think so. Well, I can understand that. Yes. That's understandable. Yes, I think so. Uh, Nick, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. I, I hadn't uh, meant to, but now, uh, Nick, look, the ship is coming closer. Yes, it's sailing this way. You do see it, don't you? Perhaps I do. Yes, coming closer. Uh, Nick, I, I. Uh, I'm going to make a confession. Um, I... I married Nellie. You did? Yes. Yes, I did. I, I took the sloop one day, and we went to the mainland and found a priest, and he married us. <laughs> See? Uh, I understand that a man wants a wife, huh? someone who loves him. No, well, I thought that being... Married to me, that would mean Nellie could claim right to the island, you see. If, if anyone would have a claim to it, she would. Uh, you understand? I think so. Now, now, when I die, why, I suppose the island will be yours. As a brother, who has a better right to it, hmm? Uh, well, I couldn't leave it in better hands, Nick, and I want you to know that's how I feel about it. Uh, Nick, you will cherish it, won't you? You'll take care of it. You will, won't you, Nick? Won't you? Yes, Captain. Mm, but uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm wandering on again, aren't I? Uh, Nick, we started to talk about... Uh, what was it we started to talk about? It does matter, Captain. Uh, yes, it does matter. Um, ah, yes, the tomb. The, the tomb and what you did to set it to rights. You were going to tell me about that. Uh, I'll confess to you. I haven't been inside the tomb since Mrs. Murdoch was laid away. Her husband visited often, but I never did. I, I should have, I, I suppose. But, but I wanted to remember Nellie as I'd known her in life. I never went near her in the tomb. It's just as well. Perhaps, Nick, I, I was unfeeling. I, I... Nellie wasn't there. Yeah, of course, her spirit wasn't there, but... Neither was her body... What? What's that? I removed it. I removed her body from the tomb. What are you saying? It was the only way, Captain. You... You were telling me you took Nellie's body out of the tomb. You, Nick, you actually... I had to. But I promised her. I, I, I gave her my word of honor that she would lie in the tomb forever. Nick, I gave her my solemn vow. It was almost my last word to her. I know, and, but you... And she was my wife, Nick. You, 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 you couldn't have known that, of course, but if you had come to me, if you had asked me... You'd never have permitted it, Captain Jack. Uh, of course I wouldn't have permitted it. Why did you do it? It was my plan to be buried next to her. Nick, why did you ever do it? You gave me permission to do anything necessary to settle the disturbance in the tomb. The scattering of the coffins. You said I could do anything I saw fit. But not that. Not, not that. You said anything at all. But why that? Why did you do that of all things? 
Because it was Nellie who was wreaking the havoc. From her coffin? Within the tomb? Yes. But why? Why would she do that? You sure you want me to tell you? Uh, of course I'm sure. Tell me. She loved Kevin Murdoch, Captain. What? She loved Murdoch. She loved him for a long time. Remember I told you that I brought her here to recover from an infatuation back there? Murdoch? Yes. But he was married, had children. He broke her heart. I thought that here, with us, she might recover. And she was well on the way when he sailed here with his family and took up residence. I tried to warn you. Are you telling me he followed her here? Yes, Captain. He loved her so much. After his own way, he loved her, yes. And she? She loved him? Loved him still? Yes, Captain. And when his children were put into the tomb with her, her fury that she'd held in check for so long, her fury burst forth. When I saw her poor wooden coffin starting to disintegrate, I began to have some fears. And when the coffin of Mrs. Murdoch, her rival, her hated rival, was placed in the tomb, she took her revenge. Ah... I'm sorry. What did you do with her? I took her out, Captain. Coffin and all. Or what remained of it. And I burned it. Then I put what remained in the dinghy. And I rowed out a good way into the sea. And dropped them over. Uh, what, what... What is it, Captain? What are you doing? Uh, wait, 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 Captain Jack. Don't follow me, Nick. You're not going in the water, are you, Captain? Take one step towards me, Nick, and I'll shoot you down. Uh, Captain, it's getting dark. Nelly! Nelly! Captain! Don't! I'm coming, Nelly! Rest easy, Nelly! Did Nick try to rescue his friend? If he did, was he successful? Did he bring him back? For darkness was falling over the sea, over the island. Or did he simply stand on the shore and watch his friend go to meet the death he sought? To meet the ghostly ship he had seen coming to fetch him? I'll be back shortly. depressed you with our story of death and dying? I sincerely hope not. These days we speak more freely about the stark and undeniable fact of death in hopes, I suppose, of fearing it less and accepting it more equably. Shakespeare told us centuries ago that death, unnecessary end, will come when it will come. There's really little more than that to be said on the subject. Our cast included Fred Gwynn, Robert Dryden, and Terry Keene. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
Weekends were Weekends were Weekends were Weekends were CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents Marshall. Art is the accomplice of love, we are told. Therefore, it should follow that the art of love is the highest art of all. But is love an art? Is it something to be developed, nurtured, practiced? Or is love something that just comes naturally? Obviously, there are two sides to that question, which is why we have a story. Uh, Mr. Crawford, this painter Kurt Strelitz, have you ever heard of him? No. But the paintings you bought are worthless. You threw away $250,000. Yeah, I know. Uh, it doesn't make any difference how much money I lose or throw away. At the end of the year, I always wind up with more than I started. <laughs> Our mystery drama, The Spaces on the Wall, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Kevin McCarthy. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Consider something. Your little daughter, age six, daubs a few colored lines, blobs, circles on a piece of paper. But nobody says, hey, let's declare a national holiday. Then you happen to pass by an art gallery, and there in the window, spectacularly framed and dramatically lighted, is what's purported to be a most fantastic masterpiece. The price tag is $150,000. You're no expert, but why is it any better than your daughter's? The art world, my friends, is a weird world indeed. We're invited to a cocktail party being given by a very rich art collector. We weren't exactly invited, but neither were at least half the people here. We might as well crash. Just as they did. Hello, Hal. Ursula, we cannot waste so much as a single moment. Come with me at once. This way. Where are you taking me? Ah, into the Sanctum Sanctorum. Will you see? See what? Ah. Oh, don't tell me you're up to one of your old tricks. Oh, now. Isn't this an anniversary? Now, Ursula, whatever are you talking about? Of course it is. It was just last year at this time that you bought the Mona Lisa. Uh, <clears throat> that was a youthful indiscretion. <laughs> last year you were hardly a youth. As I recall, this person convinced you that he'd been able to make the switch one night in the Louvre. A cleverly made fake had been hung in her place, and you could have da Vinci's very own original. No. <laughs> oh, Hal, how could you have been so, so... So immoral. Stupid. Yes. Certain people have no business being rich. <laughs> When I get an impulse to do something wrong, I, I have the means to gratify it. Whereas if I were poor, oh, well, at least I'm not frustrated. That in itself is healthy. Anyhow, I had this irresistible urge to own the Mona Lisa. I understand. Do you really? There are many eccentric people like you who will buy or steal a famous artwork if they can and lock it away somewhere in a secret place where only they can enjoy it. But I only felt that way about the Mona Lisa. <laughs> to have the eyes, the unfathomable eyes of that most beautiful and mysterious of women looking at me 
and no one else but me. Mm. And what indiscretion have you committed this time? Ursula, as my advisor, my guide in all manner of things artistic, Mm -hmm. I... I, uh... The problem is, you generally consult me after the fact. At which time it becomes my sorrowful duty to inform you that what you purchased is not a Da Vinci, a Rembrandt. Oh, wait till you see this. All right, follow me. Mm-hmm. Now, before I turn on the lights, I must swear you to secrecy. Mm, I was afraid of something like this. A condition of the purchase was that it would not be made public for five years. If the deal was legitimate and above board, you have my word. Then, uh, voila. There should be light. See? It's impossible. Ursula, my dear, hanging on the wall are four genuine... I know what they are. Strelitzes. Well, then you should also know that these are the only four in existence. Where did you get these paintings? I bought them. From whom? The owner. Impossible. Why? Because the owner is Karl Mueller, Karl Christian Mueller. Uh, My dear, the owner was Karl Christian Mueller. But Karl would never... Why, he he promised. He gave me his word. If he were ever to sell the Strelitzes, he would sell them to me. And you believed him? Carl Mueller is a gentleman of the old school. Uh, my dear, the school seems to be out. These can't be Strelitzes. They can't be genuine Strelitzes. Oh, I invite you to examine them closely. In your heart, you know already. You bought these from Mueller? Of course. Mueller personally sold you these four paintings? No, the the deal was consummated through an agent. Who was the agent? Well, does it matter? I have the bill of sale signed by Mueller himself. I have never known Carl Mueller to break his word. Well, as a first time for everything. Oh, I suppose you're right, Hal. I suppose you're right. But, Ursula, my dear, what you say is just not so. Carl, I saw the paintings with my own eyes. The relatives? Yes, all four of them. You sold them. You broke your promise. I'm sure it must have been a most fantastic offer. But you might have had the courtesy... Oh, Ursula, I am sitting in my study... I forgive you, Carl. I know things haven't As been going too well. I was saying, I am sitting here in my study with a glass of an excellent local white wine and enjoying my paintings, especially my four strelitzes. What four strelitzes? My four strelitzes, the only ones in the entire world. But you sold them. <laughs> Are you saying that you did not sell the strelitz? The spread of life in my body. I don't know why you come to me, Mrs. Derringer. I don't know the first thing about art. I don't even know what I like. I've been told you're an excellent private eye, Mr. Westerly. Private investigator. Excuse me. I resent being called a dick, a flat foot, a gumshoe. I, uh... I would like you to find the thief or thieves who victimized my friend. Who is your friend? Is it necessary for me to bring him into it? Well, he's in it now. My friend is a very wealthy man. His money is all inherited, of course. A few years ago, he decided to become an art collector. However, he faced a problem. What was that? Just about all the great art had already been collected. Well, still, I imagine for money, just about anything could be Not bought. only has most of it been spoken for, but it already belongs to museums, institutes, and the like. 
Aren't there any great painters today? Probably. Probably? What kind of answer is that? An honest answer. There are painters who are all the rage, but how do we know they're not just a fad? Mm. You need time to authenticate an artist's true values. All right, all right. Now, anyhow, your friend bought these four fakes. For how much? A quarter of a million dollars. That's about 61000 apiece. Cheap enough if they had been genuine. Mm. Who was the artist supposed to be? A German painter of the late 20s named Kurt Strelitz. He's still alive? No. He's dead. When did he die? Where and how? It isn't known where he died exactly, or when, or how. Well, then, how do we know he's dead? When the Nazis came to power, thousands of people just disappeared. Uh, The police would knock on your door and drag you off to prison. And that's what happened to this Kurt Strelitz? Yes. When had he been taken away? In the late spring of 1939, just before the war. Now, how old was he? He was about 25. And he was already famous? He was established, yes. Mm -hmm. And these four paintings are all he ever did. They're the only ones that survived. The Nazis destroyed all his other work. Mm. And you say that the four that were bought by your client are fakes. Why? Is it that obvious? Oh, no. Actually, they're excellent. But you as a connoisseur, you can tell. Is that it? Well, the fact is, the owner of the paintings, a Mr. Carl Christian Muller, promised that he would sell them to no one but me. Well, you know, men have been known to break promises. Mm, Not Carl Mueller, and certainly never to me. Why not? He's a man of irreproachable ethics. Besides, when he was in trouble himself with the Nazis, it was my father who made it possible for Mueller to come to America. I see. The Strelitzes are still in Mueller's possession. And so, naturally, the ones my client purchased must be fakes. You know that Mueller still has the originals? I spoke to him. You mean you went to his home or wherever? No, no, uh... no. He's become a recluse. Doesn't see anyone. Uh Uh-huh. Where is he? (laughs) You ask a great many questions. Well, that's what you're paying me to do. But it does seem to me that so many of them are um, irrelevant. And then you spoke to this Mr. Muller on the telephone? Yes. And he told you that he hadn't sold the paintings, that they were still in his possession. And therefore, you assumed that the ones that your client had purchased had to be fakes. What other conclusion could there possibly be? But how do you know that you were speaking to Muller? How do I know? I've known him since he came to this country. I've known him practically all my life. But someone could have imitated his voice. Isn't that possible? No. Not well enough to fool me. And even if it could be done, there would still be Erica. Mm, Who's Erica? His daughter. She keeps house for him. And she was there, too? Of course. Carl couldn't possibly live alone. And you spoke with Erica also? Naturally. She answered the phone. I I wish I knew what you were getting at. Mrs. Derringer, in certain wild desert countries, if your wife is sick, you call a doctor. However, he's not permitted to touch her. He isn't even allowed to look at her. He stays behind a curtain or a screen and tells you what to look for and how to examine her. What does this have to do with... Well, I feel just like such a doctor in this case. I'm being kept from your client. I'm being kept from anyone who might have personal knowledge of these paintings. But from a detective's point of view, it's a relatively clear-cut situation. Treat it as you would any other type of forgery or counterfeiting or or confidence game. That's exactly what I'm doing. And I already have four prime suspects. Four? Certainly. The first is your client, whoever he is. The second is this Mr. Carl Christian Muller. The third is his daughter, Erica. The fourth is you. Me? That's right. You. And there's a fifth. The artist himself. Kurt Strelitz. But he's dead. How do you know? Have you seen the body? A death certificate? No, no, my dear Mrs. Derringer. You, too, are like some poor doctor in one of these wild, desolate, primitive desert countries. All your information is gathered secondhand. So she has called in a private investigator, Tom Westerly. Mr. Westerly seems to have a technique, 
a modus operandi that's very interesting. Quite simply, he appears to suspect everybody, even his own client. A great many wheels seem to be turning within wheels here. But we'll see where they all go in the second act. that in some indefinable way a work of art will resemble the artist. Not in the external aspect so much, but in the sort of inner glow that illuminates the painting and imparts an essence of life itself. Perhaps. And even if a work of art is a forgery, it still was created by an artist. Therefore, it should resemble him, whoever he is. Shouldn't it? Are you actually implying, Mr. Westerly, that Mr. Mueller, his daughter, Erica, I, myself, and even poor Kurt Strelitz, who has been dead for at least 40 years, are somehow part of a plot to defraud my, uh, my client? I can only go with what I've got. But this is a, a most outrageous accusation. Mrs. Derringer. Do you actually want to apprehend whoever it was that sold the fake pictures to your clients? Certainly. What other reason have I for engaging your services? Just window dressing, perhaps. What are you getting at? Well, you're Mrs. Ursula Derringer. You're an art critic and historian. You're 44 years old, divorced. How do you know all this? When you called me yesterday to set up this appointment, I decided to find out about you. Of all the gold. Why? I'm sure you checked on me. From what you've told me about your alleged client, I would infer that you've got a good thing going now. I perform a valuable service. I didn't say no. At any rate, he seems to have been stunned. So, to make him feel better, you told him that you were going to employ a private detective. But he said he didn't want anyone to know he'd been victimized. So, you said you'd keep his name out of it. Who told you all this? It's obvious. A man is defrauded out of a quarter of a million dollars? Why doesn't he go to the police? He tries to show me he can make a shrewd deal himself now and then. But it almost always ends badly. Well, you and I both know that on the basis of what you've told me, I'm not going to get anywhere. That isn't so. And since he's obviously very rich and very spoiled, he has a short attention span. He'll forget all about it soon enough. That's the charitable interpretation. Charitable? Mm -hmm. Because it assumes you are innocent of any wrongdoing. How do I know that you, Muller, and his daughter didn't rig this kind of a swindle among yourselves? That's the second time you've made this monstrous accusation. Miss Derringer, you're less than candid when you refuse to give me the information I asked for. And then you forced me to rely upon my imagination. But I have so very little to tell you. You can tell me the name of your client. You can also set up a meeting. I would like to talk with him alone. I can tell you now. He isn't going to like it. I distinctly told Ursula I didn't want any publicity. Well, assuming that we apprehend the criminal, Mr. Crawford... The story will have to come out. Well, in that case, it, 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 it won't be so bad. You see, I have this problem. Which one? With my image. Everyone believes that I'm spoiled and stupid. And that isn't true. Oh, it's true enough. But I'm trying to change it. You read the papers and see where I'm always being taken by this one or that one. But I've decided no more. This last thing with the Strelitzes, that was the straw which broke the camel's back, you might say. Well, I can see why you dread another spread in the papers. Why don't you just forget about it? If the media found out about it now, the headlines would read, Gullible Holsey Crawford duped again. However, if you can apprehend the thief, that would be something else. Why? Well, it would sort of demonstrate that you can no longer pull a fast one on Halsey Crawford and get away with it. In other words, what I want you to do is to keep the investigation secret unless, of course, 
it happens to be successful. Well, if I start moving around and asking questions, the word will have to come out. We'll simply have to be discreet. Mm -hmm. This painter, Kurt Strelitz, why did you want to buy his work in the first place? Ursula, Mrs. Derringer, told me all about him. Had you heard of him before that? No, I don't think so. You paid a quarter of a million dollars for the works of a man you knew nothing about? Well, you put that much money and more, perhaps, into securities you don't know anything about either. You go by the recommendations of your financial advisor, don't you? I wouldn't know anything about that. Oh. Well, in the same way, Mrs. Derringer is my artistic advisor. But she didn't advise you to buy the Strelitzes. No, she kept insisting they weren't for sale. Well, then why did she even bother to tell you about them? Because it was going to be part of my education. Kurt Strelitz was an important modern German painter. And the fact that you were approached by someone to buy the paintings by Strelitz could be a coincidence. Well, I'm sure of it. What would Ursula have to do with it? The truth is that I've been a natural target for hustlers and confidence operators. All right, all right. You were approached. How? I received a telephone call. From whom? A woman. She said her name was... Well, it... Smith. Helen Smith. And since I was known as a man who was interested in buying art, she had four valuable works. The Strelitzes. Yes. She said that the present owner, Mr. Muller, was interested in selling them. Well, that statement sounded half true and half false. Why? Well, I knew that a Carl Muller did own the Strelitzes. But I also knew that he'd promised them to Ursula. Shouldn't that have alerted you to something suspicious? But the woman said that that was no longer true. Mr. Muller needed the money... He was now embarrassed by the promise he'd made a long time ago, which was why a condition of the sale stated that I was to keep the purchase secret for five years. By that time, Muller would surely be dead. So you agreed to buy them? Yes. And you went up to Massachusetts to see Muller and make the deal? No. I, I was told Muller is a recluse who refuses to see anyone. Even his oldest and best friends. But you were ready to pay a quarter of a million dollars to him. Well, it, it didn't matter. He wouldn't see me. How did you arrange it then? Well, we... We met halfway, this woman and myself, in a motel on Route 7 in Connecticut. She was waiting in the room. The paintings were on display. And you went there prepared to pay all that money without bringing someone along who had some expertise. Well, I couldn't very well bring Ursula, could I? Besides, I, I just looked at those paintings and I, I knew they were real. Ah, it's a good thing you have the money to go along with your uh, silliness and naivete. Well, that's true. I, I don't suppose I really hurt anyone but myself. And I don't even hurt myself. No matter how much money I lose or throw away, at the end of the year, my accountants tell me my fortune just keeps getting bigger. And uh, now, describe this woman. Well, she had flaming red hair. But it, it could have been a wig. Probably was. She was about... Five feet five or so. She was heavily made up. Could you recognize her again? If her hair color were to be different or if she wore a different wig and she had no makeup, I don't know if I would be able to. How did you know that you weren't buying stolen goods? She had a bill of sale for me and it was signed by Miss Mueller. But how could you be sure that that wasn't a forgery? Yes, I know. You're discussing all those routine take-it-for-granted rules on how to do business, but I saw the paintings, and I said, I have to have them. I, I simply have to have them. How'd you pay for them? Cash. And then what? We, we went our separate ways. May I have the bill of sale? All right. 
And uh, the motel room, the motel room that she was waiting for you in, does that mean that she engaged the room? Well, I suppose so. What was the name of the motel? Uh, which was more like those old-fashioned tourist cabins. It, it had a name like, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the, uh, uh, Cozy Best. Cozy Best, that's it. All right, all right. I'll see what I can do with all this. I know what I did sounds well... Well, we've been through all that. When I went there with the money, I, I wasn't really sure I'd go through with it, but I looked at those paintings. The, there was something in them. I can't describe it. Well, by the way, why did you violate this agreement? You were supposed to keep it secret for five years. Had you done that, at least you'd still believe that they were genuine stultures. You'd be happy with your secret. Yes, I know, but... But I suppose you can't really be happy with keeping a secret unless other people are in on it. Where's the fun? I simply had to see Ursula's face when she saw the Strelitzes. She's a very fine lady in every way, but she knows so much. I just had to get the better of her once. Better luck next time. What's your first move? I'm going to try and find your mystery lady. Will that be too difficult? It'll either be ridiculously simple or absolutely impossible. Good afternoon. You're looking for a room? Fred, I can't accommodate you. Won't have a thing till a week from Monday. No, my name's Westerly, Thomas J. Westerly. What can I do for you, Mr. I'm Westerly? I'm a private investigator. Here's my card. Oh, guess someone's been uh, misbehaving, huh? This would be a week ago, last Tuesday. A woman, medium height, very red hair, checked in here. Would you remember her? No, well, we get lots of red-haired women. Seems to be a popular color. This one checked in alone. Uh -huh. A waiter. That's what we call them. Man or a woman comes in by themselves. It means they're waiting for their friends to show up. Well, I'd like to know about this one. I'd like to help you, Mr. Westerly. I look like a fine, upstanding gentleman. However, I don't know if I can see my way clear. Why not? Well, is this going to be used for divorce action? Absolutely not. You see, lots of folks uh, stop by here ain't married. Uh, that's where my business is today. No, I understand your position. I'm not just selling folks a room. I'm also selling them some discretion. See what I mean? You will not be compromised in the slightest. I remember the redhead. I seen her come in from the road. She's been driving down from the north. Checks in as um, Miss Barnes. Barnes? No, why not? It's more original than Smith. I says to her, you got cabin seven. She registered? Mm-hmm. Let me turn back these pages here. Yeah. There's a date, and here she is. Miss Helen Barnes, 1187 Constitution Parkway, Boston, Mass. I bet you look it up, there ain't no such address. Most likely. You notice here where it says car registration, make mm -hmm. model license, print and so forth? Well, it's blank. Now, they're supposed to fill it in, but they somehow managed to forget. She didn't fill it in either. No, I don't fuss at them for it. I understand they want to leave as little compromising information here as possible, so I just quietly take a look for myself. And... Make a note of it on a separate sheet. And this is hers, huh? Mm -hmm. This is hers, this Massachusetts tag number? Now, this is just between you and I. Oh, I understand, I understand. And I can always deny you got it from me. Thank you. Sergeant, uh, this is Tom Westerly. I need your help. Thanks. I have to check out a license tag. Do you think we'll be surprised by any of the information we get? I'm sure it isn't too difficult to guess who the red-haired woman was. Or is it? It's all falling into place so quickly, so neatly, so easily. Well, 
This is the time to start questioning basic premises while we are waiting for Act 3. The ancient Sanskrit Upanishads tell us, among other things, that the immortal gods love the obscure and despise the obvious. The only problem here lies in the fact that we can never be sure which is which. Sometimes that which is seemingly obvious is really complex beyond all understanding, and that which is apparently obscure is really crystal clear when we see it in a certain light. Yes, Sergeant. What is that name and address again? The car with that license tag belongs to Miss Erica Muller, Lionsville, Mass. Thank you, Sergeant. Thank you very much. <laughs> Miss Erica Muller, did you enjoy the movie? Who are you? What are you doing in my car? My name is Tom Westerly. I'm going to call for the police. Why? I warn you. The sheriff is parked in front of the theater. He'll hear me scream. Well, it's possible I'm making a mistake. I'm sure you are. Now you just get out of my... Perhaps car. your name isn't Erica Muller. Could it be Helen Barnes? What did you say? Oh, but you couldn't be Helen Barnes. Two reasons. A, Helen was a redhead, isn't that so? And B, there is no such person as Helen Barnes. Therefore, you have to be Erica Muller. What do you want? Who, who are you? A private detective. And what are you thinking right now? It should be obvious. You worked out a little scheme to raise some money. You had some fakes made of this fellow's paintings. You knew about Hal Crawford, how he could be sold a bill of goods. As a matter of fact, you're quite friendly with Ursula Derringer. She may even have told you about him. That's what you're thinking? No, there's more. You even forced your father's name. On a bill of sale. That's not true. Hmm. Technically, I guess not. You probably handle all your father's accounts, constantly pushing all sorts of papers at him for his signature. He never could be bothered with details. I verified his signature at the local bank. It's genuine. What are you going to do? I'm going to claim the original paintings. You made a mistake. You should have forged it. This way, I have his signature on a bill of sale. And so... Armed with this document, I'm going to claim my client's property. No, please. Please what? It was the most amateurish, the flimsiest scheme I've ever encountered in a lifetime of chasing down crooks. I, I'm not a crook. Well, you're certainly not a very good one. How could you ever expect to get away with something as, as rickety as this? Can I ask you to do something? Probably not. But just, just for a little while. Reserve judgment. Reserve judgment? No, I've already made it. No, please, just listen to me and go to see my father. Your father? Well, I've been told that he's a recluse. He refuses to have any visitors. But he'll make an exception in your case. Why? Leave it to me. But promise. Say nothing. Think nothing. Decide nothing until you have heard everything. <laughs> father is sitting in his study. He won't get up to say hello. His back bothers him. He's a very old man. Now just let him talk. Come. Uh, father? Erica, uh, my dearest, did you enjoy the motion picture? Oh, yes. Uh, father, may I present Mr. Tom Westerly? You see, my car broke down and he was kind enough to rescue me. Oh, Welcome, Mr. Westerly. Uh, pour the gentleman a glass of wine, Erica. Of course. Mr. Westerly is very much interested in art, Father. Oh, splendid. I have a treat for you, then, Mr. Westerly. Uh, have you ever heard of Kurt Strelitz? Oh, I believe so. Oh, cut down in his prime by... No, all right, Father, please, you must not get yourself excited. Forty years ago, so much time gone by, I have the only four strelitzes left in the world. They're hanging in the next room. You'll want to see them, I know. Yes. Kurt Strelitz. We were boys together, schoolmates. 
We both wanted to become artists. Oh, but he had the talent. And he died for it. His genius killed him. Ask me how. All right. He lived in the wrong place at the wrong time. You see, his genius made him paint the truth. Those who danger stays for truth. Fatal days for men of genius who had no choice but to speak and write and paint what they felt. Yeah, I spoke to him. Oh, well, I remember speaking to him. It was 40 years ago. Why do I see it so clearly? Still see him and hear him as if he is here in this very room with me. Carl, I thought you'd never get here. See, the last canvas, the final one of the four, is finished. Kurt, just in time for the show next week. There isn't going to be a show next week. Well, that's impossible. We've made all the arrangements. Our license has been revoked. What license? A license we need to hold a public exhibition. Your paintings have been proscribed. All of your work that is in my gallery. It's gone. You mean... You mean you sold everything? It was all confiscated by the police. What are you saying? They marched in. The lieutenant gave a salute, produced the order, which said words to the effect that these decadent, degenerate canvases were a disgrace to the fatherland and would be removed at once before they would further pollute the true German art. What are they going to do with my painting? You know what they're going to do. They'll have a big bonfire one night this week and... No! I'm sorry, Kurt. We have to stop them. Stop them? How? Those paintings that... They're my work. All the work of my lifetime. All I have left are, ju are just these four. Now we'll have to hide them. Paintings were not made to be hidden. Then we'd better hide you. I won't run away. Oh, you must. Maybe we can get you to France somehow. No, I'll stay here and fight. Fight with what? Oh, we have to face facts, Kurt. It would help if we knew what the facts were. You have to save these remaining paintings. Let me hide them. That's the same as killing them. No, if... If they have to die, let them die in a fire. Let them be destroyed by the enemies, not smothered to death by their friends. Where are you going? I'm going to find out where my paintings are. Kurt, come back here. I never saw him again, Mr. Westerly. Where are you going? To the police station to demand the restoration of his property. I betrayed him. You betrayed him? How? What did you do? I did nothing. Oh. At least I saved the last four. The best he ever did. Do you agree, Erica? Yes, Father. Oh, poor Erica. She was only a child. She doesn't remember. And now... He has arrived. Kurt Strelitz has finally arrived. And how do I know? Because they're actually making forgeries of his work. That proves he is somebody, doesn't it? I would think so. <laughs> A very dear friend of mine, a lady named Ursula Derringer, actually told me that a friend of hers had been fooled into buying fake Strelitzes. <laughs> the last Four. <laughs> While each can stand alone, together, they form a grand design. Brotherhood, charity, wisdom, love. Ah, come, come, you must see them. Let me help you, Father. Yeah, uh, no, that's perfectly all right, child. I can... Oh, Father! Uh, here, let me give you a hand. Are you all right, Father? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, I think you heard position to my chair. Just a slightly different angle, and so I, I tripped over my own feet. It's 
The first time something like this has happened in years, isn't it, Erica? Yes, Father. Yeah. Well, Mr. Westerly, you have found me out. You see, I'm... I'm blind. Usually I can manage to hide it. I have every root in this house reduced to science. But there's an occasional accident... Oh, you know, you don't have to guide me, Erica. I, I know my way in. Uh, won't you follow me, please? He's blind? Yes. Well, then, how can he... How can please, he... please, don't say anything. Uh, turn on the full lights, Erica. Ah, now, Mr. Westerly, look at my four magnificent paintings... I managed to get them out of Germany and safely to America. How could poor Ursula Dallinger ever think that I would sell them? Oh, she will have them after I die. That will be my gift to her. But while I live, I come in here every day. Please, don't say anything, Mr. Westerly. And lightly, ever so lightly, I run my hand over the canvas. I feel the texture. It's as if I'm speaking to Kurt Sterlitz. You, um, you promised Mr. Westerly a glass of wine, Father. Oh, of course. Why don't you and Mr. Westerly go into my study and have some? I, I, I just want to stand here for a minute or two. Yeah, I... I feel very close to Kurt Sterlitz tonight. Yes, Father. Mr. Westerly? Yes. What are you going to do, Mr. Westerly? I don't know. All of my life, I worked and I lived for my father. Yes, I'm sorry. No, no, don't be. It was a choice I made freely. But he's ill. The doctors say he can't live much longer. Then, I'll be alone. I'll still have a considerable span of years before me. But I'll be alone. Well, we went through all of our money. I always felt I would have the strelitzes to see me through after he passed on. But then, last week, he said, Dear... Because of all the wonderful things her family has done for me, I would like her to have the strelitzes after I die. Then what did he think would become of you? He doesn't really think in those terms. He sees himself and me as people who serve others. Since I always thought to his needs, he assumes that someone will see to mine. And that's when you decided to sell the strelitzes? Yes. I have to have something. Something to show for my life. Oh, I understand. And he doesn't know the difference. He doesn't know that what is hanging in that room is a fake. What are you going to do? Well, I'll be darned if I know. After all, what crime has been committed? My client was told he was buying genuine strelitzes, and that's what he got. He has a bill of sale to prove it. Of course, Mrs. Derringer's feelings will be hurt. She hired me because it was believed a fraud had been perpetrated upon Mr. Halsey Crawford. But he received the merchandise as stated. He has. So there's really nothing left for me to do here. I want to thank you, Mr. Westerly. Erica, dear, have you poured a glass for me? Yes, Father. Here you are. Thank you. You know, Mr. Westerly, a work of art... Is a living thing. And my four strelitzes, never have I ever felt them to be more alive than they are at this moment. Brotherhood, charity, wisdom, love. Shall we drink to them, Mr. Westerly? Always, Mr. Muller. Always. Why not? 
From time to time, in the whirlpool of our frenetic existence, one or more of those four seem to fall out of fashion for a while. Indeed, it happens so often, and with so many people, you'd actually think that things can be replaced with something better. Don't even think about it. There is nothing better. I'll be back shortly. This is WJAX AM in Jacksonville, Florida. We now conclude our broadcast day. WJAX is owned and operated by the city of Jacksonville with studios and offices at 225 West Coastline Drive in downtown Jacksonville. WJAX AM operates on an assigned frequency of 930 kilohertz with a power of 5,000 watts as authorized by the Federal Communications Commission in Washington, D.C. WJAX is in Washington, D.C. WJAX is in in Washington, D.C. WJAX is 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 in Washington. G. Marshall. Love, said a lady named Madame de Stahl, is the whole history of a woman's life. But it's only an episode in the life of a man. Of course, she said it almost 200 years ago, and women are supposed to have changed since then. But as another French philosopher said, the more things change, the more they remain the same. We've got the evidence, Mrs. Davis. I don't care. I'm innocent. Who is your accomplice? I don't have any. I didn't do anything. Who was with you? Don't hammer at me. I've had enough. You haven't had anything yet, Mrs. Davis. You're on your way to jail. What do you want? Information. I don't have any. Okay. Sit in jail for the rest of your life. <laughs> Our mystery drama, The Giuseppe Verdi Autobus, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Tammy Grimes. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Travel used to be the privilege of the very wealthy. If you were poor, you stayed put. If you were rich, the in thing historical centers of Europe where hopefully they might absorb a bit of culture. This was known as the Grand Tour. Today, as befits these democratic times, it appears that everybody seems to be going somewhere. An endless number of travel agencies put together Grand Tours to allow ordinary everyday folk to savor the glory that was Greece and the grandeur that was Rome. At the height of the season, they say, there are more Americans in Italy than Italians. Amici! Friends, dear friends, all good members of the green bus. Il autobus verde, verde, green, like Giuseppe Verdi, green. You are now on your own for the lunch. And if you wish to shop, you walk that way five blocks to the Ponte Vecchio. And please, you must all be here again by two o'clock. Is that so, Mrs. Davis? Uh, uh, where is the Signora Davis? The bellissima Signora Davis. I'm here. Ah, please, please do not keep us waiting. I won't. I promise I won't. Because we must be prompt. When we reassemble, we shall go to see the Michelangelo's David. So, remember, amici... Eat a light lunch. One cannot appreciate great art on a full stomach. I see he's picking on you again. Gildo? Oh, I love him. He's such a lamb. <laughs> We're lucky to have such a fine tour guide, aren't we? And he just knows everything. I was wondering, Mrs. Davis, uh, do you have any plans for lunch? What did you have in mind? Oh, I don't know. I just don't care to eat alone. Won't you join me? That's hardly a flattering invitation. 
Oh. However, I don't like eating alone either. I didn't realize how that must have sounded. It's just that I, I'm somewhat out of practice. The truth is, so am I. Well, shall we? Certainly. Oh, my goodness. What is it? Look at that smile on Mrs. Morrison's face. Which one is she? Oh, oh, yes. She's been waiting for this ever since we arrived in Italy. Waiting for what? For you to take my arm, Mr. Wilson. Oh? You and I are the only singles on the tour. Ah. Uh-huh. Everybody's been trying so hard to get us together. What is there about married couples? They're such confirmed matchmakers. Perhaps they want everyone to share the happiness of married life. Or the agony. Do you speak from experience? I, uh... I'm afraid so, Mrs. Davis. Uh, Mrs. Davis, is there a Mr. Davis? There was. He died. Oh, I'm sorry. He was a wonderful man. But it's been five years now. And finally, I've decided to come out of mourning. All that time, everyone's been saying to me, life goes on. And now I realize it does. It should. It must. I see. Your marriage was happy. And yours? Well, she and I... We married too soon, and we stayed with it too long. It embittered both of us. Now, I suppose, like you, in a sense, I'm coming out of mourning, too. Shall we go to lunch, Mrs. Davis? Why don't you call me Norma? I will. If you call me Charlie. How about lunch? Why don't we go into some little shop and buy a loaf of bread? Oh, uh, you mean pane and some cheese. You mean fromage yeah. and a bottle of wine. You mean vino <laughs> and stroll leisurely through Florence. <laughs> you mean Firenze. Green boss, yellow to boss Giuseppe Verdi. Everyone here. Ah, Signora Davis. So prompt, you are here the first one. You and Mr. Wilson. You did no shopping, I see, Mrs. Davis. You can really get the same bargains at home. I didn't come all the way to Italy just to shop. Of course not. I'm sure you found far more interesting things to do. You and Mr. Wilson. Mrs. Davis. Uh, one moment. Gildo, I won't be late. I'm just going up to my room for a sweater. No, no I, I only wish to say uh, I have a letter for you. Oh, thank you. It's from my sister. Only good news, I hope. I don't have to read it. I know exactly what's in it. Is that true? How? I can read Marty like a book. She's so nervous and excited. I can tell by the way she writes the address. Why is she uh, nervous and excited? She's scared stiff about my making this trip. She's nervous and excited because she's afraid I'll meet a fortune hunter who steal all my money. And have you met someone? I, uh, I may have, Gildo. I may have. Hello? Norma, are you ready? Oh, Charlie, of course. I'm just finishing this letter to my sister. Are we late? No, 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 no. Of course not. Plenty of time. Don't rush. I'll be down in five minutes. He's taking me to the opera tonight, Monty. Just think, La Scala. Oh, he's so wonderful. Kind, sympathetic, and so handsome. Tall, slender, so distinguished looking. What more could I want in a man? You don't mind taking the time? Of course not. I have such a large family. I think that's wonderful. I miss that. There's just my sister, Marty, and me. Well, Marty and her husband, Paul. Do they have children? No. And I didn't either. You mean there are no aunts, uncles, cousins? No one. (laughs) I'm going to have to spend a full day buying gifts. You'll just have to help me. I'd love to. No, my darling, go through this list with me and see what ideas you can come up with. Did you mean that? Of course I do. I haven't the least notion of what to buy for whom. 
Did you mean what you just called me? What did I just call you? Oh. Darling. Yes. Yes, I meant that. And here is the remarkable Colosseum. Not only did they have fights between gladiators and men and beasts, but it could be flooded, and there were real sea battles. Ah, if these ancient stones could only speak, what a tale they could tell us. You don't appear too impressed, darling. The truth? This is the first thing I've seen in Italy that simply doesn't make me want to say, wow. Really? If you want the truth, the Los Angeles Coliseum is bigger. So is the ballpark, Chavez Ravine. Are they? I'd say so. Yes, I would definitely say so. Well, I've never been there. Great places to see ball games. You like sports? Well, I suppose you could call me a fan. I go all the time. Football in the fall, baseball in the spring and summer. I'm afraid this wouldn't make a very good baseball park. I hope you won't let this little disappointment spoil the trip. Darling, this is the most wonderful thing that ever happened to me in my life. Shall I order? Oh, please let me. I want to see if I can do it in Italian. Ah, you mean Italiano, darling. <laughs> Oh, be my guest. Here he comes. Um, Camerari. Ah, prego. Duo cappuccino. <laughs> See him give you that nod? I'm sure he thinks you're a native. So, this is the fabulous Via Veneto. And here you are about to sip your coffee at a sidewalk cafe on one of the most famous streets in the world. It's a far cry from Dayton, Ohio. Where are all the celebrities? I'm told the place is encrusted with them. Oh, probably sitting all around you, strolling past you along the sidewalk. I feel so giddy. Oh, giddy? <laughs> well, so unlike myself. That is, unlike the self I've been this past five years. I feel so young, so alive. How do you account for it? Probably the air and the wine. Oh, is that all? I was hoping you'd say the company. Oh. Without the company, there'd be nothing. Charlie, I'm going to do something mad. Do you mind? No, of course not. That gentleman sitting at the next table to my left, the, the very portly one. Yeah, well, what about him? Who, who do you suppose he is? Well, I guess he could be anyone. I'm almost positive. He's a famous film director. I'm going to find out. What? Well, how? Ask him, of course. Um, sir... Hmm? Excuse me. Are you a celebrity? Well, I hope so. Back home in Sadness Corners, Montana, I'm the mayor. Oh. I'm also the chief of police, the postmaster. Oh, I, and I I, I'm also the druggist, the dog catcher, and the undertaker. Oh, I could tell you're a man of parts. See, you, you want to hold still a second? I'd like to snap your picture. Oh, my, my hair. I'd just like to have a shot of all the Americans I run into. Uh, hold it. There. You you and your husband enjoying the trip? Oh, um, no, we're, uh, we're not married. Well, in case you decide to dig the step, come on out to Sadler's Corner, sir. I'm also the Justice of the Peace. Ah, my Signora Davis, you are so uh, beautiful in that lovely gown. Thank you, Gildo. I want you to have this. Oh, oh, oh no. <laughs> it is not necessary. It is, it is. And not just because the tour brochure says it is customary to tip the guide, either. It's because, oh, Gildo, you made Italy come alive for me. Uh, that is because you were alive for Italy, see? Everyone is dressed beautiful for the farewell banquet. But uh, who is like my bellissima, Signora Davis? You don't know. What a wonderful thing happened to me on this tour, Gilda. <laughs> 
Although, why do I say that? I'm sure you do. I wish you so much happiness. There he is. He's talking with Mrs. Morrison. <laughs> oh, and he's giving me a signal. He wants me to come over and rescue him. Gildo, just think. We've already established private little secret signals. Perhaps you should go to it. I will. I just want to stand here for a moment and look at him. He's so tall, so straight, so good looking. Oh, I love him. Do you, Carissima? Yes, yes. I'm not a child. I'll tell you how old I am. Should you do that? I'm 41. I'm old enough not to lose my head like a, like a silly schoolgirl. Silly schoolgirls lose their heads, but wise senoras lose their hearts. Then I've lost mine. Are you sure? Yes. Are you sure you have not lost your heart to Italy? I know what you mean, Gildo. It isn't the magic, the romance, the spell that this enchanted country cast on me. He'd be just as wonderful in Dayton, Ohio. Very well. As long as you are certain, then I approve. That's the third time he's sending the signal. I better go to him. Yes, darling. I'll come to your rescue. You may not know it yet, but there isn't anything in the world that I wouldn't do for you. There isn't anything in the world I wouldn't do for you. Well, you know what a statement like that is, don't you? Quite simply, it's a blank check. But should anybody give another person the absolute right to fill in any figure he pleases? I suppose it all depends on how much you have in your emotional account. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. A very romantic lady wrote a song which goes, We've come to the end of a perfect day, near the end of a journey, too. And memory has painted this perfect day with colors that never fade. And we find at the end of a perfect day the soul of a friend we've made. Well, we're concerned with a very romantic lady who has come to the end of a perfect day and a perfect journey and has really made a friend. Amici, all good friends of the Green Boss, El Autobus Giuseppe Verdi. You should have the luggage outside of your door in five minutes. And then we must leave for the airport. Charlie, darling. Ah, uh, have you closed your suitcase yet? No. You promised you'd save my life. I was able to get everyone's presents in my luggage except these. Oh, no problem, dear. Oh, you sure? Uh, are these packages too large? No, I can handle all three of them. Darling, I hate to impose. How can you use such a word? As a matter of fact, I even have more room. No, 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 this will be just fine. That's my nephew Terry's present. And that's a music box for my Aunt Nell. I remember we bought that on the Isle of Capri. And in here is a sweater for my sister. I picked it out. I might just as well carry it. I can't wait to meet her. And will they be happy to meet you? And now, the bag. The nice green suitcase for my bellissima Signora Davis. Oh, thank you, Gildo. To think, this will be the last time I will check your luggage. I'll see you again, Gildo. Ah, uh, no. But I threw my coin into the Trevi Fountain. That is nonsense for the tourists. Gildo, maybe Charlie and I, we could come back on our honeymoon. Carissima. We spoke about it. Then you shall be back. One day. Have a happy, lovely, and safe trip to the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, we have just landed at New York's John F. Kennedy Airport. The local time is 4.47 p.m. You better get on this line, darling. It looks shorter. All right. What do they do? Oh, most often nothing. The customs agent asks you if you have anything to declare. Well, I bought Marty a skirt and Paul some ties. Did it add up to three hundred dollars? Oh no. Well, you don't have to declare anything. You get the first three hundred free. So when he asks me if I want to declare something, then I answer no. I'll be right behind you. Charlie, 
Do you mean you want me to come to your brother's house? Well, you have to meet the family sometime. But so soon? Say, this line's really moving. The fellow must be in a hurry to go home. Next, please. Uh, do you have anything to declare, miss? No. Um, did you buy anything while you were in Italy? Nothing that would add up to $300. Would you mind opening up your suitcase? For me? Yes, ma'am. But... Oh, do you object? Well, I can't imagine why you want to. Oh, I'm sure a lady like you would have nothing to worry about. I certainly do not. Where's my key? Here it is. Let me just turn the lock and... Mm -hmm. Thank you. Absolutely everything's in order. Well, what's in this package? I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm carrying it for this gentleman behind me who has no room in his valise. Did you say this was the one with the music boxes, Charlie? Charlie, where did he go? Which gentleman are you talking about, ma'am? Oh, uh, the gentleman who was, uh, was, uh... Well, I, I'm, I'm sure he'll be right back. Uh -huh, I see. Well, uh, would you mind opening this package? Well, of course, I, uh... See? I told you it was a music box. I was with him when he bought it. Open the lid, please. Of course. That's funny. It doesn't play. It should. Well, it doesn't play, ma'am, because there are no works inside. What are those... those packets? Those cellophane packets? Well, Mrs. Davis? Who are you? My name is Detective Lieutenant Marvin Stern. I'm with the Police Narcotics Division. Have they read you your rights? Yes, whatever that was, they did it. Now, I want you to listen. Were you permitted to call your lawyer? I don't know any lawyer in New York. I called my sister in Dayton, Ohio. Mrs. Davis, do you know what the best thing would be? Look, I can't even begin to tell you how many people have been hammering at me. I tell you the same thing I told all of them. I don't know anything. I don't know how that powder came to be hidden in my suitcase. The powder found in those three packages happens to be pure heroin. Depending on how it's cut, it could have a street value of close to a million dollars. But I don't know how I... Yes, I do know. He gave it to me to carry for him. He didn't have room in his valise. Mm, I see. Charlie. Charlie Wilson. He said... Oh, what's the use? Check with the tour. Old Heritage Tours. They'll tell you a man named Charlie Wilson was on the tour. We already have. Then you know I'm telling you the truth. A man named Charlie Wilson was on the tour. That's what I've been telling you. Mm-hmm. Mr. Charles Wilson of 34 Pierman Street, Salisdale, New York. I told you that was his address. Except there is no Mr. Charles Wilson at 34 Pierman Street, Salisdale, New York. There's no such street as Pierman Street, and there's no such town. As Salsdale. Oh. Uh, Mrs. Davis, the quickest and easiest way for all concerned is for you to tell the truth. But I've told you the truth. My name is Norma Davis. <laughs> yes, that's true. I live in Dayton, Ohio. That's also true. I'm a widow. I live with my sister, Mrs. Paul Torrance. That is, we all live in my house. After my husband died, I didn't want to live alone. So it seemed like a good idea. Really, it wasn't. It isn't. I... What am I saying all this for? Mrs. Davis, we know all about you. What do you know about me? We know you work in the housewares department at Naylor's. We know... No! And... You don't know anything. Do you know what I think? How I feel? The last five years, do you know how lonely I've been? How frightened? How I finally gathered my courage and went away in a trip. And I had this dream of wonderful Italy. And I dreamed I fell in love. Or am I still there? And is this the dream? The nightmare? Mrs. Davis. What do you want? Are you telling me I smuggled in some, some drugs? Well, the drugs were in your suitcase. It's a mistake. The customs agent was performing a routine random spot check. You opened your valise for him. You saw what was there. But I don't know how it got there. You do. Charlie asked me to carry those three packages because he didn't have room in his luggage. Charlie, he can explain. There is, there was a Mr. Charles Wilson on that tour. He's gone. There's no trace of him. We don't know who he is or where he can be found. His passport. The State Department has no record of issuing such a passport. It was obviously a forged one. Why did he do this to me? I think by now, Mrs. Davis, we've gone full circle. 
From here, we shall only be repeating ourselves. It's time for the truth. Why do you keep saying that? All right. I, I was foolish, but it, it was such a long time. I wanted somebody. You wouldn't understand. Well, let's do it this way, Mrs. Davis. You're an amateur. What do you mean by that? An amateur in what? Crime. Professional criminals are using the services of more and more amateurs these days. I don't care anything about that. I'm innocent. Housewives are acting as messengers, use their telephones for recording bed. Please, Lieutenant. And smuggling. I mean, who would suspect a person like you, Mrs. Davis? For that matter, who would suspect anyone on a tour? I tell you... No. I... Let me tell you what you're up against. You were caught with all that junk in your possession. So don't think in terms of anything less than 15 years. If you get a strict judge, he'll write it so you serve every single day. Please don't raise your voice. I've had enough. You haven't had anything yet. You're on your way to jail. What do you want? Talk. I've already talked. Look, we don't want you. Then let me go. Maybe later. Later? When you've led us to Charlie Wilson. I don't know Charlie Wilson. <laughs> but you said he gave you those packages. I knew a man named Charlie Wilson who was charming and attentive and sweet. I met him in Italy. We walked through it hand in hand. But when the plane landed here, that Charlie Wilson was gone. And now there's another one. A different one. Mrs. Davis, you don't want to sit in jail for 15 years. Why should you? Why should you? You can deliver Charlie Wilson. But I don't know where. We're convinced that Charlie Wilson, whoever he is, is as high as you can take us. Now, you give us Charlie, and we move up one step. Charlie can be made to give us the guy on top of him. That's another step. I'd help you if I could. You were caught with the drugs. That's all the DA needs to prosecute. You know, go on the stand, and you'll say what? The truth. I was carrying it for a friend. <laughs> you were carrying it for a friend. Well, that's the oldest, most tired, and lamest excuse ever heard in a court of law. They won't even laugh. Well, they might pity you. Why won't anyone believe it? How can anyone believe it? A man you don't know at all? I knew him very well. After all of two weeks? How much time do you need when it's right? Well, obviously, this wasn't right. So anyhow, this man, he says to you, would you mind carrying some of my packages past customs in your luggage? Now, you claim that's what happened. Yes, that's exactly what happened. And you said, sure, okay, why not? Am I right? Yes. And the packages were already sealed and wrapped. Yes, they were. You're a grown, mature woman, Mrs. Davis. You were married once. You work in a large department store. You have some experience in the world. Now, you... You really didn't suspect anything? No, I didn't. And that's to be your story to the jury. What other story can I tell? <laughs> a better one than that. I mean, do you expect a jury to believe that any woman could be such a fool? Oh, Lieutenant, Lieutenant, you have no idea how foolish some women can be. <laughs> With that confession, we shall let her rest for a brief intermission. Let us judge her lightly, because love certainly can make a fool of any of us. Didn't the poet say, love is a folly that enchants us all? Of course he did. He should also have added, we must pay a price. But as you know, the time for paying prices occurs always in Act Three. we are told, as much time and trouble to pull down a falsehood as it does to build up a truth. Well, that's perfectly true. However, the problems occur because quite often it's rather difficult to distinguish between falsehood and truth, and so we can never be quite sure whether we should be building up or pulling down. Paul! Hello, Norma. Paul, you came here. Obviously. How is, um... Uh... Where is Marty? How is Marty? How do you think? Can you imagine what this has done to her? I'm, uh, I'm sorry. Where is Marty? Naturally home in bed. Doctor's been in. She's been sedated. She's resting calmly. I hope. 
Norma, how could you do a thing like this to us? Paul, I am... Uh... Norma Davis of Dayton, Ohio, arrested for smuggling heroin. Paul, will you listen to me? What are you going to do? Lie about it? You were caught. It was in your suitcase. I did nothing wrong, Paul. How did that, that, that heroin or uh, whatever get into your place? I was indiscreet, that's all. I did someone a favor. I mean... Yes. I warned you. Marty warned you. You were not only seduced by an adventurer, but by a criminal as well. Paul. You were always a headstrong girl, Norma. You never listened to good advice. You know, see where it's landed you? I'm sorry I've caused Marty such grief and made her ill. You should be. And now that I've said that, get out. What? You heard me. Get out of here. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, you don't look so hot. Why should you care, Lieutenant? Mrs. Davis, uh, I'm worried about you. Is that so? A guard told me about a little scene here you had with your brother-in-law a little while ago. Was he listening? Well, how could he help it? I remember a poem I learned at school. The wonderful one-horse shay. Oh, that uh, was by Longfellow, wasn't it? Oliver Wendell Holmes. Anyhow... One day it was in perfect working order. The next day it just came apart. All over. That's me. A customs officer says to me, please open your suitcase, ma'am. And my entire world crumbles into dust. A man has made a fool of me. My reputation is destroyed. My own family practically disowns me. And to top it all off, I'll probably go to prison. Probably. How am I going to avoid it? I'm sorry. I know you're innocent. Oh, please don't say that. You're changing tactics. Hard boy will get you nowhere, so now you'll become a nice, sympathetic cop. You'll seduce me into telling the truth. Seduce? It's a, it's a figure of speech, but it amounts to the same thing. Look, I'm sorry for you, because win or lose, well, you got a bad deal. Even if a jury would find you innocent, there'll always be people who believe you were guilty. Oh, well, I know it. And there's one consolation. From now on, you'll know who your real friends are. I wonder why I was afraid to live alone after my husband died. I married him right after we finished school. I never worked. He did everything for me. He sheltered me, protected me. I put up with so much for my sister. And it's her husband's fault. If he were really a man, he would never stand for her nonsense. He's been assistant branch manager at Spofford Federal for almost 15 years. He'll never get promoted. But now, he can justify it. And so can she. Why are you letting me ramble on like this? Oh, I told you. I think you're innocent. But I still have to get you to do one thing. And that's to uncover Charlie Wilson for me. Charlie? Mm-hmm. He's your only hope. But tell me, what... What were your plans? Plans? Yes. Well, we, um... We would be married. No, no, I, I mean your immediate plans. He gave you the stuff to carry in your valise. Your being stopped by the customs inspector was an unforeseen accident. Suppose you had just uh, sailed through customs. Where would you have gone with him? Where? Yes. To a motel. And the next morning we would have gone to his brother's house in Salisdale, New York. But since you have informed me that there is no Salisdale, New York, there's no brother either. He might have murdered you. No, not Charlie. <laughs> Why do you say that? You were carrying a million dollars worth of heroin. Let's see, you, you were with him for almost two weeks. In all that time, did he say anything that might give you a clue? No. Well, what did you talk about? It seems we talked about... Me? Yes. Maybe that's why I was so fascinated with him. We talked about me. Well, his accent. Eastern, Southern, Midwestern? No. It seemed to be the kind of speech you might hear anywhere. I told you what he looks like. I didn't know what more to tell you. I'm sure he's got a record. I know he's been fingerprinted and photographed. I, I know it's all on file somewhere. <laughs> but where? Now, look, the, the two of you were supposed to be so much in love. Please. Uh, didn't you at least take each other's picture? No, he didn't have a camera. And I don't believe in... Uh, wait. Oh, what is it? There 
There is, there is a picture. Yes? Yes. We were sitting on the Via Veneto. We, um, that is, I got into a conversation with another man, a tourist, an American. And he said, let me take your picture. And he did. Okay, we're halfway home. Now, who, who was this American tourist? What's his name? I don't know his name. You don't know his... <laughs> well, then what good... But I, I do know he's the mayor of Sadler's Corners, Montana. <laughs> We were sitting on the old Via Veneto, and I heard you remark to the gentleman sitting next to you that I was probably some big Italian film director. That's right. So the two of you decided to come out here and avail yourselves of my services as a justice of the peace. No, no, not exactly. Oh, that's not what he told me when I spoke to him just the other day. You, you spoke to him? Yes, he gave me a call. I was mighty pleased. It was so nice to hear from folks you run into in a foreign country. He, um, he called you on the telephone? Yeah, didn't he tell you? He said, you sure would like that picture I took of you. Oh. Yeah, so I sent it to him. You, uh, you sent him the picture? Well, didn't he give it to you? Ask him if he's got the negative. Uh, Your Honor, do you have the negative? If I kept hold of them negatives, I wouldn't have room to live in the house. Ask him where he sent the pictures. Where did you send it? Well, uh, I've got the address right here. Oh, let me see now. Charles Wilson, Pure General Delivery, Los Angeles, California. General Delivery, Los Angeles. Everything's all right, isn't it? You are coming out here to let me marry you, aren't you? Yes, Your Honor. If I ever get married... I'll let you marry me. Goodbye. That means there's no picture. Los Angeles. He's in Los Angeles. You can send his description to Los Angeles. Oh, do you know how big Los Angeles is? But he's there now. The photograph was sent to him only the other day. Look, I want you to think, Norma. Think. About what? About Charlie Wilson. You spent almost two weeks in his company. He must have said something that would give him away. He didn't. I can't think of anything. Somewhere. Somewhere he must have let something drop. I can't remember. Uh, we simply have to bring in Charlie Wilson. But I don't know where or how to. Look, we have got to find him. He must have said something. You've got to start with the very first thing he ever said to you. And you're going to try to recall every single conversation. That's impossible. Anna, what were the first words he ever spoke to you? He, um, he said, um... I was wondering, do you have any plans for lunch? And I said, what did you have in mind? And he answered... Well, I don't know. I just don't care to eat alone. <laughs> See? He didn't care to eat alone. From the very first, he used me. Now, you must try to recall every word. Let's get some cheese. You mean formaggio and wine. You mean vino. <laughs> And stroll through Florence. You mean Firenze. That was in Florence. Then we went to Milan. And what did we talk about? Da Vinci's Last Supper and the opera at La Scala. And then in Rome, St. Peter's. No, he didn't say anything. The Spanish Steps, the Trevi Fountains, the Colosseum. I did all the talking. Then we left for Venice. And in all this time, he said nothing about himself. No. He was really awed by everything. You really can't help it. All that grandeur just overwhelms you. Actually, the only thing that didn't seem to impress him was the, um, the Colosseum. Oh, yeah? Why? Is that important? Well, I don't know. Just tell me why. Because, um... Oh. Yes? Because he's from Los Angeles. Yeah, we already suspect that. We were standing there, and he said... If you want the truth, the ballpark in L.A. and the Los Angeles Coliseum are bigger. Great places to see a ball game. And I asked him, are you a sports fan? I go all the time. Football in the fall, baseball in the spring and summer. That's what he said. Okay, he goes to the ball games. And the Coliseum of Chavez Ravine... Pro football, college football, Major League Baseball. He said he was a fan. Oh, yeah. Most likely he goes and bets on the games. 
Does he have to go to the park to bat? Oh, I know his type. You find him in every city, at every major league ballpark. They congregate in certain sections. They bet on everything. Balls, strikes. Could you send his description to the Los Angeles police? We'll do better than that. We'll go there and have you pick him out. This is the section where they hang out. We've got the place filled with police detectives. If you point him out, he can't get away. Come on. Do you see him? It's um, It's difficult. Yeah, I know it's a long shot. He may be wrong. Maybe he isn't even in L.A. But it's all we have. Do you see him? Why do you keep asking? Wouldn't I tell you if... I don't know. Would you? After all, maybe you're still in love with him. Are you? No, I'm not. Not anymore. Yes, I do see him. The left aisle, third row. The seat next to the post. The man in the gray jacket and blue slacks. But he's so ordinary looking. You described him as very handsome and distinguished. I realize that. I suppose we all look different in Italy. That's Charles Wilson. He could never deny it. We could all identify him. Hey, let's walk up and you say hello to him. Hello, Charlie. Ah, uh, who? Don't you want those packages you gave me? You, you... Sit down, Charlie. You're not going anywhere. I want to thank you, Lieutenant, for everything. Well, I'm glad it worked out. He's got quite a record, our friend Charlie. Forger, smuggler, confidence operator. And heartbreaker. Well, did he break your heart? Not too badly. Besides... What kind of question is that for a detective to ask? Oh, I was just hoping it would never happen to you again. There's no guarantee. I just have to take the chance, that's all. Hmm. Well, you're uh, free to go, you know. You mean you have no further questions to ask me? <laughs> well, it seems to me we spent a whole week in which we did nothing but have me ask you questions. All sorts of personal questions, wouldn't you say? Yes. Would you... Would you like to spend some time asking me some questions? Yes. I think we could spend a very interesting week doing just that. And they did. And I would suspect they went on even longer. Perhaps it makes a considerable amount of good sense for a lady like Norma Davis to become involved with a police detective. You must admit she has a talent for getting herself into trouble. You, on the other hand, will get into no trouble at all if you wait for me to return. First, great waves of immigrants swarmed to our shores as millions came here to find something new. And they did. The things they were seeking, freedom, equality, justice, opportunity, these were new concepts for ordinary men and women. Now, their descendants swarm back to those European shores for a visit in order to find something old. So many of the old ways and old things are also precious and worth preserving. Our cast included Tammy Grimes, Robert Dryden, Lloyd Batista, and Gilbert Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and ARM, Allergy... Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. There's a common belief that in matters of criminal investigation, Scotland Yard stands fingerprint and microscope above the French Surete, the Italian Questura, the Russian NKVD, and even our own FBI. 
I've often felt that we in the USA could match malfeasance, felony, and forensic probing with anyone, anywhere. So it is with pride that we present a tale of deviousness, deceit, device, and detection in that city of American law and order, Washington, D.C. Have you no faith, Inspector? No belief that I, Andrew Wolf, could have gone straight? Andrew, you wouldn't know how. <laughs> After 40 years of embezzlement, bank robbery, every con, swindle, and heist in the book, how could you go straight? Oh, I have a surprise for you, Inspector. I have not only become a law-abiding citizen, but I'm going to help you solve a murder that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> mystery drama, The Rivalry, based on one of the first Arsene Lupin adventures, was adapted especially for Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr. and stars John Beale and Court Benson. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. of us who are connoisseurs of criminal cunning, it's an axiom that patterns of wrongdoing repeat themselves. It's as though the malefactors of today have taken example from the masters of past crime, which is why today's detectives must be as scientifically knowledgeable and unrelenting as a Father Brown, a Lord Peter Whimsey, or a Sherlock Holmes. And indeed, such a man is Inspector James. Interesting case, this. Probably the one that gave me the greatest headaches of my career. And certainly the first in which I had the assistance of a retired professional lawbreaker, Andrew Wolf. It began one sunny afternoon on the 1st of December. Sergeant Holloway and I were sauntering down Connecticut Avenue, returning to police headquarters. Let's walk a little slower, Inspector. See that man half a block ahead of us who keeps turning around? How could I miss him? A raggedy old man wearing a straw hat in the middle of winter? He stopped now. He's bending down, tying his shoelace. I know. I've been watching him. Watching us. Let's duck over to this store window and see what he does. Look. Now he's moved over to that hardware store. He's, he's looking into those mirrors on display. So that he can keep an eye on us back here. Now, where have I seen that crazy straw hat before? He's taking a package out of his coat, Inspector. He's put it on the sidewalk. Oh, I'd like to see what's in that package. Oh, hold on. Isn't what he's doing a little obvious? Obvious? It's not the package on the sidewalk that's important. He's trying to attract our attention. So, why don't we take the hint and follow him? Look! There he goes, dropping another package into a trash can. And he knows we're watching. You pick up the packages, Holloway. If they're at all suspicious looking, call the bomb squad. I'll keep an eye on our man. There's something about that straw hat he's wearing that really bothers me. But, 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 but if he's up to something, why would he want the police to know about it? Sergeant, that's exactly what I'm going to find out. The old beggar hailed a cab, and I followed in another, as far as a doorway on M Street in Georgetown, then up a flight of stairs over a bookshop. Uh, you'll forgive me for not knocking, won't you? My little room is honored by the presence of Washington's finest. I hadn't expected you for another ten minutes, though. Andrew, when I saw your scroungy-looking friend here wearing that particular straw hat, I said to myself, that's the hat. <laughs> I've seen that hat at every racetrack in the country. It belongs to Andrew Wolf. Now, how about that? You recognize my straw hat and wonder why this old bum, Louie, was wearing it. Perhaps old Louie has murdered my friend Andrew Wolf. Yes, indeed. Inspector James had better follow and find out. I admit that was about the size of it, Andrew. <laughs> I'm touched. Uh, excuse me a moment, Inspector, while I keep a promise. Louis, 
Thank you for inducing the inspector to follow you. Here's the ten bucks I promised you. Goodbye, Louis. Wherever did you find that character? Inspector, in my profession, there's an army of such characters ready to do little jobs for a few dollars. And old Louis is one of them. Oh, John, he took my straw hat. He's kind of an ungrateful fellow, isn't he? Didn't even say thank you, just left. Well, Louis can't speak. He's quite dumb. And a little deaf, too. I prefer an assistant who's speechless. Gets us both into less trouble. I thought after all those years in prison, you'd retire, Andrew. Well, but from active service, I have. Well, then why this elaborate scheme to get me here? Does the parole board have your address? You'll never forget the past, will you, Inspector? You have no faith that I, Andrew Wolfe, have gone straight. Andrew, you wouldn't know how. After 40 years of embezzlement, bank robbery, every con and swindle and heist in the book, how could you? <laughs> so you're waiting around for me to stick my hand in somebody else's cookie jar, eh? Well, I have a surprise for you, Inspector. I'm not only a law-abiding citizen of Washington, D.C., but I'm going to become a friend of the police. I'm going to help you solve a crime. Andrew, will you get on with it? Have you had a report yet at your precinct of the murder of a young lady last night? A murder last night? No, things were pretty quiet as far as I know. Hmm. You're quite sure? A ballet dancer or an opera singer? Someone who wears a costume? A young lady? No. Supposing I told you that a murder had been committed, and it's only a matter of hours before you find out. Andrew, will you go ahead with this undiscovered murder of yours? Right. Last night, a friend of mine who has a little private boat business up and down the Potomac was passing under the Arlington Bridge, and a paper bag landed on his deck. Some of the contents of that paper bag fell overboard, but I have here what my friend brought me, and I thought it might interest you, Inspector. All this has something to do with a murder? All right, take a look at what I've spread out on this table. <clears throat> a piece of a crumpled and torn newspaper, right? Mm -hmm. A cut glass inkstand with a silver top. Then a small piece of broken glass with a tiny hole in it. Two folding paper boxes, a large Dixie cup, and lastly, and most interesting exhibit, an ornate kind of red-colored shawl with a gold tassel at one end. It's the kind of thing one might see on a costume. I'd say probably was part of a costume. People haven't worn brocaded shawls for over a hundred years. Well, what do you think, Inspector? You get me up here for a look at this junk pile. You don't think it means anything? Well, sure it means something. Some jerk of a second-story amateur was getting rid of what he didn't want by tossing it over the bridge. Well, now, I'll tell you how I see it, my dear old friend. Yesterday evening, between ten and midnight, a young lady dressed in some kind of a costume was wounded with a knife and then choked to death by a well-dressed gentleman wearing a monocle and interested in horse racing, with whom this young lady had been eating a hamburger and drinking a milkshake. And to think I'm listening to all this gibberish in broad daylight. Note, the piece of newspaper is a racing form. Note, the piece of glass has a little hole in it. I'd say part of a monocle. Note. Sure, 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 sure. No one I know has worn a monocle in 50 years. Well, that should narrow down the field then, wouldn't you say? Note the paper boxes and the Dixie cup. The well-dressed man picked up two hamburgers and a milkshake and joined the young female who wore a costume. Perhaps they went to his apartment, perhaps to hers. Maybe late. After the show, first, he stabs her with a knife and then strangles her with his shawl. If you look closely, Inspector, you'll see on the red material darker red stains. 
To me, it looks like a bloody knife has been wiped on it. After the deed, our murderer has to cover his tracks, get rid of the evidence. So he wipes off the knife, picks up a piece of his monocle, which probably broke in the struggle, takes a pair of scissors and cuts off this bloody, stained part of the shawl. I'll bet you the rest of it is still in his victim's hands. He then wraps everything in a piece of the racing form he had in his pocket, adds a heavy cut glass inkwell to weigh the parcel down, shoves it all into the paper bag he brought the food in, and over the bridge it goes. Fortunately for justice, it falls right into the hands of Andrew Wolf. Thank you, Andrew. But well, I've got to go. Why don't you... Uh, Take all, all this evidence along, Inspector. It may come in useful. All right, if it'll make you happy. The only thing I'd like to hang on to is this piece of the shawl. I know you don't believe there's blood on it. When you've discovered the other end of it, as I say, around the victim's neck, why don't you come back here in, say, four weeks, the end of the month? Ah, New Year's Eve. And I'll give you this part to match up with it. Oh, uh, by the way, Inspector, when you arrest the fellow with the monocle, be careful. He's left-handed. Glad you showed up, Inspector. Chief was asking for you. You know those packages that the old bum in the straw hat left in the street? Don't tell me. I know. Empty boxes. <laughs> you never cease to amaze me, Inspector James. Well, did you catch up with that old bum in the straw hat? I did. I certainly did. Well, what's with the chief? A murder at the far end of Wisconsin Avenue. Top floor. 1333, uh, or 3313. The victim, a man or a woman? Uh, it's a woman. The visual surgeon is, is up there right now. Ours? Oh, yeah. When did you get the report? About an hour ago. Did you say a woman? Yes, young woman. Musical singer or ballet dancer. Uh, someone in show business. She was wearing a costume. I won't be a son of a gun. Oh, hi, James. <laughs> Welcome to another fatality. I'm uh, just about finished. Lab's on its way to take pictures. You know who it is? Well, the name on the mailbox for the top floor is Jenny Sapphire. Mm. Well, there she be. Much left of her. Oh, Lord, that's awful. A poor girl. What's she got in her hand? Let's have a look, Sergeant. A piece of red shawl. It's been cut off with scissors. Oh, no. What do you think, Doctor? Isn't the inspector miraculous? Uh, well, James, you do fast work. Uh, it is cut with the scissors. Oh, but look at the poor girl's neck. And the expression on her face. Did you ever see such fear? Well, my conclusions are that the victim was stabbed twice with a sharp instrument, a uh, knife, a dagger. Well, yeah, maybe even with the scissors. Yeah, and then strangled. A probable cause of death, asphyxia. Yeah, but doctor, there's no discoloration on the neck. Well, she may have been throttled with that shawl. The way she's hanging on to it. With the hands clenched. Hmm. I wonder what happened to the uh, rest of the shawl. It's possible the murderer cut it off, Harry, because it had blood stains and fingerprints on it. Let's have a look around the apartment all the way. We worked over the case the rest of that week. Everything we came up with matched the conclusions handed me by Andrew Wolfe. It burned me up no end to think that that no good thug had flaunted the right answers to a crime he didn't even know was committed. Or did he know? It bugged the blazes out of me that Wolf could have been right all along. And as a result, it put me into a terrible temper. Holloway! Holloway, where the devil is that man? He was here a moment ago, Inspector. Holloway! Yes, Inspector, coming! Well, it's about time. Now, you go in there and wait at my desk for me to come back, you hear? Yes, Inspector. Oh, boy. What's the matter with him, Harry? Well, it's darned if I know. <laughs> it's been coming on for days. Coming on? It's here. Every time we get to a new conclusion on the Jenny Sapphire case, the Inspector gets angrier. Day before yesterday, I found a few more pieces of glass in the, in the victim's room, and I said, Hey, these all fit together. It's a monocle. 
Oh, you should have seen him, Harry. He hit the roof. Uh, take a look at that sheet of paper at the inspector's desk. Look at his doodling. He's drawing animals. Huh. What is that? Head of a dog? Oh, no. That's a pretty good likeness of a wolf. Look at those fangs. Now, why would he draw a wolf? Well, the inspector might draw an Andrew Wolf if he could. You heard what Inspector James said, didn't you? That it burned him up that a man he'd sent behind bars could take a few assorted pieces of evidence and string them together to make sense. To be outwitted by an ex felon was an indignity that no self-respecting guardian of the law could put up with. Could you? I'll be back shortly with Act Two. The problem facing the good detective is to distinguish between hard evidence and red herrings. Henry David Thoreau, who went to jail rather than compromise his beliefs, had an amusing view of law and the lawless and used to joke about it. He said that sometimes circumstantial evidence is very strong as when you find a trout in the milk. However, Inspector James doesn't think this such a laughing matter. Some more background on the Sapphire case, Inspector. All right, what's her? Well, I checked the place where she worked. The old music hall at the end of the alley behind Wisconsin Avenue. Her boss, a Billy Jacobs, told me she'd been to Russia about two years ago on a State Department exchange program and brought back with her a very expensive sapphire. Some bigwig over there gave it to her, he said. A sapphire? Oh, that's right. That's why she took it for a stage name. Did anyone besides her boss know she had it? Well, I asked him that, and he, he didn't know. Well, at least we now have a possible motive behind the killing. Robbery? <laughs> you bet it's robbery. That's why our apartment was turned upside down. At least this is one piece of evidence old Andrew didn't know about. Uh, Andrew who? Oh, never mind. Boys, I think we're beginning to crack this case. First things first. I had to tackle those who knew Jenny Sapphire. So I called the old music hall and asked for the boss, Billy Jacobs. He wouldn't be in till that night during the second show. I got there at nine and waited in the wings for him. You wanted to see me, Inspector. Are you Billy Jacobs? <laughs> Impressive. The one and only. I'd like to know all you can tell me about Jenny Sapphire. Wonderful girl. Great loss. She'll be missed. And? After I told your sergeant the other day about as much as I know, he told you, didn't he, uh, how she got her name? And that Russian Sapphire she brought back. A hey, big son of a gun it was. Of course, Jenny was a beautiful girl. And I won't tell you that. Was, uh, was Miss Sapphire married? Not so far as I know. Had a lot of boyfriends? <laughs> you kidding. Talented, beautiful. She was young, pretty. She sang, she danced. She'd been with me a couple of years, uh, uh, since she was 17. So what I'm saying is, uh, she attracted a lot of attention. So she had many admirers, huh? For hours, at least uh, twice a week. Any one in particular? Steady interest? Uh, Inspector, when I tell you this man's name, uh, I don't want you to say you ever get it from me. Not that I owe the man anything, but he's so high up on the government that... If he thought I told you, oh, oh, oh boy, you know, he's got influence. Oh, well, you're probably not the only one who knows his identity. Oh, yeah, I think I am. At least so far as Jenny is concerned. No one around here ever saw him. He never came to the show. He went outside in a big black car, shades drawn. And she run out and climb in. But I should know who he was. 
Hey, Inspector. Let's go into my office where it's quieter, okay? The man's name is Robert Clay. You mean the Robert Clay? He used to be a congressman and then became an ambassador? Yeah, the same. He's the one who used to pick up Jenny Sapphire in his car every night? Well, not every night, but... After the performance, maybe I'd say three times a week. What's Clay doing now? Well, I remember. He's retired. Said he was through with politics. Spends a lot of his time at the racetrack. Yeah, that uh, post in Moscow was the last one he had. Of course. That's where he must have met Jenny Sapphire, in Moscow. Mr. Jacobs... Uh, now, listen... You call me Billy, Inspector. Everyone does. Oh, Billy. Billy, that last night when Jenny played here at the old music hall, do you remember anything particular about it? Matter of fact, I do. She came in uh, earlier than usual for a second show, second evening show. Yeah. And she asked me, would I get her two burgers, a uh, malted... Uh, for when she came off at 10.15, I say, oh, yeah, sure. She say, hold them for me at the stage door, Bill, and I'll take them with me. So I did. And then when she came down dressed, I handed her the bag, and she say, I'll pay you tomorrow, Billy. And she ran out, jumped in the guy's car. And that was the last I ever saw of her. The net was closing in. It was too bad that the murderer hadn't bought the burgers and the mullet himself. That might have given us a witness. But I knew I didn't have enough to tie Clay or anyone else to the murder. Not one solitary fingerprint. And then suddenly... I began to suspect Andrew Wolfe. Had he deliberately laid a smoke screen across the trail? Police headquarters. Inspector James speaking. How are you doing, Inspector? Is that you, Andrew? Two weeks more, and I hope to see you with the other part of that shawl. What did you call me for, Andrew? Now, now I detect a certain testiness in your voice. The case isn't getting you down, is it? I'm very busy. If you're having a hard time trying to tie a suspect to the evidence, may I suggest something? Go ahead. Suggest. I don't want to interfere, but just a thought. Suggest, suggest. Remember, I want to see you New Year's Eve with the other half of that red shawl. I'm under no obligation to bring you anything. Well, of course you're not, Inspector. If I were you, I'd double-check that piece of newspaper, the racing guide. If I remember, it had a yellow paper tag on it, which might be useful. Goodbye. I could have killed that rascal. He was right what made me so angry. I got out that piece of the racing form he'd given me, and there was a yellow address tag on it. Whoever it belonged to was a subscriber to the sheet. The name had been torn off, but a few numbers remained. I put Holloway onto it. He came back in a few hours. You won't believe this, Inspector. Sergeant, were they able to identify the subscriber or not? I presume what you gave me is something to do with the Jenny Sapphire murder? To whom did the paper belong, Holloway? To Robert Clay. You know who he is. Our former ambassador to Russia. I know, I know. Oh, come on, Inspector. Why don't you let me in on this? Uh, I don't follow you. Oh, this isn't a simple old murder case involving a music hall entertainer and a politician. This has got international implications. Oh, don't you trust me? Do you, do you think that the State Department will let us work with them? Fergus Holloway, what in blazes are you talking about? International complications, State Department. The inkwell. The inkwell? 
One of those items in the box marked evidence, case 3536, the Sapphire case, the chopped up shawl, the burger cartons, and so on. Well, the glass inkwell. I had it checked out. The inkwell? Well, I knew you wanted me to. I have to do some things without being told. It's Russian. Russian glass. Silver hinged top with a Russian inscription on it. So it's an antique inkwell. Jenny could have picked it up as a souvenir. Or when she was in Russia, maybe she even knew Clay. Maybe he gave it to her. But just the same, you have given me an idea about something very peculiar. I have, Inspector? When it was checked for fingerprints, what did the lab report? No fingerprints. Nothing. What Holloway had helped me realize was whoever had murdered Jenny Sapphire had wiped that inkwell very carefully. Certainly since the days of the Tsar, someone should have left fingerprints. Harry, have a look at these photographs. That is Robert Clay, former congressman, former ambassador to Russia, now a Georgetown resident. How would you size him up? You're an expert on physiognomy. Uh, tough, disappointed, playboy, maybe. Could be cruel. <laughs> oh, that monocle. Is he kidding? It's an affectation. Oh, uh, maybe. Uh, that monocle is made to order by a firm right here in Washington. They make all of Clay's monocles. The prescription is identical with this one. I'll show you. I'll dump the pieces out of the envelope. You recognize these pieces? Well, of course I do. Holloway picked them up from the floor near Jenny Sapphire's body. All except this one piece. The one with the little hole at the edge. I got that from an informant. Oh, oh yes. Well, uh, that must be a uh, hole through which they string the thread you put around your neck. Harry, huh? I think we've enough evidence here to put a much heavier cord around someone's neck. However, you're telling me that this man, this uh, Robert Clay, knifed and strangled Jenny Sapphire? I got a real strong hunch, yes. <laughs> yeah, but you don't have a motive. If he needed money... She owned a sapphire worth a great deal. Maybe he gave it to her. Maybe he wanted it back. Losses at the racetrack. We don't know yet. She... He's hidden the stone. He turns the place upside down. Must be an angle. That could be it. The angle. Could you tell from the angle of the knife thrusts how strong the attacker was? Oh, quite strong. Oh, yeah. Was he very close to her? Yeah, just close enough. Anything else? Well, there uh, weren't serious wounds, mind you. It was the strangling that caused her death. You know, I always thought it strange the way we found her holding on to that shawl for dear life. At least the part that wasn't cut away. I haven't figured that either. Harry, think now about the assailant. You know anything else? Yes. But I think I told you, didn't I? The uh, murderer was left-handed. Interesting belief about left-handedness, which since early days has been linked with the sinister. A left-handed compliment, even today, is considered malicious or insincere. It begins to dawn on Inspector James that the man he is looking for may not only be left-handed, but two-faced. I shall return shortly with Act Three. your attention has been wandering, let me capsulize. Andrew Wolfe, a retired criminal, gives his old nemesis, Inspector James, a number of material clues which make it appear that a man once in high political office may have caused the death of a music hall entertainer. The problem is that no one has yet identified the suspect as having anything to do with the victim. Much hearsay, but no fact. And so we find the inspector burning the midnight oil at police headquarters puzzling out a solution. Police headquarters. Inspector James speaking. You're up late, aren't you, Inspector? 
Andrew, what do you want? Just to be helpful. After all, I'm looking forward to our meeting New Year's Eve. It's a little early to wish me Happy New Year. You're having trouble getting proof positive, aren't you, Inspector? You've a suspect, but it's not open and shut. Well, this business is never easy. Retrace your steps, Inspector. Someone may have been lying to you. Good night. <laughs> Jacobs? Oh, well, hello, Inspector. Hey, you're too late. The last show's over. Everyone's gone home. Ah, I'm just checking the receipts. That's you have come to see, Billy. Do you remember identifying the two little boxes in which you brought some hamburgers to the theater? Yeah, yeah, I do. And a malted milk yeah. for Jenny. Well, I'd like you to come down to police headquarters with me now and let us take your fingerprints. Yeah, my fingerprints? But why? I, I haven't done anything. Well, if I were less than honest, Billy, I'd tell you it's uh, purely routine, but it's not. You mean now? This time of night? Of course, you're going to find my fingerprints on those boxes. I handle them. True. Then again, we might find your prints somewhere else. What do you mean? Well, shall we say in Miss Sapphire's room? Yeah, I was never in her room. I, I swear to I have never. The night Miss Sapphire died, you weren't there? Billy... It'd be much easier for you if you'd tell me the truth. How did you know? Why didn't you tell me before? It was easier to say it happened the way I said it did. I didn't want to get involved. Go on, Billy. The first part was all true. About Jenny asking me to pick up her stuff. But I guess she was so excited about a date that she ran out the stage door before I could stop her. So anyway... After the theater was empty, I walk over to where she lived. Top floor, number 1333, Wisconsin. I knock on her door and I say, Hey, Jenny, I brought you hamburgers. You forgot them. And this man opened the door. He was a boyfriend, I guess. It was the first time I'd ever seen him. He took the bag from me. He nodded. He goes back in. Then I hear Jenny call out. Thank you, Billy. That was real sweet of you. Good night. She was alive then, Inspector. I hear her voice. And then I walked away. Now, that's the real truth. I show you a photograph, Billy. Was this the man who answered the door? Yeah, yeah. That's him, all right. Those are the ABCs of investigation. Sometimes you have to bluff your way to the truth. Billy Jacobs had left no fingerprints in Jenny Sapphire's room. But then again, he might not have been above helping himself to a valuable sapphire. However, as they say, the finger of suspicion pointed directly elsewhere. Uh, yes, gentlemen. Mr. Robert Clay? Uh, yes, that is me. Oh, we're from the Washington police. I'm Inspector James, and this is Sergeant Holloway. Oh, well, uh, I would like to help you gentlemen, but I am just on my way out. Uh, you'll excuse me. Now, this won't take long, Mr. Clay, and it's a rather urgent matter. I am afraid I can't talk to you now. Slam the door right in our face. Shall I break it down, Inspector? I'm afraid we're going to have trouble. Holloway, go around back and cut him off in case he tries to leave that way. I'll hit the call box for some more men. Mr. Clay, I'm Sergeant Holloway. I can see you're opening the back door a crack. Now, let me warn you that to try to run for it only makes your case worse. Now, why don't you just come out peaceably? I won't be harassed this way. Do you hear me? Mr. Clay, I ask that you cooperate with us. It'll make it easier all around. Now, now, would you just mind opening the back door wide and standing away from it? Now, don't you come any nearer, whoever you are. I haven't got the slightest compunction in defending myself with this crowbar. Now, Mr. Clay, don't be childish. We mean you no harm. Holloway, duck! He's got a gun in his left hand! No one was hit. I had Andrew Wolfe to thank for warning me that the man I wanted was left-handed. It was with that hand he had fired. Holloway and I rushed him and disarmed him. And by 9 o'clock that morning, we had Clay in custody. You know I have the right to consult my attorney before answering any questions. Now, I have put in a call to him, but he is not yet at his office. Uh, let us get this over with. I want you to know, Mr. Clay, 
But I've sent Sergeant Holloway with a warrant around to your house. What for? To search for anything that would link you to the murder of Jenny Sapphire. I do not know what you are talking about. Jenny Sapphire had a four-week singing engagement in Moscow when I believe you were there as ambassador. I uh, didn't know any Jenny Sapphire. At that time, she called herself Jenny Hart. I understand all exchanges of Soviet and American artists were known to your office. You never met Jenny in Russia? No. I have asked a witness who has identified a photograph of yours to be present. Well, what does that prove? I have had my picture taken. Have him in. Let's get this over with. Turn around in your chair and face the wall, Mr. Clay. I shall address you as Mr. Jones. Mr. Jacobs, will you come in, please? Mr. Jacobs, you told me that you believed Miss Sapphire and a certain gentleman knew one another. Where did you get that information? I, I, I don't know exactly, Inspector. I mean, uh, I heard it, and I assume the man she was seeing regularly was that gentleman. Will you turn around, Mr. Jones? Mr. Jacobs, I ask you now to take a look at this gentleman. Have you ever seen him before? Uh, I'm not sure. The man I saw in the evening clothes and uh, that, um, he, uh, what, what you might call it, uh, in the eye. Uh, Mr. Jones, I notice you have a black silk cord from your lapel to your handkerchief pocket. Is that a, a monocle? Uh, yes, it is. Would you mind placing it in your eye? No, not your right eye, your left eye. That's where you usually wear it, isn't it? Can you identify the gentleman now, Mr. Jacobs? No, I, I, I wish I could be more positive, but I can't. There's no similarity to the man you saw in the doorway of Miss Sapphire's apartment? I, I wouldn't say no. It might be him, but I couldn't swear to it. You want to see me, Chief? Uh, well, sit down, James. About the Sapphire case. It's been a week since you picked up Robert Clay. I think we'll have to drop the charges against him. Why so? His attorneys produced a pretty hard alibi for the night in question. He turned up a ticket stub and a program for a concert at the center. That concert lasted till half past midnight, so Clay couldn't have picked up Miss Sapphire at the music hall at 10.30. Well, she went with someone in a car. It wasn't him. Moreover... There are a number of young men in the diplomatic service who wear monocles, four of them actually living in Georgetown. Those daggers found in the clay house, the clean and inconclusive. So what do we have? Half of a shawl with a tassel, no blood, no fingerprints on it except the victims. If we could lay our hands on the other half of the shawl, maybe we'd have a case. The other half. We have no case against Clay. So I'm notifying his attorneys we're dropping the charges. Charge, uh, Chief, can you wait till tomorrow? What'll happen tomorrow? You had almost a month. I think I can come up with the evidence you need. What, the, the other end of the show? Yes. Is this a hunch? It's, it's more than that. But I need one thing. Would you authorize the property clerk to release to me... The half of the shawl we found in Jenny Sapphire's hands. <laughs> Why not? James, I, I don't know what you're up to, but I wish you luck. Andrew Wolfe had said, you'll be coming to see me on December 31st with the other half of the shawl. Then I'll let you have this piece. I hated like anything to find myself obeying this devil, but I had to. <laughs> Was I right about the show? Cut in half with scissors, right on the button. Frankly, Inspector, I consider this caper the epitome of my career. Did you bring the show? I did. The half that was in the victim's hands. Have you the other half? Right in this bag. All right, let's compare. Let's put them on the table. Spread yours out on the right, and let the tassel hang over the edge. Right. And I'll spread mine on the left. Well, well. Inspector know it all, wasn't I right? You scissor cuts correspond exactly. Hmm? Let me show you something else. Come to the window. I'll hold my piece of the shawl against the glass. What do you see? 
Great Scott, this was it. You see what I see, don't you? The mark of five fingers and a palm. Bloody fingerprints. <laughs> what did I tell you? It's the evidence. If those prints will show up. The murderer held that shawl with the same blood-stained hand with which he stabbed the victim. Yes, a very clear imprint of a left hand. All right, take this half. It's yours. I promised it to you, and good luck and good hunting in your laboratory. Andrew, I was angry with you. Furious, in fact. But in all truth, I have to admit, no more. I wanted to have a look at that piece of the shawl the victim had. Let me see it for a moment, will you? Now, don't be afraid. I'll, I'll give it back. Sure. Here you are. Ah, almost identical to the half thrown off the bridge. Tassel and everything. Will you look at that tassel? She must have made this shawl herself. You know, I examined the piece I had, and inside the tassel I found a sacred medal. She must have stitched into it. Touching, isn't it? What are you doing to the other tassel? Be careful of that half. Don't, don't smudge those fingerprints. Well, I won't, I won't. Interesting the way these tassels are made. Braided gold cord wound around a tiny wooden cup. Big enough to hold a medal or anything. Even a sapphire. Will you look at that? <laughs> Beautiful, isn't it? Did you ever see a stone this perfect? This size? Give that back to me. It's part of police evidence. Just think, that poor girl had hidden the only thing precious to her. Andrew, me. hand it over. You give that sapphire back or I'll... Oh, what, you idiot. Did you think I handed you all that evidence for nothing? A murder has been committed for this stone. For four weeks, I've kept you on the move and you never even guessed. Now, you listen to me, my friend. I've given you five fingerprints of a left hand for your trouble. You can have the murderer, and I'll have the sapphire. And so the curtain descends on today's Theater of the Mind, where you see 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 of the mind, where you see what of the mind, where you see. people for whom the truth is like poison. It can irritate and sicken and also kill. That's why some of us will go to any length to evade, avoid, or even suppress it. How many of us? There's really no way of telling. Each of us can only speak for himself or herself. I'll never forgive you, Will. Never. But, Marsha, I didn't really do anything. I am not one of your liberated modern women. To me, infidelity is the ultimate wrong. Now, Marcia, you must believe me. I never have any intention. I can of... never believe you. I will never forgive you. And I will make you pay for this. Our mystery drama, Smile at a Homely Girl, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Larry Haynes and Terry Keene. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Why bother to look for deep and complicated hidden meanings, especially when you contemplate the mystery of life? No less an authority than the immortal Goethe himself put it as clearly and as simply as this. Getting along with women, knocking around with men, having more credit than money. Thus, one goes through the world. Can things be really as basic as all that? 
For a great many people, absolutely. And especially for the hero of our story, Mr. William Bennett. William is having breakfast with his wife, Marcia. One thing you're going to learn about Marcia, she is a woman who doesn't mince words. Notice how she gets right to the heart of the matter. Well, mm -hmm. who is Linda Tunnan? Ah, uh, Linda Tunnan. Why do you repeat her name? Obviously you know who she is. Are you stalling for time? Ah, uh, Linda, Linda Tunnan is George Morrow's secretary. Well, that answers half my question. To George Morrow, she's a secretary. What is she to you? To me? Hmm? Well, uh, to me, she is, uh... No one. What you're saying is you have no relationship with her at all, hmm? Relationship? Well, that's a rather heavy word. Is it? Well, yes, it's filled with implications, innuendos, and so forth. It happens that I have to see a good deal of George lately, and there are all kinds of things that she is in a position to do for me. Really? Yes, like uh, typing and so forth. Mm -hmm. And that's why you've been taking her to dinner? Yes, yes, now that you mention it. Now, these past few days, we've uh, been working rather late. Have you? Yes, taking her to dinner was just my way of saying thank you. Why didn't you tell me about it? Well, quite simply because I was afraid that you would misunderstand. Oh? And you do. Now, I'm positive you believe I'm having an affair with her. You mean you are? Oh, come on, Marcia. I'll never forgive you for it. All I'm doing is being nice. Not only will I never forgive you... Marcia, will you listen? I have been insulted and demeaned. And I intend to make you pay for it. Marcia, please. I am not having an affair with Linda Town, nor have I had one with anyone else since you and I have been married. I... I had intended to discuss another matter with you this morning. I'm sure I know what that little matter is. So let me tell you that the answer is... What my answer has always been... No. Marcia, Marcia, it isn't all that much money. You're talking about $30,000. It's only a fraction of what your folks left you. Therefore, I should let you squander it. But I won't. I... Oh. Marcia? Oh. Something wrong? No. Uh... I have a headache. I don't seem to feel very good. Uh, you're not supposed to get excited, Dr. Carraway. Told you, not with your heart. I, uh... Now, Marcia, I'm, I'm going to call Dr. Carraway. No, I don't want Dr. Carraway. He said that at the first sign of I any kind I don't need of... Dr. Carraway. What I need is a loving and understanding husband. I don't have one. Oh, Marcia. Oh, get out of here. Go to your precious Linda Thompson and leave me alone. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. Are you headed for the station? Oh, I couldn't get my car started this morning. Oh, well, hop in. I'll give you a lift as far as the library, anyhow. Well, I shouldn't, but I don't want to miss the train. <laughs> what do you mean you shouldn't? Oh, nothing. Come on, Will. You can tell me. It's Marcia. Marcia? Yeah. All that has to happen is for me to be seen talking to a woman, and Marcia is convinced we're having a flaming affair. Well, is it true? What are you saying? Does she really have grounds for these suspicions? Now, Sarah, here I am, sitting in the car with you. Have I made a pass yet? Oh, uh, you never made a pass at me, Will. Not even when we were in high school. Are you kidding? I think I'm the only woman in this town who can make that statement. Well, I wasn't as bad as all that, was I? Mm, it seemed that way. Mm. You know, I, I don't know what's gotten into Marsha lately. But since the day she became my wife, I never, I have never been with another woman, and I've had plenty of chances. I'm sure of that. The fact is, I... I like to have a good time, go out, and Marsha likes to stay home. Poor Will. Yeah, that's right. Poor Will. And poor Marsha. The handsomest boy and the prettiest girl in the senior class. Oh, come on. That was almost 15 years ago. I remember at your wedding, the minister said, now here is proof that marriages are made in heaven. Well, they may be made in heaven, but something happens to them on the way down here. What happened to yours, Will? Oh, I don't know. I guess one day we just woke up to the fact that it wasn't fun anymore. Marriage isn't supposed to be fun all the time. Oh, no? <laughs> My goodness, listen to me, the sage little spinster giving advice on connubiality. <laughs> well, that's a pretty good word. Connubiality. Well, don't forget, I'm surrounded by the best words you can find. After all, I work in the library. Oh, which reminds me, 
Uh, Marcia came in just the other day. Marcia? Mm, it's the first time she's been in there in 12 years. You're kidding. Well, sooner or later, everybody in town comes into the library, even if only to get out of the rain or use the restroom. But Marcia actually came in to take out a book. And since it was such an unusual event, I, I even remember the title. It was The Count of Monte Cristo. What? By Alexander Dumas. Count of Monte Cristo? Uh, why would she want... Uh, isn't that the one about the man in the iron mask where this fellow is railroaded into prison and spends 10 or 20 or however many years in solitary confinement? Mm-hmm. Do you uh, think maybe she's trying to get some ideas from it? Ideas? Sure. On how to get rid of me. Hi, George. I'm sorry I'm late, but I forgot we were supposed to meet here, and I went to your office. Hey, are you sure you didn't go to my office to see my secretary? Hey, come on, George. Yeah. She happens to be a very beautiful girl. Now, you won't get any argument from me on that. What kind of line you've been handing her? Line? You told her you were going to divorce your wife, marry her? <sighs> How people turn and twist what you say. What I actually told her was that if, if I ever divorced my wife, I'd certainly marry her. Of all the times for you to be fooling around. I'm not fooling around. Oh, no, then it's serious. It isn't anything. Besides, it's my affair. In one sense of the word, I'm sure it is. But in another, it's also mine. I've got a lot of money sunk into the project, Will. I'm sorry. This is no time for you to be alienating Marsha. I think we've been alienated from each other for the past five years. What happened? I don't know what happened, George. Maybe if I did, I could do something about it. Oh, well, maybe... Maybe I do know what happened. Want to tell me about it? Yeah, I might as well. Now, part of it is your fault. <laughs> How can you say it's my well, fault? Well, you what and is? just about everyone else in town. Since we were kids, everybody kept saying what a sensational couple Marcia and I made, what a natural we were. Everyone took it for granted we'd married, and we did. Everyone said, look at those two beautiful people, how much in love they are, so we believed it. Until about five years ago, when I guess both of us realized we never really loved each other. Mind you get a divorce? Because things aren't that simple. <laughs> you could walk out on her. Okay. Suppose I shall. One of these days. But George, believe me, that is why I like to look at your secretary, Linda. Uh, look at her. Now, it hasn't gone very much beyond that. She is so much like Marsha was at that age. The very, the very young Marsha. Well, you know who you should have married? Sarah. Sarah? Sarah Lewis, librarian. She's always crazy about you. Oh, I never knew that. <laughs> She's always been kind of quiet. Not pretty the way Marcia was, still is. Sarah Lewis. You were always nice to her. Said hello, gave her a smile. You, the high school Adonis. You know, I was... Uh... Very much impressed by something said by H.L. Mencken. He said something like, uh, If after I'm dead, you want to do something for me, smile at a homely girl. <laughs> I still say you should have married Sarah. She'd have been so grateful. You'd have been able to get away with the murder for the rest of your life. But George, is this uh, what we're supposed to be talking about? Right. Can you get the 30000 by the end of the month? I'm trying. You'll lose the option, Will. Ask Marsha. The answer was no. I have a meeting at 4 o'clock. No, with whom? With uh, Tom Pratt. Cancel it. Tom said he's pretty sure he can arrange the loan, George. Have you any idea of the interest Tom will hit you for? It won't be low. I know that. Do you know where Tom Pratt gets his money? I know there are rumors. It's shady money. Underworld money. Well, right now, it's the only kind of money I can get. Oh, don't get started with Tom Pratt and his people. Well, I don't know where else to go. Marsha. Marsha has already said no. But she can't say no. Oh, you don't know Marsha. But I do know Marsha. And what's more, I'm going to ask her. Another cup of tea, George? No, no, thank you. Uh, Marsha, I want to talk to you about a matter of life and death. The answer is no. But you don't need another question. Oh, yes, I do. Will sent you here, didn't he? Yeah, of course not. Then you decided to come by yourself to see if you could have more success with the old bag than he did. Uh, that is not how Will refers to you. Well, that's how he treats me. 
Marcia, he's in trouble. He should be. It's a sound enterprise. Well, then you advance in the 30000 Oh, I'm overextended now. Marcia, he'll go to Tom Pratt. He should. Tom's in the business of lending money. Once you start dealing with Tom Pratt, you wake up one morning and discover that Tom's in and you're out. Oh, that's too bad, isn't it? Look, you're his wife. Let him think about that when he's with Linda Thompson. Oh, no, Marcia, that's and not... And I'll the... wager she's not the first. I know Linda, and I can assure and you that... And to do it openly, publicly, to be seen with her, to announce to the world that he's being unfaithful. Oh, no, George, he's going to pay for that. Look, the Rosecommon property can be developed into a major all-year resort. Will and I, we have the know-how. We can do it. All Will needs is the money due on the option. The answer is no. But you've got the money. Yes. And you can spare it. Mm hmm And there's no danger of loss. You can always sell the option, even make a profit. Yes. Look, it's the biggest thing in his life. Please, stop it. I have a headache. I'm sorry. Just talking about Will, the way he's been treating me, makes me ill. I must ask you to excuse me. Of course. But please try to understand it. This could destroy Will. I don't care. Masha, you're not Will. You don't know what you're saying. I know what I'm saying. Let him be destroyed. Uh, Masha. Masha, you want me to call the doctor? No, 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 I'm all right. I'm perfectly all right. Now you and everyone else let me alone. Oh. Consider the computer. It works smoothly, efficiently. It does its job. Then, suddenly one day it becomes erratic. It doesn't make sense. Then, finally it breaks down. And why do we bring up the computer? Simply because it's the closest thing to the human brain, which can also become erratic and finally break down. There will be further exploration into the mysterious abyss of the human mind in Act Two. It was one noted philosopher or other who sagely remarked that the cart has no place where a fifth wheel could be used. Well, it's easy enough to see the basic soundness of this proposition when we consider the physical appearance of a cart. However, the concept itself may escape us. After all, a fifth wheel may describe more than just a round, disc-like object. It can also refer to a person. And so one may ask, how do we know when we ourselves may have become a fifth wheel? Leave me alone, George. Marsha, I'd like to help you. Why would you want to help me? Because of your friend. Oh, no. Your Will's friend. You don't look well, Marsha. There's something the matter with you. You're right. There is. Will is what's the matter with oh, me. The two of you were so much in love, Marsha. What's happened? Look at me. And you'll see what happened. I don't see anything. Well, I'm not pretty anymore. Oh, Marsha, you're still beautiful. Oh, I was never beautiful. I was just pretty. Beautiful stays, pretty fades. That's why he runs around with other women. He doesn't run around with other Don't women. Don't cover up for him, George. Especially since one of those women is your own secretary. Marsha, there's nothing between and them. Don't try to tell me. It's in my mind. It is all in your mind. You're doing this to yourself. You go back to him and tell him it didn't work. He isn't ever going to see one single penny of my money. Never. Marsha... Shouldn't you see a doctor? It's none of your business. Didn't you say it yourself? You don't feel well? What kind of doctor did you have in mind, you and Will? Well, I just look at you and Psychiatrist, I... maybe? Marsha. Of course, that's the plan. What plan? The one you and precious William cooked up between you? There isn't any plan. Maybe you can get some shrink to decide I'm crazy. Oh, that's ridiculous. And then you can put me away. Marsha. That way Will can get his hands on all my money. That's the plan, isn't it? Uh, no, Marsha. There isn't any plan. Will is never going to get one penny from me, period. Marsha, let's say you're right. You admit it. It doesn't matter. But there's still the rest of your life to go through. Whether he's guilty or not, forgive him. You're married. You don't believe in divorce. Do you want to stay this way all the time, bitter, angry? It's his fault. It doesn't matter. It takes two. 
try to be reconciled. He only wants my money. Maybe that's what's wrong with your marriage. There's my money and his money. He doesn't have any. And the two of you used to be so crazy about each other. Wouldn't it be wonderful? If only you could recapture all that. Oh, no. Uh, no, 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 don't say a word. Tonight. Have a beautiful dinner. Uh, prepared with wine, candlelight, everything. Maybe you'll find each other again. So, the meeting with Tom Pratt sent badly. Hmm? You know what he wants? Just about everything. I'd wind up being a very small junior partner. George, I don't know what I'm going to do. Tom Pratt is what I'm reduced to, and if I let him in, I'm dead. Then why don't you try Marsha again? No, I'm poison around her. Why don't you go home tonight, right now? Have dinner with her. Right now, all I would need is that sweet, warm, understanding wife of mine. No thanks. Will, I spoke to Marsha. All she needs is for you to meet her halfway. Come on, try it. Well, I have a sort of a date with Linda tonight. There's no future there? Maybe, but at least the present is so pleasant. Oh, grow up, Will. You and Marsha have a problem, sure. But face it like two adults. George, I've tried. I wish I could tell you how I've tried. Will, when you're in that type of situation with a woman, what's your best argument? It's such a beautiful dinner, darling. You're using silver, good china. Is it uh, a special occasion? Shouldn't every dinner married people have together be a special occasion? And you're looking so pretty tonight. I hoped you'd say beautiful. Well, that's what I meant. Beautiful. <laughs> well, I'll settle for pretty. You know, looking at you right now, it's as if we were both so much younger. Do you really feel that way? Mm, I do. Marcia, darling, are you all right? Why do you ask? Well, you seem... Seem to be very pale, suddenly. No, I'm, I'm all right. I, I'd like a glass of wine. Should you? Why not? Well, uh, all right. Uh, pour us each a glass. We'll drink a toast. Oh. Marcia. Oh, Marcia. Oh. What, what, what is it, darling? Something. Something. I, I don't know. Just sit back, darling. Just sit back. I feel. I feel. All right, all right. I'm going to call it down. No, I... Oh. Now just relax. Oh. Just try, try to relax. Oh. Charlie? Mm. Mm. Hello? Uh, is this Dr. Caraway's service? Well, it, this is an emergency. Mm. He is. Oh. Who? <laughs> yes, yes, all right, all right. I'll call her. Oh. Now, darling, Dr. Caraway is on vacation, but there's a doctor covering for him. Mm. Dr. Henrietta Rice, and I'm calling her right now. Mar Marcia. Marcia. I feel it. Uh, Dr. Tew Hello. Is this Dr. Rice? Uh, I'm a patient of Dr. Caraway's. Uh, that is, my wife is. Uh, look, could you get here right away? She's ill. She's definitely ill. Well, I, I don't know. She just feels bad. She's flushed and, and, and feverish. And... Yes. Yes, all right. I will. Uh, darling, darling. She says... I'm to get you over to the hospital immediately. I don't want to. Now, that's where they have the facilities. And I'll just put you in the car, and we can be there in less than five minutes. Now, just lean on me. Everything is spinning. All right. All right darling, I'll, I'll get you to the hospital in a few minutes. Just a few minutes. Are uh, you Mr. Bennett? I'm Dr. Rice. Yes, Doctor. How is my wife? Mr. Bennett, your wife is dead. She was dead before we could even get her out of the emergency room. Marcia, dead? I'm sorry. I wish there were some easier way to tell you. It was a heart. We aren't sure. Well, she did have a heart condition. I'm aware of that. Well, now, I don't understand. What else could it have been? Mr. Bennett, was this a sudden attack? Well, well, sure. Had she complained of illness or pain recently? Yes, certainly. She, she would... Get these spells. Why, you, you could ask Dr. Carraway. No, I'm sorry to have to ask these questions at a time like this, but I have no choice. Yes, she uh, she did. She did complain about not feeling well. Starting when? Oh, maybe a week ago. Mm, pain, mm. dizziness, nausea. Her face flushed. Yes, yes, I, I would say it, it appeared that way. 
Mr. Bennett, we're going to perform a post-mortem. Now, wait, 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 just a minute. Yes? What for? To determine definitely the cause of death. Oh, but she is dead. We know why. Her heart. Don't you want to be sure? Well, what does it matter now? We do. Well, now, just a minute. Don't, don't you need my permission? Your permission? Yes, I think that's the law. I see no reason why I sh should subject her to something like that just to satisfy your medical curiosity. I respect your feelings, Mr. Bennett. But in this case, we can proceed without your permission. Now, wait a minute. We are virtually certain she has been poisoned. <laughs> Dr. Rice. Yes, Mr. Bennett. Well? Your wife has been poisoned. What? You are the second person I've notified. The first, naturally, had to be the sheriff. Poisoned? I, I don't understand. Arsenic. She was filled with it. You could practically see it starting to come out of her nails and her hair. Well, how? How, how could she have gotten arsenic poisoned? I am only concerned with what happened. How? Is someone else's responsibility? I just can't believe it. I don't know if that matters. Good night, Mr. Bennett. Now, wait. Now, now, look, it isn't true. You don't like me. As a matter of fact, I can tell you took an active dislike to me the moment you heard my name on the telephone. It's true. I don't like you, Mr. Bennett. But that doesn't alter the basic fact in the case. All right. Are you allowing your attitude toward me influence your medical judgment? My medical judgment has been sustained by two other pathologists. Now, just what have you got against me? My sister's name is Joan Tum. She has a daughter, Linda. Yes? Good morning, Miss Bennett. I'm afraid you'll have to come down to the courthouse. Oh, Why? Uh, for one thing, we've got a coroner's jury ready to deliver a verdict on your wife. Now, look, we know how she died. Arsenic poisoning. That's true. But uh, that has to be all tied up legally, you know. That's just because a man's wife dies of poison, that doesn't necessarily mean that the man is guilty, now does it? No, not necessarily. But it sure doesn't provide a very good argument for his innocence, if you know what I mean. The purpose of this coroner's inquest is to determine the manner in which death came to Marsha Bennett, Mrs. William Bennett. The first witness is Dr. Henrietta Rice. The arsenic had been ingested in minute amounts over a period of time. How long a time, Dr. Rice? Perhaps a month. And uh, where was she getting this arsenic from? From the food in the house. And how did you establish that? We tested various samples from the refrigerator and the shelf. And how did she die, finally? From an accumulation of the poison. And therefore, Doctor, what would you recommend to this jury? In my opinion, death was due to arsenic poisoning administered to Mrs. Bennett by... Well, I'm sure we all know by whom. I object to that. Now, you have no right to make that accusation. Yes, you're absolutely correct, Mr. Bennett. Don't worry. You'll get your day in court. Yes, he most certainly will. But it doesn't look as if it's going to be a very good day, does it? Certainly not, when you consider all the evidence. But then again, things aren't always decided in the end strictly by the evidence, are they? We'll see about that in the third act. was that story? It took place in ancient Rome. A man saw a lion who was suffering from the effects of a sharp thorn in his paw. It was a minor thing. Anyhow, the man pulled out the thorn and went on his way. Years later, the man was sentenced to be killed in the arena by wild beasts. And he was thrown to a hungry lion. Guess what? It was the same lion. And didn't they ever have a happy reunion? Of course. It's called Androcles and the Lion. But what has it to do with our story? Don't worry. We'll have a parallel of sorts. How could you do it, Will? 
To what? You poisoned her. George, I swear to you. You expect me to believe you? George, they're going to ask me questions, Will, under oath. Yes, I know. Do you want me to perjure myself? All I can tell you is I'm innocent. Sure. Now, George, somebody has to believe you. I know what they're going to ask me. How were you getting along with Marsha? The money, the bind you were in. You were tired of her, Will. You told me so. You said you no longer loved her. That you, that you never really loved her. Oh, sometimes we just say things. And Linda, be prepared for Linda. What am I supposed to say about all that when they ask me? George, I'm not asking you to lie. Oh, that's good. But there is a certain way of putting things, if you know what I mean. <laughs> we did speak about this, Will. I distinctly remember. If things were going so badly between you, why didn't you divorce her? You couldn't answer me. But it doesn't matter. Everybody's going to know. You wanted her money. I know, I know. It looks bad, but you have to help me, George. I wouldn't know how. Mr. Bennett, you've heard all the witnesses testify how you had this very strange interest in your wife's death. Is there a statement that you care to make at this time? I'm innocent. Your guilt or innocence is not at issue here. The purpose of this investigation is to come up with the cause of death. Now, let me ask one question. Do I impress you people as a stupid man? I mean, you may not like me, but certainly you'll admit I'm not a fool. Just what is the point you wish to establish? Well, just how? How could I expect to get away with it, huh? After all, if I murdered my wife, I'd certainly be aware of the fact that I'd be the prime suspect, wouldn't I? If I intended to kill my wife, wouldn't I use a method that would be more clever? Now, why would I do something that could be discovered so easily? May I answer that question? Yes, Dr. Rice. And I would remind you that you're still under oath. Mr. Bennett, you depended on Dr. Carraway. What are you talking about? I am sure you know. Dr. Harold Carraway has had a long and distinguished career. But he's well along in years and semi-retired. Your wife suffered from a heart condition. That's part of her medical record. You counted on that. You were sure that if your wife died suddenly, Dr. Carraway would automatically assume it would be from a heart attack. And that would be the end of it. Now, you have no right to accuse I me. I only know this. When I telephoned Dr. Carraway up in the country to tell him that Mrs. Bennett was dead, his immediate reaction was heart failure. Well, I don't care what anybody says. I didn't I am only answering the question that you raised yourself. You would probably have gotten away with it had Dr. Carraway been in town. But you had no way of knowing that he would be on vacation. I have nothing more to say. Thank you, Dr. Rice. <clears throat> we have additional witnesses, but since it is noon, we shall adjourn for lunch and reconvene at one o'clock. Hello, Will. Sarah, what are you doing here? I thought I'd drop by. Was that wise? The whole town is just about ready to hang me. You don't want to be known as a friend of mine. Well, somebody has to stop by and say, good luck, Will. Well, you're the only one, Sarah. It doesn't look good. Not at this point. And it's not going to get much better either. You see what they're doing? They'll definitely establish the fact that she was poisoned. Yes. And they'll have a murder. And at whom will all the evidence point? I'm going to be indicted, Sarah. Just no way out of it. But I didn't kill her. I believe you. And that makes you the only one in town. Will. Hmm? Do you remember the senior prom? Hey, that was a long time ago. Oh, now, of course, why should you? After all, it was just another dance, another ball, another party for you. Well, I guess you reach a certain age where everything was a long time ago. Oh, I didn't want to go. Uh, no, that's not true. I did. I wanted to go more than anything else in the world, but... Nobody asked me. So, Mama bribed her sister's son, her nephew, from Chicago to come all the way out here to be my date for the prom. You didn't know that, did you? No. Well, of course, he resented it, and I suppose he had a right to. But he went through the motions. He bought me a corsage <laughs> with Mama's money, and he drove me to the prom in Mama's car. And that was just about the last time I saw them until it was time to go home. I spent most of the night just, you know, standing around with the girls like me, the ones who had no dates or who had phony dates, like mine. 
It was the worst night of my life. Until you saved it. Me? Yes, you. <laughs> How? What did I do? You asked for a dance. Oh. <laughs> you really don't remember, do you? I just can't tell you what that did for me. I was actually dancing with Will Bennett. The fabulous Will himself for four beautiful minutes. That's how long it took the band to play Stardust. I was no longer Sarah Lewis, the wallflower, but Sarah Lewis, the queen of the prom. And I fell in love with you at that moment. Well, I didn't know that. Why did you ask me to dance, Will? I don't know. I, I just... Oh, okay. I, I won't press it. I might not like the truth. After all, it could only be that you were sorry for me. Oh, no, no. And I, uh... I couldn't face that either. So, I constructed a, a little fantasy, which was that... Secretly, you adored me. And that one day, you would declare yourself... And you kept nourishing that little conceit of mine because every time you would meet me, you would smile and you would say hello. You saved my life that night at the prom. Oh, and I kept saying to myself, if only one day I can do something for Will Bennett, something as beautiful as the thing he did for me, if only I could save his life as he saved mine. Well... Maybe I can. Sarah, what do you say? Well, I can save you. I'm the only person in this whole world who can do it. No one else would know how. Do you know what you're talking yes, about? Yes, Will, I know what I'm talking about. But you, you'd have to... Well, there'd, there'd have to be evidence. I know. Sarah, do you, do you have evidence? Yes. You do? Oh, you do. Oh, oh, Sarah... Sarah, I, I look at you now and I see the most, the most wonderful person I, I, uh, Sarah, Sarah, what, what is the evidence? A book. Are there any further witnesses who wish to be heard? Uh, yes, sir. Is that you, Sarah Lewis? It is. Will you wish to testify to the matter at hand here? I do. You'll have to come forward and be sworn. I believe there is medical evidence to prove that Marsha Bennett's death was due to arsenic poisoning. Yes, there is. And we have every reason to suppose that the coroner's jury will come up with that verdict. Well, the jury has not yet reached that decision. They will call it murder. What is your point, Miss Lewis? I know for a fact that Marsha Bennett died from arsenic poisoning, but I also know for a fact that it wasn't murder. What's that? It was suicide. Suicide? Are you saying that she took her own life? Yes. Uh, not intentionally, but she did. She poisoned herself. Well, what do you have to, uh, to, to back up that statement? You need evidence. I know, and I have it uh, here in this book taken from the town library on the 17th. That's exactly 16 days ago. The title of the book is The Count of Monte Cristo. It's by Alexander Dumas. And here is the borrower's card number 17763. It belongs to Marcia Bennett. And the clerk will accept these as exhibits uh, as soon as their relevance is established. On the morning of the 17th, Marcia Bennett came into the library and asked me if we had a copy of The Count of Monte Cristo. She remarked that she remembered reading the book in school and enjoyed it and would like to read it again. I still don't see what this has to do with I kept asking myself why she would want this book. It's an old, practically forgotten classic. And uh, further, Mrs. Bennett hardly ever used the library. So why would she want The Count of Monte Cristo? Uh, I must remind you, Miss Lewis, that you have been given the floor to answer, not ask questions. Yes, sir, I understand. Uh, she was highly nervous and very upset. And I was sure she had a reason. So I took down another copy of The Count of Monte Cristo and read it carefully, cover to cover. And I found out why. Now, are you prepared to tell us? The Count of Monte Cristo was required reading in our junior year at high school. 
Something from that book stayed in her mind, perhaps in her subconscious. Somehow it must have suggested itself to her, so she came to refresh her memory. Ah, can you tell us that something? Yes. Uh, I will show you the passage. Uh, There's talk of how to murder someone by feeding him arsenic. And the way to do it is this. First, you yourself take just a few grains of arsenic one day. Then on the next day, you take a few more. On the third day, a few more, and so on. Now, by the end of the week, you would have ingested a considerable dose. Large enough to kill, if taken all at once by somebody else. What Dumas did not quite understand, but what he was talking about, was what today we call immunity. Yes. The passage goes on to say... Now that you are accustomed to ingesting arsenic with no harmful results, you can safely poison someone else. Uh, The clerk will mark this exhibit. And that's exactly what she had planned. She would take these minute doses daily, build her immunity. Then she would fill a bottle of wine with a lethal dose. Now they would both drink from it. He would die, and she wouldn't. The doctors would examine his body. They would know it was arsenic. But they couldn't blame her, because she would show traces of the poison, too. It would therefore appear that he had been trying to poison her and had somehow made a mistake and taken a drink from the wrong glass. Continue, Miss Lewis. Everything would be in her favor, you see. Everyone knew they weren't getting along. Even better, everyone knew he had several very good motives for murder. Enough of them have certainly been brought out here today. Uh, But not everyone can build up an immunity to arsenic. She didn't know that. Uh, Neither, I suppose, did Alexander Dumas. Uh, Well, that's all I have to say. Uh, Thank you, Miss Lewis. The jury will consider this new evidence carefully and retire to consider its verdict. Hello, Will. Hi. I, uh... I thought I'd come by the library to thank you. I didn't get a chance back there in the courtroom. Sarah, that book did it. You just about saved my life. That makes us even. Do you know what you said a few days ago? That you had this, uh... This fantasy... In which I... Secretly adored you. And that one day I would declare myself... Yes. When I wasn't a fantasy, Sarah, it's real, I think. I think I always adored you. I, I think I was always in love with you, Sarah. Were you, Will? Really? Yes, yes, Sarah. Ah, uh, we're making a bit too much noise. After all, this is a library. You know, I, I know now that I was always in love with you. Will? Hmm? I'm sorry, but... I'm afraid I'm not in love with you anymore. Sarah. Oh, Will. You should see your face. Shock. Dismay. How is it possible for any woman not to be in love with Will Bennett? Mm. It's possible. Sarah, Sarah, I mean it. Maybe I was never really in love with you, Will. Maybe it was... You know, all gratitude. But after what I did today, I feel as if I can do anything, even meet a man who really loves me. Sarah, I, I'd love you. Poor Will. Thank you for asking me to dance at the senior prom. Now, finally, we're even. not exactly true. He was rich Will. After all, he did inherit his wife's estate. Perhaps we might call him aging Will. There's nothing so pitiable as an Adonis who grows older. The hair goes, the paunch comes, and as they say, the spirit is hot, but the flesh is cold. We'll have more about spirit and flesh when I return shortly. (laughs) 
Friday's a night to remember on CBS Television. We're looking good, starting with the Incredible Hulk, victim of a nuclear experiment. David Banner is now a man pursued by danger and fear. What are you going to do now, David? I think I should leave. Now that the Hulk has been seen, my time's going to be running out. Will David Banner find a way to control the beast within him? The Incredible Hulk. Next, it's the Dukes of Hazard, Hazard County, that is, as Bo and Luke Duke go up against Sheriff Roscoe Coltrane. You're under arrest for grabbing at her, and you're under arrest for swinging first. But watch out for Boss Hogg. Seeing the Duke behind Boss is my favorite bowl of the team. Then, the jealousy, the lust for power, the drama of Dallas. I should have killed you out in that field when I had a chance. Well, I guess not even you are capable of cold-blooded murder. No, I wasn't then. Of course, that's where I found out about the cheap little romance you're having with my wife. Right a night to remember this fall on CBS Television. With CBS, you're looking good. The exact quote which seems to have fueled so much of the motive force of this story is by H.L. Mencken. If Ever I depart this veil, and you remember me, and have thought to please my ghost, forgive some sinner, and wink your eye at some homely girl. You remember that now. And a similar sentiment may also be found in the Old Testament. It has to do with casting your bread upon the waters. No good deed is ever wasted. Our cast included Larry Haynes, Terry Keene, E.V. Juster, and Ray Owens. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I'll sell my boots and share with you. Hmm? You sure they hit me hard in the stomach. You'll see, you'll see, I don't abandon my friends. We're not the rich who quarrel over who gets what, huh? We'll get money. I've always got my long knife. Hmm? Ivan, have you ever used it on someone? No, but I'd like to if I get hungry enough. Oh, they catch you and send you to Siberia if you try. Hot threats. They whip you with threats. Don't worry. You're not rich enough for me to slice you up. <laughs> Siberia. Ha! <laughs> Maybe some things are worth going to Siberia for. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and True Value Hardware Stores. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. is the texture of his twisting tales of the sudden and unexpected. You won't be bludgeoned by what you're about to hear, but you will feel a hand at your throat and a fluttering of the heart. <laughs> See this knife on you? Long and sharp. Have you ever used it on someone? No. But when I get desperate and hungry enough, I'd like to. Oh, they'd catch you and and send you to Siberia. Ha! <laughs> threats! They whip you with threats. Uh, maybe, maybe some things are worth going to Siberia for.
drama The Fools was especially adapted for Mystery Theater from a story by Maxim Gorky by Gerald Keene. It stars Fred Gwynn and Russell Horton. It is sponsored in part by ARM, Allergy Relief Medicine. I'll be back shortly with Act One. I generally introduce our mystery drama with a philosophical observation on crime and punishment. Let us bypass that today to tell you where we are so you can visualize it in your mind's eye. It is colder than where you sit at this moment. The snow falls deeper. Sleighs and horses and hoofing it on the foot is the only way to get around. It's a hundred years ago. It's Russia in winter. It's a churchyard where the father of Vanya Kuzin has just been buried. And Vanya and his mother stand in the cemetery in their black clothes against the white frozen flakes. I thought father had more friends than that. It's too cold and the church is too far. No. They're in the tavern, all those so-called friends. Makes me very angry, mother. Oh, Vanya, Vanyushka, what can they do for your father now? They could be here in the graveyard to honor him. And to honor you, mother... We must not start our new life with ugly words. And you, son, can honor him best by being the man of the house. Mother, I'm frightened. A big, strong man like you. Oh, son. You don't understand. Father always did the thinking for us. That was easy for me. I obeyed. I did what I was told to do. I plowed. I planted. I... Said the cow. You are strong. But for me to decide what to do is very hard. Vanyushka, you're a grown man now. It's time. Perhaps your father was wrong to make all the decisions of our life. He should have let you take the reins. Mother, when one is in the habit of following, to lead is not so easy. Who said it was? But you can. It will be strange to walk on my own feet all of a sudden. Son, what are you doing? Peeling potatoes. A week has gone by since we buried your father. That much? Why don't you go to the city, Vanya? Mother... Why have you stopped calling me Vanyushka? Vanyushka is what you say to a baby you love. Have you stopped loving me? It is time to grow up. But you still love me. Feeling potatoes. A big man sitting by the stove. I said, why don't you? Go to the city. What for? Take your father's heavy axe and go. There are many in the city already with axes. How do you know? In the tavern father used to go to... I drink vodka. I listen. Very little work in the city, they say. Hardly any. I'm sorry to have to order you what to do, as your father did. But I have been waiting too many days for you to begin something. I've been thinking about it. Oh, yes. Over glasses of vodka in the tavern. Move yourself, Vanya. There is work in the city, and they will pay a big, strong man. I'll... I'll think about it. Don't think so much. You don't know how. Are you awake, Vanya? The stove's gone out. Bring in some wood. Get up. I'm not asleep, Mother. When your father was alive, there was always wood. We never had to sleep in our clothes. I don't mind sleeping in mine. Uh, uh. I'm up. How much money do you have, Mother? One ruble and five ten kopeck pieces. Give me the fifty... What for? Would you take a long? You're going, then? Yes, I'm going. This very minute. God be praised. And God be with you. Uh, Have some hot soup before you go. No, no, it it, it would take too long. Listen to him. It took him 31 years to make up his mind, and then he has to leave the house without breakfast. (laughs) Now, here's the money. Better count it. Always count your money. That way you don't get cheated. (laughs) I've 
I've never had this much money in my pocket in all my life. It's a good feeling. Now, yes, here are your father's mittens and his fur cap. Ah, oh, fits down over the ears, nice and warm. Well, how do I look? Vanya. These mittens are better than mine. Be on your guard against city people. Take care what you say, how you behave with them. City people, they're sly. And no drinking. Keep your money. If you are cold, go to a tea house. Tea and sugar are good for you. Shall I bring in the wood for the stove before I go? No, no, Vanya. I'll do that. You have suddenly caught ambition. You have decided to leave. Go now. This instant, before it wears off. I'll take Father's axe anyway. I'll open the door for you. Go. Don't look back. Well, goodbye. When will I see you again, Mother? I'll see you when I see you. Sit down here. You have a good table by the fire. Suit yourself. Hey, hey, be careful where you shake the snow from your coat. You want to get me wet. I'm sorry. That's what comes from walking in the snow. You don't notice it. Huh. You've been walking? For how long? Uh, I've been on the road nine days, and it didn't stop snowing once. Uh, where do you eat? Taverns like this. Just bread and tea. I sleep in barns. I never realized how well off animals were. And I was brought up on a farm. Warm hay. Sometimes the horses get blankets. Hey, watch where you're putting that axe. Do you want to cut off my foot? All right. Oh, good to sit down. I started at five this morning. A lot of people here. <laughs> Place like this is never empty. Uh... You from the country? Yes. Uh, looking for work? Uh, yes. Uh, well, nothing much doing here. Maybe in the next town, but uh, here... Uh, this is my third week in the city. No work? <laughs> Fact is, you starve. Hey, look at that snow coming down out there. Oh, gives me the shivers to look at it. <laughs> You're not Russian? <laughs> of course I'm Russian, but I... I never like snow. Waiter, bring me some tea and, and two rolls. Uh, I, I had an overcoat when I first came here. I ate it up. I had a cap. I ate that. All I have left are my boots. Uh, soon I'll have to sell those, too. Maybe you'll find work. Gee, small chance. There are as many looking for work here as yellow leaves in autumn. Turn your head. Hmm? See? Hey. They're all from the backwoods and farms, and they all want to eat. Let's have tea together. Uh, I thank you very much. I've had tea. Uh, but I tell you what would really warm me. Uh, a little glass of something. Why not? Uh, uh, waiter, don't bring the tea. Uh, a half bottle of vodka and two glasses. <laughs> Uh, uh, more suitable for this weather, believe me. <laughs> uh, uh, what's your name? Vanya Kuzin. And yours, brother? Uh, Ivan Salakin. They call me Daredevil on the estates. I can ride a horse bareback and stand on my head. Just like in the circus. Ah, here's the bottle. He brings it right away. Uh, that's the lesson of the city. The more money you spend... The better the service. What did you say your name was, brother? Vanya. Ah, ah yes, Vanya. Mine's Ivan. You told me. Uh, what will we drink to now? Hmm? Two jobs for two worthy people. Mm, we drank to that already. Uh, so we drink again. The more powerful the desire, the quicker it happens. What happens? Anything. <laughs> Come on, drink up. I'll, I'll fill them again. Not much left, and this is the second bottle. 
Am I mistaken, Ivan, or have most of the people gone? What time is it? Time? <laughs> do I have a gold watch? Where do you sleep? Not far from here. Three kopecks a night. Hmm. You? Mm, nowhere yet. I've just arrived. Uh, hey, why don't we go to the same place? They have lots of beds. Real beds? Of course. You're in the city now, not on a farm. I used to come to the city with my father. He had business in the city often. Your father? Where is he? In the graveyard. We buried him almost a month ago. <laughs> He's well out of it. My dead father? What, what do you mean? Never mind. Hey, look out the window. How high the snow is. <laughs> I used to work on the estates, I did. Take care of the horses, help the gardeners. If a hen house needed fixing, I could do it. General uh, caretaking. That overseer, though, Peter, at my last place in Borisovo, he fired me. Unjust. I never did like those estate managers. Since my father died, I'm my own master. I don't have to work for anyone I don't he like. He was a black-bearded man with a scar on his face. He was my enemy. Why did he fire me, I ask you? Oh, I don't know. Two years I worked there in Borisovo. Everything was as it should be. Then, one day, Peter Yasevich, he gets angry with me. Accuses me with the cook, Maria. Said she and I, we did uh, things like that. And then about the reins. Mm, that was my fault, too. The reins got lost. Look for them, he says. I can't find them. Then go, he says. Get out. You're finished here. I, I'm no use to him, he says. <laughs> I know why he fired me. Jealous. Hmm? He wanted Maria for himself, but she wouldn't look at him. He, of course, you can't fire a cook. <laughs> They're hard to find. Uh, Vanya, order another half bottle. Hmm? When I get work, I'll order you six bottles. <laughs> Waiter, my friend wants more vodka. Huh? And, uh, and then we go. <laughs> Are you awake? Oh, go away. My mother always stood over me like that in the morning. Vanya, are you awake? Get up. Three kopecks oh. only entitles us to be here to seven o'clock. I thought you told me there were real beds here. Planks of wood. <laughs> what difference did it make to you, Vanya? <laughs> you were so drunk last night I could have thrown you into the well. Oh. <laughs> Come along. Get up! Uh, now, who are you kicking? I'll show you you don't kick a man like that. Hold on, hold on, hold on there. Spent all my uh, money on you and you kick me out. Get, get, a, get away from me, you greenhorn. Greenhorn, is it? I, I warned you. See this? A, a, a knife? Yes. Long and sharp. Now, get away from me, stupid idiot. I wasn't an idiot last night when I spent all my money on you. All right, all right, all right. I'll, I'll put it away. Yeah, calm down. I, I don't like to be kicked, that's all. I'll sell my boots and share with you. Hmm? You really hit me hard in the stomach. You'll see, you'll see, I don't abandon my friends. We're not the rich who quarrel over who gets what, huh? We'll get money. I always got my long knife. Hmm? Ivan, have you ever used it on someone? No, but I'd like to if I get hungry enough. They catch you and send you to Siberia if you try. <laughs> threats. They whip you with threats. Don't worry. You're not rich enough for me to slice you up. <laughs> Siberia. Ha! Maybe some things are worth going to Siberia for. What a clear, 
picture of the dregs of humanity, the lower depths, as Gorky called them, is painted here. And the bleak, dark shadow cast across it, that foreboding sense of impending doom. These outcasts struggling to keep alive in a society that rejects them. What next? I shall return shortly with Act Two. homeless Russians have come to the city for work. Vanya spends all his money on vodka. Ivan sells his precious boots for a miserable two rubles. During the day, blue with cold, they roam the streets. Sometimes they're hired to chop ice, sometimes to split wood. Not often. The pay is in kopecks, pennies. Vanya is reduced to begging. Ivan to stealing. At night, they share and quarrel. It's food, isn't it? Raw, frozen cabbage? It twists my inside. <laughs> you managed to eat half of it just the same, I see. And yesterday, raw potatoes and turnips. I never thought I'd be living like this. And I, uh, flop house with dozens of bums. It's better than spending the night out there. Besides... Who are you to look down on the poor? But I want to work. So do I. Is it my fault it's easier to steal than to find work? Six <laughs> kopecks between us. Another night on these miserable wooden planks. <laughs> That's gratitude. For you, I sold my boots. Two rubles. Have you forgotten? And what about my 50 kopecks? Have you forgotten? Uh, I was a fool to take you up. To befriend you, ignorant peasant. Hey, go back to your village. Why do you hang around here? Be huh? Because I'm ashamed to go home. Oh, you wouldn't understand that. What could I tell my mother? That I wasted all my money on vodka and, uh, and poured it down your ugly throat? Ha! You're a weakling. Not strong enough for the city. If you had guts... What? What? No, no, never mind. Muscle bound like an ox is, but weak in the head. Guts. Courage. Uh, you don't even know what I'm talking about. Suppose I told you I was ready for anything. Then what? What? To steal some more? Uh, you, you wouldn't be interested. <sighs> You don't have any ideas. You're all talk. Oh, all right, I'll tell you. Only... Only, only. You have nothing to say. Stop pretending. Big plans, ideas. Leave me alone. Hey, hey, hey. Vanya, listen. Come with me. Where? To Borisova. What for? I'll tell you on the way. Tell me now. We start off tonight. I know the way. We'll get even with that Peter Yasevich. Who's that? That black-bearded, black-hearted overseer who fired me. Hey, we'll rob the place. Oh, go to the devil. Will not leave me alone. I am trying to sleep. Listen, 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 listen. It's simple. I know every in and out of the estate. Where the money is kept. And the silver. And spoons. Goblets in a cabinet behind glass. Gold goblets. Get away from me, you devil. It'll be easy. No one will know. Hey, that'll pay back that Peter. Uh, fire me for no good reason after two years' service. Uh, they'll send him to prison. They will. He's the only one who knows where everything is. <laughs> He'll get it. Ivan? Brains. Brains. That's what I have. This is the time to do it. Huh? Snow everywhere. Vanya would know. Ivan, is there much money in it? It's not easy walking in this snow. Your feet sink right in. Is it much further? I don't know. All the landmarks that are familiar are covered. Are we on the right road? Yeah, of course we are. 
What do you think I am, stupid? You can hardly see in front of me. <laughs> That's good. Means no one will see us either. No witnesses. You think they'd stop, eh? They see two men on the road and they drive right by, throwing up a spray of ice all over us. That's their way, the rich. They don't see anything they don't wish to. Ivan, can you walk slower? My legs won't work. They're stiff with the cold. Uh, Force them to walk, you idiot. Think of the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Uh, When we get there... uh, Are you listening, Vanya? Yeah. Uh, When we get there, the first thing we do is set fire to the shed. Understand? When it catches, everybody will run to the fire. Peter Yasevich, too. We'll make a big fire. Then we go into the house and clean it out. Hey, you and I. And if they catch us? Who, who would catch us? You have a fire in the shed, you have to put it out. Not run after the thieves. You don't know human nature. Uh, oh, here's another sled coming. Vanya, let's stand here and wait for the driver. Perhaps he will stop and give us a lift. Come, Vasya! Come! Come! Ah. You see him? See that smug look on his face? Stared at us as if we were dogs. He sells charcoal. How do you know? All that soot on the back of the sleigh. Bags of coal. Black as his heart. He was alone, too, Vanya. Big fur rug all over him. Plenty of room for two more. Ah, let's keep walking. Ivan, Ivan, do you have any idea how far we've come? How can I? There's no seeing what's in front of us. If someone doesn't give us a lift, we won't get there before dark. Huh. If someone said, hop on, we, we could even pay five kopecks apiece. For what five kopecks apiece? We have no money. <laughs> you think I'm stupid enough to travel without something for emergencies? And I took it from the flop house attendant when he was asleep. Fifty kopecks. Well, uh, we need it more than he does. Anya! I'm, I'm here. I'm here. Are we there? See that house? Huh? I know it. Borisovo? The inn at Fokino. Two towns from Borisovo. Let's go in and have a glass. Oh. Yes, yes. I think we got here just in time. I might have passed out. Hey, see that man in the corner drinking beer by himself? Which corner? There. The table with three chairs. See him? The man with the black hands. You never get your hands clean. He's got his feet on the second chair. See? He's taking off his jacket. On the, on the third chair... That warm, beautiful sheepskin jacket. Oh, 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 yes. That was his sleigh and horse tied up outside. He passed on the road. Remember? Hey, maybe he feels better and uh, he'll give us a ride to Borisovo. Vanya, uh, come on. Take the bottle and your glass. We'll go talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a good-sounding cough, brother. <clears throat> Did anyone ask you? Oh, oh I, I didn't mean to insult you. I uh, I was concerned. Uh, what do you want? <coughs> uh, want? Uh, I want nothing. I uh, I heard you coughing, that's all. My uh, my concern for my fellow man. Uh, you sell charcoal. That's what it is. The dust. <laughs> it gets into your lungs. Uh, are you going in the direction of Borisovo? What does it matter to you? My friend and I, uh, we're going there. We've been hired by the oil factory. Uh, Thought you might like some company if you're going in the same direction. Give you a ride? (laughs) For nothing? (laughs) I see you're a shrewd businessman. Uh, We'll give you five kopecks apiece. I don't need it. Uh, Ten kopecks apiece. Uh, hmm? What's the difference to you? I told you we'd get 
the lift. It's even colder under these coal bags at the back of the sled. Walking. Ooh, the air cuts my face. Then cover your head with the coal bags. Oh, what do you expect for ten kopecks? A fur rug? Uh, I'm going to move forward and talk to him. Hum, Laska, hum. That's a good horse. Uh, Barasova is not far away, brother. Far enough. Uh, you take this road every week? When I have to. Mm. I neglected to ask your name. Uh, I am Ivan Salakin. My friend in the back of the sleigh is Vanya Kuzin. <clears throat> My name is Nikolai Nikolovich. Who are you? Uh, me? Uh, a human being. Everybody's a human being. I'm asking where do you belong? I belong nowhere. Uh, I have no relatives. Uh, Vanya! You back there. Uh, are you still alive? Yes. Barely. I look at you two. I can see you are unfortunate. Both of you in rags. <laughs> Bums. Loafers, I suppose. Uh, oh, what do you mean? We're, we're uh, hard workers. Do you think I believed you? And you said you were going for a job in Borisovo, an oil factory? Huh. Take me. I burn charcoal. Take it to town, to this distillery. I live it in peace. I have enough to eat, something to wear, shoes on my feet. A man who works can get along. Two bums. Why do you want to live? You're cold, hungry. The wind must be cutting you in half. It's crazy. Is that the way people should live? A man should live well. Uh, you share your money with me, and, and I'll live well. What? Uh, I said, you share your money. I'll share you. you do you see this? This iron weight on the end of this chain. You try anything funny and I'll smash your head in. Whoa! Whoa there! Now, get out. Uh, here? But we're... 21st from anywhere. I don't care. Get out. We gave you 20 kopecks to ride all the way to Borisovo. Get out. Uh, I hate you. you. You parasite. You think you're the only one who wants to work? I wouldn't ride with you. Dog. I'll get out. Listen, teach your lesson. Coward. Uh, hit me. Hit me in the back with that weight. Uh, a man's back is turned. I'll pull you down in the road with me, you yeah. scum. Help! Mother! Take your hands from my throat! Maria! Maria! Maria, come help me! The snow swirls around the sleigh. Two human bodies twist and struggle on the ground. One to kill, the other to live. Ivan has come to the end of his rope no longer able to bear contempt and insult. He is a wild man, one hand closing about Nikolai's throat, the other holding a knife. I shall return shortly with Act Three. Vanya, crushed by the cold, lies in the sleigh buried under empty coal sacks. Hearing the charcoal burner cry out, he is seized by terror. I'll say I was asleep and didn't hear anything, he says to himself. Vanya stumbles to his feet. He sees his friend slowly get up from the ground. In front of the sleigh lies a dead man. It's done. He won't torture anyone anymore. There's blood all over you. Uh -huh. A knife cuts. That's what it's for. The horse is looking at us. It saw everything. Uh, idiot. He, the horse isn't likely to do any talking. Oh, eh? We've done it now. Uh, well, better to kill him than have him kill us. Come on. Let's take his clothes off. You can have the sheepskin jacket. I'll have the overcoat. Uh, come on, Vanya. We, we must hurry. Someone may come by. You're not afraid, Ivan? How is it possible? You're afraid? Help me. Come on, come on. Leave his trousers on. Uh, Here, take his cap. Uh, where's my own cap? Uh, my father's cap. 
Yeah, they must have dropped it somewhere in the snow. Yeah, here, here, then put this one on. Uh, you'll be cold. It won't look good, a man without a cap. I'm going to turn his pockets inside out. Uh, hey, look at that. A gold coin. And five rubles. No, seven. Is this... Even... Tell me, is this... The first time you... Killed someone? Huh? What am I? A bandit? I only asked because you undressed him so quickly. It's hard to strip someone living. But the dead one is a cinch. Ivan, let's go back. Right now, back to the city. No, no. Ivan, please, I'm, I'm scared. First we must sell the horse. And then we'll go to Borisivo. Set fire to the shed. <laughs> I'd like to see Peter's face. What are you talking about? We're done for, brother. What's going to happen to us? A dead man? Blood everywhere? <laughs> Is this what we wanted for life? Done for? What do you mean done for? Are we the only ones who killed a man? <laughs> Is this the first time it happened on Earth? Please, please my brother, please don't be angry. How can I help it? Here, this thing has happened and you're whimpering like a baby. Come on. We have to bury him. Help me dig a pit. Clear away the snow. Then we'll drag him over. We're done. Let's go. On to the sleigh. It's no good, Ivan. Someone will see this mound beside the road. There are snow banks everywhere, and it's coming down heavier. That'll cover him even more. They won't find him until spring. Oh, we're done for, Ivan. Nothing good can come of this. The horse is getting nervous. Uh, I'll go calm it down. Uh, 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 Vaska, steady now. Good horse. Uh, good Vaska. Uh, I'll hold on to the reins. Uh, you get on by the Oh, not yet. There's blood on you. You have to clean it off. You're right. I, oh, yes. I'll clean myself with some snow. Uh, hey, Vanya, now you're beginning to think like a man. Uh, we'll sell the horse and then go back to the city. Uh, the devil with Peter. Let him rot in Borosivo. Uh, go on. Take the reins. Horses and wagons and sleighs. That's your specialty, isn't it? Uh, I'll be up there as soon as I've cleaned off this blood. Shut the door! You want us all to freeze to death? Shut the door, Vanya. You heard what the lady said? Uh, how's that, miss? Uh, should I put a chair in front of it just in case it blows open again? Hmm? Oh, don't be stupid. Do you want to stop other customers from coming into our tavern? Do you think we can exist on two people's drinks? Turn on the tap, miss, and give us a glass each. Oh, we are out of beer. I'll have to go down to the cellar and bring up another keg. Hey, don't go away. Uh, in this blizzard, where, where should we go? I'm scared, Ivan. What of? Money in your pockets and a horse and sleigh outside to take us wherever we want to go? No good is going to come out of this. I know it. Is that all you can say, hmm? Be quiet. No good's going to come of what? Uh, uh, who are you? Nice way to talk. I run this tavern. Well, I, I mean to, to come upon a man suddenly like that and ask questions. I, um, I'm, I'm waiting for your girl to bring up some beer. Mm. You come a long way? Uh, we? Uh, uh, no. No. Uh, we, uh, we, we don't come from far away. Uh, about, uh, 30 bursts. In which direction? Uh, uh, that way. Ah, so you're from Fokino. Oh, here. Here is a barrel full. I've uh, changed my mind. I'll have vodka. Uh, Vanya? Uh, vodka? Anything you say. Is that your brother? Oh, no, no, we're not brothers. Uh, here you are. For my friend and I. Uh, keeper, pick it up. It's for you. Uh, don't you want the money for the vodka? No, Harry. You may want a few more. Vanya, to your health. To yours, Ivan? Uh, let's go now, Ivan. I, I, I think we should go. Let's drive off. What for? We still have a long way, even with the horse. 
don't like the way that man looks at us. Who? Oh, the, the tavern keeper? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> These fellows look at everyone that way. When you've been in as many taverns as I have, it will not bother you. Suppose they find out. What's to find out? Two men drive up in a sleigh, get out and have a drink. Hmm? It happens all the time. What is it with you fellows? You stop drinking? Natasha, unplug the beer. Maybe these gentlemen would prefer it. One at a time. I haven't given you your money for the last ones. Did you ever see anyone so anxious to pay up all the time, Natasha? What is this? A gold coin? I haven't seen a gold coin since I was baptized. Look, Natasha, millionaire. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, I, I have rubles. Uh, 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 my mistake. By the way, whose is that horse? Uh, that horse? You, the silent one. I look at you and your friend answers. What's the matter with you? Uh, uh, y- yes, yes, the horse is ours. Oh, here. Here are your drinks. Natasha, that horse out there, doesn't it look familiar? I saw these two ride up with it. It must belong to them. You think so? Uh, Of course it's ours. (laughs) Who else is? You silent one. What do you do for a living? Me? Yes, you. Who am I looking at? Uh, We're butchers. What are you saying? Butchers. So that's why I noticed in the front of the sleigh there was bloodstains. What? Didn't you know? Come outside, I'll show you. This horse looks so familiar, Natasha. Yes, Joseph. I see what you mean. Are you sure it's yours? Uh, of course it's our horse. <laughs> Didn't I say it was? Uh, you're restless. Why don't you go pat him on the nose? Certainly. Uh, I, uh, I don't have any sugar with me. <laughs> uh, uh, there, there, Vaska. Ivan, get back. Doesn't seem very friendly, your horse. I know horses, Joseph. That horse is frightened of something. He doesn't like that man. What are you talking about, stupid girl? No, no, no rudeness, please. Oh, that horse, I'll, I'll tell you, she's uh, a, a little nervous. She doesn't like standing about. She wants us to be on our way. She? Did you say she? <laughs> That's no mare. Listen to the man, Natasha. Ah, come here, you two. Now, isn't that blood on the front of the sleigh? Uh, of course it's blood. What did you expect on a butcher's sleigh? Fish scales. Joseph, come back here. Coal sacks. Empty coal sacks. I think this sleigh belongs to the charcoal burner. Oh, Nikolai. Hmm? But Natasha, you heard what the gentleman said. They're butchers. <clears throat> Uh, thank you for both making us feel so welcome, but we must go now. I left my cap inside. Oh, uh, uh, yes, uh, so did I. Can't get along in this weather without a cap. Did you find your cap, Vanya? I've got mine. Young, uh, young lady, goodbye for the last time. Uh, where is our host? Oh, he'll be back in a minute. Excuse me, you, sir, with the sheepskin jacket, is, is that blood on your collar? Blood? Uh, uh, uh we're going now. Uh, come on, Ivan. I, I think you should wait. Joseph will be right back. He'll want to say goodbye, personally. Uh, it's all right, Rohanya. Hmm? Uh, why not? Uh, I, I don't, I don't like to be rude. Please, Ivan. Uh, y- you don't understand, miss. We're in a hurry. Oh, wait. Anyway. What for? Well, Joseph went for the bailiff. The, the bailiff? Is, is that like the police? The bailiff's nothing to me. Oh, perhaps you'll be something to him. Ah, here is Joseph. The bailiff's coming. He's just out front looking at your horse. They didn't wish to go, Joseph, without saying goodbye. I... I give up. It's all over. Take me now, please. Vanya, uh, Vanya, be quiet. <laughs> He's drunk. Two glasses, and he doesn't know what he's saying. Good day, my friends. Which of the two coal-carrying butchers? These two, Bailiff. Well, now. 
Well, now, who are you? I... I... Take me. Take me, please. Uh, uh, Mr. Bailiff, don't listen to Vanya. He, he's drunk. One at a time. Make a clean breast of it, men. Where did you get the horse? Stealing is a very bad offense here. Especially a man's horse. You in the sheepskin jacket. You look like a horse thief to me. It isn't me. It's it's him. Uh, we, we didn't steal the horse. It just pulled the sleigh along and we were on it. We didn't steal anything. We buried the charcoal burner. He's... He's there, not far away, on the road, in the snow. We were, we were just driving along, honest. I was asleep. I was trying to keep warm under the coal sacks. It's not me. They, they, they were fighting. I came out, and, and it was all over. All I did was dig a hole in the snowbank to bury him. We, did, we didn't want to kill him. He had a weight on the end of a chain, and he beat Ivan. Look, 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 his eyes are staring. His face is blue because of it. It's, it's the weight Nikolai hit him with it in the back. His back was turned. He started it. We were two innocent victims. We couldn't get work anywhere. But the horse, we didn't steal it. We wouldn't do that. Uh, go, no, go to it, Vanya. Go ahead. Don't stop. Bury me. Mother, father, I didn't mean it. These two criminals, uh, fools, bone-headed fools. It is said the story you have heard was drawn from life, that these people of the lower depths of Russian life were known to Maxim Gorky that he wrote from the world he had lived in. Gorky himself had experienced many hard years from the time he was eight years old and went to work. His voice speaks loudly for the poor underdog caught in the haphazard design of fate. I'll be back shortly. Once there was a young Russian poet. He was 19. It was Christmas. He had seen too much injustice, felt too much despair. So with his last coins, he bought a revolver, aimed it at his chest, and shot himself. That bullet remained in his lungs for 50 years. No wonder he saw life as a precarious thing it is. His name? Maxim Gorky. Our cast included Fred Gwynn, Russell Horton, Bryna Rayburn, and Ray Owens. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.